bag back here for? <laughs> it's 10.01, and I'm calling this March 30th, 2021 meeting of commissioners court to order. Commissioner Cable. Thank you, Your Honor. Today, uh, I'm pleased to present for doing our morning invocation, Rabbi Dan Gordon. Uh, he is the, uh, the rabbi for Temple Beth Torah, which is up in Humble, Texas, Judge. He's been there for 23 years, uh, ordained at uh, Masifta Adath Wolkowski Rabbinical Academy in New York. And I know that I'm butchering those pronunciations. He has spent many years working with students in summer camps. Uh, man, he's managed an auto parts warehouse. He loves to connect with people through stories. He has co-chaired the National Jewish Storytelling Network. He's a strong advocate for interfaith dialogue. Uh, and he is a member of the American Jewish Coalition and the Coalition for Mutual Respect. Judge, this week is Passover and the next week is Holocaust Remembrance Day. And so I think that it is appropriate that we now allow Rabbi Dan Gordon to uh, lead us in our morning invocation. Thank you so much, Commissioner Cagle. And, and you didn't butcher the pronunciation of New York. You got that perfectly. Uh, the, the rabbinical academy, though, is Volkovisk, which I don't expect you to pronounce anytime soon. Uh, thank you so much, Commissioner Cagle, and respectful greetings to the Honorable Judge Hidalgo, as well as Commissioners Ellis, Garcia, Ramsey, and all others who have business to present here today. It's an honor to be invited to offer a blessing for this important meeting. Harris County, as you know, includes one of the most diverse populations in the U.S., and I commend the commissioners for choosing diverse ways to open your meetings. Of the many faith communities represented in Harris County, this season recognizes three of the most numerous communities observe important springtime festivals, define their sacred values. The Christian community is preparing for Easter, a time of rebirth, renewal, resurrection, and hope. In two weeks, the Muslim community will be starting the sacred fast of Ramadan, strengthening their community and spiritual connections with the Almighty. And my own community in the Jewish world is in the midst of Passover, the story of liberation of one people that carries universal lessons. Of the many lessons the Passover story teaches, I'm going to share two significant ones that are meaningful for Harris County at this time. One commandment in the Hebrew scriptures is repeated more than any other. 36 times in one form or another, we are taught, treat the stranger as one of your own, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Almost every American has ancestors who were once new to this country and could be regarded as strangers. Thinking of people as strangers leads to ignorance, fear, and prejudice. When we make the effort to get to know the other, to truly know the other, there are no strangers, and we become one community. Another lesson from the biblical exodus helps us learn about responding to challenges. The Jewish people were enslaved for generations. Of course, this is a universal story, as we know too well about other populations who have also been unjustly enslaved. When our people was finally redeemed, our freedom journey started in a mysterious, sometimes dangerous desert wilderness. The struggles in the desert led to finding a promised land, but of course, there were challenges there too. Throughout the generations, one challenge leads to another, but each one brings new knowledge, wisdom, and inner strength. Harris County has endured hurricanes, debilitating freeze, economic turmoil, and many other challenges. Those who dedicate themselves to the well-being of the community know this as well as anyone. Overcoming a hurricane does not mean we won't have another one, but we learn from our challenges. And now, as we battle a health pandemic, we count on the wisdom of our leaders to help guide us to ways of health and safety. 3,000 years ago, the Jewish people had a guide to help them through challenges in the wilderness. His name was Moses. When the challenges were great, Moses and his brother Aaron delivered a blessing that has stood the test of time for many Jews and Christians. I offer you this blessing that is found in the book of Numbers, for the sacred work you do to care for the well-being of all Harris County 
It's a blessing that reminds us we are not alone, and God is with us as we are with each other. May God bless you and protect you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God's presence be with you and give you peace. Judge, commissioners, and staff, may the work you do today and every day bring a sense of comfort and unity to all those who live in and visit our home, Harris County, Texas. And may us all say, and may we all say, Amen. Amen. Shalom, Rabbi. Thank you. Rabbi, thank you Shalom so much. Shalom to all. Peace words. be with you. Thank you, Judge Hidalgo. Thank you, Commissioner Cagle. Let's move on to our resolutions. We've got several this morning. Our st I'll start with a resolution commending Marie Cook Tran on her retirement. Whereas Marie Cook Tran retired on February 26, 2021, after 27 years of dedicated service to the Harris County Public Library, the mission of the library is to provide information and resources to enrich lives and strengthen communities. She joined the library in 1993 as a cataloger. When the opportunity to work as a desk assistant arose at the new Parker Williams Branch Library, she jumped at the chance. She's been an incredible asset since the branch opened in 1994. She never stood still. She's played an integral part in the surrounding Vietnamese community and has worked with her colleagues to prepare some of the branch's most popular programs. She goes above and beyond and that flexibility has made her impact on the community quite large. Ms. Tran looks forward to spending more time with her family and continuing her passion for gardening. Her energy and exceptional customer service will be missed by colleagues and customers alike. Therefore, be it resolved that Harris County Commissioner's Court hereby commends and congratulates Marie Cook Tran for 27 years of dedicated service to the county and wishes her our absolute best in her retirement. Congratulations, Ms. Tran. I believe she's on the line. Yes, I am. Go ahead. Um, thank you very much for allowing me to work for the county for the last 27 years. I enjoy my time here, and thank you very much for the resolution. Thank you for your service, and congratulations. Congratulations, thank Maria. You. All, all the best you. on this new chapter. Thank you. We have another resolution, and this is on um, commemorating the life and memory of Miss Lisa Patty. And Miss Lisa's sister is on the on the line. She passed away on March 7th, 2021, and is survived by and will be missed by her loving husband, Stephen, Patty, children, Elizabeth and Jarrett, parents, Nicolasa and Jose Montalvo, siblings, Don, Erica, Ernestine, and Joe, other loving family members, and many treasured friends. She was hired by the Harris County Clerk's Office in February 2006 under the Honorable Beverly Kaufman. She began her career in the clerk's office as a document organizer for the Real Property Division. During her tenure, she displayed excellent attention to detail and she was promoted to quality control clerk. Her sweet smile, laughter, positive attitude, generous spirit is celebrated and will be missed by her colleagues. Some recently shared this kind tribute, quote, I will truly miss you being my neighbor at work. You were always positive, and I will miss your singing of your special song when it played on the radio while we were working. Lisa was the recent voice heard when the Harris County Clerk's Office called in sick or were running late. She was very active in her parish and brought her faith and good-hearted nature to the Clerk's Office. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the Harris County Commissioner's Court offers its sincerest condolences to the family and friends of Lisa Patty and recognizes her 15 years of dedicated service to Harris County. 
to the family, we're very sorry for your loss and grateful for your support of this incredible, incredible member of our Harris County family for 15 years. I believe her sister is on the line. Judge, unfortunately, we cannot reach uh, her sister. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Lucinda, for trying to reach her. And if she calls in, let us know. Thank yes, you for doing this, do. Judge. Thank you for doing this. Condolences to the family. The next resolution is designating the month of April as Child Abuse Prevention Month in Harris County. <clears throat> April is nationally recognized as Child Abuse Prevention Month, a time to raise awareness and provide resources for communities to ensure children are safe and to strengthen families. Children are one of the greatest resources, as we know, but research shows that children who experience trauma, such as child abuse or neglect, are at greater risk of experiences, experiencing an array of social and economic hardships and often develop emotional and behavioral problems, do poorly in school, are more likely to enter the criminal justice system. But community-based programs, especially those focusing on prevention, are essential to reducing rates of child abuse and neglect. The Texas Abuse Hotline by the Department of Family and Protective Services is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, nationwide, as a resource for reporting suspicions of abuse and provides training and resources. Whereas during the month of April, Harris County Attorney Christian Menefee, the Children's Assessment Center, Texas Department of Family and Protective Services, and Harris County Resources for Children and Adults, as well as various community partners, will join forces to raise awareness of child abuse, of course, continuing the work they do year round with an incredibly committed team. Therefore, be it resolved that Harris County Commissioner's Court hereby designates the month of April 2021 as Child Abuse Prevention Month in Harris County, Texas. County Attorney Menifee. Thank you, Judge, and thank you to the commissioners uh, for your continued willingness to support uh, our efforts and the efforts across the county to protect children. Uh, it's with great appreciation that the County Attorney's Office speaks in support of this resolution recognizing April this Child Abuse Prevention Month. Our office is committed to the protection of children uh, in Harris County from abuse and neglect. As you all know, we employ a team of attorneys, paralegals, and support staff who are really dedicated to this work. Uh, 89 of the employees in our office are dedicated to this area of law, and 31 of the lawyers in our office practice child welfare law. Uh, I have a ton of statistics here that I, I won't run through all of them, but suffice it to say that we file thousands of cases every single year uh, in protection of children in Harris County and in representation of the Department of Family and Protective Services, which at the state of Texas level uh, does the necessary work to go in and ensure that kids are being protected from abuse and neglect. And I've met with a ton of folks in our uh, CPS division here in the office, and these folks don't just do this work on a day-to-day -day basis, they really live this work. Uh, Nelson Mandela once said, there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way it treats its children. And we know that here in Harris County, children depend on many people to keep them safe from harm, such as first responders, teachers, and doctors. And I'm incredibly proud to work with a staff of folks who will continue to do the work uh, to also be on that list of folks who are protecting children. So again, thank you, Judge, uh, for your support of this resolution. And thank you to every single member of Commissioner's Court for your support of this office and the work that we've done here and for the work that you do in your departments and in other departments across the county. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Commissioner Garcia, and then Commissioner Cable, then Commissioner Ramsey. Thank you, Judge. And uh, Mr. Menifee, thank you uh, for supporting this uh, resolution and uh, proud and excited to vote for it. You know, I, in all of my career as a uh, law enforcement officer, a few things have, have shocked me. But the one uh, that has always escaped me uh, in terms of understanding is um, how anyone could have the capacity to injure something so innocent. I'll, uh, I'm never ashamed to say that when my daughter was born, the first thing I thought of was when I was holding her, just as she was born, was how could anybody hurt uh, 
of something so precious, uh, so beautiful. And uh, it still makes me choke up when I remember that. But I, I, I just can't uh, thank those. And look, this is one area of work in law enforcement that I uh, uh, didn't want to get assigned to because I knew I would lose my career. Uh, I, I just, uh, so I just applaud and commend and appreciate uh, everyone from the prosecutors to the investigators and the social workers, everyone in between for uh, their professionalism, their commitment uh, to uh, the most vulnerable amongst us who truly do not have a voice uh, because if not for their work, uh, this uh, a lot of these cases would not be possible to bring justice to those tiny victims. So, uh, this is uh, just brings back uh, brings back a lot of memories, and I'm just uh, glad to see it on the agenda. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Commissioner Commissioner Cagle. Thank you, Your Honor, Mr. Menifee. I've I've had the privilege of of being at I guess nine of these resolutions now, uh, where we uh, recognize Child Abuse Prevention Month. And one of the things that always struck me is the, the team that would come. And Mr. Menifee, you've, your, your first term in service, you're, you're going to miss out on being able to have gathered in commissioner's court all the way down the side of our courtroom uh, the, the magnificent team of folks that assemble and dedicate themselves to help and to protect these children. And so I, uh, I know that uh, as you gave your remarks that you recognize that fabulous team that is in place from the assessment center to your prosecutors, uh, quasi prosecutors in your office, and then the, uh, the folks that work over on, on the other uh, uh, side of the aisle in the DA's office all coming together to make this a better, safer place. And so um, uh, next year, Mr. Menifee, you'll get to have the privilege of standing arm in arm and next to each other uh, as this resolution is presented as we stand virtually linked in fighting this abuse in, uh, in our region and in our nation. Commissioner Ramsey. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Mr. Menifee. There is a no higher calling, certainly in the in the biblical sense, than how we treat children. And I know currently I'm serving on a board called Loving Kids with Bishop Dixon, and our priority is to go into underserved uh, schools and read to children. And it grieves me greatly that we've not been able to do that for nine months. So the very children that probably need that the most are not able to do that. So that is, that's a point of prayer. That is a point of focus in terms of, of being sure that we provide resources where we can, particularly during this time. They are so significantly impacted by what we're seeing going through in terms of the pandemic. Uh, they're impacted by crime more than they should be. So thank you for what you do. That's you're on the front lines of being sure that there is uh, some clear uh, protection for these children that need it. Thank you very much for putting it there. Commissioner Ellis. Judge, I just wanted to chime in. And Ms. Menifee, it's a great resolution. And I have noticed on social media, you've been spending time in, in Austin. And, you know, we're all supportive of the resolution this year, as we are all the time. But it is important that people like you who are willing to get out and make the case, usually financial resources and policies are a big part of making a, a dent on these problems. And even during a pandemic, which is global, obviously, I'm going to make sure I post this. And we all have to do as much as we can uh, to go out and, and deal with the circumstances as they are uh, before us to try to make a difference. But hey, it's a great resolution. Thank you. And uh Look forward to working with you on, on this and so many issues down the road. Thank you. Thank you. The next resolution 
is uh, item 349, a resolution designating Thursday, May 6th as Harris County Peace Officers Memorial Day and further designating May 9th as National Police Week in Harris County. Whereas Peace Officers Memorial Day will be observed in Harris County, Texas on Thursday, May 6, 2021, as part of Police Week to honor those law enforcement officers who've lost their lives or who have become disabled in the line of duty. It's important that all residents understand the problems, duties, and responsibilities of their law enforcement agencies, and that members of our law enforcement agencies recognize their duty to serve the people by protecting their life and property. Whereas the President and Congress of the United States, as well as the Governor and Legislature of Texas have designated a day in May as Peace Officers Memorial Day and the week in which it occurs as Police Week. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Harris County Commissioner's Court proudly designates Thursday, May 6, 2021 as Harris County Peace Officers Memorial Day and further designates the week of May 9th through 15th, 2021 as National Police Week in Harris County, Texas, extending its sincerest appreciation to all the dedicated police officers who serve and protect our community. Every day, these brave men and women put on their uniform, pin on their badge, and put themselves in harm's way. With their service comes risk and sacrifice, we are grateful year round for their service and we take one week each year in May to thank them for all they do to keep our communities, families and property safe. Commissioner Garcia. Thank you, Judge. And this is another one that's uh, very special to me for a lot of reasons. Um, I would ask Judge if, if uh, uh, our colleagues and, and you would indulge me for recognizing a moment of silence on behalf of those officers uh, who have paid the ultimate sacrifice, their families who continue to miss them, and their colleagues uh, who also miss them and work uh, to continue uh, their uh, the work that they started. So, Judge, if, if, if we might, moment of silence. Thank you. Thank you, George. Thank you, Commissioner. That, go ahead, Commissioner Cagle. Judge, thank you for bringing this motion. Uh, I too uh, have a special connection, uh, not directly and career-wise in terms of serving with the badge on the streets, but in terms of hand-in-hand -hand working with our law enforcement community. And I, I want to, to thank you for reading that uh, and bringing it to us. And I also want to uh, remind the court and, and others that we will be having uh, our annual uh, virtual event this year of the uh, seventh annual police memorial ceremony. And this is something that Judge Ted Poe, when he was in Congress, started. And then Harris County picked that up once he retired from his congressional duties. And so this will be the seventh year that we are doing it. It will be virtual this year, Your Honor. And it's Monday, May 17th at 9 a.m. Um, during this period of time. And everyone is welcome. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Commissioner Cagle. Commissioner. Thank you, Judge, and appreciate this resolution. It's always great to pause and reflect and, and remember uh, their sacrifice, as Commissioner Garcia referenced, uh, daily. Uh, I think resolutions are great, and we should do that. It's also appropriate that when we can, and when it's appropriate, it makes sense to provide resources to those same officers. So we have those opportunities, and I look forward to having uh, more conversations on that. But uh, support of them uh, and encouragement to them is important as is providing resources where we can. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. 
Commissioner Garcia. Yes, go ahead. I'm sorry, we do have a speaker. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Lucinda. You're welcome. Major Jesse Razo with the Harris County Sheriff's Office. Go ahead, please, sir. Good morning and thank you, Judge Hidalgo and the commissioners. Uh, on behalf of Harris County Sheriff Ed Gonzalez and our entire agency, I want to thank you for recognizing Harris County Peace Officers Memorial Day. The past year has been a difficult one for our entire community, and that includes our peace officer family. The Sheriff's Office lost several members of our family in the past 12 months. This includes four teammates who died after contracting COVID-19, Sergeant Raymond Slowinski, Deputy Juan Menchaca, Deputy Johnny Tunches, Detention Officer Robert Perez. We also lost Cadet Cornelius Anderson, who had just begun his training at our Sheriff's Office Academy when he died unexpectedly. The Precinct 5 Constable's Office also lost a teammate to COVID-19, Deputy Mark Brown. Last week, these men's names were added to the Harris County Peace Officers Memorial Garden at Crime Stoppers of Houston. In May, we were ret returned there for a formal ceremony honoring their sacrifices. Again, thank you for honoring these brave public servants who gave their lives in service to our community. Thank you. Thank you, Major. Thank you. And I just, I was going to move on to Commissioner Garcia, but I just remembered, Commissioner, you, you mentioned to my staff that uh, Sheriff Gonzalez has a commitment here in a few minutes and that you needed him for one of the items. I apologize. I didn't get to that sooner. No uh, what, I, Commissioner Garcia, if you'll just remind me the item. 13. The okay. sheriff is on if you'd like him now. Thank you, Lucinda. Go ahead, Commissioner. So we'll take the brief detour to item 13 and then continue with the resolutions, take the speakers, and then uh, move on to the agenda. Wonderful. Go Thank ahead, you, Judge. Thank you. And uh, item on item 13, um, first, I want to just say to the sheriff, in uh, light of the, um, the resolution we just uh, presented, uh, please always know and let your staff, as well as Deputy Constables uh, know that we are always uh, respectful and mindful uh, that uh, they put themselves in harm's way. So thank you for your leadership, uh, Sheriff, and that of your of your law enforcement uh, family. On item uh, 13, <clears throat> this is, um, Judge, you know, uh, you and I have been concerned about how to be responsive to all aspects of this pandemic and um, in the issue of victimization and crime has not been uh, forgotten. Um, and I want to thank uh, Sheriff Gonzalez for helping to structure a uh, program uh, with uh, the help of the budget office to make sure that we are paying attention uh, to how to deal with those cases and making sure that those people who are dangerous, violent, in causing harm, especially in the way of domestic violence, can find them uh, find their way uh, to the county jail. And I know, with the help of the uh, sheriff and his team and our uh, other law enforcement colleagues, that uh, there'll be an opportunity to show just how effective this can be for all uh, members of our community. And so, this is a um, an overtime uh, uh, project. Uh, overtime initiative uh, when I was with the Houston Police Department. Uh, part of the thought of this was born from Mayor Lanier. Uh, Mayor Lanier took office uh, at the peak of a uh, horrendous crime wave, uh, working with uh, Chief Lucci. Uh, there was a very strategic overtime initiative that was implemented. And as a result, uh, the city of Houston was able to uh, see a dramatic reduction in contrast to other major cities. And so my hope is that uh, this uh, initiative will have the same impact. I'm very confident uh, that it will have a similar impact because uh, Sheriff Gonzalez has shared that uh, they did one uh, on his uh, with the resources that he had and that it showed very significant uh, uh, success. And so with that, uh, this item uh, is to move that funds be dispersed in tranches and that the budget management office work with the sheriff's office to develop a schedule for disbursement of funds for performance metrics and reporting on said performance metrics to qualify uh, tranches. This is again to focus uh, in the areas of uh, warrant execution. Uh, we have heard how 
there's been, uh, in order to try to maintain some degree of sanity in the county jail and protect the people uh, there that are there from the pandemic, uh, that the sheriff has, uh, uh, and the district attorney's office have issued a um, significant number of to be warrants. To uh, be means to be arrested. And, uh, and so those people are out there, but they've caused harm, they've caused uh, victimization, they've hurt uh, someone vulnerable. And we want to make sure that the sheriff's office crime reduction units have uh, the resources to prioritize these violent crimes and to go after them and uh, show them the door to the county jail. So that is uh, my item, uh, Judge. Uh, the only other thing that I'll add to it is that aggravated crimes increased by 21%. Uh, domestic violence incidents increased by 51%. Child uh, crimes were able to go unchecked without the ability of educational institutions to report signs of abuse to law enforcement officials. And so this is an opportunity uh, to provide the sheriff the resources uh, to uh, start bringing justice uh, and a jailhouse uh, to those uh, violent offenders. Judge. Uh, let's hear from Commissioner Cagle, Commissioner Ramsey, and then Commissioner Ellis. And, and uh, Commissioner Garcia, just let me know about when you wanna hear from Sheriff before he has to hop off. Go ahead, Commissioner uh, Cagle. Thank you, Your Honor. And thank you, Commissioner Garcia, for bringing this resolution. Um, I, I think that uh, it is an excellent uh, step and I, that's one foot forward. And I'd like to make the motion that we put the other foot forward with regard to our law enforcement community, which are our constables. Um, I think I circulated that around yesterday morning uh, after we received the, uh, the original resolution and would like to add uh, as a proposed amendment, which was uh, forwarded that we approve an additional 3 million from the same fund to be distributed equally among the county's eight constables for overtime units and those targets, offices targeting violent and serious crimes upon submittal of plans to the budget management department for review. Uh, uh, Commissioner, if, if I may, um, we do have the sheriff. I know he's on a, a compressed uh, schedule. I will say this, that uh, there's, um, with your number and my number, there's not enough money in that particular fund. Um, but I have spoken to the sheriff to think through how the entire law enforcement uh, community plays a role in this particular initiative. Uh, I would like to leave that with the sheriff and the budget management offices and uh, to to uh, figure out how to dissect that and make sure because that uh, it wouldn't make any sense to give folks warrants that are in some other area. Uh, so I'd like to uh, just ask for your consideration that we give uh, the sheriff, the budget management office and the constables the opportunity to uh, figure out how uh, that particular process would work. So with that, I'll just uh, judge if we could have the sheriff uh, uh, give his uh, thoughts. Let's have a show very briefly as I know he has to leave and then we'll hear from Commissioner Ramsey and Commissioner Ellis. Uh, good morning, Judge, Commissioner Garcia, to uh, Commissioners Ramsey um, and uh, Commissioner Cagle as well. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me this morning. Thank you for the uh, proclamation you issued as well on behalf of fallen officers, as well as the one uh, for child abuse, all very important. Uh, very excited about this initiative to be able to uh, supplement some of our uh, ongoing efforts to try to reduce crime uh, in our communities, in our county. Uh, we know there's been an uptick in violent crimes throughout the nation. And of course, Harris County is not immune to that. We said early on that with the onset of COVID, we would likely see more cases related to domestic violence as well as child abuse. Some of those safety nets have been removed with uh, children not being uh, always in, in, in person schools, for example, and teachers not able to be that liaison sometimes to really give us information to help uh, pinpoint whenever they see some of the, the warning signs of abuse. Uh, nonetheless, those uh, reports have uh, gone up and we need to make sure that we stay vigilant, proactive and on top of them, time, time, uh, time, is, time is of the essence. And so uh, we do look forward to being able to utilize these dollars and we thank uh, Commissioner Garcia very much for his leadership. We know he's intimately uh, in, informed on these issues having served in this very important role as sheriff. And uh, you know, it, it does take investment to be able to 
be proactive out there being able to address uh, pending warrants uh, that are targeted on the most violent as well as our crime reduction units as well. To Commissioner Cagle's point, uh, absolutely agree. This needs to be a shared responsibility and, and uh, very much look forward to including and working with our uh, uh, eight elected constables as well uh, to make sure that we have a coordinated response to this, that the dollars are being designated in, in a responsible way that suits the needs of the taxpayers, uh, victims of crime, and that we're most effective. And so look forward to making sure this is a coordinated um, uh, effort. And we really would uh, appreciate your, your favorable uh, support of this uh, of this uh, item. Thank you, Sheriff. Commissioner Ramsey. Thank you, Sheriff Gonzalez. Thank you uh, for your service, what you do. Uh, it's, it's great to vote on uh, support uh, for law enforcement. Uh, I agree with Commissioner Garcia, crime is up, precinct three. Uh, homicides are up 41%. Domestic violence up over 100%. So this is a crime demic that we need to put dollars into and it gets serious about. And this is how you address uh, the issue. And I agree with the spirit of this. We're gonna have some other opportunities to talk about how we can uh, support this going forward. I find it interesting uh, that the rollover funds that Commissioner, that Sheriff Gonzalez uh, uh, contributed, uh, to, as, as we look through that, that's about equal to what we're doing here. What am I saying? I'm saying that we've been able to replenish that, if you will, those dollars that uh, he had saved over time uh, to do some good, uh, some good law enforcement initiatives with. So uh, in the context of that and looking forward to having more discussions related to how we can support the sheriff's office and all of our law enforcement, including the constables, uh, is a good. I'll be supporting this and other initiatives to support uh, law enforcement. Thank you. Commissioner Ellis. Sheriff, are you still here? Yes, sir. And thank you, Commissioner Ramsey. Appreciate your support. Yeah. Sheriff, look, I, I, I appreciate uh, the fact that uh, you didn't have a lot of rollover because you were budgeting and spending it as you needed. Is that correct? So you, we, there was no really rollover from your department that we went in and moved. Is that pretty much correct? Um, yes, Commissioner. We try to obviously be good stewards of it. We've never gone over our budget, but we try to utilize the dollars in a smart way. And, and uh, obviously, you know, frankly, we could always use more, but we try to be uh, good stewards of the monies we do have and we appreciate it. And, and, and Sheriff, I appreciate your willingness to work to come up with an alternative respond to program and a host of other things, because we know during a pandemic, obviously uh, crime stats around the, the country are going up. And some of that is caused by a host of other issues that are brought about by economic malaise that we are in and a host of other issues. So we, we got to think outside the box, and I appreciate you doing that. As Commissioner Garcia said, the amount of money we have is, is three. If I understand it, maybe it's a question for you or Commissioner Garcia. Uh, if we put this three there, if you can't use it, then you would work in collaboration with the uh, constables and the budget office to decide what to do. Uh, but this motion uh, is to pretty much put you uh, in a key position to decide whether or not you can use it. And if not, out of that three, a decision would be made. I assume come back to us on putting it with the constables or somewhere else. Is that is that your intent, Commissioner Carson? Uh, sure. Commissioner Commissioner Ellis, I would I would uh, just counter on that a little bit. I think it's it's on the contrary. We would work proactively up front to make sure that we identify a number of uh, crime reduction slash violent crime initiatives up front and make sure we work collaboratively as we do quite often on, um, you know, impaired driving initiatives and many other things. Uh, you know, we have a very vast uh, geography um, and, and crime is everywhere. No area is immune. I know that Commissioner Ramsey just spoke about, um, you know, West Harris County, Northwest, the areas that he represents and, and crimes everywhere. And so we have to make sure that we're being good stewards. I think just because we're uh, countywide, it gives us uh, that global perspective of being able to make sure we're working collaboratively with everyone and not just dole out dollars in a way that's not 
the most responsible. Um, and so we'll try to make sure that we find a fair and equitable way that meets the mission of reducing crime in our communities. And uh, we'll report back with, with our efforts as we go uh, forward. Uh, the number one priority is to reduce crime in Harris County across the board. So you all are around a table or Zoom or whatever, and you all will sort it out. Just, we know the amount is three million, not, not going to <laughs> six Yes, correct. Uh, we, we would uh, do a collaborative type of approach where we would sit down, see, uh, get feedback from them on what they're seeing in their respective areas, uh, looking at data, and then trying to go after, again, the most heinous crimes. You know, of course, we're, we're very focused on, on violent crimes, uh, child abuse, domestic violence, adult sex crimes. You know, domestic violence, it, it's up. We have to be very smart of how we address that. Sometimes it's very hard to police crimes that obviously are occurring behind closed doors. And so a lot of that is also raising awareness to make sure communities know how to go to and find the necessary resources with areas such as the Houston Area Women's Center and other resources like that. But we also have to be following up with cases when we do get those reports that there could be a timely response as well because, uh, you know, that, that, that sometimes those domestic violence are the ones that end up becoming tomorrow's murder. Well, I think Commissioner uh, Garcia, you, you sent, is this the motion you sent around? The original That's correct. motion? I'll be That's glad correct. to say. Good deal, thank you. And Could Sheriff, again, oh, I'm sorry, Judge. If I might just add something before Sheriff hops off, I know Commissioner Cagle has a comment, but I, I want to just clarify here before we get to that, Sheriff. My understanding, and I appreciate the way the way you guys have drawn it up, Commissioner Garcia and I talked about something like this, so I appreciate it, Commissioner, is six, specific violent crime units that are facing backlogs and so that's the the violent crimes adult special crimes child abuse domestic violence crime criminal warrants for those violent crime offenders um and, and patrol crime and unit lieutenants is that commission is that a uh, sheriff and commissioner garcia still what we're talking about what throws me off is you know i think this is smart. I think that it's getting at um, hyper targeted solutions that will be evaluated. So we're not just throwing everything at the wall. Um, it is not about growing um, the, the force. It is about um, making sure that the best people have the ability to do their work more extensively. Uh, and it's gonna be, the, the effect is gonna be measured so we can see what happens. Uh, I think it's smart that it's being paired with violence interruption programs that JAD is conducting. I know they're conducting one that is to get at, um, trying to see here, the cure violence, to, to contact and divert individuals at high risk of recidivating. And then the hospital violence interruption program that gets people, you know, once they end up at the hospital. So it's sort of multi-pronged and this is smart, but I just, in, in this discussion about um, constables, I don't want to dilute what's been proposed. I think it makes sense if the constables want to work with budget to present something similar that would also be evaluated and also, uh, you know, but I, I don't want to dilute the proposal that, that the sheriff has made. So can you guys just clarify that? I, I would just add uh, one point, Judge, that uh, the, the, um, the warrants of which um, uh, need to be executed um, are really um, under the purview of the sheriff's office. So when when the, uh, agencies execute those warrants, they have to return those and they have to be well documented and then uh, and then well uh, 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 refiled or or, or 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 kept track of. And so in that regard, I think there's there's an excellent uh, utilization and coordination with the constables to do that. And then obviously, uh, whatever cases the, the sheriff has seen on his side, I won't speak for him, but um, that uh, uh, that further investigation to get to those warrant uh, points and get statements of victims and things of nature, that will be a work that the uh, sheriff's office, I'm sure, will uh, understand and, and accomplish. But those warrants um, sit in the uh, sheriff's office every day. Different agencies come and pick those up. But it will be good for the sheriff's office 
crime uh, uh, crime uh, uh, real time crime center to be able to make sure that those warrants and hotspots around the county are being uh, that they're connecting the dots uh, to make sure that they're having maximum impact, and that could be done with uh, coordination. Okay, so it's basically what I really appreciated is the sheriff identified specifically how many cases are in the backlog and how much overtime it's going to take to clear those cases. So you're still going to clear work to clear that backlog through overtime of the best officers, and and then you will you will work with the constables in the goal of the backlog in those six key areas. Yes, sure. uh, Judge, that that's correct. And and to your point earlier, I definitely agree that we do need some element of violent interruption programs as well. Uh, this will also have some advocates included. I know that in the past, you know, this court, I know uh, Commissioner Cagle, for example, has talked about uh, a greater emphasis, for example, on, uh, on the uh, survivor side of things as well. I know we're doing that with CJCC under your leadership as well. So this will also provide some advocates to do some of that outreach uh, to work on some of these cases proactively to seek the shelters and uh, work through the criminal process with them to make sure we have successful prosecutions and then those warrants as well uh, to make sure that we're focusing on, on the most, uh, you know, violent offenders out there uh, so that they don't continue to reoffend as much, you know, as much as we could limit that. And so it would be coordinated. To me, I don't see this as simply just throwing money at a problem. We have to be smart. We have to measure results, uh, which we will. And I think there's room as well for uh, collaboration with our uh, Harris County law enforcement partners. That's always uh, important as well, just to make sure that we force multiply. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, you know, it's about making sure we put the best teams together to accomplish the mission and not just throwing dollars at this. We want to make sure we're being effective for uh, Harris County residents uh, and, and uh, making sure that we, we distribute the monies to meet that mission, not necessarily on who gets what dollars and anything like that, because to your point, we want to make sure we don't lose sight of a very tight mission here uh, and that we uh, get results that really are working for the Harris County community and keeping our community safe. Yeah. I have a question for the sheriff before yeah. it goes away. Commissioner Cagle. Um, sheriff, I know that we're all wanting measurable metrics and outcome based determinative evaluations to be applied to these circumstances. But the constables are currently working with you on your bank robbery task force, the violent crime initiatives, the DWNI initiatives, and a number of others, which are all part of this program. And so my question to you is, is it sounds like there's going to be a table. Is this going to be a round table like King Arthur had with the knights that are all out there working together? Or are you going to be at the front of the table dictating to everybody that's down at the end and there's going to be the kids into the table and the adult into the table? Uh, well, Commissioner, I mean, in, in, in my four years, four plus years now, uh, we've never had that kind of relationship where it was me dictating to any of them. Obviously, they they run their uh, individual offices. They know the priorities of their respective communities. You know, we work collaboratively on a number of these initiatives. Some of these are just more general in nature, which is more, you know, maybe more visibility, uh, more driven by, let's say, a Labor Day initiative, holiday type initiative. You know, we want to make sure that we work collaboratively, uh, what the makeup of that looks like in terms of in a Zoom world, you know, if it's gathered around a virtual table, if you will, and talking about key priorities, we're going to we're going to work collaboratively with them. It, it's not me dictating alone, but at the same time is we want to make sure that it's driven by data and data that we have as well and that it's tightly focused on these crimes because you know, at the end of the day, the follow-up investigation is very critical for these because there's people that are waiting for their cases to be investigated. It's not just increasing uh, police presence, if you will. It's also the, the behind the door kind of investigative work uh, that, that has to go on. And, and, you know, our investigative bureaus have not grown historically over the years. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the more cases, the more population Harris County has had, the upticks that we've seen as a result of COVID, does lead to greater backlogs and that requires some of the investigative work that isn't always driven by a patrol presence unfortunately the second question i had judge may be one that mr barry could answer better and that is how much money is in the covid response and recovery fund which is where i thought these proceeds were coming from
Dave, you may be on mute. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, good morning, Commissioner Cagle. Uh, the, we have an approximate estimate of that because we are still working through the finals of last year's expenditures uh, related to COVID. As you can imagine, there are any number of moving pieces. Um, but we have a range here of, uh, I'd say in the neighborhood of 25 to $30 million is remaining in uh, that response and recovery fund prior hey. to any, any of these allocations. So with 25 to 30 million remaining funds that are in that fund, um, Judge, I would like to renew my motion uh, with the caveat that it be spent in these areas that we've identified with the sheriff with regard to where we are going to have measurable metrics and outcome determinative uh, valuations uh, and the science. And so that we would then employ those uh, protocols to allowing the sheriffs to also engage in this science of reduction of crime. Uh, since we have uh, com 25 to 30 Pink. million. Yes. This is a sheriff. Can I, can I borrow some of your time just to make a comment? Yes. Yes. Uh, Commissioner King, I just want to, just to manage everyone's expectations because I want to make sure that we're being transparent um, is that some of this work does go to the specialized divisions uh, that work on this investigative work daily, uh, just, just such as the child abuse unit, domestic violence unit, those are established uh, units that are in place under the purview of the sheriff's office historically from, from forever. And so I, I don't know, um, uh, you know, how many units exist under my colleagues. So I, I just wanna say, when we say about investigating these, these fall under investigative bureaus. And so uh, as much as they could come in and work under those bureaus with, with a, a caseload that they're not maybe personally managing, and not to say they don't investigate cases, I'm just saying the, the backlog sits within the sheriff's office. For better or worse, uh, it, you know, it, it, it's where it sits. So we have to deal with those numbers and it reflects on us, but they really stem from investigative um, you know, investigations that maybe initially started under a constable's area, but but ultimately we, we're the lead investigation uh, body. And so I just, wanna, I just wanna make sure we're managing expectations because as we divvy out dollars and what have you, if we're really gonna stay focused on the areas that you mentioned that were laid out here, those currently sit under the sheriff's office. Not everybody has investigative units for you know, uh, child abuse units and all that. They may work some cases, but it's not their daily caseload, for example. So. Uh, we, we end up a little bit bifurcated there and that those units fall under the sheriff's office. And I think that's a little bit complex. Perhaps if you did want to find separate dollars that they could uh, then work, you know, under their own uh, discretion um, on, on separate initiatives that, I mean, I don't have an issue with that at all. I'm just trying to manage expectations and advise where the domestic violence unit sits uh, for the Harris yeah. County community. Uh Commissioner Garcia and then Commissioner Ellis. Thank you. And, and Sheriff, thank you for laying that out. Um, and uh, I would just, uh, look, this is a, a initiative. Um, the county hasn't done something uh, this uh, strategically. Um, it didn't happen uh, in my time. And so I would ask us to uh, allow the sheriff and the constables and the budget management office to work uh, together and uh, let's roll this out and uh, give this an opportunity to to be measured and then come back and then you know uh, we can have another discussion on this but uh, the constables are not off the table uh, whether it be round or in, in, in any other shape and I think uh, we're hearing the commitment of the sheriff on uh, how that uh, coordination can exist so um, and, and without just adding more money. And I think that's, uh, without speaking for the judge, I think that's the, the thing that we have to be cautious on. And that is that uh, all money can be spent, but we want to make sure that we're spending it uh, wisely and strategically. So I, I would just uh, ask that we allow for this initiative to roll out, uh, start to hit some successes. 
get a report back and then we'll figure out what the next uh, phase of this could look like. Judge, I have a sure. compromise to offer, which would oh, be that we'll just hear from Commissioner Ellis. I know he's been waiting for a bit. Judge, I, I, I want to be respectful yeah. of, of all of us uh, here at the table on the Zoom and the hundred people who signed up. But yeah, I'd like us to to go ahead and vote on Commissioner Garcia's motion. And if there's another one and it's relevant, it can be made. But I know we pulled this out of order so the sheriff could be here. But I, I'd like to just call a question to go ahead and vote on Garcia, Commissioner Garcia's motion. And we can vote on the others at some point, but we do have 100 speakers that are waiting to give their input on the whole survival today. So I'd like to call a question. I'll second the motion. I have another motion that I will urge when this is over with and might have a compromise that all would accept. Okay. So we have Commissioner Garcia's motion. Commissioner Garcia, would you mind? Um, it is it is to move move the items and that the funds be dispersed in tranches and the budget management work with the sheriff's office to develop a schedule for disbursement of funds, performance metrics, and reporting on said performance metrics to qualify for tranches, correct? That's correct. So that's the motion, Commissioner uh, Garcia made the no, motion. Just a second, Judge. I, yeah. I just got this one at 1045. Yeah. I, I'm okay with the modification. It, I like to read them before I vote on them. Okay. So you're good with the motion as I read it? Yes, Judge. Although tranches and measurable performance metrics and outcome-based determinative valuations aren't defined, I'm good with the motion as it is because I think that what we've heard from the sheriff is he's going to have a round table and he's going to sit down and talk to folks and he'll come back later. Well, and what I'll say is, as I'm trusting budget, you know, to let us know if, the, if we're not getting the report backs and the adequate metrics, which I suspect we will. I know sheriff and his team have been very, very helpful in, in this in the PFM uh, data sharing, but obviously, you know, that's a, a condition of the approval. Um, so anyway, Commissioner Garcia made the motion. Commissioner Ellis had seconded it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I'm in favor. Motion carries unanimously. Commissioner Kegel. Judge, I had previously had circulated a amendment to the motion. It would be a standalone motion at this time, which would be for the the additional $3 million, what I would, and I've not had a chance to write my proposed thought, but my thought is, is that we would make that to where uh, after the constables and the sheriff have a chance to visit with the budget office, that if there is a need for additional funds to engage in these initiatives uh, through the constables, that up to an additional $3 million uh, be approved. That doesn't necessarily mean, Judge, that they will draw the three million, but that they will sit down, visit with the budget office, visit with the constables, and see if, as the constables are developing their same programs, that they would ha have uh, access to this scientific, measurable metric outcome determinative valuation process. Judge, I, I just want to uh, if I might, maybe I, uh, offer as a friendly amendment. Um, I know Mr. Chauvin's trial is starting in Minneapolis today, and on the day of Jewish Floyd's funeral, we committed a $25 million marker, I think, for criminal justice reform. I don't think that's been spent, so if we're going to vote on this, I'm just going to add to it that they also come back with a recommendation on that $25 million, and we committed to it, uh, but I've not seen it yet. So while we add it, I'll just add that as a friend amendment to Commissioner Cagles. I just want to make sure we don't forget that that kind of was, was made. I'm not accepting that as a I prefer that we not sit here at the table and just I'll go through the budget process. But, but, but if we are going to do it, I want to make sure that I lay that $25 million. I prefer we not do that, but I'm just making the point. And, and I could have done that on the host items that came up. We discussed it. It was before Mr. Barry was here. I don't think it was a moment of emotion. I think people were sincere can't recall if it passed unanimously or not. Commissioner Cagle, you might have to help me. Honestly, can't remember if you voted for it or not. 
but I know it did pass. It sounds what I what I'm seeing is a proposal that that sheriff clearly worked with budget on very closely, obviously Commissioner Garcia, and it gets at um, addressing a specific need without increasing staffing and with measurable metrics. We've not received a similar proposal from the constables. We do have an understanding that the sheriff will need to work with the constables to address this specific need and these specific programs. So I would suggest that we keep things with the approval as they are. Sheriff can go work with the constables. If there is additional an additional specific need without increase in staffing with measurable outcomes that has been worked through with the budget office, to be proposed, that can come back. And what I'm hearing from Commissioner Ellis is there's some other pending uh, promises that need to come back as well. So they may want to look into that too. Uh, but I, I think I, I read this thorough proposal from the sheriff. It's based on a conversation I'd had with Commissioner Garcia. I feel comfortable with it. I, I, I appreciate that it is not an increase in staffing. I appreciate that it very clearly defines the backlog and that it, it says, it is going to use specifically for this backlog and we're going to report back exactly how we'll, we'll counter that backlog. So I, 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 I wouldn't feel comfortable uh, growing it at the table without that level of detail, but I, I'm open to that discussion. So I understood, I understood clearly judge what Commissioner Cagle has proposed and it was very uh, complimentary in terms of what we discussed with the sheriff. Uh, if Commissioner Ellis wants to have another motion on another subject, that's fine. I'm seconding Commissioner Cagle's motion related to uh, a review of this and coming back to the table because I believe the constables remain hyper-focused every day as our first responders most days in addressing this crime demic we have in Harris County. So uh, clearly they have a role to play. Clearly they are playing a role. And specifically what they are doing, uh, and when I look at the what we just passed in terms of performance metrics, uh, it was clearly this came from PFM in terms of it be, being rather generic. I haven't seen some, some other information. So I, I look forward to seeing all of that information. But I think within the spirit of what we're doing with the sheriff, there are other resources that could be applied to addressing the crime problem, and I second Mr. Cagle's motion. Yeah. Yes, Commissioner Ellis. I'd just like to make a substitute motion that it's a worthy idea, both ideas, just refer to the budget management and see if they come back to us with some recommendation. Yeah, I agree. And Commissioner Ramsey said, come back to the table is what we're all saying, come back to the table. I mean, it's... I'll second that substitute motion. Okay, so we're saying uh, the motion is, you know, Commissioner... Ellis, if, if you'll repeat it. But so, my... Commissioner Cagle's a very worthy idea and the idea that I made reference to the 25 million we committed some time ago after Mr. Floyd's funeral, just send them to budget management office, keep them both on the table, come back with a recommendation. Okay, I'm so good. that's, uh, yes, is that James? Uh, no, ma'am, this is Marisala. Um, I did, would like Hi. some clarification on that. It's me this time. Hi. <laughs> Um, so if I can get some clarification on the second motion y'all would like for this item. So I made a substitute motion that we send Commissioner Cagle's motion to the Budget Management Office and uh, also a review of the $25 million we committed for criminal justice reforms to the Budget Management uh, Office as well to come back to the court with some recommendations. Uh, no timetable specific, whenever they think it's appropriate. Um, and would Commissioner Cagle be able to please reread his motion for I can have that notated too. Yes. My motion is that we approve up to an additional $3 million from the same fund as was the sheriff's motion to be reviewed and to work with, uh, to be dispersed in tranches that the budget management work with the constables and the sheriff's office to develop a schedule for the disbursement of the funds, performance metrics, and reporting on the same performance metrics, qualifying tranches for the constables. Is this different, Commissioner Cable, from the one you sent around? 
it's a little bit different because the one that I sent around just said give $3 million. What I've done is I've adopted the the new speak of the latest um, motion that was sent around at 1045 from Commissioner Garcia and just said that we would employ those same uh, that same approach to the constables to where they would be reviewed and then um, and to be uh, approved up to three million dollars, not necessarily that they have to have the three million. So, but so Jason, I don't orders. want to confuse her more. My substitute motion was to send Commissioner Cagle's motion to budget management and also that we send the recommendation that we passed after Mr. Floyd's funeral to put $25 million into criminal justice reforms to budget management as well and come back to us with some recommendations on both at some point. And, uh, for sure, Ellis, if I, if I could just add on. And Commissioner Cagle, I want to be clear. My staff's been circulating this and, and speaking with all staff for about a week. Uh, There's just some tweaking on the motion that you got at 1045, but this is this is a the whole program that uh, I put together uh, after discussion with the judge. This is we didn't put this together overnight. I mean, it's been there's been a lot of work, uh, and uh, and it it happened over weeks. Uh, and so I just want to be clear: conversations with your staff and other staff has been going on for about a week, and uh, just a tweaking of the motion happened. Uh, at 1045. Thank you, George. So, Marcella, are my you first amendment was on? yesterday because that's when we had got your fully fleshed out motion at that time. Yeah. We we do have a lot of speakers. Marcella, are you good to vote on Commissioner Ellis's motion? Uh, yes, ma'am. Are we going to do a full vote also on um, Commissioner Cagle's motion first and then the one um, Commissioner Ellis? May. We'll vote on Commissioner Ellis's motion first, and then we'll vote on Commissioner Cagle's. So yes, Commissioner Ellis made a motion. Commissioner Garcia had a second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? No. No. I'm in favor of Commissioner Ellis's motion, so that passes three to two. Commissioner Cagle made a motion, which you took note of, Maricela, and Commissioner Ramsey seconded it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. No, I, I am opposed. <laughs> I'm opposed as well. So that motion fails uh, three to two. So that is item uh, 13 that we had to take a detour there for the sheriff. Thank you, Commissioner Garcia and sheriff for your work on this and, and, and budget management, uh, those, those specific programs. And, and I'm eager to see what comes back. So let's go back to the resolutions. Commissioner Garcia, you had a resolution, uh, a couple resolutions. Yes, um, I've got uh, three resolutions here. I've got a fourth amendment to my resolutions. And that's simply, go Cougs! Go Cougs! Go Cougs! Uh, and so uh, my first resolution is one I'm incredibly excited uh, to present uh, because it deals with an incredible public servant um, in, uh, in the name of Jerry Smith. Jerry has been a um, precinct two uh, and county employee for 34 years, 30 of those serving specifically with precinct two. And, um, and I, I, there's a couple of folks here that will uh, share in some discussions. And that is uh, Jimmy Sue Ferguson, uh, who's, uh, I think she's gonna roast and toast uh, uh, Jerry. But my resolution is, whereas for over 34 years, Mr. Jerry Smith has worked for Harris County in many roles, including foreman, master operator, herbicide specialist, and all around operator with 30 years serving precinct two in our beautiful community. And whereas most recently, Jerry was part of the weight camp team that escorted an ambulance judge and colleagues from Methodist Hospital Baytown to Bentop Hospital in the Texas Medical Center under dangerous road conditions during the February 2021 winter storm. And whereas Jerry is known by his peers as a very reliable, dedicated employee at Wade Camp, always willing and able to assist 
the county at any time necessary, and that he has done. Whereas whenever working outside on site, Jerry enjoys talking with constituents and has developed a good long lasting relationship with the community. And whereas an avid outdoorsman, Jerry looks forward to spending more time enjoying the outdoors in his retirement. Um, Jerry, we love you. We're gonna miss you. We're grateful for you. And, um, and we are just um, always, always so appreciative of your incredible dedication and service for so many years and doing it so incredibly well. And uh, so judge, we have the infamous, the one and only Mr. Jerry Smith uh, on the uh, on the call, I think. Marcella, is he on? This is Lucinda. Mr. Oh, Smith, it. go ahead, please. Uh, yes, I want to thank uh, all the commissioners and Judge Hidalgo, but and especially Judge Garcia, uh, Commissioner Garcia. Uh, it's been a long career with Harris County. I started in December of 86 and worked for Flood to Grow for a few years and then transferred over to Precinct 2 under Jim Fontino. I worked for Jim Fontino, then Sylvia Garcia, Jack Mormon, and now Adrian Garcia. And I tell you what, Adrian Garcia, he's been a great commissioner I uh, support him. And uh, it's been a long run. I've seen a lot. I've seen a lot of flooding, a lot of, I've seen good and bad at the at the county, but uh, Hurricane Harvey was something terrible, and the ice storm was bad too. But uh, it's been a great career. I appreciate everything from Harris County, and I don't know what else to say. But it's it's been great, and I'm I'm gonna enjoy retirement. I miss work. It's it's nice to not have to get up to work, but then you know you miss all the employees because I had great employees I worked with. But well, thank you very much. Well, Jerry, we we're grateful to you, buddy, and uh, you don't have to miss us that much. So if it gets uh, more dangerous and hazardous at home, we we'll always take you back, bud. So uh, you'll always have a home here, man. So thank you, and Judge. We also have Jimmy Sue Ferguson. We may have a little roast and toast uh, for her colleague. Jimmy Sue Ferguson, go ahead, please. Good morning. Uh, good morning to the commissioner's court and uh, Judge Lena Hildago. Thank you for allowing me to speak on behalf of Jerry Smith today. Um, I'm one of the newer employees that he worked with in his 34 years with uh, Harris County Precinct 2. Uh, <laughs> but I think I am one of the first females that ever worked out in the field. They they did not have too many females in, in his career that would work out in the field. And he was one of the first ones that they put me out with when I when I started here at Harris County uh, Wade Road Camp. And um, he's just he's just a leader in many ways. He served, as he said, in, in, in many assignments and uh, he is the epiphany of working smarter and not harder. So um, because of that, we all have uh, learned some better ways to, to make being productive in what we do each and every day. Uh, I started as just an operator, and he was also the person who trained me on the Vactor truck. There was several operators that uh, they put me with, and then it turned out that Jerry said, none of them are doing it right. <laughs> I'm the one that took the course when the Vector trucks were bought. And so uh, just let me teach this lady how to do it the right way. And uh, he did a very good job at it. And uh, so now, uh, because of that, he can uh, be the sole purpose in why two females can get on that Vector truck and go out there and, and perform ditching and drainage for Commissioner uh, Garcia. Um, he also uh, worked as our camp maintenance person. And when we first uh, set up over here at Way Camp, he apparently had come from uh, Miller Road is what I recall him saying. And uh, they didn't have any kind of organization. And he set up cages and built cabinets and shelves and, and made it where everything's labeled and, and very meticulous. And it, it's just so easy for everybody else. We're, we are very definitely missing not having Jerry here on a daily basis. And uh, But... I'm so happy for you, Jerry, and, and I hope you find other things in your life 
to keep you productive. And uh, I hope you have good fishing and hunting because you have all the time to do it now. I know it was something that you enjoyed. And uh, thank you so much for letting me speak for him today. Thank you, Jimmy Sue. And, and listen, since you're a protege of Jerry, would you mind the nickname of Jerry Sue? <laughs> well, they call me J Sue. They do call me J Sue sometimes. So I guess it fits. <laughs> I'm Wonderful. like the baby Thank Jerry around here. Some of them do call me baby Jerry because uh, sometimes we could get kind of loud with things if, if we weren't happy with the way things were being done. But anyhow, we just do what we can. Thank you for sharing your thoughts on Jerry. And Jerry, again, congratulations, buddy. We love you and give your family all of our gratitude and appreciation for sharing you uh, with the county for so many years. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you, Judge. My next resolution is uh, one that uh, is painful to think about, but uh, in the discussion of keeping people safe, I hope this resolution will um, awaken us all to do all that we can and more. And uh, I wanna thank uh, State Representative Gene Wu for uh, joining me on this resolution. This resolution, um, is in light of uh, some horrible events that uh, have recently taken place. And it reminds us that uh, we cannot take uh, things for granted, especially hate. And so with that, I read, whereas members of the Asian American Pacific Islander community have faced racism, prejudice, xenophobia for centuries in the United States, and whereas known facts pertaining to the murders of eight people in Atlanta in March of 2021, including six Asian American women, strongly indicate that the legacy of racism against people in the AAPI community, particularly against AAPI women, played a significant role in those deaths. And whereas beginning with the first cases of COVID-19 our country has seen a sharp increase in the number of attacks against Asian American and Pacific Islanders. With more than 3,800 hate incidents recorded in the last year, and whereas there are increased reports of assaults, harassment, and hate crimes against those of Asian descent, with a higher number of, those, of these attacks against Asian American women, as well as the elderly and youth under the age of 21. And whereas in addition to the health challenges brought by COVID-19, uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders are facing more acts of violence, hatred, discrimination, and economic insecurity, causing increased pain and fear in the activities of daily life. Be it resolved that Harris County Commissioner's Court condemns all forms of racism, discrimination, hatred, and violence against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, and will work to take affirmative steps to end racism against this beautiful community. That is my resolution, and I think uh, State Representative Wu is on, on the call today. I'm sorry, he cannot... Re uh, we 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 did have him on the line. Um, however, he was a, he had to uh, hang up. But oh. we do have another speaker on the line. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Linda Toyota with Lift Fund. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Judge Hidalgo and Commissioners. My name is Linda Toyota, past president of the Asian okay. Chamber, now with Lift Fund. Thank you, Commissioner Garcia, for your long-standing friendship with the Asian American Pacific Islander community who supports your resolution today condemning hate crimes against AAPI. Thank you, Commissioner Ellis, for attending and speaking at the Stop AAPI Hate Vigil and Rally at Discovery Green. Thank you all for your support for small businesses. Asian Americans have faced a double pandemic of COVID-19 and anti-Asian racism Asian elders are being physically assaulted in the streets on their way to church. Asian American children are afraid to go back to school. 
Asian businesses are suffering. Asians are being targeted for the language they speak, their accent, where they work, their culture, how they look or dress. Doesn't this sound familiar? Asian American workers have faced the highest rate of long-term unemployment during the pandemic. As our country grapples with the COVID-19 pandemic, the Asian American community is facing an alarming rise in anti-Asian violence, racism, and discrimination. In 2020, nearly one in three Asian Americans reported experiencing racial slurs or jokes since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. The Stop AAPI Hate Coalition documented almost 4,000 incidents against the Asian American community since March of last year, ranging from violent attacks to verbal harassment and deaths. 35% of the incidents reported indicate that businesses are the primary site of discrimination. Whether it's in public transit, on the street, at their business, or even at their workplace, we, Asian Americans, continue to experience violence. There are more than 20 million Asian Americans in the United States, 2 million Asian American-owned small businesses, generating $700 billion in annual GDP and employing around 3.5 million people. But 75% of these businesses do not have access to COVID-19 relief. We believe standing up and voicing concerns against racism will reduce economic disparities and close the economic divide that prevents too many minority and women entrepreneurs from achieving their dreams. We must look to building communities where people of all backgrounds are protected and have the ability to live, work, and thrive. The message of see something, say something is important. But despite wide-ranging contributions to the United States economy, AAPIs have historically been overlooked, statistically insignificant. But not today, Commissioner Garcia. Today, we are not invisible. You have elevated our AAPI voices with your resolution. Today, we matter. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Thank you. Ramsey and, and then Commissioner Ellis. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Commissioner Garcia. Thank you for highlighting this important issue. It, it reminds me, Commissioner Ellis and I attended the G family uh, celebration. Uh, it was Sunday night a week ago. And it reminded us of our diversity. It reminded us of the important things we should be focusing on within our community. I know that every day or every time I go into the Tracy G uh, Community Center, it reminds me of the life of that young lady and her legacy and how we, we should never let our guard down when it comes to these kinds of issues. So. Uh, within Precinct 3, within Harris County, certainly uh, we, we have great uh, leaders within the Asian community, and we will continue to work closely with them to be sure these types of things don't happen in Harris County. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Ellis. Yeah, Commissioner Garcia, I, I do want to echo uh, Commissioner Ramsey's comments, and, and thank you for putting it uh, on the agenda so much. It, I think that was Miss Linda Toyota uh, who uh, who spoke. Um, you know, I know all of us uh, are sensitive and care, and I was proud, Judge, at that rally. I think it was mainly the younger folks, the millennials who organized it. By the way, they were socially distanced for the most part, uh, but it was an impressive crowd on short notice, and I was impressed by the diversity of the crowd. Uh, in, in particular, and it made me go pull some statistics. I was trying to figure out what to say. Sanjay Ram went went with me and, uh, uh, and was telling me what I ought to say. But, you know, when you want the last one to speak, everybody said it. You don't want to use the talking point somebody gave you. But 
I, I did think to myself, you know, to be anti-AAPI, that is over 60% of the world's population. You got to really be hateful. Cause, you know, you, you really narrow your choices on, on who you, who you can, can run with, but it is important. And I'll tell you an interesting stat I found, which I didn't know. Sometimes I give this speech about our diversity and mention that, you know, city most diverse in the country, county most diverse, the fourth majority minority state in the country. Well, that's no longer true. There are now six majority minority states uh, in America. And we, our, our population is very much a reflection of what this country will be. So resolutions like this help Commissioner Garcia, education helps and exposing people. And as I looked at that crowd of young people and that diversity, it really did strike me how, you know, younger people don't really get caught up on a lot of things for their group, the way older people do it. And that gives me hope uh, for the future. But uh, hey, thanks for bringing it forward. Thank you, thank you. Commissioner Garcia, thank you. I, I, it's important, and uh, you know, a lot needs to change. But having leaders out front calling out this discrimination and violence is is crucial. And uh, as always, we continue to stand with our Asian American community. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. And my final resolution is um, another one uh, for an important entity that we have here in Harris Judge, County. Judge, on that last resolution, I just wanted to join in with my colleagues and also to give a shout out for Gene Wu. Um, he and I might not be on the same side of the uh, legislative aisle down there, but he has always been a friend to Harris County and someone that we can always work with. And I'm sad that we didn't get to hear from him today. Um, Commissioner Garcia, thank you for bringing the resolution. Yeah, uh, thank you, Commissioner uh, Cagle. And my final resolution, uh, Judge, is for an important entity that we have here in Harris County, and uh, and that is the Toll Road Authority's Incident Response Team. And this resolution reads: Whereas the Harris County Commissioner's Court created the Toll Road Authority's Incident Response Team in 2001 as a pilot program to assist stranded motorists on the tollway. And whereas initially the program provided services such as changing flat tires, providing fuel and water, performing minor repairs and removing debris, it has grown over time to now also provide free towing to a safe location, hazardous material spill remediation and traffic control at incidents. And whereas since its creation, the incident response team has assisted more than 284,613 members of the public. And I wanted to make sure to read every one of those that we have documented. Members of the public by changing more than 74,243 flat tires to on more than 56,000 780 vehicles at no charge, remediating more than 1,544 hazardous material spills and removed more than 69,694 traffic hazards and debris from the roadways. And whereas the incident response team has received over 12,380 positive customer service responses expressing gratitude for the program and praising the excellent service provided by these county employees. And whereas the incident response team members are exposed daily to an inherently dangerous work environment, some experiencing severe injuries and many close calls, they continue to strive for excellence and provide a vital service to the community during freezing roadway conditions, floods, hurricanes, and now a pandemic. Be it resolved that Harris County Commissioner's Court uh, commends the Harris County Tow Road Authority Incident Response Team for its unwavering commitment to the safety and well-being of the patrons of the county's tollway system and to extend best wishes for the safety of its members, honoring the great service they perform daily for our community. And Judge, I'll say that uh, what one is that we have Assistant Chief uh, Calvin Harvey, uh, who will share some few thoughts. But let me just say that the reason 
I put this uh, on the agenda was because I was the recipient of one of those positive comments from a citizen who wanted to let uh, the uh, toll road authority know that they were grateful for the incident response team to work in helping them get uh, to wherever they were going safely. And, uh, and I'll tell you, uh, you know, no one hates, uh, uh, no one wants to be changing a flat tire in the heat of our summers or in the cold of our winters or in the uh, wet of our rains. Uh, but these guys and gals, they do it uh, and they do it professionally. They do it with a smile. And it also prompted me in that we have had uh, several of our operators who've been injured. And, uh, and I want to uh, make sure that we keep them in mind as we uh, are grateful for those who put themselves in harm's way, like our law enforcement officers. Uh, but these operators do it because uh, people flying down those tollways uh, don't always pay attention to what's going on. And they get very close when these folks are changing flat tires or trying to help uh, you know, those uh, stranded motorists. And so I just uh, didn't want to miss the opportunity when I got that email. When I get those emails, it really lights me up and it excites me. And I want to make sure that the staff know that the citizens of our community uh, really appreciate what they're doing. And so thank you. Thank you for our incident response team for the phenomenal work that they, that they do on a day, uh, daily basis. I echo that, Commissioner. Yeah, go ahead, Lucinda. Sorry about that. Calvin Harvey with Tow Road Incident Response Team. Go ahead, please. Uh, Commissioner Garcia, Judge Hidalgo, Commissioners Ellis, Ramsey, and Cagle, thank you for recognizing the men and women of the Tow Road Incident Response Team. Daily, they rescue folks who are in potentially dangerous and stressful situations while striving to provide excellent customer service to the Tollways patrons. This civilian team <clears throat> expresses that even though it can be dangerous, it's still a very rewarding job because they're helping people in need. Commissioner Garcia, as a fellow first responder, you have also seen that same gratitude in people's eyes when you've assisted them in duress. It's a very meaningful when they do not expect it and they discover it's a complimentary service from their government. I will feel privileged to share this court's resolution with the entire team at our next safety meeting. And I'd like to thank you all for supporting this vital safety program and helping us get back to the community which we all serve. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Thank you and to your team. I believe that was your final resolution, Commissioner Garcia. That's correct, Judge. Thank you so much. Go Cougs. Go Cougs. <laughs> Commissioner Ramsey. Yes, I, I guess we're taking up 352. Is that where we are? Correct, Commissioner. All right, I, I am pleased and honored to present a resolution in support of Senate Bill 21. Uh, we've talked at length already in this meeting about crime, and one of the great uh, unfortunate contributors to that uh, relates to this bill, and I appreciate Senator Huffman and what she's done. So let me read my resolution, and uh, we can... Um, which I think explains uh, the merit of what we're considering. Whereas on February the 26th, 2021, Senator Joan Huffman filed Senate Bill 21 related to rules for fixing the amount of bail to the release of certain defendants on a bail bond or personal bond to related duties of a magistrate in a criminal case to the reporting of information pertaining to bail bonds and to the regulation of charitable bail organizations and this bill gave an extremely low number by the Lieutenant Governor to underscore its priority in the Texas Senate seeks to address repeat violent offenders from committing new crimes while out on bond. Offenders charged with new crimes while on bond has risen from 7,452 in 2016 to 18,796 in 2020. Further, the offenders on multiple bonds rose as well in 2016, uh, 18, 1,812 offenders had two to four bonds in 2020, 7,312 offenders had two to four 
uh, in 2020. In 2016, 33 offenders had five to seven bonds. In 2020, 555 had five to seven bonds. In 2016, zero offenders had eight plus bonds. In 2020, 74 offenders had eight plus. So violent crimes by offenders on bond has put our community at heightened risk. In 2016, 33 homicides were committed by those on bond. In 2020, the number rose to 72 homicides. In 2016, 36 on bond committed sexual assaults. In 2020, saw the number on bond committing rise to 96, 92 sexual assaults. In 2016, 710 assaults committed by those on bond with the number rising to 3,028 in 2020. Robberies were committed by 230 on bond in 2016, and the number was 634 in 2020. All or most of these were crimes committed by offenders on numerous bonds could and should have been avoided. And whereas for violent offenders granted personal reconnaissance bonds, PR bonds, the numbers are frightening. In the 2016, 106, 17 were granted. In 2020, 1,097 were given. PR bonds were granted for capital murder, murder, man, manslaughter, aggravated robbery, aggravated sexual assault, aggravated kidnapping, aggravated assault, aggravated human trafficking, robbery, and sexual assault. And whereas the growing number of pandemic of violent crime committed by offenders on bonds was emphasized during testimony in the Senate Jurisprudence Committee on March 18, 2021, by Harris County District Attorney Kim Ogg, who stated, crime is up. Ladies and gentlemen, it's associated with bail and by Administrative Director David Slotton of the Texas Judicial Council, who related 20% more crimes are committed 12 times more violent crimes are committed by dangerous people who are out on bond. And whereas this legislation is critical to the safety of our Harris County residents to provide protection for the most vulnerable populations for crime victims to allow law enforcement to fulfill their sworn duties and perceive, pre preserve the ruling of the Fifth Circuit of Appeals for the accused. Now, therefore, be it resolved Harris County Commissioner's Court supports Senator Joan Huffman in her ongoing efforts to work with all stakeholders during this 87th legislative session to mold Senate Bill 21 from its initial draft into a final form for passage to ensure that our residents are protected from those who would erode the security of our homes and our community and that due process be provided for the accused. That's my resolution. Judge, I would second it, but I'm going to fuss at my colleague for being slow and getting me the actual resolution until a little bit later. I fuss at my other colleagues for not getting me resolutions early. I'm going to fuss at this colleague too, but I'm going to still second the motion. All right. Uh, Judge, I'm sorry, this is Marisala. So, would the motion be for it to uh, support the bill to request action? In support of the bill. In support of the bill. Thank you. Um, I I can't I can't just sit quietly and listen to the some of the numbers that are are not not going to get us to a decrease in crime. A lot of the data that is being cherry picked is being cherry picked by the folks who are opponents of smart on crime policies that have led us to where we are, where we incarcerate more people than any other nation on earth. If you look at it per capita, it's tragic. And we're not any safer because it's been uh, red meat pandering as opposed to actually getting to what are the interventions, what are the investments that are actually going to reduce crime? We've had several analyses by experts, including independent experts, on the, the bail reform situation in Harris County. And, and let me share some specific findings. The only formal bail reform, quote unquote bail reform, that has taken place in Harris County 
is misdemeanor bail reform. That is low level, non-violent offenders. And you know that Commissioner Ramsey and so does Senator Huffman. And so do the folks that are saying that bail reform has caused an increase in crime. The only bail reform that's taking place is misdemeanor bail reform. And it has taken place because Harris County practices were violative of the constitution of the United States, the equal protection clause of the constitution. The county spent millions and millions of dollars fighting a losing battle against a lawsuit because we were violating the rights enshrined in our founding fathers constitution. Now, bail reform was enacted, misdemeanor bail reform, and independent research uh, specifically by a court appointed researcher from Duke University has found specifically that Harris County has not only prevented the needless jailing of poor defendants and erased racial disparities, and I'll remind folks that we are in the trial of of uh, Mr. Floyd's murderer today. Misdemeanor bail reform has also not caused an increase in crime. Both the misdemeanor case and defendant counts fell by, appro by approximately 25% between 2015 and 2020. Let's talk about felony bail. Felony bail amounts have changed, I'll grant you that. But here's how they've changed. And I'll point you to Dr. Chepron's research that he presented to the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council that he's presented to all of the, the, the advocates and we will continue showing. Felony bail amounts have become more restrictive for defendants, more restrictive, not less restrictive. So if you wanna say that the felony changes have led to an increase in felony crime, what you would be saying is that more restrictive felony bond, higher felony bond is what's leading to crime. The average bond amount for felony defendants actually increased. Now, there was more unsecured bail to felony defendants in 2017 through 2019. That trend stopped in 2019 and flattened in 2020. You can't say that something that was done in 2017 and 2018 is suddenly having an impact in 2021. But right now, those amounts are increasing, Commissioner. There are increases in some types of violent crime, but those increases are nationally. So even if there were some changes in Harris County felony bail practices, which again, the change is that they're actually becoming more stringent, why, why would we be seeing the same trends in every other county? Some other forms of violent crime, like robbery, have actually not changed or have declined. You list out these numbers of felony defendants that have multiple bonds. As you know, and Dr. Chepron has pointed out, and Jad has pointed out several times, I think it's disrespectful of the community to try and mislead them by listing out the number of unsecured bonds that folks have. A majority of defendants still receive secure felony bonds. They must abide by the conditions of the secure felony bond. You may cite to such and such defendants has one bond. They have secure felony bonds. And I can have a JAD, Dr. Chepron, the Duke researcher from that is appointed by the federal judge cite to all of this. But what we need to do is get to the root of crime what we should have gotten to a long time ago, the fact that we need intervention specifically for folks who might recidivate, that we need to get our children early on before they go into, into the criminal justice system, that we, that we should have a juvenile justice system that is smart, that if you simply lock everybody up, it's, at some point they're gonna have to get out. And if you haven't dealt with the core issues, yes, they will recidivate again. We can't just have a contest as to who can have the better headlines and try and create a straw man of a problem that is not the core of the problem. You and I both knows, and I'm, and I'm sure Senator Hubman knows too, we all know that the reason for the increases in crime is not the misdemeanor bail reform that has taken place as has been cited by a court appointed researcher, independent researcher. And we know that there is no felony bail reform to speak of 
if anything, felony bail reform has become more restrictive. And so you can't possibly say that felony bail reform has led to an increase in crime. So let's deal with the crime issue by being smart on crime, like the, the investment we approved earlier today, like the violence intervention investments we've made, like the, the survivors and victims of crime interventions, like the support for domestic violence um, organizations. That's the kind of work we should do, and I invite you to do it, but I, I am saddened by the, the attempt of the proponents of this bill, and, and Commissioner, you as well, because you've seen this data. You were there with me at the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council when Dr. Chepron explained all of this and went through every felony judge and how they've become more aggressive, not less aggressive. You were there. So in saying this, you're misleading the community into thinking that this intervention is gonna solve crime that is not going to solve it. And that in fact would put us violative of the constitution again, because we do have a consent decree on misdemeanor bail that we have to meet. So we have to be real. If you really care about the increase in crime in the community, you're gonna tackle the problem that actually exists and not invent a problem that doesn't exist for the sake of pandering. Yes, Commissioner Garcia and then Commissioner Ellis. Thank you, Judge. And um, you, you pretty well uh, said it for me, but um, I, I just want to point out that the analysis of, that this impact could have, as you alluded to, um, would cost county taxpayers a ton of money. I mean, that this would effectively lead to actual defunding of the police. And so I'm, I'm just shocked for someone who's spoken up on behalf of victims and law enforcement that we would support something that would actually force us to have to make difficult operational decisions on public safety. And um, so I, 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 I agree with you, Judge and uh, Commissioner Ramsey. I just hope that you would rethink this. I, I, I think uh, more of you, but uh, this would really hurt our efforts to keep people safe. And um, there's there's just so much already well documented on what uh, the impact of this bill uh, would be. Um, you know, we're anticipating that it could create an annual cost of $125 million. Um, and, uh, and then it would, you know, expose us to uh, having to, you know, feed lawyers instead of taking care of our community by having to pay you know, 60 to $100 million. And then um, it would just force us to have a just a, a very, very unsustainable process to have to monitor thousands of, of folks uh, otherwise. So I, I, I just, this is really just a throwback to the days that, um, you know, we that created Alberti and had us warehousing people. Uh, I just, I just don't think that that is you, Commissioner Ramsey. And I just, it, it, it pains me that uh, you would uh, be supportive of of something that is uh, definitely going to lead us in the wrong direction. So, Judge, thank, thank you, and I, I support your your comments. Yeah, Commissioner Ellis. Thank, thank you, uh, and Judge and Commissioner Garcia. And I'll try not to repeat much of, of what you said, but. I, I do want to stress this point. Um, if Senate Bill 21 becomes law and a host of other uh, bills that follow the same track, it will put us in Harris County and many other counties in Texas in a position where they have to choose between the United States Constitution and state law. It will end up spending uh, a considerable amount of money in lawsuits trying to figure out what to do. Uh, I'm very proud of what this county did on misdemeanor bail. And as you stated, Judge, that's all we have done so far. And um, I'm proud that the new judges who came into office were willing to settle that case. It was interesting how even some of my friends in the media with the hype, they just go out and conflate uh, people who paid to get out with people who got a bond from the judge. And I assume intelligent people know better 
but were just busy and didn't go through it, or it's just so easy to fall into that normal narrative because you get a headline. All around the country, other counties were following Harris County on criminal justice reform with regard to that misdemeanor bail case. That's really what prompted Cook County, the presiding judge uh, in Chicago, to go in and start reforming their system. Of course, the state of Illinois has done it statewide. New Jersey uh, has done it statewide. Uh, we have made no progress on, on felony bail. Uh, and it, it looks like we just sort of stuck there trying to do something. Uh, I, I hope that at some point, maybe when the elections are over, you know, sometimes that does strange things to people and they all have to get in their little box. Uh, but it really ought to be a time when we have a serious discussion about criminal justice uh, reform. Well, I hope that there'll be some incentives coming on the federal level to encourage more recalcitrant states uh, like ours in, in some regard to come along, maybe the, the carrot approach on, on some things, and, and we'll just have to see what happens. But uh, we made tremendous progress, and we need to go in that direction. Look, it's amazing I hear some people even say, oh, I'm for misdemeanor bail reform after they got through criticizing it. You know, Commissioner Cagle, uh, you in particular, when that lawsuit was going on before our three new colleagues joined us, uh, two who were here in particular, including the judge, some of the stuff that we were doing was just so ridiculous. And the county was scrambling to go do little minor things in the indigent defense space so they could brag about them. It was awful. And we should have been embarrassed uh, by what came out in federal court. I, I'm so proud of Judge Lee Rosenthal for writing a very thoughtful, analytical opinion, which really became the roadmap for many other people around the country and prompted some changes. And I hope at some point uh, our uh, felony judges, even if uh, we can't make our way through the courts to get there, because we, we do sit, you made reference to the Fifth Circuit. That's the dreaded Fifth Circuit. You know, that's the Fifth Circuit, by the way. We still, hey, we we lucky. Thank God Brown versus the Board of Education didn't come through the Fifth Circuit. Our schools, would, we'd still be stuck in that era. Uh, but, uh, you know, I just hope that progress will be made. I know that a number of other people who are speaking. I hope some of these judges, I know they cannot speak about individual cases, but I have encouraged them. Since people are going to try to use it as fodder, to get a few political points, they can certainly serve as a resource. And when I was in the legislature, it was judges, the current DA in Dallas County, Judge Cruzo, who really came in and was the expert witness on so many of these issues. So I hope these judges, within what the law permits them to do, uh, and the other side knows you run to the judge and they can't talk about their case and they're hamstrung but to the extent they can talk about the broad policy issues as a resource, I hope they would do that. And I know there may be some judges who have signed up to speak today, uh, uh, Judge Hidalgo, and I hope we'll try to let them speak. But thank you. And thank you, Commissioner Garcia. Commissioner Judge, Garcia. Judge, a quick comment. The bill that we're talking about is not talking about misdemeanor. The bill we're talking about is addressing bail reform, addressing bail, a crime committed by felony defendants on PR bonds. So what I think about when I read this is that single mom with two babies that's going to go to bed tonight in a very unsafe situation. I, I've lived in Harris County for decades, and I know what crime can do to a neighborhood. We all do. So we've got to be sure that, that uh, as we go through the reforms that Judge Hildago referred to, that we also provide protection uh, for folks like the single mom with babies in a uh, uh, crime-impacted uh, neighborhood and be sure that they're safe because when someone's let out, when a violent offender is let out on a low PR bond, and they go into a neighborhood and do bad things. That's not that's not good. I think we're better than that. So I would hope that 
uh, we can reach some kind of, of, of ability to address those kinds of things. Yeah, and, and I agree with you, Commissioner Ramsey. It's, we, we have to stop saying tough on crime, do the same thing that hasn't worked for 50 years. We got to be smart about it. And, and no, we shouldn't have those kinds of situations, but we can't pick the, the one headline making case and pretend that that is how everything happens. We have to be level headed and think about how to solve this. This bill, as Commissioner Garcia mentioned, would, would, would mean 120, 126, 110 million dollar increase in our cost because we'd be warehousing people as opposed to keeping them, keeping community safe. And that doesn't even include the capital costs that we'd have to invest in building more jails because it's a blunt tool that's not going to get at the core of the issue. It's just going to say if you have uh, if if you fail to appear for a court date any time in the past two years while on personal bond, you you got to be warehoused at the jail. Now it may be a tiny minor thing that you didn't show up for. It maybe you didn't you couldn't show up because you had a job so you could feed your children because you are a young mother. We have stories like that all the time. So how do we be smart, make sure that people show up for court, but also make sure we don't just keep them there because they're poor as opposed to because they're a danger to the community. And that means you have to look at the crime. You can't hit it all with a hammer and just say, lock everybody up. It's, it's cost prohibitive. And it's not smart. It hasn't worked. We've been there. We've tried that. It doesn't, there's not enough jail space for that. It doesn't make us safer because then you, 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 you get these low level folks, they lose their job, they lose their children. They're in, they're in a spiral. It doesn't, it doesn't help. Commissioner Cable. Judge, a brief comment. Uh, we've got 28 speakers that are signed up. We're getting really close to noontime and I need my two o'clock break. I mean, my two hour break. Um, very, very brief. Judge, we paint broad strokes on one side saying we're jailing everybody. And then we criticize the other side for saying you're painting broad strokes because everything uh, isn't necessarily bail reform related when there are accidents. I'm going to use, I think that was the term you used earlier out there when when someone committed a crime when they were on bail. I think that we need to keep in mind the goal of keeping communities safe. And I think that we need to keep in mind the individuals who are disproportionately impacted by crime. The poor individual is impacted by crime more than the wealthy individual. And if we say that we care about our poorer communities, we need to make sure that they are safe. Uh, and number three, Judge, nobody wants to have anybody sitting in jail just because they are poor. That's a mantra we hear over and over and over, redundantly, repetitively, and again and again. Um, nobody wants to have anybody in jail because they are poor, but nobody should be allowed to continue to hurt their neighbors. And Judge, I, I'll, I have additional comments, but I will reserve them until after our 28 speakers talk. Um, and would ask your indulgence for a, at least a brief break. Yeah, no, I, I think we all are mindful of the increase in crime and, and, and the victims, I mean, gosh, they're a top priority. They, they, they deserve the absolute best, but the way to serve them is not to perpetuate a, a revolving door of recidivism and crime. We got to tackle the root causes. We got to try to tackle mental health, the drug use, the youth involvement, the broken families, the, the, the case backlog that, that the judges haven't gotten through. This isn't a workable tool. For one, we can't even afford it, but it's not a workable tool because it doesn't differentiate among defendants. Let's take, a, uh, it's noon, so let's take a 10 minute break and then we'll hear from all the speakers. Looks like we have a quorum. It is 12.15 and Commissioner Scord is back in session.
We are going to take the speakers for item. Um, Judge Adalgo. Yes, yes. If we could, I know that Judge Fields and Judge Draper signed up. I'm assuming they may be at lunch. So I was just going to ask if Lucinda could try to reach out to them while they're on their lunch break from their dockets. They're on the they're line. On the They've been on the line. Okay. Well, Lucinda, let's go ahead and hear from the judges so they can they can go back to their their dockets and then we'll hear from the rest of the speakers. Yes, ma'am. Judge Genesis Draper, go ahead, please. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. All right, thank you. Um, hi, my name is Genesis Draper. Of course, I'm the judge of Harris County Criminal Court at Law Number 12. Um, so one of the 16 misdemeanor courts here in Harris County. I mean, I just want to thank you all for the time. I wanted to jump in briefly. I am still in docket, so um, when I say brief, I do mean briefly. Um, and just provide some guidance here as you are contemplating SB 21. Um, I won't go back over some of the things that have already been said, but one of the things I did want to um, just clarify for Commissioner Ramsey, um, everybody, for just as a reminder, I'm a misdemeanor court judge. I was one of the judges involved in the settlement. Um, and Commissioner Ramsey seems, seems to be referencing that um, this would not affect misdemeanor cases and everyone, no one wants to hurt misdemeanor cases. Um, but I would encourage you to actually read this bill because it would affect misdemeanor cases. And actually much of this um, does not specify whether or not it's related to a misdemeanor or a felony. So there is quite a bit of language in this bill um, that specifies offenses in general, um, whereas, you know, if people are out on multiple cases that they could not get a personal bond. For example, it does not specify felony versus misdemeanor. And so I, I just want to um, advise that this does and would affect misdemeanor cases. To that end, as you all know, we are under a federal consent decree um, after having settled this lawsuit. And so this um, legislation, if passed, would have a significant impact on that. Um, and while this legislation itself will, will likely face a number of challenges, constitutional challenges, and, and um, those types of things, it will be specifically harmful to Harris County because we have entered into this consent decree. So while everybody else is challenging the statute just on constitutional grounds, we will also be challenge on those grounds, but also for being in violation of the consent decree. Um, so that is something to certainly consider. The other thing to consider is that as of today, we have 8,486 people in custody. Um, we have more people held in custody pretrial than almost any other large jurisdiction. That includes New York, Chicago. Um, we are not being beat on pretrial incarceration. Um, I remember when the pandemic hit, having 7,500 was alarming and we are at 8,400 and some days 9,000. We do not have the capacity to house um, the number of people that would be affected if this bill went into effect. And so to the extent that people are wanting to collaborate um, on issues of public safety and, and um, you know, brainstorm with stakeholders, I would encourage that, but, but maybe a more effective area to look at would be how to uh, decrease the length of time from charge to trial, right? Our, our courts are still suffering from the effects of Harvey and now the pandemic and cases go on for years and years and years. And I would argue that that is what is having a significant effect on public safety. It's just not workable to have any number of cases, not just murders, any number of cases go on three, four, five, six years. Um, and so I think that that's something that bears taking a look at to the extent that Senator Huffman or anyone um, is would like to reach out to me as a resource or for insight on how this affects people boots on the ground, I'm happy to do that. To my knowledge, none of my colleagues have been contacted um, about SB 21, despite the fact that it could have on the consent decree, but we are certainly open to doing that. And I can certainly make my information available for anyone that would like to have um, a longer discussion about this. Thank you for your time. I, I do have a docket waiting for me. Uh, but I do appreciate your time today. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Thank you. Judge, it seems that uh, the county clerk is having issues with their timer. Um, 
I will do my best to try to keep time. Thank you, Lucinda. You're welcome. Is Judge there Michael. Judge? Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Judge Michael uh, Fields. Good morning, and thank you, Judge Hidalgo, commissioners, for giving me an opportunity to speak about this resolution uh, to support SB 21 made by Commissioner Ramsey. I'm here just right up front in opposition of that resolution. Um, Commissioner Cagle, I appreciate that you said you haven't had an opportunity to read SB 21, and I think knowing you and knowing how you are as a fellow Republican judge who served with you for many, many years on the bench, uh, you would be opposed to this as well, I believe, after having read it. Because not only does it prohibit people who have offenses as low as Class C misdemeanors from receiving personal bonds, not only does it require defendants who may be uneducated, un undereducated, or simply don't speak the English language to file complicated legal documents without the benefit of counsel in violation of the Supreme Court's Rothgary decision, not only does it discriminate against religious and charitable bond organizations by imposing disproportionately more strict measures on them than they would uh, uh, for pay bond agencies, and exponentially expand the authority of sheriffs to suspend charitable and religious bond organizations for minor infractions. The most important thing about this legislation that requires us to oppose it as a group is that it won't make us safer. We keep hearing statistics, and Judge Hidalgo, you pointed to these statistics about uh, surety bond versus personal bond and how these things are being conflated. What's not being said in real terms is this. Of those people who committed the tragic and horrible offense of murder, 93% of those people were on surety bond. 93% of those people were on surety bond. If this commissioner's court backs this piece of legislation, it will put you in direct contradiction to the, the consent decree that the judges you supported signed, which will lead to millions of dollars in extensive litigation, which is what my group, when we were there, cost our county. We cost our county millions of dollars fighting common sense change, fighting to keep people who are poor, black, brown, indigent in jail for minor offenses. Commissioner Ramsey, this piece of legislation does include misdemeanors. When you look at 1703B1C, you'll see that any offense charged, even as low as a traffic ticket, can keep a person from receiving a personal bond. I know Senator Huffman, I believe that she is a good person and that she is right-hearted, but this piece of legislation is wrong-headed. And it's not right for Harris County. It's wrong for the state of Texas. It is violative of our constitutional imperatives and rights, and it will do more to harm the citizens of Harris County than it will to help. So I stand in opposition to supporting SB 21. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you. Judge Fields? Thank you. Judge Albert? Yes, sir. Judge Fields, I, I just like to give us a bit of background. I know that. Uh, uh, Judge Daryl Jordan was very much on the, the hot seat, very much by himself. Uh, I, I assume he, he's, he's in the service of this country and probably cannot watch us on internet, but, uh, you know, he was out there by his lonesome. And I was just so proud of you. And to be honest with you, just so surprised. You know, we've been friends for a long time, even if we have different parties, always respected one another. I guess probably helping one another a little bit behind the scenes. By the way, not that I could do much in your party, or you could do much in mine, but how did you come to the decision that you would uh, back the plaintiff's position, shall we say, on the misdemeanor bills? I just want you to give us a little background. I think being a, a, a Republican, you know, uh, I wish I could have been a fly on the wall when you made that decision. But can you comment on it? Uh, yes, sir, Commissioner, and thank you so much um, for giving me the opportunity to answer that question. You know, for me, this was my Saul on the road to Damascus moment. Um, 
when I sat in the courtroom and I listened to Judge Rosenthal explain how our system over decades has disparately impacted black people, brown people, poor people, uh, communities that are the most negatively impacted by these kinds of onerous bail schedules, which SB 21 will take us back to, um, and how those schedules violate our Constitution, there was no other choice. Judge Rosenthal said it plain, and she said it best. If a person is entitled to bail, they are entitled to a bail they can afford. Every misdemeanant is entitled to bail and therefore they should be entitled to a bail that they can afford. That's what puts us in the position of offering pretrial release bonds when a person is too indigent to afford anything. Of course, we're very comfortable and we're all privileged and blessed to have great incomes that allow us to spend money for dinner that most people would spend for rent. Uh, This type of legislation puts poor people in a disadvantaged situation where they often have to plea just to get out of jail, just to get back home to their families and provide for electricity, food, clothing, housing, the things that we all take for granted because we have been blessed uh, in in our lives and in, in our opportunities and jobs. These are critical issues for these folks charged with these minor misdemeanors. And for us to say, hey, you know what? We want to keep poor communities safe. So the way we're going to do that is lock everybody in the poor community up. That makes no sense. And so when I listened to Judge Rosenthal, that was the moment where I said, you know, I'm on the wrong side of this. And no matter what it costs, I've got to get on the right side. Well, Judge, I know I've said it privately. I'd just be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to thank you publicly for being on the right side of history. Hey, Judge Phil, this Judge Phil, this is Commissioner Garcia. Good to hear your voice. Commissioner, your your yes. mic is locked up, Commissioner Garcia. Oh, oh. Judge, can you hear me? Hear me? I can hear you. You are coming in broken, but I can't hear you. All right, Judge. I just wanted to add uh, my my comments and really really appreciate you. Look, look. I know you. I you know work with you. 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 Uh, I went through the held out together. together. I, know I know that you are. are a uh, staunch staunch supporter of uh, constitutional law, law. and uh, and so you're you're probably one of the strongest strongest voices on this issue today, and I just want to to thank you for your willingness that that you don't have to step into this fray. Uh, You're uh, you're not not in public service, service, but your heart heart still is. is. And so I just just wanted wanted to thank thank you, Judge, uh, for your strength and courage. And, uh, and you're going to to, to to the right, right side, side of the law, 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 law. Thank, thank you. Thank so you. Just, 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 y'all go because I know Mr. Garcia's voice is, is, is muffled. I, I'll just add to that. I know that uh, just Jordan got a, some, it raised some eyebrows when he picked a, a Republican to represent him because he's, um, uh, he's in the reserve. So he's protecting this country somewhere. Um, but uh, I, I think he can hold his head up high, uh, Judge Fields, uh, and uh, feel proud that he made the decision to have you stand in for him while he's out protecting America. So thank you. And Commissioner Garcia, we call him to thank staff you, and help him fix that mic. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Thank one ar- one Army soldier always has to help another Army soldier. There you go. Thank you, Judge Is there uh, any other judges, Lucinda? Can we go ahead with the, with the speakers? Uh, I believe we can go ahead with the speakers. All right, let's go. Uh, let's go on with all the speakers. And thank you to Judge Draper and Judge Fields for taking the time. Michelle Hines, Leading Women for Public Safety. Go ahead, please. Hello, and thank you so much for allowing me to speak today. I am saddened and appalled that the Harris County Justice Administration could give an approximately three-minute speech opposing SB 21, a bill that admittedly is not yet perfected. But the goal and intention of SB 21 is to enhance Harris County citizen safety. When Dr. Colin Shepard testified on behalf of the Harris County Commissioner's Court, he blatantly ignored the soaring violent crime rate, 
especially murder. Dr. Sepran refused to acknowledge even one Houstonian that was victimized by the thousands of violent descendants released each year due to felony bond reform. Nor did he mention the over 100 victims murdered at the hands of felons released on bond reform. Dr. Sepran's testimony makes me wonder if the Harris County Commissioner's Court thought about any victims when they decided to oppose SB 21. I am not against bond reform for victimless crimes. However, I feel that violent habitual offenders should be held based on their risk assessment, not their race, not creed, not money, and not gender. As a Harris County taxpayer, I am disgusted that my hard-earned money paid for a report that completely lacks accurate data. The Harris County District Attorney's Office presented startling statistics that were completely ignored by your spokesman, Dr. Sepran. The report presented by Dr. Sepran was skewed and inaccurate, with the goal obviously being to meet the Commissioner of Court's biased narrative. Additionally, why are taxpayers paying Dr. Sepran's salary when he publicly states that his goal is to abolish all prisons? Even more surprising, why would the Commissioner of Court choose and support someone so biased to be their spokesman before the Texas legislative body? The victims are taxpayers, and they all pay your salary, which makes one wonder, which side has the Commissioner's Court chosen to take? The victims or the felons? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Lucinda, you may be on mute. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Rania Mancarius with Crime Stoppers of Houston. Go ahead, please. Yes, hello everybody. I want to thank you so much for allowing me the time to be here today. Um, I, I wanted to take this moment to really potentially address a disconnect between Crime Stoppers of Houston and, and your position um, as a county on certain issues. So I'd like to start with what we agree on, talk about what needs to be worked through, and then and talk about the singular concerns we have and where we potentially disagree. Look, we agree, we applaud the 2016 work on misdemeanor bond reform, indigent, first-time offenders, low-level offenders should never be held pretrial. We agree on that, we applaud that, we have said that over and over and over again. We agree that the jails are overcrowded, that the courts are not moving fast enough. We recognize that there is an inherent issue in the systems that have existed going back decades and they need to be addressed. We recognize that we also work, need to work through these realities, that the pretrial numbers are shocking, but we've got to get the courts moving and that is in your control. We need to ensure speedy trials. We need to ensure fair trials. We need to make sure punishments are appropriate. We must examine the conditions within the Harris County jails. We need to work on rehabilitation for those serving time in prison. We need to ensure schools are solid in all communities, that students have programs they need to thrive, that communities have basic infrastructure like homes, health care, food, and opportunity. We agree on all of this and we are willing to do our part. You know that we have been your friends and partners for 40 years and we, are, we want to continue to do more. But we disagree, it seems, on a singular issue. We are absolutely not saying that we need to lock up everyone and that we need to treat communities in need disproportionately. We disagree with that on every level. But the singular consequences of felony bond reform has created a system where violent, habitual, criminal actors are getting arrested and released over and over again, often by a judge or magistrate who is doing his or best job, but with limited data and tools. It is an unintended consequence, we are sure, but nevertheless, it is happening and it is our singular issue today. It appears that risk assessments are not being done because these judges and magistrates are lacking data. SB 21, while still needs to be thought through and worked on, at least at this point, seeks to give judges information, 
create a system for obtaining data, bringing, brings back the notion of risk assessment tools when dealing with these specific violent, habitual felony offenders. Only in those cases, we believe it is reasonable to discuss whether those specific defendants should keep being released back into communities on bond. This is the singular issue we are looking at. It is not about race. It is Sorry, not about uh, gender. Three minutes are up. I'll just Thank quickly you. say that. It I'm afraid a, I have to stop you right there. Otherwise, we'd have to let every speaker go over time. But thank you, and thank you for your work. Judge, may I ask her a quick thank question? You. Oh, yes. Go ahead, Commissioner K. Um, when you were talking about the singular issue, you were halfway through that sentence when you got paused. I would like to hear the remainder of that thought, if you would please complete that for me, please. Absolutely, sir. It's, we were saying it's not about race, gender, creed, color, or status. It's about a solution when dealing with a very certain scenario. And the question of what we do when dealing with these violent, repeat, habitual offenders is the only question we're asking. We have talked to so many people, and the argument they keep giving us is about misdemeanors, about low-level crimes, about people that commit crime based on poverty or color. We, that's a different argument. That's a different argument for a different problem that I think you guys have done a very good job handling. We are talking about violent, repeat, habitual felony offenders that are going back into this community and committing crime and crime. You have called us out for studying these cases. You have called us out, but that's okay because we are truly just studying the cases. We don't seek to push any narrative other than the fact that those who are at risk to this county and community that you all love as much as we love need at some level, common sense, common minds would say, at some level, we have to do something about them, those particular class of people. And, and a solution is at some point, whether it's the third or fourth offense, after it's a violent, habitual felony offense, we say, look, no more bonds in this case. It doesn't matter what you look like, what you can pay, where you come from. This is for the sake of the suspect, for the sake of the victim, and for the sake of the community. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming and sharing your views. Thank you. Anthony Graves, I'm oh. sorry, Anthony Graves with the Public Defender's Office. Go ahead, please. Yes. First, I would like to thank uh, Judge Hidalgo and the Commission's Court for allowing me this time to speak in regards to SB 21. August of 1992, I was arrested and charged for a very horrible crime that I knew absolutely nothing about. I was placed in jail where I waited trial two and a half years. Two and a half years I waited trial with no bond. Why? I was innocent. I knew absolutely nothing about the crime, but yet I had to wait two and a half years. I couldn't help my attorney. I couldn't help myself. I had to rely totally on a system that had took my freedom before I was even convicted. We're not talking convictions here. All I hear is locking people up who have repeated offenses. Well, let's just say someone claims that they did a crime they didn't do. You're going to lock him up and take his freedom because of an accusation or an allegation, no conviction? We just lock people up because we're talking about safety and security of our neighborhood? If we're really serious about safety and security of our neighborhood, then we will put programs in place that will address the issues while we got people there. So when they come home, they can be productive. They can be on the right track. This talking about locking people up to peace and security is not gonna happen because hundreds of people come back to our communities every day, every day unprepared to return. We are not addressing that issue. And that is the biggest issue that we have. It's not about locking people up and making sure they don't get a bond. They haven't even been convicted. It's about who are coming back to our, our community and who are causing harm in our community, whether they're on bond, whether they're on parole, whether they're on probation. We are all causing harm in our community because we are not addressing their issue. 
We don't have programs in a place that will address them before they come back home. So we are making ourselves vulnerable, but not putting our resources in the place that are most effective that will keep us safe. This whole notion of just locking people up, like we're going to, all of a sudden, that's going to be the magic cure? I promise you it's not. I was down there. I talked to people. People are frustrated. They're upset. They're scared to even come back here because they're not prepared. And then when they get back here, what do they do? They target us because we are not putting resources in place to help them make that transition. I don't care if they're in jail or if they're in prison. If we don't put the resources in place for them to make that transition, we're going to continue to be vulnerable. We're going to continue to be ignorant and stupid to the way in which we can protect ourselves. So I'm saying to you, based on my experience, based on what I know, based on the cheat sheets that I sat in, that what we're talking about with SB21 is wrong. I read this, and the first thing I saw, my God, presumption of innocence is being used as collateral damage again. Just I'm sorry, to three minutes, this are notion up. of securing and safety. Thank you. Thank you so much Judge. for that. I, I, thank you. Judge. Yeah, Commissioner Ellis. Yeah, Mr. Graves, I just have a, a quick question. I, obviously, I, I know you and your, your, your background, but uh, just in case my colleagues don't know, how much time did you spend on death row before you were exonerated for being wrongfully convicted? I, I spent a total of 18 and a half years in prison, 12 and a half on death row. I had two execution dates. I witnessed 415 men around me being murdered, kids to all the way to grown men. They were all meeting the same fate. Some was innocent, most was guilty. A lot of them had mental issues, but they were all being executed. And then from there, I came home. Nothing was in place for me to make a transition. I just came home. That is our problem. Well, I've, I've read your book, and uh, I still distribute them periodically. I appreciate the work, and I know that as part of the compensation, which was not nearly enough for the years of your life that were uh, lost, uh, you made a significant donation uh, to start a clinic. Uh, I think it was over at uh, St. Thomas for the students and the University professor, in honor of the professor. And we are proud of your work, and I appreciate you uh, for speaking out on, on, on this piece of legislation. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you all. Thank you. Mr. Graves, thank you for, for your work and your perseverance and for joining us. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bill. And apologies you so that much, you went Thank you. And apologies that you went through what you went through. Thank you so much. So I just want to say that people in jail that's been there seven years, I go and mentor those guys. They're in there seven years and haven't been convicted. That's a problem. Thank you. Thank you. Nick Hudson with ACLU of Texas. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Judge and Commissioners. I am uh, testifying against item 352 because Senate Bill 21 is unwise, unfair, and unconstitutional, and money does not make us safer. SB 21 takes away judges' discretion to give personal bonds for huge groups of people, even if there is no evidence that the person is a flight risk or poses a danger to the community. And these provisions impose an absolute bar on release for people who do not have money while allowing identically situated people to purchase their release from jail. Uh, this will cause already overcrowded jail populations to increase. It will force innocent people to plead guilty. It will exacerbate racial disparities in our criminal legal system. It will increase federal litigation. Um, and it will also harm public safety because what we know is that when people in uh, People in jail uh, are there for more than just two days. They become more likely to commit additional crimes in the future because uh, the, the thinking here is um, jail destabilizes people, takes away family supports, uh, causes people to lose their jobs and homes. So um, I ask that you all uh, oppose Senate Bill 21. If you want to look at things that would make a difference, I would recommend looking at House Bill 4281 by uh, Representative Sherman. It's the Ends Money Bail Act. Um, and also look at practical things like text message reminders. There's a bill by Representative Hinojosa, House Bill 4293, that would require text, text message reminders for people to ensure that uh, people appear in court as required, because the key obligations of the pretrial system are to maximize public safety, maximize court appearance, 
uh, and maximize pretrial liberty and fairness as required by the Constitution. So please uh, oppose item 352. Thank you. Adriana Bain, go ahead, please. Hi, this is, um, I wanted to stress my support for Senate Bill 21 because Harris County families deserve better than the failed system that we have now. And I hope that as commissioners that we would be on the side of safety for our families, not those of recurring violent criminals, uh, especially based on the fact that our own county DA is testifying in support of it and has staggering statistics showing the increased crime from violent repeat offenders. And I'm hoping that we can uh, free up our courts to be able to get cases going through faster and that the magistrates and the judges will be able to use real risk assessment from um, these violent offenders who are just harming our families and that we can please protect our families in Harris County and be able to push up these um, courts and really be able to keep these violent felons that should be behind bars where they should be. Thank you. Thank you. Leah Brown with Texas Civil Rights Project. Go ahead, please. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you, judges. Uh, I am testifying in strong opposition to SB 21. But first, a statement about the harms of bail and pretrial detention in Texas generally. A reminder that jails and pretrial detention are for people who are presumed innocent. They have been arrested and charged and not been found guilty of any, any crime. 62% of Texas's jail population is presumed innocent. 62% of the people who are behind bars in Texas are presumed innocent and are awaiting for their trials to happen. 32% of those people who are presumed innocent are black, disproportionate to our population in the state. And 33% of those people behind bars who are presumed innocent are Latinx disproportionate to their population in the state. Any amount of pretrial detention causes harm and can have lasting and social economic consequences. And I will remind the commissioners and to everyone that families are not just families of, um, quote, victims, but people who are accused of crimes belong to families and have families as well. We know that pretrial detention results in family and caregiver separation, the loss of employment, health insurance benefits, and other wages. It causes housing instability. It disrupts medical and mental health treatment. And pretrial detention causes lasting trauma for parents as well as their ch children. There was another witness who spoke of the harms of pretrial detention on the future incarceration of children. We also know that pretrial detention results in higher rates of guilty pleas and longer sentences. And in fact, Harris County led the country in exonerations, which resulted from wrongful convictions in drug cases involving people who pled guilty just to get out of jail, many of whom were charged with nonviolent drug offenses and were black and brown. So we know that Texas's criminal legal system unnecessarily and disproportionately locks up brown and brown, black and brown people, even without a guilty finding or a conviction. Stepping away from the harms of bail and pretrial detention generally, when we look at SB 21 in particular, we see that it is especially harmful in its hostility. For one, SB 21 is not narrowly tailored to repeat violent offenders or even to, to violent offenders. Instead, SB 21 uh, captures a whole host, a whole range of people who would be ineligible to be released from the community because they do not have money, although their behavior is not violent. For example, the targeting of community bail funds. I'm afraid I have SB to stop 21. you. Thank you so much. Christian Caballero, Texas Appleseed. Go ahead, please. Hi, this is Christian Caballero with Texas Appleseed and also from the Right to Justice Coalition. 
We echo the sentiments of other social justice advocates in opposing SB 21 and the gross burden it imposes on indigent people. We need to protect the most vulnerable who already struggle with the vicious cycle of poverty and prevent them from being trapped into the criminal justice system. It's important to recognize that overcrowding jails is not only inhumane, but it's a great cost to the county that will be held responsible for the jail conditions and deaths exacerbated by COVID-19 and other crises like the winter storm Uri, the brutal heat from our summer months, and additional storms brought on during hurricane season. We need to create more avenues for diversion, rehabilitation, mental health support, shelter, and financial relief. Only then will we truly see a positive shift in our communities that don't perpetuate a lifetime of poverty and criminalization for people and their families, or worse, death from exposure to jail conditions. We encourage all of you to not support uh, SB 21, and instead, please invest your time and resources elsewhere in the community that desperately need your support in this harsh and unprecedented time. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Brian Klosterbor, ACLU of Texas, go ahead, please. Hi, Judge and Commissioners. Uh, I'm an attorney with the American Civil Liberties Union of Texas based here in Houston, and I co-sign many of the comments from other groups about some of the problems with Senate Bill 21 and its harms for taxpayers and residents in Harris County. Although this bill seeks to change Texas's pretrial system, it goes about this in all of the wrong ways. SB 21 flips the presumption of innocence on its head by denying personal bonds to many people who are simply accused of a crime. Under our current system, pretrial liberty is the norm, but this bill seeks to punish people who haven't yet been convicted of any crime. This bill is particularly harmful because it doesn't affect money bail, which means that people who have wealth will still be able to buy their way out of jail but those without financial resources will be separated from their families, jobs, and housing for months, and perhaps even longer as their cases are pending. When people are forced to stay in jail pretrial, they're more likely to plead guilty even to crimes they haven't committed, and they're also more likely to commit an offense when released. So SB 21 would make our communities less safe. This bill would also have an enormous fiscal impact on Harris County. Harris County already spends over $330,000 per day to keep people in jail pre-trial, and this number is growing with a tremendous backlog in the criminal courts due to the pandemic. SB 21 would force even more people to stay in jail simply because they don't have money to pay. It will also lead to more expensive litigation for Harris County, particularly because part of the bill is trying to resurrect the bail schedules that were already declared unconstitutional in O'Donnell versus Harris County. This bill would also violate the First Amendment by seeking to curtail and diminish the activities of bail funds. This bill seeks to stop bail funds from ever helping someone accused of a felony and from helping anyone with more than $2,000 with a misdemeanor. And it would require bail funds to disclose their donor lists and submit monthly reports to the sheriff. In short, this bill would be a boon for the for-profit bail industry but it's detrimental to Harris County taxpayers and residents. Thank you. Thank you. Christopher Rivera, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, commissioners. Uh, thank you for your time for allowing me to testify today. And I am also here to speak against any support for Senate Bill 21. Uh, Senate Bill 21 is a clear giveaway to the bail industry. They rake in profits over $2 billion each year. And essentially what this does is penalize black and brown and poor people. And we already have a pretrial uh, detention problem in Texas. There's over 39,000 people simply waiting in jail because they can't afford bail. And we know that some of the collateral consequences that bail uh, pretrial detention causes is that strips wealth from black and brown communities, and that number has been estimated to a number of about 55,000 to 99,000 in economic benefits that a person that's detained would uh, would get. And we see that a lot of these consequences uh, result in people losing their housing, employment, and, 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 and custody of children. And essentially what this does is exacerbates crime. And uh, I would hope that the commissioners would read 
they the Justice Administrative Administration's Department report on bail because they find that there is no relation in the increase in violent crimes to being traced to bail reform. They point out that there and there was an increase in secure bonds, and they found that that was actually related to an increase in monthly murders. And they see that it is not how felony bonds could have caused an increase in crime in the past several years when policy and practices around felony bonds have not changed. So there's no correlation. And I think uh, some of the commissioners' courts have echoed, the commissioners have echoed that. And second, when bail reform did occur, it, it occurred between 2017 and 2019 when we saw that crimes did not increase until 2020. Furthermore, we see that crimes have exacerbated across the U.S. and, you know, suggest, suggestions would say that crime is increasing because of national socioeconomic pressures rather than small county policies such as bail. Further, the memo concludes that other policies, initiatives, not renewed reliance on cash bail will be required to halt the increase in violence. So I would just hope the commissioners read this report and to disprove all these false claims that increase in violence is related to bail. Thank you. Thank you. Briella Barahona with Texas Jail Project. Go ahead, please. Good afternoon, Commissioners and Judge Hidalgo. My name is Gabriela Berjona. I work at Texas Jail Project, and I'm speaking today in opposition to Senate Bill 21. SB 21 would prevent those charged with a crime from being released on a personal bond if they'd recently been convicted of a felony or Class A or B misdemeanor. Even charges like possession of cannabis, which is decriminalized in our county, or driving with an invalid license could disqualify a person. The state legislator wouldn't be footing our bill either. This is an unfunded mandate, and the cost of housing more pretrial defendants would be shouldered entirely by our county's taxpayers. In fact, the Sheriff's Association of Texas spoke against this bill to the Senate Jurisprudence Committee not two weeks ago, precisely because it is an unfunded mandate. Senate Bill 21 also limits free speech and assembly by targeting charitable bail funds. According to the ACLU of Texas, quote, charitable bail funds work is advocacy, which our Constitution views as speech on behalf of incarcerated individuals. SB 21 attempts to curtail that speech through overburdensome regulation, and it threatens the right to freedom of assembly by seeking to force funds to disclose their donor names and contribution amounts. Judge Rosenthal's ruling affirmed that an upfront payment of money bill does not meaningfully promote public safety or appearance in court. As others have cautioned, why would Harris County support legislation that would reintroduce and re-aggravate the very same practices like bail fee schedules that were already found to be unconstitutional and invite more lawsuits as a result of this legislation. Senate Bill 21 is a solution in search of a problem. In our own county, only about 3% of defendants who had risk scores from zero to three and received a no flag did end up having a new violent crime arrest. Further, when the court granted a defendant pretrial release with a yes for the new violent crime arrest flag, only about one in 10 of those defendants actually had a new violent criminal arrest. Further, the same court-appointed independent research referenced by Judge Hidalgo found that increases in violent crime like murder may be better explained by unemployment than by pretrial release or bail reform. Finally, I'd like to read excerpts of Harris County's Public Defender's Office's written reaction to Kim Ogg's misleading data presentation to the Senate Jurisprudence Committee. Quote, regarding the first district attorney slide, the PDO has requested that Jim Spetsky's Harris County Justice Administration Department critique the pretrial population numbers. The PDO knows that the sheriff has come up with lists of nonviolent incarcerated people to consider for release, which have seemed to be more substantial than this list. There may be some padding of the aggravated and assaultive cases on this colorful chart. Also, regarding the slides that depict the three defendants, anecdotes do not outweigh statistics. The only bail reform implemented in Harris County has been for misdemeanors, and the federal monitors have recently issued their second six-month report showing that releasing most misdemeanor defendants without cash security neither increases non-appearances nor makes for new offenses. The average person in Harris County Jail has been there for 229 days I'm waiting afraid for their day in court. You. I'll finish quickly. Um, while they've no, waited, I, they've been I have subjected to stop to everybody at time, ma'am, because otherwise we'd have to let everybody go for, for extra time, and we have several speakers. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you.
Goldie Van Zandt, go ahead, please. Hi, my name is Goldie Van Zandt. Um, I speak before you today uh, to urge you to vote no on Senate Bill 21. I uh, just want to say thank you all for having me. It's my pleasure. Uh, my husband and I are both veterans of the United States Navy. Uh, we have to dedicate our lives to service and build a family rooted in love and respect. My husband is not a criminal. He is a loving husband, father, and grandfather. Nevertheless, my family's life has been forever changed by his incarceration in Harris County Jail due to his mental illness and high bonds. I am a veteran. Um, I served honorably in the United States uh, Navy active for five years, and I did one year of reserve service. Uh, my husband served 20 years in the military. Uh, he is an honorable retired 70% uh, disabled veteran. Uh, currently, well, his first hearing, I mean, he went to a hearing today. Uh, the Harris County Jail uh, system treats our veterans with hardened criminals. Most are not, but suffer from mental illness. Uh, and health, mental health issues. My husband suffers from PTSD, and he also suffers from bipolar due to his military service and going to separate combat zones and being in the war, uh, in several wars. Uh, um, he's in jail right now. Um, he's gone to veterans for counseling. I also have gone to veterans uh, counseling as well. Um, um, he's only been rehabilitated uh, for seven days. He started, um, he was given medication from the Veterans Administration, seven min uh, medications that weren't, you know, weren't up to his par. Um, they weren't good, so he started self-medicating. So that's the reason he's in jail right now. Um, right now I have gotten, finally got a referral from the VA to have him, to put him in a one- to three-month veterans um, drug abuse program specifically for veterans, before they only put him for seven days at a time. Uh, it's hard to get care from the VA, but I have finally gotten it. Um, after many sacrifices, uh, serving during wartime, sleepless nights, he's missing the birth of our kids, anniversary, birthday, school plays, graduation, and a separation from the family that he loves and holds dear, uh, we got to thank you for your service. Well, that's not enough. I wish this that the country would stop thinking veterans for our service and truly show some state, show some thanks by voting no on this bill. And that would make it harder for families like mine and people suffering, uh, you know, from the PTSD. Existing bail law in Texas is restrictive and punitive enough. Our jails are already crowded with hardworking service members like my husband who simply cannot afford bonds. Let's not make it. Thank you so much, and thank you for your service, that of your husband. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye. Nathan Fennell with Texas Fair Defense Project. Go ahead, please. Hi. My name is Nathan Fennell. I'm a lawyer with the Texas Fair Defense Project. We're opposed to SB 21, and we're asking the Harris County Commissioner's Court to oppose SB 21 as well. The current bill is unconstitutional, it's unfair, and it's discriminatory. It's most accurately read as corporate welfare for the for-profit bail bonding industry at the expense of primarily poor people of color. This bill would mean that a vast swath of people who get arrested would have no option but to sit in jail until their case was over if they didn't have money to pay either the court or a private bail bondsman. Y'all are familiar with O'Donnell versus Harris County. Central holding in that case is the Constitution doesn't allow that. Um, I understand that people have some people have testified in support of SB 21 today. Um, they say it's necessary because some people who get released on personal bond uh, commit additional crimes. Some of those crimes are violent. Uh, I, my understanding is people talk about murders in this context. But the fundamental premise that you would have to accept in order to support this bill is that people who don't have access to a few hundred dollars are more likely to kill someone than people who do have access to a few hundred dollars. Because that's what this bail is about. Anyone with several hundred dollars or a thousand dollars can still get out of jail, no matter how many crimes they commit. They pay a money bond. It's only people who don't have any money who end up staying in jail. And we know that's just not true. Uh, the JAD released a report where they specifically found that released on personal bond were not correlated with increases in violent crime, which also just intuitively makes sense. 
the fundamental problem when you really get down to it is that SB 21 would undermine the presumption of innocence. Uh, it would punish people as soon as they get arrested, making them sit in jail or pay a fine right away. Um, that might just feel fair to some people, but we're not supposed to punish people for getting arrested in America. Uh, we've designed a system that's only supposed to punish people uh, after they've been convicted, after a process that's supposed to protect the rights of the accused. Please don't let SB 21 move the goalposts on this very fundamental due process protection. Thank you. Thank you. Coretta Brown with Texas Organizing Project. Go ahead, please. Hello, hi, my name is Coretta Brown and I'm speaking in behalf of Texas Organizing Project. Senate Bill 21 and House Bill 20 would drastically increase the chances of black and brown people being incarcerated pretrial. This bill, these bills call for mandatory drug testing for any and everyone as a condition on bail, even if a person is not accused of drug related charges. This bill also calls to increase the amount of money one must pay to have the liberty to fight to be proven innocent. Bills like SB 21 and House Bill 20 are embedded in white supremacist language that will without doubt socially and financially harm communities of color. We are on the brink of finally making justice equal and fair for all. And now District Attorney Kim Ogg and her longtime friends in the Senate are fighting to stop progress. They want to stop black and brown people from having an opportunity to defend our freedom. One of the main reasons people plead guilty to accusations that they are innocent of is because they just don't want to be confined anymore. And jail has a way of breaking down the strongest among us because it keeps us away from our family and loved ones. We can't feed or provide for our children if we are incarcerated pretrial. The felony money bail system in its current form is yet still the model for human capitalism and has very little to do with ensuring if a person returns for a court date. Period, point blank, both of these bills need to be tossed in the trash and we ask that you oppose these bills. Thank you. Thank you. Those were all the speakers we could reach. Thank you, Lucinda, and everybody who spoke. Commissioner Garcia. Thank you, Judge. Um, I've got a, um, I, 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 you know, with um, Commissioner Ramsey's commitment to, and, and comments about victims and public safety and the like, I, I think his heart is in the right place. Um, and so I've got a, uh, an amendment, <clears throat> a friendly amendment uh, that is being circulated right now. And, um, and I think this will more effectively express um, a resolution I can support uh, with uh, Commissioner Ramsey. And that uh, it would read as such, whereas on February 26, 2021, Senator Joan Huffman filed Senate Bill 21, relating to rules for establishing the amount of bail to the release of certain defendants on a bail bond or personal bond to related duties of a magistrate in a criminal case to the reporting of information pertaining to bail bonds and the regulation of charitable bail bond organizations. And whereas this bill ostensibly seeks to address repeat violent offenders from committing new crime uh, while out on bond, but fails to implement any meaningful or productive steps to protect the public, particularly victims of crime. And whereas this bill is a blunt tool to address a complex problem that would have significant operational impact on Harris County, potentially costing the county more than $100 million in increased detention costs annually, which could impact the county's ability to provide important and critical functions, including law enforcement and public safety. And whereas this bill would require Harris County to warehouse residents in jail rather without regard uh, to the to their risk to the public, impacting their ability to rebuild their lives and potentially increasing the risk of recidivism. Be it resolved, Harris County Commissioner Court, 
calls on the 87th legislature of Texas to pass legislation that meaningful, meaningfully uh, improves public safety and serves justice and refrain from passing legislation that would fail to do so while harming the county's ability to protect the public. That would be my friendly amendment uh, to the proposed resolution. And I would be, uh, I, I would be able to join Commissioner Ramsey in support of that resolution. Uh, and I think that will uh, meaningfully express uh, the uh, interests and desires uh, that we're trying to accomplish here is to keep people safe, do it in a smart way, and uh, and still be able to take care of infrastructure and public safety um, as we do every day. Thank that, you, Commissioner. Yeah. I, that looks like a separate motion on a separate uh, uh, item. I, I I don't consider that would be, to be a friendly amendment to mine I, I'm gonna let mine stand as it as it is so let's vote on on Commissioner Garcia's substitute motion I'll second. Vote on I'll second. Garcia. wouldn't we so vote if, on uh, I made the motion and got a second earlier this is a friendly this is a friendly amendment uh, to your uh, to your item Jay, friendly amendments have to be accepted by the movement, do they not? Uh, that's correct, uh, Commissioner. So th this really is a substitute motion that's being made, which um, uh, I think in the past, Judge Hidalgo has allowed that these items to be voted on prior to the main amendment. Um, just, to the motion. just if I might. But you're correct, uh, Commissioner Cagle. This is a substitute, not a, not a friendly. So, Mr. Ayer, just to make sure I get yes, it. Sir. Uh, we would have to vote on the substitute first because if not, it wouldn't be called a substitute. <laughs> It'd be a separate motion. So if, if both sides are just trying to get a vote on that item, I'm just kind of, what little I remember from being in the legislature, you vote on the substitute, but then if, if the person still wants to vote on the main motion, so be it. Uh, that, uh, sometimes that, in Austin, they pull the bill down. If the substitute passed, you got to pull the bill down. If they both pass, it would, that'd be what you call a non sequitur. Right. Um, so, uh, uh, Commissioner Ellis, the, the the court in the past, when there has been a substitute motion made, has voted on the substitute motion prior to the main main item. Now, that that has been the history. That's been the case certainly in the last three or four times that's happened in the last three or four months, um, and I believe that's the way it's been in the past. Um, if, if that's not the court's three hours, yes. <laughs> oh, that's what I'm saying. That's, that's what I'm saying, Mr. Ayer. And obviously, if the substitute failed, then you go to the main motion. Just the way I've seen it operate in Austin, if the substitute makes it, whether it's friendly or not, most people would say, "Well, why vote on the other one?" Let's just. I, I have fresh in my mind the motion Commissioner Garcia just read. Let's vote on that one, and we can still vote on Commissioner yeah. Ramsey's motion. But we don't need to not vote on it. So Commissioner Garcia has a motion on the table. Commissioner Ellis has offered a second. All in favor of Commissioner Garcia's motion? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. I'm in favor, so that motion carries three to two. Commissioner Ramsey, you had your motion from earlier. And uh, Mayor Sala, you know which one we're referring to? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so Commissioner Ramsey made a motion. Was there a second? I seconded, Judge. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Aye. I'm opposed. So that motion fails. That's it for our resolutions. Uh, Commissioner Ramsey, you yep. don't have other resolutions, do you? I do not. Judge, I have a, okay. a I have yep. two questions. Because we are talking about legislation at this time, um, and because there has been a reference as to what has been testified in Austin on behalf of the county, do you want to take up now um, a brief discussion on how we are to approach it when our court is divided on an issue, how that's represented in testimony, or do you want to take that up when we get to the legislative affairs section in a few minutes. I'd recommend the legislative affairs commissioner, and I'll make a note 
only because we have speakers on several issues that have been waiting to go at the top of the agenda and because of sheriff's timetable and commissioner ramsey's motion that was particularly involved it's taken a while to get to them all right thank you judge but i'll make i just, just want to just thank you for making a note okay so let's take the rest of the speakers of cinda if you could please Yes, ma'am. Uh, actually, we're trying to, we're a little stuck right now. I apologize for that. <clears throat> and we're not able to get to any of the speakers at this time. If you give me a few seconds. Okay. In that case, um, we could, we could skip to that item, the legislative uh, under, under our, our intergovernmental affairs. Uh, they they have a broad item, Commissioner Cable. If you'd like to take that up, yes, your judge. Um, I would, uh, and I do That's want to get clearance from Jay. One seventy five, item one seventy five. Go ahead, Commissioner. Sorry, page twenty one, item one seventy five, under legislative items. I know that um, there was testimony, and this was referenced during some of our folks who spoke on Commissioner Ramsey's bill uh, that. The JAD department had an individual speaking to uh, the legislative body. And I know that we have had shifting uh, rules on how we approach whether the county is behind a bill or not. I would like to, to request that when someone is one of our agencies and they are speaking on behalf of the county, that they clarify in their testimony whether or not that there is full support of an issue or only partial support of an issue so that the legislators will know whether there is full support of the court or partial support of the court. And I, I think that that's just a, a, a fair thing for those who are listening to the testimony and fair for the public. Judge? Commissioner Ellis and then Commissioner Garcia. So, Judge, um, the policy was in Harris County before I got here that something did not get on the legislative agenda unless it had the unanimous support of Commissioner's Court. So when I exercise uh, my prerogative to be against something, the policy changed. Mm -hmm. And there was no reason for somebody to have a designation that uh, well, the other four were for it and Rodney Ellis was against it, I would just call up and tell people in Austin, I let them know I didn't agree with it. But last time I checked in America, <clears throat> majority rules and haven't been in a minority all my life, I've lived with it, it's okay. What I don't want to do is put someone in a burdensome position as though they violated some edict because they testified before a committee and the vote was 3-2 or 4-1, if it's the majority opinion I, of the legislature, that is, uh, of the court, that's the Harris County Commissioner's Court position. Sometimes I win them, sometimes I lose them. But most people that I know who are woke, if, uh, if they're wondering whether or not uh, all five of us, of us supported it, they could just ask. I mean, I only served up there for 26 years, and there were times when I would ask on some issues, I could just about figure out who might have been for it or who was against it. So I, I, just, I just think it's kind of a waste of time, to be honest with you, whatever the court thinks. But, you know, I don't want somebody when they go up and testify to say they're representing Harris County Commissioner's Court to have to say, I'm representing uh, these three or those four. You got me? Uh, if it's Because we each have a representative up there that we pay it with taxpayers' money. So if you all take a position opposite of my position, if, if I don't have time to call somebody, I'll ask somebody to put in a card and let them know what well, precinct one is against that. I'm just, you know, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but, you know, I hate somebody's feelings were hurt, but, you know, my feelings were never hurt when there were issues that, uh, when, the, when the policy changes. I just think it's that big of a deal, but that's my two cents for what it's worth. Yeah, Commissioner Garcia. Yeah, uh, Judge, uh, 
uh, Commissioner Ellis said it well, because as the sheriff, when I would uh, try to get uh, legislative priorities into uh, the county agenda and uh, was told back then that one commissioner wanted to uh, uh, veto it, that it wouldn't go on to the county platform, but it didn't prohibit you as a uh, department head uh, from or elected official from still walking the halls and advocating for your own position. Uh, so I think, you know, we're establishing the, um, the uh, county platform and we just move on. Commissioner Ramsey. Yes, I'm going to go ahead and second uh, Commissioner Cagle's motion. I know when uh, I engaged the legislature working with 33 cities, uh, not named Houston and Harris County, and as we got into the legislative malaise called Austin, it was helpful to provide as much clarity as possible when we're communicating on an issue. So I think it would be it would be helpful when we're representing uh, the county where we are, just to be sure that it's it's clear. So I would second his motion. One one last point, Judge. Yeah, yeah. Commissioner Cagle, do you know if any other county does this? So Dallas County or Bear County, they go and say three of them are for it, four of them are for it. I, I'm just curious. I, I just never seen that. And I, I chaired the Intergovernmental Affairs Committee, I think, for about four years when I, when I was in Austin. I don't know um, the answer to the question. I do know that um, previously when Donna was our legislative person, that if we were not in agreement, she would share uh, that that there was a uh, disagreement, of course, but the majority was in favor of X, Y, and Z. I, I was uh, just not aware of that. I mean, I would talk to folks, and I, I don't, nobody ever told me she went up and said, because usually it was 4 1. I just, I don't remember anybody saying that when they pointed out Rodney, you were against it. They kind of knew it. <laughs> Commissioner Ellis, with you, you, you raised the point earlier, and I, and I struggled a little bit. When when we changed away the veto, but I I recall the reason why the veto veto got changed wasn't because of one, it was sort of the straw that killed the camel's back. You were against everything, and so we were having a hard time getting anything. Thank, thank God for my beard here. You got me. I don't think that was the case. Uh, I think it was a few specific items, but you know, sounds like you. It sounds like you. I can say that, about, but I wouldn't say that about you. Such a nice guy. All yes, right. You're you're there, Commissioner Kegley, uh, if you would just restate your motion for my benefit and that of Maricelis. I want to make sure that Jay is fine with it, but propose that the commissioner's court adopt rules to require county employees testifying in support or against legislative matters to divulge the court's voting record on relating matters or at least to acknowledge the lack of unanimous vote. And I would maybe, if, if if you want, Commissioner, maybe we could check with Ender and have him come back and say if that's something. I just don't know to what extent, if, if other counties don't do it, and already we're trying to advocate for ourselves. Um, I'd, be happy I'd also say county employees would include, if the county attorney happens to be a county employee, independently elected. But under your motion, if he had a position counter to ours, he couldn't say that. If the sheriff, uh, if... If, if Adrian Garcia was still sheriff, or, uh, the current sheriff, Sheriff Gonzalez, had a position counted on which you better turn that paycheck back in under the language I just heard you read. I think that all they'd have to do is say, I have this position and commissioner's court has that position. If, if they were asked, obviously they would, uh, they would be able to answer the question, right? If they say, you if, know, if they, they're yes, related if they'd be on the oath, they'd have to answer it. If they were asked the question, the, the the issue is is the appearance when someone or an entity gives testimony, and they say that they are from the county. That it looks like that means that that is the uniform position of the county. I don't think anybody's. Uh, if, um, oh, I'm just curious if Ender Reed is available. I, Lucinda, do you have Ender by chance? Sam, uh, Judge, would you like for me to read it again? Um, I got it, unless Maricela needs it. Are you good, Maricela? I am good, Judge. Thank you. 
Ender, what's the, what's the practice? If and if you don't know, that's okay. But what's what's sort of the practice, and what would you recommend? I, I sure do, Judge. Thank you, Ender Reed, Intergovernmental and Global Affairs Director. Uh, so the the practice of of the county and and generally all all of the counties is to represent the position of the of the commissioner's court as as a whole. Um, and but always we suggest to individual office holders that they can put in um, positions for their their own constitutionally uh, guaranteed office. So um, so in the case of of uh, Senate Bill Twenty One, for example, um, and and bills that we know uh, where there there may be disagreement, we we represent the the will of the court um, based on the legislative platform, but we also uh, do inform um offices that we know may have issues that um where where the where our position is going to be um so that they can make their decision yes commissioner ellis so uh, mr reed uh also based on my experience i just don't recall any county coming up saying the vote was three two or four one unless somebody asked so in other counties do they pretty much do what we do is what i'm asking Yes, sir. Uh, that that's that's how the other counties operate is to represent uh, that. For example, Dallas County Commissioner's Court would say Dallas County Commissioner's Court uh, opposed to uh, whatever bill that might be. And oftentimes, I, I know you have to be a highly skilled generalist, but generally you just put the card in. So I don't think of reflection <laughs> on the card to say what's the vote. Now, if the Senate wanted to go do that, they could ask. But most of the time, when you give an opposition. Are you going in there saying it, or you just turn it in a card for uh, or against? We we do also uh, go talk to the offices to try to determine if if there's some way that we could get the bill into maybe a neutral position or or even a support position. So uh, we are we are working with the offices on languages on those things. I got you. Uh, I'm just, yes, I'm just based on my experience. Usually it's a card because things are moving so quick, as you know. And of course, if you talk to somebody in, in my office here. I hope it gets to me, <laughs> you know, but at least when they when the hearing is coming up, it's going to show on that little sheet, the list of witnesses yes, for or against or neutral, sometimes saying on it. You got me? Yes, sir. That That is that is what shows up on the sheet. Yes, yes, I just want to make sure it hasn't changed. I've been gone four years. I, I just didn't think it would change that much. <laughs> uh, other than the COVID procedures to get into the Capitol, not, not much has changed, Senator. Or excuse me, Commissioner. Yeah, Mr. Cagle, I understand the where you're coming from, and my my two points would be if the practice is to reflect what the majority of the body has said, I I would want to follow what generally the counties do, but I would ask Ender to the extent, and it sounds like it's part of his policy, but certainly to redouble it to make sure that if there's an issue where there's one or two commissioners that disagree, that they are informed so that they in turn can can go, you know, send someone to the hearing and say, hey, you know, that was the majority position, but this is me. Just so that, I, you know, nobody's, and I don't think if that's how all the other counties do it, I don't imagine that the, um, that the other, uh, that the senators or the legislators would, would assume that it's unanimous. Surely they know this is how it's been done and other counties do it this way. And just last one, I, I would just suggest I mean, if I felt strongly enough about something, I'd just send a letter. I mean, I don't think you have to do that. I don't think there were that many instances where I disagree with the majority. But if there were that many, Cactus, as you seem to, your memory might be a little different from mine, but I'm about to turn 67. Maybe I'm forgetting stuff. But if, if, if I had that many where I disagreed, I think I'd worked up a little chart and sent it to them and said, watch for all of these. I'm against them, but the court is for them. And I would just suggest you could do that. Uh, if, if you or anyone else is concerned about it. It might be more effective than what's said in committee. From what I recall, oftentimes when it's a lot of talk like we do, some members in the back room anyway, and it's just listening to it. Um, and Judge, I'm, I'm glad to redouble those efforts to make sure that, that everyone's aware of where our support opposed positions are. Um, absolutely glad to do that and to share with who uh, IGA has decided to to get to testify because that tactical decision uh, rests rest with us to find and, and have the correct subject matter expert uh, on, on each of the bills. 
and and to date we've uh, supported or opposed 113 bills. So um, that's that's the number right now. Yeah, Commissioner Cagle. Judge, I want to thank you for your comments. I think that they were thoughtful and appropriate, um, and uh, I appreciate them. But I would like to just go ahead and take take a quick vote on on the motion. Uh, but thank you again for trying to find that tertium quid there. Commissioner Kegel made a motion. Uh, we, we all heard it. Marcel has it. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. I'm opposed. The motion fails. Let's go on with the speakers, Lucinda. Thank you, Ender. Judge, I'm sorry. So the motion, so this item will be approved as presented on the agenda? Judge. Yes, Marcel, yes. it's just a discussion. I believe the IGA was just a, um, a request for discussion, possible action. So there is, it's a, it's a no, no action was taken. Thank you. So, yes. so just, I know are the speakers, on, I, are we on IGA? Cause I had a couple items on IGA. Or would you prefer to hear from the speakers and I get to it later? I prefer to hear from the speakers I just because they've been okay. waiting. And just now, let's see IGA if on, Cause I have a couple of bills I want to uh, ask us to support. Thank you. Okay. And you'll be available under? I've muted him just a moment. Enter. Yes, Judge. I will be here. Okay. And, and Judge, if he's busy in Austin and can't be available, I'll lay him out. I don't think these bills are going to move anytime soon. If he has to go do what he has to do, I'll bring it, I'll bring it up in two weeks. I don't want to hold him up if he needs to be in Austin running around the Capitol. Fair enough. Okay. Listen, I'll, you, have the, you have the speakers on the line, correct? Yes, ma'am, I do. Okay, well, let's go ahead and hear from them. We've just, they've been on the line for so long, but then, then we'll keep going down the agenda. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Angelica Razo with Mi Familia Vota. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Hi, my name is Angelica Razo. I'm the Texas State Director for Mi Familia Vota, a national nonpartisan civic engagement organization. Our mission is to promote the social and economic justice of the Latino community and our ally communities. Um, I'm speaking on the district clerk's request to increase juror pay and provide free parking to our jurors, and we support this request. Harris County historically has had low juror participation rates, and we know that Latinos are disproportionately underrepresented when it comes to serving as jurors. We encourage our Latino community members to be civically engaged beyond registering to vote and voting. Uh, and jury duty is a very important civic activity. So while we encourage our community members to participate in jury duty, we do want to ensure that the system is one that does not burden our community. Missing wages and then having to pay for parking downtown are two big factors that are deter our community from participating in jury duty. So we need to make significant changes in these two areas. We need a juror system that centers and values the diverse Harris County residents that are taking time out of their lives to provide crucial insight into cases. Our community should have confidence in the justice system and for them to know that their voice is important. For various reasons, our community has a history of mistrust in our, just, in our justice system and our government system. So we need to take action in creating initiatives that would increase that trust and participation. Again, I support the district clerk's request to increase your pay significantly and to provide parking for individuals serving jury duty. Uh, we look forward to an evaluation and analysis to see how these changes have impacted our juror participation rates across historically underrepresented populations. Ultimately, we want a juror system that reflects the diversity of Harris County. Thank you so much for your time today. Juan Sorto, go ahead, please. Yes, hi. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Juan Sorto. I am the current chair of the 88 Super Neighborhoods around the Houston area, also known as the Super Neighborhood Alliance. I am also here uh, to advocate on behalf of the increase in jury and also uh, parking as well available. Um, as many of you already know that um, downtown currently parking, it, you can't get any parking cheaper than $5, and that's even if you're lucky to get you know, uh, parking at that price. Um, I feel that this will definitely assist on um, diversifying the jury selection and address a lot of the concerns that members have um, that, you know, could deter them from um, serving on the jury. So Super Neighborhood Alliance fully supports uh, this uh, amendment, and I'm looking forward to uh, um, the, hearing the positive outcome. Thank you. Thank you, Juan, for coming. 
Shackelford, Houston Area Urban League. Go ahead, please. Yes, good afternoon. This is Ray Shackelford from the Houston Area Urban League. We are speaking uh, for the proposal to increase your pay, excuse me, uh, provide free parking as well as full implementation of the e-juror system. Uh, some of the speakers have mentioned before me, Harris County is one of the most, if not the most, uh, diverse counties within the country. However, when we look at the overall participation and the makeup of the juror pool, uh, it definitely does not reflect our county. Approximately 43% of Harris County residents are Hispanic uh, and about 20, and only 29% are actually eligible to serve. Uh, the majority of the community that the Urban League serves is African American, but also uh, about a quarter of our clients are also from the Hispanic and Latino community. They come from neighborhoods literally all over the city in Harris County, uh, be it Third Ward, Acres Homes, uh, Fifth Ward, Sunnyside, I could go on and on. Uh, and I think it's critical as we continue to make different changes to the overall criminal justice system uh, and make it more inclusive uh, and better performing for all that it impacts. And I know Commissioner Ellis has been one of the leading uh, commissioners, even when he was at the, the legislature, uh, leading officials on this. We want to continue that improvement. Uh, even though this is not a cure-all, we definitely feel like this is a move in the right direction uh, because you have so many that would want to participate in juror pools, but they either cannot afford it uh, to take off from work or they need to make other adjustments as it relates to parking uh, and trying to make sure they can be accommodated to serve in those capacities. So again, we're speaking in favor of these different measures to improve the juror system. Thank you for your time. Judge. Commissioner Ellis. Yeah, Mr. Shackenfoot, thank you. This is Rodney Ellis. And, uh, uh, I, and I'm not sure exactly what all we ought to do. Money is a part of it. You know, and I, and I did raise that when I was in the legislature, but I, I know we're looking and we're going to continue to work with the uh, clerk and others to see what's going on around the country, particularly in this pandemic. I want to throw money on it, but I want to make sure we're doing it in a smart way. And some of it might be a PR campaign. So people, uh, you know, in the early league should play a role in that. Uh, so people in all communities are more willing to participate. But I just wanted to mention that to you. But thank you for dialing in. Yes, sir. Judge, I'd like to piggyback on what Commissioner Ellis said. I, I think that in some instances, if we provide free transportation and free parking, and we did, and um, we did circulate my additional resolution there about the e-service system, so that people don't show up and then get turned around to go back home again, to where they feel frustrated. That our funds might be better spent instead of you, you're not going to pay them enough to compensate taking the day off of work, no matter what that is. But maybe we're better off investing in the PR outreach into these differing entities and encouraging people to come. Um, judge back in the, back in the day, I gave a speech about how to get out of jury service, but why you should not, and would, would tell folks if people would come to hear me talk, cause they want to know how to get out. And then I'd spend the time preaching at them for why they should be there. Um, preaching might be a strong term, but, but that was one of the things, and especially with, with differing groups that are out there, if you want your group to be represented, you need to show up, but we need to make it easier for people to do so. I don't know uh, what the fiscal impact of all this is going to be. That was part of our resolution. I think uh, uh, Commissioner Ellis made a reference to it. Let's let's let folks look at it and let's use some science to see if actually increasing jury pay increases the number of people that come. Um, and I think, Judge, more than once you've said, let's be smart on where we spend our dollars. If if we could get bigger impact by providing free parking free transportation, and, uh, and then community engagement, as opposed to just throwing dollars at jury pay when people aren't going to show up anyway, if you pay them more, that would just be money that's not wisely spent. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Chriselle Pillay with Home Coalition. Go ahead, please. Good afternoon. I am Chriselle Pillay with the Home Coalition, the Houston Organizing Movement for Equity. And I'm um, here today to, regarding the upcoming American Rescue Plan direct allocation 
and really urge the court to break barriers by leaning into innovation, inclusion, and equity as the county prepares to receive over $900 million. It's really important that we prioritize and allocate these funds in a way that is both accessible and provide substantial benefit to all residents of Harris County. Despite the fallacy that this pandemic is coming to its end, I want to strongly emphasize it is far from over for thousands of Harris County residents. And as many are celebrating getting vaccinated, socializing, and taking off their masks, the daunting reality is that there are families that will be left behind trying to cobble together a semblance of normalcy. There are thousands of residents who have lost jobs and have not regained employment. Homes have been lost through the eviction and foreclosure. Children's education has been interrupted, and in some cases, discontinued because of housing instability and other issues. And let's not forget the families that have dealt with direct health impacts of COVID, becoming ill and some unfortunately dying. There is a great opportunity for these funds to play a pivotal role in the outcome of lives of families whose living conditions have been exacerbated by this public health disaster. I really urge the court to take advantage of the flexibility of these funds by prioritizing health, housing, and jobs for community members that will likely feel the long lasting brunt and impact of this pandemic long after many have resumed their normal lives. For the first time ever, Harris County took the leap of examining and applying an equity lens on infrastructure. Residents of Harris County are counting on this court to deepen these efforts so that they have a real chance to not only recover from this tragic virus, but to also have a real shot at thriving, not just for themselves, but also for their families and future generations. Thank you. Commissioner. Yeah, Ms. Blake, uh, thank you. And, and, and judge and members, uh, I think we all ought to be proud that uh, I think Bloomberg uh, philanthropy uh, did uh, award a grant to us based on the equity uh, issue we've been taking along with Allegheny County. And I was on a call the other day with the National Association of Counties and the executive director made reference to that uh, equity intelligence platform. And for a moment, it lost me because I didn't know what he was talking about. I thought he was talking about a new one. But we, we have, I think, come a long way in focusing on these equity issues. And for us, it's been more than just a six letter word uh, because everybody says it, that they're for equity, but we've really done it. I think with the language uh, that uh, we included in our $2.5 billion bond package, we'll have discussion about that to make sure we're following that prioritization. Uh, and with what we did with money we've gotten so far, particularly on that direct assistance. So I do have an item. I've really called Matt Chase asking him what county to turn to. And uh, I was hoping he wouldn't say King County uh, uh, again, but he did say that was one, LA County. And he mentioned several others. But so the item, Ms. Palladium, we put on the agenda was instead of us trying to figure it out, you know, once that bill passed, I wish it had had bipartisan support, but it didn't, but it passed. I just want to make sure that when we get it, we're thoughtful and have some prioritization schedule and not do what there's always a temptation to do. And whatever is hot for the moment, uh, throw it on the agenda and try to grab some money to go in and do that. So uh, I hope that uh, before that money gets here, that item that we have on the agenda does, does pass and we have our experts here at the county working with us, come back with some recommendations and see where we go. But thank you for speaking up on it. And thank you, Judge. Thank you. Joy Davis with Texas Organizing Project. Go ahead, please. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioners and County Judge Lula Hidalgo. Uh, my name is Joy Davis. I'm a resident of Houston, Texas, and I'm also a member of the Texas Organizing Project. One of the reasons I'm speaking today is that I'm still seeing people around Houston hurting and trying to recover from the winter freeze. I've lived in Texas all of my life, and I don't think I've ever seen this much damage from an ice storm. This devastation hit all of our residents at once. People lost their lives due to the freeze, and it was also a very traumatic experience for those that survived. One of the things that we did um, through TOP and through other organizations after seeing our communities hurting was to jump into action and partner with community organizations to help bring resources into the community. Uh, I know I partnered with churches, HVAD, Houston Society for Change, the Red Cross, Omega Sci-Fi, 
and others. Um, and we distributed over 45 pallets of water, thousands of blankets, hand sanitizer, and MREs to the communities. Uh, Commissioner Ellis, I want to thank you also for donating water to the Texas Organizing Project so we could also get those to families that needed it. Um, our communities continue to need more. Thousands of families have pipes that have burst at all at the same time. And as you may have seen on the news, many are still without water even today. So making sure this funding is equitably distributed is going to be a huge factor in how quickly our communities recover. Uh, in all honesty, there were families still trying to recover from uh, Hurricane Harvey. Even some of the landlords are having a hard time because their pipes burst. There was a shortage of plumbing supplies and plumber services. So I'm extremely grateful for the nonprofits that are stepping up to help these families, uh, but we need more of them. We need more plumbers, we need more funding, and hopefully these funds can be distributed to uh, some of these nonprofits and direct assistance as well. Uh, I just wanna thank you, Commissioner Ellis, uh, Commissioner Garcia, and Judge Hidalgo for always making sure equity was a factor whenever our communities needed you. And historically marginalized populations are not forgotten about and pushed out of recovery efforts. The quicker our communities recover from Harvey, the pandemic, and winter storm, Uri, then we can return to some sort of normalcy. And then we can start to prepare for hurricane season. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Reader Hugler, go ahead, please. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, this is Rita Hugler. This morning, the meeting started with no identification of resolution. So one had to wade through to determine, through the agenda to determine what was being addressed. The resolution for law enforcement was identified as 349, but it was item 343. Please judge and commissioners properly identify what item number you are addressing so those who, of us who are attending virtually will know. My first question, why is there an overpayment of the appraised value in items 29, 28 and 29? Is it due to competing interest in a property? I wonder why this is being done and how frequently it's done. Another question, since last spring, countless homeowners have been making improvements and updated, updates to their homes. One can only wonder if things are moving at court because from what one can see of Commissioners Ramsey and Cagle, it looks the same. Last year, the fire marshal explained the necessity of moving the court to the first floor. Considering that court has not been in session on the ninth floor since mid-April 2020, I am wondering what stages of work have been completed and when is this move expected to be finished and will it stay in the approved $1 million budget? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hugler. We'll, we'll work to, to identify the items accurately. And as to the court construction, we'll make sure someone circles back. Thank you. And what about the overpayments in 28 and 29? I, I'm not sure I know what you're talking about, but I'll make sure someone circles back. Uh, commission, uh, commission. There, there were addition on 28 yes. and 29. There were yeah. additional um, 2000, in 28, 2000 over the appraised value. In 29, $112,230 over the appraised value. I want to know why. Judge? I can't hear you. Um, the judge these, is these, these, these two projects, Your Honor, are in precincts one and in precincts two. But this is something that regularly occurs in Precinct 4 as well. And um, if my colleagues for Precincts 1 and 2 would trust me, I'll get with uh, Ms. Hugler later on and explain to her how when we're trying to negotiate a purchase of a property, that sometimes in that process we'll, uh, we'll agree to pay a little bit more just so that we don't have the legal expense or other expenses of litigation. Okay. That's reasonable. Thank you. Have a good day. And the judge is muted. Go ahead, Lucinda. Thank you. Doris Brown, Northeast Action Collective. Go ahead, please. Yes, hello. My name is Doris Brown, co-founder of the Northeast Action Collective. Thank you all for this opportunity. 
We are all supposed to be protected by this law. The promise of this bond was that it was going to be different and historical injustice was going to be addressed. But the same black and brown neighborhoods are being divested in, one problem after another. But the map looks the same every time. What the devil, the affluent neighborhoods always recover from disaster very quickly. I have lived in Cindy Woods for 53 years and there has been no upgrade, no infrastructure. We celebrated thinking that finally we would get some equitable justice. Our neighborhoods and communities still until this day have not, not recovered from harvest. Emelda. <laughs> we never recover from one disaster, flooding event before another happens. Upon close inspection of the map, all affluent neighborhoods and communities have been restored. Some still have excess money in the millions. But since we're low income, poor neighborhoods and communities, again, we are left out. The only time we seem to have value is when we are being taxed and overtaxed. In the middle of a pandemic, houses still not repaired are only half finished. Our taxes was raised in 2020, so we're getting taxation without representation. For three and a half years, people can't prepare a nourishing meal, some laid out from their jobs, record eviction, homelessness thriving, as whole families try to make try to make a lifetime of belongings fit into a shopping cart. COVID affecting families to the point of death. Still, we wait. What does the commissioner's court expect with hurricane season approaching? Moved up to May. What do we tell our families? our neighbors, our communities, we shall overcome. For 156 years, slavery has been abolished. So now we have the new slavery, systemic racism, barriers that impede instead of push. We have redlining, zoning laws. Don't judge us by the color of our skin. But Thank you. Thank you. Your time is up. Billy Guevara with Northeast Action Collective. Go ahead, please. Hello. Um, my name is uh, Billy Guevara. I'm a resident of Precinct 1 and a member of the Northeast Action Collective. And I'm calling you re re uh, regarding about the news reported about three weeks ago, Harris County has two one point four billion dollars shortfall in um, the bond that we vote, voted for was included. An equity pre provision to pr protect my black and brown neighbors. It's become become predictable uh, on all the projects needing the most projects right right here in Halls and Greens Bio which are the most poorest areas in Houston. Uh, all the projects, the projects needed in this area are still incomplete and are uh, completely, absolutely un, underfunded. We are prone to danger and danger. We are prone to danger and flooding but by the, uh, with the lack of bio improvements every time a storm comes into the Gulf. Number two, we need to spend money on things that to save our lives. Police and sheriffs don't save our lives. Expanding bios will save lives as long as the funding is there. What we can do is take away a money in from the sheriff to compensate for the lack of protection that has been put, meaning our 
bios and drainage, but I, I know that y'all are, don't do, the, aren't responsible for the drainage, <clears throat> puts us at risk. Now, it's time for y'all to put some, uh, put some political risk to get to the equity that we deserve. Um, bottom line here, people, look, I lost six of my relatives in the last, uh, in the last, uh, Harvey storm trying, trying, they were trying to get away from the flooding by going to a safer location. And this is something that I'm going to have to expect every time there's a storm in the Gulf or even if there's a few drops of rain, this is uncalled for. This is the kind of thing that happens in third world countries or in other states where they mismanage funds. And I just want to say it's detrimental to our safety and our livelihood uh, for the people of Northeast Houston. Um, and furthermore, I just, you know, want y'all to get it together. I mean, we deserve it. We pay taxes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Shanza Branch with Northeast Action Collective. Go ahead, please. Hi, my name is Shanza Branch. I'm a precinct, I'm a resident of precinct one also, and a member of the Northeast Action Collective. I'm calling in regards to the news reported three weeks ago that Harris County has a $1.4 billion gap in the, their flood bond program. It, it hurts me to see that the bond we voted for in 2018 that included an equity provision to help protect my black and brown people in the Northeast is now disintegrating. It's become a predictable narrative that the project needing the most funding are right here in Hales and Greens Bayou, which runs from through some of the poorest areas in Houston. It has been reported that the projects along these two bayous still need about 75% of their funding. All of the commissioners on this court have known for decades that these waterways are prone to dangerous and costly flooding during the storms that pass through our region. And this map makes me feel that me and my family are certainly going to flood again. The funding gaps in the areas where NAC members live show that we live in a sacrifice zone and that the zones being sacrificed are where low income black and brown people live. And, um, you know, I've been in Houston since 2007. And I, I've been through Hurricane Ike, I've been through Harvey, and I've been through the flood. The flood was like the worst. And I had nowhere to go. I had to stay in my damaged up address. And, um, you know, now when it rains, me and my husband, we get paranoid because we don't know what to do. We don't know whether to pack up and run or get life jackets or what because it's the, it's the, the, the flooding is, is terrible. And then, you know, along with the freeze, you know, people that don't need money is getting the funds. That make it hard for the people that need the funds in these areas, that make it hard for us to get the funds. Because people lie, they cheat, they scam. You know, the people should be, be more thorough in their inspections or, or however they, you know, approve people to get finances or to get their house fixed. My house is half fixed, and it's and it's been since Harvey, you know. But thanks to the West Street Recovery that picked up my case, you know, I'm getting some things done. But that's it. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Judge. Yes, Commissioner. Allen. Judge, I know we have about five people with the Northeast Action Collective, and I'm glad that they're here. And I hope they'll stay on the line because that item is going to be discussed a bit in. I just want to know we hear you. I won't jump in after everyone, but I know a few more. We do hear you, and uh, we're committed to doing something about it. You hear some discussion about that today, and 
I'm keeping it on the agenda, whether the department it does, I do until they come back with a plan to make sure greens and halls in particular are, are funded with existing money. Uh, I wanna make sure if we end up going to the voters again, they're not out there uh, by themselves because I, I do think they're absolutely right. And those, that, those neighborhoods have pretty much been the detention pond for the county. And that's just not right. And we're gonna stop it, but I do hear you. Thank you. Yeah, and, and just so you all know, the direction has been that no project should lose its place in the sequencing. And I know these were, were near the top quartiles. So we're, we are working on it as Commissioner Ellis has said. Go ahead, Lucinda. Yes, ma'am. Diana Contreras, go ahead, please. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Diana Contreras, and I'm a resident of the Prison One and the member of Northeast Action Collective. I am calling in regards to the news to the news reported three weeks ago that the Harris County has 1.4 billion gap in their flood flood bond. It pains me to see that the bond we voted for in 2018 that included inequity provision to help protect my black and brown neighbors in the Northeast is now disintegrating. It's become a very predictable narrative that the projects needing the most funding are right here in the halls in the Northeast is now disintegrating. All of the commissioners on this court have known for decades that these waterways are prone to dangerous and costly flooding during the storms that pass through our region. Money spent to protect poor areas has a greater impact at reducing disaster impacts because poor people are more hurt by disasters. It's harder for us to afford insurance and we're more, more likely to be denied. We're all supposed to be protected by this law. The promise of this bond was that it was going to be different and historical injustice was going to be addressed. But the same brown and black neighbors are being divested one problem after another, but the map looks the same every time. I moved to this area in 2017, and since then I have been in fear of my home being flooded. I am one house away from Northeast Wayside. For many years, North Wayside has been known for its bad conditions and floods are one of them. I want to show my community that we matter and we're not forgotten. Thank you so much, commissioners. Thank you. Felix Kapoor with Northeast Action Collective. Go ahead, please. Uh, Judge, commissioners, thanks for your time. Uh, my name is Felix and I'm a resident of Precinct 1 and also with the Northeast Action Collective calling in regards to the $1.4 billion gap in the flood bond that was reported three weeks ago. Um, and just reiterating what my colleague said, the projects in need of the most funding are in some of the county's poorest neighborhoods that have repeatedly flooded in recent decades and not ha have not received the same amount of funding for flood mitigation as other communities have. These include halls and greens, which have been studied or under improvements for at least 15 years and counting. And then during Harvey, over 24,000 homes in this floodway um, were flooded. The Northeast has had to face the brunt of the damage from flooding, followed by inadequate billion dollar repair programs, both from the county and the city, and an uncomfortably high rate of FEMA denial as well. Local media outlets have even been reporting on the deep freeze we just had and recognizing how little FEMA is giving in assistance. And this deep freeze still has thousands of Houstonians either without water or are not completely back to whole. I recognize that this court is working on plans to close this gap and I mainly wanna remind the court that this bond was supposed to help unravel some of the historical inequities which the Northeast never deserved. Right now, this isn't happening with this funding gap, and I trust that this court will work to correct this. I want to also acknowledge the, court, acknowledge the court's lawsuit against the um, Texas Department of Transportation to stop the I-45 expansion. This was a great mood, 
and move, and I applaud the court for, for doing this, especially given the fact that this was going to be a $7 billion project uh, towards more concrete in our area, while we seem to be always short on funding to alleviate our region's chronic flooding problem. Thank you. Thank you. Matthew Malil, go ahead, please. Yeah, hello? Yes, hello? go ahead, please. Yeah, I was calling in reference to item 172, the property tax uh, collection for delinquent property taxes. <clears throat> and I simply wanted to say that I believe already the county attorney's office and the budget management department has uh, already put out reports showing that we can probably bring that work in-house and not continue to outsource it to uh, a law firm. And I think it can be done. I think it's already being done elsewhere. I believe it's Travis County. I don't have my notes in front of me. But I just wanted to offer a philosophical reason as to why we should do this, because the analysis has already been reflects that we can do it in a cost-effective manner that would still benefit the citizens. I think there are times to outsource uh, government work, and there are times to bring it in-house. But here, we are outsourcing work where the incentive is to go after people who don't have the money or don't pay their property taxes with fees. And I think that's fundamentally wrong. So I live in Precinct 2, but I'm financially blessed, and so I can pay my property taxes every year without an issue. So Weinberger doesn't make any money off of me. But they do have an incentive because they only get paid when somebody is a delinquent. So they, ha they are just financially incentivized to go after folks to pursue money who are delinquent, who are probably already stressed financially. And that is just philosophically goes against everything local government or state government or federal government should do. Uh, we have to figure out ways to collect things that don't hurt people who don't have the money um, and, frankly, make them suffer more than they already do. So I sort of believe that we sh – not sort of – I believe that we should find a way to bring this in-house. The analysis shows that we can. And – if you're going to outsource work to anyone, they should be providing a real service and not one that just allows them to make money off additional fees, additional like late charges, sort of like almost like charging a vig, like the mafia does, and that's how they make their juice. We shouldn't be doing this, whether it's legal or otherwise, by outsourcing it to a firm. And so for all those reasons, I think it is, the time is right uh, to bring the work in-house um, and so that the, the county can figure out how to collect it without detrimentally affecting those persons. Thank you. Thank you. Demo Figueroa with LULAC Council number 4967. Go ahead, please. Good afternoon, Judge Hidalgo and Commissioner Ellis, Garcia Cagle and Ramsey. My name is Demo Figueroa and I'm president of the Greater Houston LULAC Council. It's my privilege to address you on behalf of my members and their families to support good government that works for all of its citizens. We've all had a hard year, especially the Latino community here in Harris County. Our workers are overrepresented in industries that have been hit hardest by the pandemic. We face large employment losses, particularly among Latinas in the service industry. Together, our black and brown communities have accounted for 23% of the job loss due to the pandemic. That means that paying the mortgage and putting food on the table is a struggle. And our communities are doing everything they can to hold on to the roof over their heads. That's why I'm here today to support transition of any tax delinquency to the Harris County Attorney's Office instead of keeping a third party private agency that is charging a fee up to 20% on top of a tax bill and on top of interest. This fee is solely for profit. It doesn't go back to our communities. It doesn't support county services. And it certainly doesn't help homeowners that have been struggling for over a year to make ends meet. Let's save on the fees and penalties and help Harris County homeowners get back on track and recover. Homeownership is a hallmark of achieving the American dream. It shouldn't be a nightmare that a private company profits from. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Amber Boyd, go ahead, please. 
Hi, good afternoon. Um, I would like to address the court on um, item number 74. And I'm calling because um, I see the three options that are, and, I'm, and I agree with the, the collections being in-house. But I would like to also um, look into moving to maybe a hybrid option, and I would want the court to look at this as, a, as an option as well, where the collections can be done in-house and then also maybe possibly uh, picking outside firms, local, local outside firms, uh, to handle some of these cases. Um, I've been an attorney for, for quite some time now, and I believe that there are plenty of firms that can handle um, the county tax collections. Um, I believe that this option could also have, have it where Harris County would be able to vet these, these firms, and these firms are given batches of cases. And based on, based on the cases that they're given, they're assessed by, they're assessed by performance. And, and that would kind of, that would make, not kind of, but that would negate the, the fee-based and, 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 and some of the, the, the penalties that the current vendor is, is forcing on taxpayers. Um, this would create more of a competitive, competitive, um, competitive uh, edge again, when these firms are assessed on this performance-based um, action. And, and I think this would be, Something that should be looked upon because I, I I agree with it going in house and that will allow Harris County to have control but also have control over who they choose to pick to um, to, um, to to do these cases or handle these cases and that would also go through a, a process a vetting process like most of the projects that are, are handed to small uh, contractors and things like that that would be the same thing with some of these firms that handle the collections. Um, and, and to be honest with you, I agree with, I, I want to I add on to what the other speakers have said about our economy and what has happened with this COVID-19. We're going to be seeing a lot of things uh, as far as our, our rebuilding our economy in Harris County from COVID. And unfortunately, through this, a lot of people have lost their, their, their jobs and will continue to go through uh, many of the things of trying to get back to normal. And some of that will be where they can't afford the taxes. And I think that if we find a way to utilize the firms that we have in Harris County, local firms, and utilize the access we have as in-house, I think that could be a plausible and a valuable option that we, could, we should look at, into as well. Um, and then also, I, you know, with that, I, I'm going to leave it at this point. I'd rather see us making sure that our residents in Harris County stay in their homes than other firms uh, going out and buying ranches, naming them 3348. Thank you. We are hitting up against the two hours. We do have a couple more hours of speakers. Um, we could also take a lunch break. Do folks have a preference? Judge, how about a hybrid? How about a long break, but not a full hour? Somewhere in between. Okay, so it's 2.13. Why don't we take a break um, for 30 minutes until 2.45? Let's do that. Does that work for folks? Yeah? Okay, and then we'll, we'll come back. 2.45. Thank you, Judge. Okay, so we have a quorum. It's 2.46. Commissioner's Court is back in session and we'll continue to hear from the speakers. Yes, ma'am. Abel Garcia, go ahead, please. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, directors and, and uh, of the Cares County for your offering me this opportunity. My name is Abel Garcia. I am the executive director of NAMAC, the National Association of Minority Contractors here in the greater Houston area. We have approximately 300 members in our association. The issue that I have with Mr. Line Barger, I think the name is, is that number one, I don't know how long they've been since they've been without a, you know, a contested uh, type of uh, bid. Uh, I do know that they have 45 offices throughout the United States. And of course, my question is, is here in Houston, Texas, we've got a lot of great attorneys and it's Houston based, not Austin. And so if I need to get a hold of somebody, and this is important because this is my home, okay? 
that's not protected by all the other protections. So even if you go bankrupt, you have a protection. They take the house away. And I think that's not the way it should be. I think, first of all, and I believe I spoke to city council last week, 75 to 80% of the population, according to Dr. Kleinberg, is minority. I don't know that we have any minority representation. I think that we should do away with what we have, and we should have a diverse set of attorneys that look after our interests, our Houstonian interests, okay, where we have maybe three Latinos, two African-Americans, one Pacific Asian, whatever it may be, but we have plenty of talent here. I also wonder where the, where the interest came from. There's credit cards that have less interest than what they charge. These are our neighbors that you're charging, that not you, but this entity is charging 15%, and then it goes as high as 43%. So, in fact, the people that you guys are representing is uh, the ones they look to you for solutions. And so we need to step up. We meaning our representatives need to step up and get the type of representation we need. Most of these folks, and I assume that most of these folks, I don't have anything in front of me, are diverse people. They probably don't know how to operate a computer more than they do Facebook and email and that sort of thing. So, so these, there's all these new fancy tools that the city, the state, the county has that maybe you need to ratchet back and say, how do we represent our folks better? How do you get in touch with them when you're running for re-election? Do you use Zoom or do you use in person? Do you appear places that you haven't been invited, but you want to talk? That's the same passion I want to see in getting our message across. After all, this is our home that we're dealing with, that we saved to make sure that we get it paid for. I'm a, I also am a property owner. And I, and I look at these taxes that have gone up, 80%, 70% for my rental properties. That doesn't make any sense, especially when we're building more properties. But again, getting back to the issue, I don't feel that we, I think we should break this thing into about six different parts. They did it with OCT. Thank you. Your time, your time is up. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garza. It's Rod Nealis. Thank you. You're Jay Carana, go ahead, please. Thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, commissioners, Judge Hidalgo. My name is Jay Carana. I'm at your local attorney in Houston, Texas. I certainly do a lot of collection work. And obviously, even from a personal point, I would certainly love a crack or the opportunity to bid on collection work that the county does. My understanding is there is just one private firm that the county has essentially contracted with for the past 30 years or so. There hasn't been any new procurement. There hasn't been any new bids. And there hasn't been any, you know, focus on minority participation, minority participation and WE participation. Now, I know you all are considering three options, but I would propose a fourth option, one where you have a new procurement that is fair and equitable, that looks into minority participation, encourages it, and actually, like the last caller mentioned, selects multiple firms. That is actually in the benefit of the county because then it's not just one firm that you can't really judge how they're performing or not performing. Now, we all know, and I know you guys have had meetings on this before, where the status quo is just not very feasible. You have a situation where the private firm does not even negotiate with homeowners to come up with a payment plan or anything until they're behind at least six months. By the time they're 12 months behind, when you tack on the fees that they charge and everything else, you are almost at 43% increase from the taxes that they owed. Now, if people are already behind on their taxes and are barely making their mortgage payments, when you tack on this fee, which I think the one private firm ends up getting anywhere from 15 to 19%, and the county gets the other penalties, but at the end of being 43%, that's not in the benefit of anybody. If you have multiple firms that are selected, you can then dole out the work, different contracts, to all of them and see how they perform. If some of them encourage settlement or can get results for the county sooner, rather than six months, 12 months, 10 years, some of these probably have been for close on for like 10 years. But then you can provide more work to those particular law firms or companies or private firms that show results, that can show productivity. And you can actually compare versus the other people, vendors and just having one vendor that's been there for the last 30 years. Now, I know one of the options that you also have is to bring it in-house, and that might indeed save some cost, but as we all know, you know, commissioners of the county already have so many things on their plate, and that would just add more to the bureaucratic mess. 
the fact is other private firms that are collection firms are specialized to do this. They just need the opportunity to be out there, to be able to bid on this project, and for more than one to be selected so they can at least compete against each other in some ways and show provable results that then the county can consider on who to give the work to. That not only benefits the county, but it also benefits the taxpayers because the fact is if homeowners can negotiate some sort of payment plan or a collection plan sooner, they're more likely to pay. The way it's set up right now um, is essentially based on Thank you. Your time is up. Thank Appreciate you so much. It. Thank you for your time. Elizabeth Martin, go ahead, please. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Elizabeth Martin. I'm from Precinct 1, landowner, business owner. Uh, right now, the county employs a law group whose law suit in Iowa you guys should definitely take a look at. The county has a backlog of collections, and the lack of timeliness in collecting creates a poverty sinkhole that the low-income individuals cannot climb back out of. In 2020, 76% of delinquent accounts were for property values of $150,000 or lower. Those are homeowners that struggle financially every single day. The current collectors allowing this account to snowball causes irreparable damage. At this moment in time, the entire structure is counterproductive on improving the overall financial ecosystem and is focused on setting up the taxpayer for failure rather than providing a viable solution in which the taxpayer can recover from and which the county can collect faster and more efficiently. I urge you to consider different collection models that will allow some local businesses to be involved in the process, creates competition, and most importantly, stop our most vulnerable from being preyed on. Consider the really heinous things that we have done in our history just because that's the way it's always worked. We don't want to keep doing that and not put this on the streets. There are plenty of models out there that you can research, research that show a more robust collection method, some of which use early warning systems that help protect all stakeholders. Research into these methods um, may help when creating an RFP and putting this back on the street. This, if you research some of these methods, we will be able to have KPIs, such as faster collection of taxes, improved percentage of collected delinquent taxes, enhanced constituent experience from the technology perspective, follow through from early warning systems, and a space created for small minority women and local businesses. Um, I appreciate your consideration, and, and I do hope that this will be looked into. We've seen a lot of change in Houston. We've seen a lot of new leaders in Houston. And I'm hoping this is another thing that, that can be updated. Thank you. Thank you. Maria Lewis with HBREA. Go ahead, please. Hi, my name is Marla Lewis. I am the president of the Houston Black Real Estate Association. It is our position that the current uh, way of collecting the taxes, um, the late fee is basically a usury tax. It is our duty to be responsible enough to take something like this into our hands. And we are asking that this would be researched. In the city of Austin, Travis County, they collect their own uh, fees. And we also need to take a look into how uh, the collecting of the fees, where is this money going? This is a burden, a perverse uh, incentive, if you will, and an unnecessary incentive uh, to some of the most vulnerable um, individuals that we have within our community. We are asking that this be corrected as quickly as possible, as it has posed unnecessary burdens on homeowners that are already struggling. Thank you so much. Thank you. Laura Thurman, go ahead, please. Good afternoon, Judge and Commissioners. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you for providing the forum for us to give you these comments and the feedback. Today I'm speaking on the topic of the penalties assessed on delinquent property tax and the outsourcing of this collection uh, resulting in fees to a third party. It seems to me that the real approach should be to create and focus 
on a program that creates a pathway for property owners to address their unpaid balances, as opposed to the current program where fees and interest are just com compounded exponentially to the point where a property owner really has no feasible means to save their property. Um, the program should focus on finding ways to collect the actual taxes owed and not be promoting a third party to assess fees and penalties to line their own pockets. I think that's just going in the wrong direction. We want to get these, give these property owners a pathway to getting their property, property balances paid. Um, these fees don't benefit the city. These fees only benefit a single third party who really has no incentive to find an equitable resolution between the city and the taxpayer. And that's why I think that we really need to look at the program in its entirety and find a way, if it's in-house or if it's partially in-house, find a way where we come to a resolution where it's good for the taxpayer and it's good for the city, and it's not just a program that puts fees in the pockets of a third party. Thank you for my time. Thank you. Felix Gora, go ahead, please. Yes, Jerry, thank you for your time. Um, I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of my family. Uh, we've gone through situations where um, we've lost property because we weren't given ample time to um, work out an agreement or something um, with the commissioner's court or with the court um, uh, member. So uh, that's something I'd like to see um, handled a little differently. Um, and I've known about people's property all around us, and it seems to be happening in minority neighborhoods. So uh, that's one of the issues that, that, that I have. Uh, I grew up in the home area, so um, I've just watched property after property. We've been concerned about uh, uh, those are taxpayer dollars, and, and, and we're losing tax money just by letting the property sit for years and years and years. Um, and thank you for your time. Emily Paul with American Heart Association. Go ahead, please. Good afternoon, Judge Hidalgo and fellow commissioners. My name is Emily Paul, and I am a community impact director for the American Heart Association based here in Houston, Texas. First and foremost, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak in support of the Memorandum of Understanding between Harris County Public Health, the University of Texas Health Science Center, and American Heart Association. As you know, the American Heart Association's mission is to be a relentless force for longer, healthier lives. Every person deserves the opportunity for a full, healthy life. We know addressing the drivers of health disparities, including the social determinants of health and structural racism, is the only way to truly achieve equitable health and well-being for all. AHA is dedicated to achieving our new 2024 impact goal to advance cardiovascular health for all, including identifying and removing barriers to healthcare access and quality. One way the American Heart Association is working to achieve this goal is through its role as a backbone leader for the Greater Houston Coalition for Social Determinants of Health. We are steadfast in our commitment in supporting the coalition's mission to establish an impactful, sustainable, data-driven system to promote health equity. The coalition's development of a system level solution between healthcare and community services to address the social drivers of health outcomes is transformational work. The American Heart Association is honored to serve in the role alongside Harris County Public Health and UT Health. This memorandum of understanding solidifies the sharing of responsibility between agencies. Harris County brings the credibility and expertise necessary to enhance this collective impact effort. The American Heart Association is grateful for the partnership with Harris County Public Health and UT Health. Together, we effectively guide vision and strategy, align activities, and build public will across many sectors throughout the county. We look forward to continued collaboration as we work to put the health of the community especially those most vulnerable first. 
Thank you. Heidi McPherson with UT Health. Go ahead, please. Good afternoon, Commissioner's Court. My name is Heidi McPherson. I'm a senior project manager with UT Health, focused on co-leading the Greater Houston Coalition for Social Determinants of Health, along with my colleagues Harris County Public at Harris County Public Health and Emily Paul at American Heart Association. Thank you for this opportunity to speak in support of formalizing the collaborative leadership of these three organizations. The organizations are committed to cultivating collective capacity for addressing social determinants of health across Harris County in order to improve health equity. We've heard from so many today of how important and how big that need is. The University of Texas Health Science Center's vision is excellence above all in the quest to be an acknowledged leader in collaboration to treat, cure, and prevent the most common diseases of our time through education, research, and clinical practice. In this quest, the evidence is clear that we must focus on promoting health equity and systemically addressing the drivers, uh, social drivers of health outcomes in order to prevent the burden of diseases suffered across our region. UT Health seeks to cultivate these collaborations and collective capacity necessary to create a healthier county. The Greater Houston Coalition for Social Determinants of Health emerged from the Clinton Health Matters Initiative, which did a lot to accelerate clinical health information exchange and to better understand the needs of individuals across the healthcare space. It also developed a new capacity for social determinants of health screening and referral to needed social services. At the end of 2018, leaders within Harris County Public Health, the AHA, and UT Health stepped up to co-lead this work into the future. We've embarked on an extensive listening tour of coalition members and health leaders across the region and beyond, learning much about the opportunities for better serving and addressing health needs, not just health care needs of our community. Collectively, we've mapped the next steps in a plan that meets Harris Care's report transformational recommendation number one, and beyond, and promises to be a leading example of health data sharing ecosystem nationally. This coalition has grown significantly from 75 members to over 350, representing more than 125 organizations across health and other sectors committed to cultivating health equity in a sustainable and scalable way. The coalition is actively aligning various health equity efforts across our region to improve their impact and is moving forward with plan improvements to the health data eco-sharing system to support these evolving multi-organizational and multi-sectorial workflows. This MOU between our three organizations solidifies the shared leadership role as a backbone organization, securing our respective strengths for the collective benefit. We humbly ask for your blessing and approval of formalizing this collaboration in order for it, us to better serve and provide a foundation for future health equity and improved health outcomes across our community. We would be happy to share additional details on this collective effort with any of the commissioners. Thank, Thank you. you. Ray Prysock with Texas Organizing Project. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, my name is Ray Prysock. I'm a housing justice organizer at Texas Organizing Project. Um, today we brought a few members here to discuss the uh, Community Centers Department item uh, on Winter Storm Uri. So as of two weeks ago, FEMA has um, collected about 121,000 uh, Winter Storm URI related registrations. Of those, uh, almost 70,000 are renters and about 50,000 are homeowners. So the vast majority of the people who are applying for assistance through FEMA um, are in fact uh, renters. Also data revealed that around 70% of Harris County applicants are without home, homeowners insurance. Uh, and this creates a significant financial burden, particularly on low-income households without the resources to pay for immediate plumbing repairs. Um, that's a really big issue. Also, FEMA does not reimburse uh, for insurance deductibles. Um, a lot of people, they can't even afford to pay the deductible once um, they are impacted by damage, uh, you know, any, due to any kind of storm. 
Um, you know, also FEMA data reflects that uh, there's a very low eligibility rate. So it's around 12%. Um, a housing repair is uh, the residents are on average are given about $3,000. And that's just not enough to cover um, a lot of the damages that uh, we see not just with winter storm Uri, this is just one of the you know many disasters that have happened in the last few years. I'll never forget that you know black cloud floating over the county, um, flooding, Hurricane Harvey. This is regular business here in Texas. Um, so you know we support um, uh, an assessment to be done. Uh, and to look at how we can lessen the impact on low-income black and brown households specifically. Um, at least 55,000 homes in unincorporated Harris County experienced some type of pipe damage, uh, which interrupted water flow. And there are still many, many people who uh, don't have running water. And there are landlords that are saying, that they're not going to do any repairs. And unfortunately, because we live in a system where it's so slanted uh, to support landlords' rights over tenants' rights, um, they can simply say, you know, the CDC moratorium, for example, oh, you haven't paid rent in a few months um, because of COVID, so I'm not going to repair your pipes. I'll never forget seeing people pull water out of ditches. Thank you. I have so to this stop is something you. that you so need much. to support. Thank you. Judge, I'm unmuting the interpreter. Great. Interpreter, you're unmuted. Thank you. Thank you. Mitzi Ordonez with Texas Organizing Project. Go ahead, please. Hola, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Mitzi Ordonez. Soy organizadora comunitaria de la campaña de vivienda con todo, Texas Organizing Project. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Michi Ordonez. I am the lead organizer for Houston Justice with TOP, Texas Organization Project. Y quiero compartir mi experiencia y las necesidades que he visto en la comunidad desde la tormenta invernal, URI. And I would like to share my experiences and, and the assistance that is needed in our communities since winter storm URI. En esta ocasión voy a hablar en español para que nuestras comunidades se enteren que en estos espacios son para todos, no importando el idioma, ya que hay mucho temor en nuestra comunidad que no habla inglés por venir a compartir sus historias. On today's occasion, I will be speaking in Spanish so that our community understands that these venues are for everyone, no matter the language. Since a lot of them don't speak English, there is a lot of fear for some people to come forward and share their stories. Adelante. Lamentablemente, la tormenta pasó en un momento en donde nuestra comunidad estaba lidiando con la pandemia. Y desafortunadamente para nuestras comunidades afroamericanas y latinas, el impacto ha sido mayor. Unfortunately, the storm happened in a moment where our community is dealing with the pandemic. And regrettably, for our black and brown communities, the impact has been major. Muchos de nuestros miembros aún, aún no han podido recuperarse económicamente, tienen rentas atrasadas y están haciendo lo posible para cubrir sus necesidades básicas. Many of our members have not been able to recover financially. They have fallen behind on their rent and they're doing everything possible to cover their basic necessities. Adelante. Desde que pasó la tormenta... Gracias. Desde que pasó la tormenta, he recibido a diario llamadas de gente que no puede acceder a recursos, ya sea porque la información no está en su idioma o es difícil aplicar, ya que uh, no entienden el proceso o no saben cómo acceder en línea. Since the storm, we have received daily phone calls. People have been seeking resources, and many of them called to find resources to see if they are available, and they are not available in their language or the process to apply is too difficult since many of them don't have digital capabilities to do so. Y otros miembros me llaman por los abusos y la falta de respuesta de los dueños de la propiedad. Others have called due to the abuse and the lack of reply from the owners of the apartments. Uh, durante la tormenta, algunos inquilinos tuvieron que esperar semanas 
para que los dueños pudieran hacer las reparaciones. Esos días no tuvieron servicios básicos como agua y luz. During the storm, some of these tenants had to wait weeks for the owners to do repairs or for them to acknowledge the repairs. And during those days, they lacked basic services such as water and light. Tal es el caso de la señora Mercedes, abuela de cuatro nietos, que durante la tormenta estaba lidiando con el dueño de sus apartamentos para que no les pusieran candado en su puerta, como lo han hecho con sus vecinos, por no pagar la renta. Such is the case of Miss Mercedes, a grandmother of four grandchildren, who during the storm was in fear that the owner of the apartments would lock her out, like they have for other, other tenants, for lack of payment. Y cuando la tormenta pasó, ella dejó de trabajar por 10 días, el cual ocasionó que se volviera a atrasar con la renta y además tuvo que cubrir los gastos que llegaron con la tormenta. Later when the storm occurred, she stopped working for 10 days, causing her to fall behind in her rent again and on top incurring additional fees and expenses like eating out. Uh, la señora Mercedes, como muchos más, están enfrentando una crisis de salud física y emocional por la situación que están viviendo. Muchos de ellos sienten que no le ven el fin y están muy desesperados por la ayuda. People like Ms. Mercedes, like many others, are facing a crisis with their physical and emotional health due to the situation that they're dealing with. Many of them feel like there is no end in sight and they are desperate for help. Sí, nos aseguramos que estos fondos que van a llegar, lleguen a la gente que se encuentra más vulnerable en estos momentos, podría ayudar a mitigar sus problemas. If the assistance from the county were to reach those who are most vulnerable at this moment, it could help mitigate their problems. Pero la gente en estos momentos ya no puede esperar más. Esos fondos tienen que distribuirse pronto y tienen que hacerse de forma accesible. Tienen que ser en su idioma y fácil para ellos para, apl para aplicar. But the people can no longer wait. The assistance has to come now, and it has to be easily to apply and accessible in their language. Y nosotros estamos organizando para que la gente conozca sobre los recursos que hay en la comunidad y conozca sus derechos, pero no es suficiente. Necesitamos ayuda económica para que nuestras comunidades puedan volver a, resta a res restablecerse. We are organizing so that people are aware of the resources available in their community and their rights. But it is not enough. We need financial assistance so that the communities can reestablish themselves. Gracias. Thank you. Gracias. Interpreter, please stay on the line. Carmen Yvonne with Texas Organizing Project. Go ahead, please. Hola, muy buenas tardes, jueza. En comisionado, mi nombre es Carmen Ivón. Good afternoon, Judge. Uh, my name is Carmen Ivón. And I'm from Texas Organizing Project. And soy de la mesa directiva en todo el estado. I am from the director's uh, table of the whole state of Texas Organization Project. Y estoy aquí para compartir mi historia. I'm here to share my story. Con la tormenta, uh, perdí el medio tiempo de trabajo que tenía para poder uh, pagar mis piles. With the storm, I ended up losing my part-time job that I was using to pay my bills. Porque soy una persona deshabilitada y en esta tormenta sufrí demasiado igual que otra gente. Because I am disabled and during the storm I suffered like many other people. En mi baño, hasta la fecha no tengo agua en mi baño. Tengo que poner al toilet agua con un bote. Solamente tengo agua en la cocina porque mi baño se destruyó por la humedad y el agua que se tiró del shower. My restroom. To this day, unfortunately, I still do not have water in my restroom. For me to be able to use a toilet, I have to get water from the kitchen because I have water in my kitchen, but my restroom has been destroyed because of the humidity from the shower. Estoy pidiendo, por favor, la ayuda uh, que se pueda dar a la gente como yo, como tanta otra gente, 
porque FIMA es muy lenta y realmente no está ayudando. I am asking for assistance for people like me, for people who need it, because FEMA is unfortunately too slow. Too slow. I do apologize. Estoy aquí esperando uh, que alguien me ayude. Yo vivo sola. Uh, estoy deshabilitada. Agarro cheque del Seguro Social, pero no es suficiente para cubrir los gastos que por culpa de terceras personas ocasionaron en, en todo el estado de Texas. I'm here waiting for some type of assistance. I live alone. I am disabled. I receive a social security check, but unfortunately it is not enough to cover my expenses. I need to be able to pay my bills and due to third parties, I, I'm sorry, due to third parties, I haven't been able to cover my expenses. Soy una persona con muchos problemas de salud que ha estado lidiando esto después de Harvey que me picó una araña en desafortunadamente a mí nunca nadie me ha ayudado. Ahora es el momento que yo estoy hablando por mí, para mí y para otras personas que están pasando la misma situación que yo. I've been dealing with my health. Um, unfortunately, something that happened to me during Harvey was I got bitten by a spider and unfortunately I've been disabled since then. Um, I have not ever received any type of help. And it's come to the day that I just, I need to request some type of help. I'm speaking up for myself and for my community and other people like me. Uh, esperamos que se toquen el corazón y puedan traer los fondos, que ya no sigas habiendo más uh, anarquismo, más uh, gente que solo se aprovecha de la pobreza de la gente. En, no tienen, uh, piensa nada más en su bolsillo, no en, en la comunidad. Y yo les agradezco a los cuatro comisionados y la juez Lina Hidalgo por todo el apoyo que estamos recibiendo y que sé que vamos a recibir de ellos porque ellos son los que han estado cambiando el sistema para bien de la comunidad. We ask that you please, you know, deep down, look into your hearts and assist us with this fund. We hope that the end of the anarchy has come. Um, I'm asking that people stop taking advantage of the poor, stop thinking about your pockets instead of the community. And I'd like to thank the four commissioners and the Judge Hidalgo because we want to thank you for your support in advance because we know that you are the ones that have already been making the change. Muchas gracias y Dios los bendiga. Thank you very much and may God bless you. Gracias. Thank you, interpreter. Cecilia Fontenot with Texas Organizing Project. Go ahead, please. Good afternoon, judge and commissioners. My name is Cecilia Fontenot and I reside in South Park. The reason I'm here today, and it's with a very heavy heart, Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, yes, ma'am, go ahead. Okay, my name is Cecilia Fontenot. Good afternoon, judge and commissioners. I live in South Park. The reason for me being here today, and it's with a very heavy heart, not not, I'm talking now. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, we can hear you. Please continue. Okay. Not only do I not have water and busted pipes from winter storm Yuri, I made it. Unfortunately, my dog, Rosé, she did not make it. She died. Thank you to Senator Miles, who let me have his personal heater from his office. And then the cabinet, after the burst of pipe, blew off the wall. I have dishes glasses, 
and all kinds of stuff all over the kitchen floor. I cannot get to the stove or to the refrigerator right now. Thanks to organizations like COP, Pure Justice, Greater St. Matthews, they provided me with water and food. Now, I want to know, what are you all going to do to prepare us for the next disaster? And trust me, there will be another disaster. Hurricane season is right around the corner. I also want to know what happened to the maintenance dollars that was supposed to secure the grid by which this should never have happened to us human beings. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Stacy Jones with SRJ Realty. Go ahead, please. Um, good afternoon. My name is Stacy Jones, and my company is SRJ Realty LLC. I live in Precinct 3. I'm a landlord and own 15 units. My units are located in Precincts 1, 3, and 4. I support the Small Landlord Emergency Repair Program outlined in Agenda Item 196. Winter Yuri. Winter Storm Uri has adversely affected my business with respect to emergency pipe repairs and flooding in several units. When the tenants began calling saying they had no water, I immediately began lining plumbers up to help restore this vital service. All plumbing repairs were completed prior to any insurance check disbursement to get the tenants back to some sense of normalcy. Even with this swift movement, I sustained damages to flooring, sheetrock, insulation, appliances, and cabinets. The Small Landlord Emergency Repair Program could potentially help me recover from the damaging effects of Winter Storm Uri sustained in four of my 15 units. While I did immediately contact insurance to begin the claims process, and they were swift in their scheduling of adjusters, the amount provided has fallen short of covering the damages sustained in the units. On February 22nd, the insurance adjuster came to my first unit and reported damages of 31,124. Insurance paid 10000 leaving a shortfall of 21000 On March 6th, the adjuster came to my second unit and cited damages of roughly $6,200. Insurance paid 3100 leaving a shortfall of 3100 On March 11th, the insurance adjuster came to my third unit and cited damages of 11000 Insurance paid 8000 leaving a shortfall of 3000 My fourth property sustained a broken pipe underneath the home, of which I paid five fifty out of pocket. So the total out-of-pocket for my small business as a result of Winter Storm URI stands at 27000 Any financial assistance that can be provided by CSD would greatly help me recover from the horrible after effects of Winter Storm URI. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Green Evolution, LLC. Yes, good afternoon. Um, sorry Please to hear state about the your name. dog loss. Yes, Ali, good. Ali Khan. Thank you, sir. Go ahead. Hello? Yes, sir. Go yeah, ahead, so please. Yes, Ali Khan mm -hmm. with Green Evolution LLC. I actually only have one uh, unit in Precinct 7. Um, I do support this um, emergency for um, this, this, this allocation of dollars hopefully to be um, addressed to people like myself. Um, what I've actually learned is uh, that, you know, we can never be fully insured for every single small little thing or big little or big thing, um, earthquakes, tornadoes, whatever it is, whatever seasons it is. But um, what I do support, obviously, if there are federal allocated dollars or local allocated dollars for these types of emergencies, um, I, I sustain one of those massive pipe breaks in my only only unit in Precinct 7, and um, the damages are probably between fifteen dollars to $20,000. I never had insurance for this, um, and so when I went through the SBA, um, the FEMA, whatever that um, outlet is, they would kind of put me in circles and, 
and give me what's you know a, a, a business loan as a crutch. And I've always looked at this as um, something that's not necessarily a crutch, but to further in debt um, the business uh, with a high interest rate. I really don't have too many options other than trying to you know collect my nickels and dimes, and um, and that was my issue. So I'm still going through the the pains of finding you know regular contractors that aren't going to um, squeeze me and et cetera, et cetera. But you know, this is like I said, this is my only unit that I have, and um, it's it would be great to address you know and financially help those people with um, smaller smaller businesses like myself versus people with you know many many units et cetera. And um, you know, I just hope it goes to the right place, prioritized to the right folks, and um, that's the quintessential thing that I think that um, should come out of this. So be safe, everyone. Thank you. Randy Ramdoss with Ramdoss Enterprise LLC. Go ahead, please. Yes, hi. Good afternoon. Hello. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Randy Ramdoss. Uh, my company is Ramdoss Enterprise LLC. I live in Precinct 3. I'm a landlord, own 22 units, and they're both located in Precinct 1 and 2. I lend support to the Small Business Small Landlord Emergency Repair Program outlined in Agenda Item 196. Winterstorm Uri caused damage to the apartment and property and disruption for safe and quality living for our tenants. They were out of power for about four days and then disruption in running water. Normally our concern in Houston is the summer and heat, so each of our units are equipped with central AC and heat. However, with no power, there was no heat. And as a result, severe cold resulting in freezing pipes and extensive damage to the units. We were able to temporarily fix the leaks and restore running water to give our tenants a decent environment for their well-being. There was no insurance coverage for the water damage from the pipe burst. They stated if the water damage caused by the roof, then they would cover it. Also, I was denied FEMA assistance and in the process through SBA uh, for a loan. I was denied already, so I'm not holding any hopes to the SBA. The weather has provided some insights as well into making the property a bit more resilient, and the Small Landlord Emergency Repair Program funding will help fund permanent repairs and added resiliency. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your generosity, especially with the Small Business Resiliency Program L-I-S-T and S-B-E-R-P. Thank you for all you do to help small business because when you do help small business, you're also actually helping the folks that sometimes their voices are not being heard. Thanks for all you do and I appreciate you. Angelina Hudson, go ahead, please. Uh, yes. Uh, hello, my name is Angelina Hudson, and I live in Precinct 7. I've lived in Precinct 7 all of my life. I am a landlord, and I have uh, one property with two units, and both of these units are located in Precinct 7. I'm really a very small landlord, and I support the Small Landlord Emergency Repair Program outlined in Agenda Item uh, 196. Uh, not just because I had damage on the home. I, I did. We had to replace all of the water lines. Uh, all of the faucets had to be replaced. There was sediment that backed into the house, and the washer had to be replaced, and the dishwasher. I mean, it's just, it's just been an unbelievable amount of damage. The heating unit went out. The, it, it was just a, a, a harrowing um, week of not knowing if um, we were going to have to relocate the tenants because one person who lives in one unit is disabled and the other person that lives in the other side has two small children ages four and five and quite honestly they did have to the children had to leave but the adults uh, stuck it out the issue is it was just so cold that um, all of the pipes broke I mean it's just you know it's a 1939 house and while we've been making a repairs all along, replacing segments of pipes, 
it did not withstand this particular uh, freeze. Now, I'm here today because I'm just after $25,000 of repair. And this is the that is the absolute limit that I can either borrow or beg for or or uh, you know arrange you know I've come to the end of myself and just learned that the wastewater line leading to the main sewer cracked in this extreme weather, and so we have uh you know restricted laundry use and that kind of thing. But this is this is incredible uh, amount of damage on a single property. And, and I, I was listening to those who um, talked before me, and it's, it, you know, we, no one's getting rich on this. We, you know, we um, pay a note and we pay taxes. Really, it's, it's almost passed through. The pandemic was enough trouble with, you know, the, the tenants not always being able to secure the, their rent and, and trying to go through the rental assistance programs and so forth. But this, Really, if if we're not able to get this sewer thing uh, repaired, and I don't see where it's coming from, uh, then then these people have to be put out. Um, the, the, it won't be healthy enough for them to stay, and so it's a tragedy. And it was certainly related to um, issues beyond beyond what we were able to do. So, thank you. Just thank you for listening, and this program would help small landlords like myself. Thank you. Capiche Chitalia with Chitalia Investments, LLC. Go ahead, please. Yes. Hello. My name is Palpish Chitalia. I'm a small-time landlord. I have a few properties I manage, uh, which are rented out. And this uh, winter storm has damaged quite a bit of my property. A few of my properties have very much damaged because of the pipe bursting, water leak, and because of the water leak, uh, plumbing expenses, uh, the wall uh, water expenses, and a couple of my houses, they are so much damage. I had, for one house, I had more than $20,000. In one house, just 20000 right now is estimated. I had to remove the, all the carpet or house, the, the wall are all wet. Uh, pipes are busted, plumbing, they had to, I already uh, spent about $1,200 uh, for plumbing for that house and 3500 for plumbing for other house. That's just a plumbing damage. I have to repair all the walls and all that. So I appreciate uh, this program and I appreciate any help uh, given on that. I have been listening to other things. I have the same heating unit went out. I had to let the tenants, I cannot ask a tenant to stay, they have to go out of the house and uh, give the arrangement for them so that they can stay or pay them something so that they can cook something, have some food. So we uh, we did all those things because it's not a healthy environment for tenant to leave. And that's what I did. But at the same time, like for us, there are properties which are HOA, they are townhomes. HOA is charging me. Okay, I have to keep on paying the bill, but I'm not getting a rent from the tenant because they are not able to leave in the house anymore because there's so much damage of that. So again, once again, this program is very helpful and it does help us a lot for like a small uh, a small business owner. Uh, this helps so that we can also contribute to the uh, system. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Stephen Dow with LISC Houston. Go ahead, please. Good afternoon, Judge Hidalgo and Commissioners. My name is Stephen Dow, and I am the Executive Director of LISC Houston office. Uh, I will begin by first um, thanking you all for your sponsorship of the Task Force on Rental Housing Stability, which LISC was honored to really help try to play a role in coordinating. And in the course of that task force work, as many of you know, uh, we really brought together a diverse set of stakeholders, including tenant and tenant advocacy organizations, as well as landlord and uh, landlord representatives. And it's really related to the outgrowth of that work that I want to speak to uh, in support of item 196 on the agenda regarding the relief requested for Storm Uri. In the course of doing our work, I think we owe an enormous amount of gratitude 
to the commissioner's court for the extraordinary amount of assistance that you all provided in rental assistance, direct rental, direct assistance, and to small businesses. And I think that one of the things that this work ex- demonstrated was the connection and relationship between the well-being of tenants and the well-being of landlords. In this particular case, I want to really highlight what one of the things that we identified in the task force work, which was the unique role that small landlords play. And by small landlords, uh, for purposes of this conversation, I'll talk about landlords who own fewer than 30 units. And what our own work showed, as well as work that's been done around the country, is that a disproportionate amount of the rental housing in vulnerable neighborhoods and which is affordable to lower-income renters is, in fact, owned and managed by smaller landlords. And really, in many ways, they have suffered the dual problem of the reduction in rent collection associated with the hard times that many of their tenants have experienced, as well as now increased costs. And so I think that as we are looking at one of the things that they tend to see that the the properties that they own tend to be a significant share of their wealth, and in fact, much of the wealth that's held in lower wealth parts of the community. That same landlord group, however, is very fragmented and not politically active. Uh, nearly to the extent that other groups are. And what I want to suggest is that the hardship associated with the COVID rent collections um, has fallen particularly hard on them, and then combined with the unanticipated expenses of URI um, is really something that calls out for the attention of commissioners' court. Uh, while the detailed study has not been I need done... To stop. Thank you. Elaine Morales with LISC. Go ahead, please. Uh, Good afternoon, Judge Galdo and to all commissioners. My name is Elaine Morales, and I'm a community development officer at Lease Houston, working with the Go Neighborhoods Program, which represents 13 neighborhoods locally. I also supported the work of the COVID-19 Housing Stability Task Force, and I'm a resident of Harris County Prison 2. I'm calling in support of the item 196 of the agenda, which lays out a winter storm URI recovery plan proposal. We support Harris County investment in an emergency home repair program that leverages the private funds from Houston Harris County Relief Fund to work on critical repairs and the stabilization of households that experience damages during the winter storm. Based on recent estimated calculations, beyond 12,900 homeowner households will have unmet home repair needs. Many of these households have deferred maintenance or experienced previous damage from hurricanes, storms, and floods. Investing in home repair, rehabilitation, and preservation of existing units supports long-term resilience and the preservation of affordable housing units in our region. We also would like to highlight the current gap in assistance for both renters and landlords after disasters and request your attention to this matter and a significant funding will be required to meet current needs. This could be achieved through landlord home repair programs, as listed in the proposal, but also with renters rehousing assistance for households struggling with inhabitable conditions post-disaster. We appreciate also the efforts to support FEMA assistance navigation and to increase access to emergency assistance for multilingual, vulnerable, and low-income residents included in this proposal. Navigating disaster assistance, along with eligibility requirements, is one of the biggest barriers for disaster relief and the road to recovery. This proposal starts to address these issues, but additional funding for these efforts should be considered. We recommend these efforts and are implemented in collaboration with existing initiatives, such as the Alliance Helpline and the Connective Home Repair Application, so that FEMA and privately funded home repair applications are completed at the same time and the recovery process can be streamlined for residents in need. Thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of this proposal. Bye. Winter Bush, go ahead, please. Uh, 
Hello, my name is Winter Bush, and I live in Precinct 2. I'm a landlord, and I own 10 units. My units are located in Precinct 2 and 4. I support the Landlord Emergency Repair Program outlined in Agenda Item 196. The winter storm has affected over half of my units, and all of them require some sort of major repair related to frozen plumbing, frozen pipes, and pipe repair. In addition, there's um, sewage issues related to the pipes not being fixed. Um, that is the end of what I need to share today. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Judge, I'm not sure that we have the next person available yet. Um, bear with me one second. We're ready, Judge. Peter Bruton with Houston LISC. Go ahead, please. Good afternoon, Judge and Commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Peter Bruton, and I work with Houston LISC. You've already heard from my colleagues, Stephen Dow and Elaine Morales. Houston LISC surveyed landlords in December 2020 and March 2021 to gauge the impact of COVID-19 and wintry storm URI on these landlords. We found strong indicators of vulnerability among a population that often lacks the financial reserves and access to capital necessary to weather a once in a generation economic recession and a once in a decade weather after failure. We believe the results demonstrate a need for assistance. In December 2020, we surveyed 267 landlords. 83% reported the new compared to the previous year including nearly 30% reporting revenue declines of 50% or greater. 30% of the respondents reported being behind on payments related to their business. And approximately 50% of respondents reported that at least one tenant had received assistance from the Houston or Harris County Rental Assistance Program. In March 2021, we reached back out and heard back from 33 landlords. Key findings from this survey include the unweighted average repair the cost was $11,400. 67% of respondents held property insurance for all of their units. However, 52% of the respondents, half of the respondents, reported that their property insurance did not cover any of the units that were damaged as a result of Winter Storm URI. A large majority of the deductible payments for damaged units covered by insurance was less than $3,000 per unit and nearly half of the respondents reported paying the deductible payments from their personal finances, and 29% stated that they could not afford the deductible payments. In conclusion, the landlords surveyed by Houston LISC were experiencing significant financial stress in December 2020, and that was compounded by Winter Storm URI and the related infrastructure failures. The quality of their units, which are likely to be occupied by low and moderate income households, is likely to decline due to damage from storm and deferred maintenance, decreasing quality of life. Uh, we support uh, item 196 and the Small Landlord Emergency Repair Fund. Thank you. Thank you. Andrea Guten with HILSC, no, go ahead, please. Um, hi, my name is Andrea Guten. I'm the legal director for the Houston Immigration Legal Services Collaborative. Um, we run a crime victims working group made up of um, over 10 immigrant legal services providers. Um, and we gave participation and were sought for our input um, for this memo and for the proposed policy. Um, um, however, that doesn't mean that like the whole entire policy has our stamp of approval. Um, we really appreciate being brought into the process and we do need continual feedback um, as 
um, victims advocates, as immigration experts, as immigrant survivor voices. They need to continue to be centered. Um, so I just wanted to kind of like say that before going in that, you know, we really appreciate uh, the policy that's being brought forward today. Um, the sample policy is better than what exists locally, but there's still room for improvement that other jurisdictions outside of Houston and Harris County have adopted. Um, for instance, uh, removing the statute of, limit, statute of limitations on U visa certifications is really important um, for a number of reasons. Uh, Crime victims do not always are not always able to seek um, certifications um, in the immediate months or even years after a crime due to trauma and other reasons. Um, currently, both HPD and the Harris County District Attorneys have a statute of limitations, so the fact that the sample policy removes it is really good. Um, additionally, the presumption of uh, crime victims' helpfulness to police is incredible. This is something that on the national level, a lot of um, uh, agencies advocate for, and no one locally has explicitly um, taken on that presumption of helpfulness for uh, their U visa policies. Uh, we also appreciate a quick turnaround. Um, a lot of our partners, uh, law enforcement agencies like the Crime Victims Unit at the District Attorney's Office are have that quick turnaround, but it's important for all agencies to do so. Um, we also want to uplift the language justice aspect to publish the information to victims in a lot of uh, languages. It's really important. Um, that being said, um, we did kind of have some issue with the policies um, recertification language. Um, we feel that it could be stronger um, for um, uh, oftentimes because certifications um, expire after six months, there are a number of circumstances, including USCIS error, attorney error, crime victim error, um, that might lead to needing a recertification. And, um, there are a few arguments um, for, for why you wouldn't be able to recertify in those cases, and yet it's often policy to do it only on a case-by-case -case basis, and it could be friendlier. Um, is that my time out? Yes. Thank you so much. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Finally, the, crime, the, the, the criminal history issue. I'll just flag that. I believe other folks have spoken to that, but, but that's the other issue with it. Thank you very much. Annalise Bustillo, go ahead, please. Good afternoon, judges, commissioners, and thank you for having me. My name is Annalise Bustillo, and I serve as the director of the Women and Gender Resource Center at the University of Houston. But today, I come to you not as a representative of my work, but as a citizen with a vested interest in gender equity and a staunch supporter of Commissioner Ellison's resolution in recognition of Women's History Month. At the heart of this resolution is the continued fight for women's gender and economic equity. Houston has a rich history of women leaders, from Mayor Anise Parker to Representative Barbara Jordan to Colonel Oveta Colt Pabi to our very own County Judge Luna Evago. These women have defined our city's history, yet they, they, oftentimes they did this without the express support of their city, state, or nation. Founding American ideals such as economic liberty and political equality were not, and in many ways are still not, granted to women, especially women of color. And the concept of self-reliance is steeped in privilege and has played a vital role in a system that has denied women access to employment and economic mobility. Women of color specifically face the largest gap, all of which were only exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. According to a 2020 study by my colleagues at the University of Houston's Institute for Research on Women, Gender, and Sexuality, in Harris County, the median white woman is making 69.4 cents on the dollar to white men. Black women, 47.1 cents, and Hispanic women, 33.5 cents. In other words, a Latin like me, a Latina like me, makes roughly one third of what my white male peers make. One third. And all of these statistics are frighteningly low compared to national averages. To make matters worse, COVID-19 has, has been the most detrimental to women, specifically women of color. Before the pandemic, 28 million women in this country we're already working in jobs paying less than $11 per hour. According to the Brookings Institute, 54% of black women and 64% of Latinas work in these low wage jobs. And because black and Latin women are more likely to be shift workers, they were hit hardest. 
The U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics reported that in May, Latinas were at 20.1% unemployment and Black women were at 16.6%. The two groups hit worse by the recession. Additionally, the closure of childcare facilities left many mothers strapped with no options for their families. In Spring Branch, Gracewood, a residential care program for single moms, saw almost 40% of their mothers become immediately unemployed due to a lack of available childcare or a cut in wages, making childcare no longer financially feasible. I come before the commissioner's court today to call on you to take action. Unless our economic recovery efforts prioritize gender equity, this recession has the capacity to set women back decades. We need long-term strategies to address structural inequities, and we need to address the urgent needs of Houston's women now, especially our Black and Latin women. I encourage you to consider economic relief that prioritizes them in an effort to combat the systems which have marginalized us since our nation's founding. Thank you. Judge. Yes, Mr. Rose. Yep, yep, Ms. Bastillo, thank, thank you, and, and thank you for working with uh, my staff, uh, particularly the women on my staff who drafted this. Uh, I know Commissioner Cagle had some recommendations and I just sent them over to you as a courtesy to see if you had any concerns. I had a little heartburn on one part, but did, did you have any thoughts on the recommended changes from my colleague? Absolutely. I think my, my biggest thought, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, my biggest thought is concerns about ideals of our nation's founding. Um, so much of our nation was founded for predominantly white men, white Christian men, and those systems have continually oppressed women. The idea of economic liberty, the idea of um, political equality. Political equality did not exist for women in this country until less than 100 years ago, and even then that was white women. And the idea of economic liberty definitely did not exist for women because women were not permitted to have jobs until the recent century. So I think when we talk about national ideals that we hold, that in many ways seems to undermine the history of women in this country and the, the changes they have had to make to build a more inclusive government. I think about that course, also in the idea course, of... Yeah, I should point out that idea was for white men who own property, including owning my ancestors, by yeah. the way. So the other language was okay. And I'm just kind of giving you a heads up, uh, Commissioner Cagle. I will object to to that part, I think it, it diminishes, it demeans the entire rationale behind this resolution uh, about Women's History Month. But uh, my staff will work with you, but I will object to that point. Yeah, let me let me know what part it is because I thought we were trying to be encouraging and all this. Of course, I had some assistance in the drafting of this. Uh, most of my Apex employees in Precinct Four are women, including my chief of staff. My uh, first assent. My, my staff will let you know. It was a one phrase about the ideals of the nation, because obviously it didn't, it didn't include my ancestors or women. I don't think ideals, but they'll send it to you. But just give me a heads up. I want I, I sent it to her because she worked with my staff on drafting it. Okay. Thank you. Okay, you're saying the phrase about contributions that women have made to our nation is. No, we'll send it to you. It's going to be a long day. We'll just highlight it and send it to you. Thank you. Harvey Brashear with HCDVCC. Go ahead, please. Thank you and good afternoon. Um, again, I'm Barbie Brashear. I'm the Executive Director of the Harris County Domestic Violence Coordinating Council. I'm, my sincerest thanks go to you all, Judge Hazago, Commissioners Ellis Garcia, Cagle, and Ramsey. I'm here today to support the Harris County application for funding from the Office of Violence Against Women. This application supports a collaborative approach to exploring expansion of the Harris County domestic violence high-risk team. Unfortunately, Harris County continues to lead the state in the number of domestic violence homicides as compared to all other counties in the state. This thoughtful and methodical approach to addressing the highest risk cases for homicides can prevent domestic violence deaths. It will seek to triage and prioritize the most lethal cases within every system to improve victim safety and offender accountability. The size of our county, the complexity of our systems, and the volume of domestic violence cases presents many challenges. However, we know there's a strong foundation to support project success. This application is a beautiful example of collaborative work. I wanna thank the Justice Administration Department for leading our efforts. 
along with the Harris County District Attorney's Office for meeting with our team at HCDVCC for the numerous hours of work that it took to write and complete this grant application and for the commitment to work to make the required change to save lives. We're hopeful to be funded and very proud of the work that we've done together. Many of you are familiar with the saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Working to prioritize the highest risk cases will first and foremost save lives. It can also save resources in the long run as one domestic violence homicide can cost a community upwards of $17 million. Thank you all for your support to address this critical need. We can all agree that one domestic violence death in our community is one too many. And your leadership and support of the high risk team model can propel the county to leading the state in prevention of domestic violence deaths rather than continuing to lead the state in the number of deaths. Thank you all so much. Darla Jones, go ahead, please. Hi, uh, my name is Darla Jones, and I'm speaking as to item 358 on the agenda. Thank you for having us, uh, having me, allowing me to speak. I'm a volunteer deputy voter registrar and have been for three cycles now, so that's three two-year terms. I've registered hundreds of people at parks, places of worship, high schools, and festivals. Um, but we have a five-day window for turning in the forms, and that's a five-day window, not a business day, five business days. So it's very important that VDVRs have a number of places that they can go to to turn in their forms with Houston traffic uh, being what it is. Uh, for example, I might register at Westside High School out far west, but if I had to come downtown to turn all, the, all those uh, forms in, it would really be difficult at the end of the school day, right in the middle of traffic. Um, so I would encourage uh, any effort to have multiple locations for VDVRs to turn in their forms. Thank you very much. Thank you. Kristen Williams with Move Texas, go ahead, please. Hi, uh, my name is Kristen Williams, and I'm the Houston Regional Coordinator for Move Texas, a nonprofit organization that registered over 50,000 voters across Texas last year. I've been a volunteer deputy voter registrar since early 2019 and have had extensive experience as a VDVR over that time. Being a VDVR is truly a labor of love that folks carry out across our communities, as it is quite a meticulous process due to its strict rules and procedures. After a voter completes a paper voter registration application and gives it back to the VDVR, they must then hand deliver it within five days to a county drop-off location in order to be processed. From personal experience, I will tell you that even when I was able to use the various Harris County tax offices as drop-off centers, it can still be inconvenient. Over the past two years, I registered voters across all parts of the city and afterwards, if possible, I would try to submit the voter registration forms the same day in order to proactively ensure compliance with the five-day deadline. Depending on where I had to uh, register voters that day, I sometimes had to drive 45 minutes or more in traffic to reach a location where I still have to go into the office and hope for a short wait time when submitting the forms for processing. I routinely frequented five different Harris County tax offices to complete this process. That's why one of my concerns for VDVRs right now is our lack of options for submitting applications. Currently, we only have two uh, locations available to submit these forms. One of them is the downtown Preston Street office where the volunteer registrar must first pay for parking, and the other is in East Spring Branch, which I'm sure is convenient for some, but not for others. It's not hard to imagine the difficulties a VDVR would have if they're from Baytown or Atascocita, for example. With the challenges that COVID-19 presents as far as registering voters in person, and the fact that there are only these two locations now available, VDVRs are facing an uphill battle. They're really superheroes in their communities committed to meeting folks where they're at and helping them to get registered to vote. And I believe we need to work quickly to provide them with, at a minimum, the same opportunities they had uh, before to comply with these procedures. I see you've already approved a plan for the annexes and also that the county attorney has approved the sharing of tax office space, verifying that it does not violate any part of the election code provided that each office's data and records remain separate. It seems that sharing tax office space is a smart, suitable, and simple solution for the elections administrators need to have annexes equitably located throughout the county, not to mention it seems like an incredibly cost-effective uh, solution for taxpayers. With this information, 
I humbly request you to move forward without delay with the office space being shared between the tax offices and the elections administrator. Thank you, uh, Judge Hidalgo and County Commissioners for allowing me to speak today. Thank you. Teresa Allen, go ahead, please. Hello, my name is Teresa Allen, and I've been a deputy voter registrar for approximately 10 years. Um, I have set a goal recently, I guess in the last six years, to register at least 500 people a year. I primarily go to uh, college campuses, uh, high schools, and um, I have also uh, set up occasions where I recruit other deputy voter registrars so we can process people quickly. Um, Usually, I, I live in Spring, and I used to take my forms to the Cypress Hood Court Annex. Of course, several years ago, that was flooded, so I've not been able to take them there. So I have most recently, in the last couple of years, taken them to the Humble Court Annex, which is 14 miles from my home. Um, I have also dropped some down at uh, um, down, the downtown office, although there are parking issues there. Um, I also register voters in Montgomery County, so occasionally I have to drive approximately 25 miles to Conroe to drop them off. Um, if, you know, I have five days to turn them in, so I could conceivably, if I turn in my forms and then I'm in a situation maybe at the library and I register another voter, I could conceivably have to make the trip. Oh, bye. I could have to uh, go the next week. So conceivably, I could have to go turn them off, turn them, uh, turn the forms in about 60 times in a year. Um, I want to say that it's disappointing to me that Montgomery County only has one place, for example, to turn them in. And I've always thought very highly of Harris County being able to have to give me a choice of places to turn them in. I think it's wonderful that our new elections office is working with the tax offices to turn them in. Um, it's been actually, actually when I go to, to the tax office to turn them in, I frequently find people in line outside and I can pass out forms so more people can re get registered to vote because people just don't know where to do it. And I, I will register people in a barber's office or a hair salon or a nail salon or wherever necessary. Um, I, am, I thank you very, very much for being concerned about the, the safety of the process. Um, and I think it would be helpful if I don't have to drive so very far. Um, um, I am concerned with the increasing uh, percentage. I would like to, to know what counties are more, most effective in registering more people. And I have a feeling that because there were so many places to turn them in that Harris County was doing better than other counties. counties. So thank you very much uh, for listening to my concerns. And I hope that you will pass and it on is, and, is up. and, and assist. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Bye-bye. Carisha Rogers with Texas Rising. Go ahead, please. Hi there. Uh, my name is Carisha Rogers. I'm with Texas Rising. We are uh, actually committed, uh, committed to getting young people out to vote. I am also in favor of the agenda item 358 because we do manage a couple of universities across the city. Um, and having extra locations to drop off BDVR will be most appreciated because we'll be able to get to the certain locations faster instead of having to, you know, battle downtown traffic and just general Houston traffic. So, um, Thanks to all the other people from before me that I kind of already kind of gave more logistics about it. I just in favor of this item and encourage you guys to kind of vote in favor so we can have more locations to do drop off polls. Thank you. Rebecca Shukla, go ahead, please. Yes, my name is Rebecca Shukla. I'm, I've been a volunteer deputy voter registrar for the past four years. I've worked with many different voter registration volunteer organizations and a lot of people know me. And for this reason, a lot of other voter registrars have uh, reached out to me when they have questions. And recently, several have called me with their concerns about the 
you know, that there are only two locations to drop things off at. They aren't convenient and, you know, and and so I keep trying to find out what's going on and I was very, very happy to hear that there are plans to open up more annex locations soon. And it's it just when you look at the situation in a, in a county with a population that's greater than 25 states um, and covers over 1,700 square miles, it's just not sufficient to have only two locations. It puts a burden on volunteers who are already doing a public service uh, just out of the goodness of their heart to sometimes drive an hour each direction and pay up to $10 each way on toll roads. And that's just assuming that they have a reliable car to do that since we don't have the kind of uh, public transportation infrastructure that they can just hop on a bus or a train to do that, especially when we have this five-day um, limitation for getting things in and the people who do this volunteer work take that take their work seriously and won't to follow the laws. Um, we want to make it possible for people to vote and we want to make it possible for well-meaning volunteers to actually uh, carry out the service in, in the ways that are legally prescribed. Um, thank you. Thank you. Dani Danielle Bartz with Harris County Department of Education. Go ahead, please. Hi, I'm Danielle Bartz with the Harris County Department of Education, and I'm calling on behalf of Superintendent James Colbert today. We're really excited about your supplemental COVID-19 item where you're considering putting more response and recovery dollars toward a County Connections Youth Summer Programs Initiative in partnership with us. And we're serving kids across Harris County all day, every day, and so we wanted to call in and make sure that you heard our enthusiasm and excitement for this type of partnership. We want to be a resource and as you all may already know, we are doing early childhood in the east side of Harris County with Head Start programs. We are doing after school programs through our Case for Kids division that you have on your agenda today. You may know of some of those programs like Case Debate and EcoBot um, robotics and STEM programming. We are special ed therapists in the classrooms of the independent school districts across Harris County. We run four special school campuses in Harris County for very specialized needs and we're workforce development. So we just appreciate that you're thinking of us, that you know we're a resource and we're very excited to be part of extending um, summer and after school enrichment programming for the students that need it the most in Harris County. So that's what we wanted to make sure you knew. Judge, we appreciate you. Judge Hidalgo, if I might. Uh, 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 thank you for coming on the line. Uh, I, I know, I know it, it's, it's a long day and uh, I did want to ask, uh, uh, make the point, it is important if we're going to do it to pass it now because summer school is about to begin. I, I know I have one coming out of a uh, uh, college and one coming out of high school and it's just devastating what we think my fear so many kids uh, are going to take a long time to catch up uh, because it was just not quite the same doing it virtually as it would have been being in the classroom and that's why I think so many of these kids that are vulnerable and we tried to do this with an equity lens because we don't have enough to pay for it for everyone and I know you all have a program with the city of Houston during the school year is that correct? But this will be a uh, we us to do it during the summer. Yes, absolutely. We do we do the city connections program. We've been doing it for years, and um, and this will operate logistically very similarly. And we do summer, summer camps summer. all the time. The this is what we year. do. Yeah, and the other one is during That's the school right. year. This will be during the summer. This is prepared to kick off in the summer. That's correct. And if we don't if we don't do it now. In order to go through your RFP process, it would be pretty much dead uh, if we don't if we don't pass our, it now. So. <laughs> yes, sir. Our business office is already yelling about the RFP timeline. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Judge. Maybe Commissioner Allison will jump in here. Is yes, sir. County, is this a countywide process or is this just something for precinct one? No, it's countywide. Yes, sir. It's countywide. And, 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 and Commissioner Cagle, I, I did 
I asked the superintendent to call you. He may not have caught you, but I told him he might want to make some calls. Okay. But call him. I know he probably couldn't stay on his line since 10 this morning, but you might give him a buzz. He's one of the few folks I know that'll quote Clausewitz. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Lisa Caruthers with Harris County Department of Education. Go ahead, please. Hi, I'm Dr. Lisa Thompson Carruthers. I'm the director of Harris County Department of Education's After School Division K-10. I'm also excited to talk about how we can serve as a resource for the court as they consider to support summer programming and camps as part of your pandemic funding efforts and relations. So I'm 368. Uh, summer 2021 program is, is important for kids, working families, and youth serving organizations. It is a countywide initiative that we are proposing to collaborate on that would go and divide funding across all four precincts. This summer, more than ever before, our youth need a chance of high quality engagement through enrichment activities, whether virtual or in person. Working families need safe places for in person services following the CDC guidelines or engaging virtual programs complete with material kits curriculum delivered directly to their homes. In the summer of 2020, we surveyed our programs after the beginning of the pandemic. Over 80 Harris County summer providers reported that they had to close 66 sites, 77% drop in students served from the previous year, and they had to furlough over 1,701 staff. With that said, there were still several celebrations. I have one illustrative quote from the survey I would like to share. Families reported that having a reliable day camp helped them experience a peace of mind while they went to work. One parent reported it saved the mental well-being of those parents. It taught him that this is everyone's fight. The staff stepped up and have inspired a whole generation of kids to step up. I love our camp. As the pandemic conditions evolve, we plan and are prepared to facilitate a process that includes the RFP, which includes which would be marketed through each of the commissioner's offices, as well as through our circulation of over 350 after-school program providers in the community. We will collect and process all applications, including the review of paperwork to determine organizations' eligibility, eligibility, provide a list of all applicant organizations to each commissioner, and monitoring of awarded programs, processing payments, and collection of final reports. It is viable. Uh, we will score based on viability of the history of the organization, ability to provide safe and learning environments, quality of services, ability to meet individual precinct needs, and we will award and notify in May and so that the services term could be June through August. Judge, just quickly, if yes. I might. I know it's an ambitious schedule, um, but I thought it was important. The, the city has been doing it for a number of years. A city, the city of Houston, in uh, the city limits, uh, but only during the school year. And uh, my, my staff that worked on this, uh, this car in particular, uh, uh, thought that it was important, Eric Lee Carter, important to try and, and do this because of the pandemic during the summer. You feel all right about this timeline? It's a lot to do. I know your template is there because you've done it uh, uh, during the school year, but you feel you can meet the deadline if we get this done, if we decide today? Yes, yes, we are prepared to post publicly and run an RFP process that follows federal guidelines, as well as notify and get programs running for the summer. All right, thank you. Thank you. I'm trying to call back one of the uh, the last speaker on this item. Um, she accidentally dropped off. Um, meanwhile, Judge, we do have another speaker that was uh, called uh, that call, we called earlier. She called us back. Her name is Elizabeth Watkins with CLK Solutions LLC regarding item number 196. Go ahead, please, Ms. Watkins. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Elizabeth Watkins. I live in Precinct 1. I am a landlord. I own four units in Precinct 1. Um, I do support the Small Landlord Emergency Repair Program outlined in Agenda Item 196. The reason I support this program is because as a small landlord, during 
Storm Uri. Um, all three of my units sustained pipe damage, um, water damage. Um, one unit had the tile floor to buckle, and none of the repairs were significant enough to file an insurance claim and have to pay a deductible. However, they were significant enough that I had to either move out one tenant um, into a hotel while repairs were being made and or make the repairs with my own personal funds, um, which was um, in addition to not receiving, you know, rent because if they couldn't live in a unit, they didn't want to pay the rent. Um, so, you know, not having um, plumbers in the area, you know, we had to pay ex extra plumbing fees to, if you could find a plumber and then they couldn't find the um, materials needed to make the repairs, which prolonged it. So um, a lot of us saw, you know, the, the ads from uh, different municipalities or, or programs saying, you know, we could get help from FEMA, but when you went on the FEMA site to apply for funds, the site either wasn't working, crashed, or it simply was to apply for a loan. And, you know, we don't really have the time to apply for a loan and wait and turn in all this paperwork when the house has to be repaired. So that was kind of a dead end. Um, the programs that offered to pay rent um, to help um, the tenants, those have not been paying out. One of the sites was um, recently redone. You had to start all over again. And, you know, one of the things that they ask for in order for you to get um, any assistance is that you issue the tenant a um, eviction notice. Well, we don't want to issue an eviction notice when they're technically not behind in their rent. Um, they're just using their rent money to pay for food or pay for water or pay for other things. So um, I really think it would be helpful with a lot of these programs when, you know, it's for uh, rental assistance that you take out the information about the, the eviction notice. Because if a landlord has to go through the trouble of writing up an eviction notice, hiring an attorney, filing the eviction notice, many tenants will just leave once they get that notice. So it's, it's kind of a um, catch-22. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Emily Smart with Social Motion Inc. Go ahead, please. Good afternoon. My name is Emily Smart and I'm with Social Motion Skills. We are a small nonprofit in the Spring Branch area and we are the very grateful recipients of the Case for Kids City Connections funding for this school year. We offer social emotional and behavioral strategies for the one in 54 children diagnosed with autism. We serve about 200 individuals every week at our center in Commissioner Precinct 3 and at a satellite location in Precinct 1. Our after school classes are year round. We offer all services on a sliding scale. And in 2020, we provided almost $100,000 in tuition assistance. The funding that we received from the Harris County City Connections made that possible. We currently have um, around a $1 million budget operating um, on an annual basis. Support for Case for Kids has been instrumental in allowing us to offer these programs for one of our community's most vulnerable populations. This support is impacting students like Santiago, who has selective mutism and extreme social anxiety. He spread it with us last year. In our year of social skills classes with us, parents learned that he no longer qualifies for special education support services because, because he no longer needs them. He's connecting with his peers and thriving. We are so grateful for the support of this wonderful program, and we appreciate everything that the program has made possible for us. Thank you. Emily, this is Tom Ramsey, Precinct 3. Thank you for what you do. Thank you, sir. We appreciate it. Judge, those were all the speakers on the regular items. Uh, these are non-agenda related. Thank you. Judge, would you make a note that when we discuss um, this item here um, on the uh, 
the summer programs that we incorporate in that discussion, the discussion about making our, li our libraries available for our kids during the summer too? 368, okay, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Judge. Yes, Commissioner Ellis. Judge, are we going to the agenda now? No, we're going to hear from a dozen or so speakers at a non-agenda. Okay. All right. Derek, Derek, oh yes, I'm sorry. sorry. I'll wait. I'll wait until we hear from these speakers, and then I have. Sorry about that, Derek Whitset with Poll Experience. Go ahead, please. Mr. Whitset, we'll try him back, Judge. Okay. Aaron Potier, go ahead, please. Thank you. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I wanna start off, Commissioner Ellis, you'd probably recognize my name because you helped me out uh, sometime during the summer when I had an issue with the Confederate flag uh, thing at Energy Park. Uh, so I wanna thank you for that. We got that taken care of. Um, what I'd like to talk today about is uh, dealing with Ravenel Country Club, uh, the acquisition of it by the flood district um, this falls into Commissioner Cagle's uh, jurisdiction. Um, I have had conversations with uh, Landon in your office. Um, I've also uh, had uh, in-depth discussions with Will Sherman, uh, the liaison with Precinct 4, and with Dennis Johnson in the Parks Department. And what I'd like to see is um, if there's a possibility, if the tennis courts can be opened up over at the uh, country club site. Right now, everything is closed off. Um, I initially wanted to come to you to see if we could add tennis courts to Meyer Park, since there's an overabundance of soccer fields there. Um, and then I noticed that uh, the flood district had taken over Ravenel Country Club now, and there's 12 tennis courts there. And since it's publicly owned now, I think it's a great idea, especially since we've all been locked up uh, for the last year uh, to get some outdoor, um, you know, activities done. Um, you know, these are existing tennis courts that don't have to have money spent on them uh, to be built. Um, and I think it's a, it's a great idea uh, for us to try and see if we can get the flood district to keep the tennis court uh, in their future plans. Um, from speaking with um, Mr. Sherman and Mr. Johnson, it looks like it's going to be a while before we see anything done with that land over there. And rather than see it um, just sit there unused, um, I think it's a great idea maybe to have them to remove the barriers so that we can park there and allow us to use the, um, the tennis facilities there. Um, doesn't cost anything. You can have a constable sit his car there just like he does at Meyer Park and at Champions Park. Um, and you just have someone empty the trash every now and then. But um, I'd like to see if it's something that we can do. I've also reached out to the, the Houston Tennis Association to see if there's maybe something that they can do to help with sponsorship as well. Um, so uh, I'd like to see what your ideas are uh, on this. Judge, um, globally, we're not allowed uh, to discuss these matters, sir, because they are not a, an agenda item. However, um, I can let you know that we are in discussion with the flood control district and of the local PUD there to try to come up with solutions to where we could take maximum advantage of all that's there. And that's all I okay. think I can say yeah. here in court. Okay. I just like to, I mean, we're, we're coming into spring and summer now, and uh, I, I just think that it would be a great opportunity to make use of the, of the court facilities uh, that are there uh, until uh, they figure out exactly what they're going to do with that land now. I've, I've had discussions with them, and I know that they say that there's some, you know, there's a little disagreement of what they're doing with the designs and everything else. But until then, I think, you know, we can at least open it up so that they can be used. Uh, right now, and uh, you know, I, I I think it's a waste to just have have it sitting there. Uh, I'm sure the people with the four million dollar houses across the street would love to be able to see that at least it's being used and maintained in the interim. Thank you. So, as Commissioner mentioned, because there isn't an agenda item on this, 
legally we can't respond, but I'm sure Commissioner and, and the, the team will have, we'll make sure somebody follows up with you directly, but thank you. Yes, I think Landon said he was going to keep up with me on future uh, uh, information on this particular uh, subject. Great. Well, thank you. Take care. Thank you. Derek Whitset with Poll Experience. Go ahead, please. Hi. I was just calling because I was um, wrongfully terminated from an employer, and I just wanted – well – wrongfully terminated but then also um, I didn't receive my last paycheck so I was just trying to figure out how I can go about it legally sir we will have someone follow up with you and let me just uh, we'll we'll have someone follow up with you Dell Ingram, advocate for CUNY Homes resident. Go ahead, please. Good evening, Judge and Commissioner. Thank you all. And I want to say thank you to uh, the Commissioner Rodney Ellis' office for diligently working on the Baker Ripley, Houston Housing Authority, and Ala Orion, I'm a little horse, for the, the check situation that has been addressed to some degree. They're still working on it. But I wanted to come back and say thank you because a lot of times we come before you, but you don't know the result. But right, uh, Commissioner Ellis, your office has diligently worked on that, and I'm asking them to continue to work on it because some of the residents are saying they're going to get eviction notices on April the 1st. But I really want to thank all of you all and anyone that have public housing or Section 8 in their precinct. Please check into that and make sure that the property management are receiving those checks from Baker Ripley. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Felipe Sanchez, go ahead, please. Yes, hello, Judge and Commissioners. My name is Felipe Sanchez. I'm a resident of Precinct 5, and I'm a member of StopTechs.I-45. Just stopping by to say thank you so much for taking action against the I-45 expansion and filing the lawsuit against TechStop. It means a lot to me to know that there are people in your positions looking out for the interests of me and my friends. Thank you to Judge Hidalgo, Commissioner Garcia, and Commissioner Ellis for your words at the press conference, at our events, and at the HJCTPC meetings over the last few years. We know it isn't a small thing to sue TechStop. We will continue to fight for our city, and we are so grateful we can count on you to do the same. Thank you. Thank you. Judge, those were all the speakers that we could reach. Judge. You're on, you're on yeah, mute. Commissioner Ellis. Thank you. It's, it, it's, it's been a very uh, informative day. And um, what I'd like to do is ask the legal department uh, if they would come back with some recommendation on how we could both give the public a chance to give us the input like they did today. Uh, but also uh, have more time to focus on our agenda as well. And my suggestion, much to my chagrin, by the way, would be that they look at whether or not it would make sense for us to do what the city does uh, if the support is here on Commissioner's Court. And that is to come in, say, Monday uh, afternoon, they have public testimony, and then have Tuesday to go through the agenda. Uh, you know, it's, it, it, it's all enlightening and helpful. But well, we got about, we do have a consent agenda and thank you judge and the budget office for streamlining this so we could do it. But of course we've had our department heads, most of them probably waiting somewhere all day, multitasking, but waiting all day. we got 30 items that we spend five minutes on each. Uh, we, we, we'll be here another three hours. So I just like them to look at it. And look, and judge, I think I might've mentioned to you when I was on council, I had this bright idea of lengthening the term and shortening the week. Uh, so they used to meet two days a week. In the old days, they met one day a week. So I, I was, they didn't, they didn't lengthen the term. Later on, they went to a four-year term, but they did shorten the week. And then when I left, they went back to the two days. But I think looking at this, I don't, I don't know if some of it is because there's so excitement, so much excitement about what we do, or because we're all at home and we do it virtually. It may change when we're back in person. 
But even with that, if 100 people, 89 people, 100, if 100 people wanted to speak, I'd hate for them to have to wait uh, all day and then we get to the agenda. So I just want to ask the legal to come back with some recommendations. I think this this is broad enough. I'm not crossing the line, I am on Mr. Ayer, by just asking you all to come back with something. Uh, no, Commissioner, you're not. We're, we're, we're still we're just in the conclusions of speakers, so it's it's relevant to, to discussing that. And, and, and judge and members, if there's no support for it, don't do it. But you know, I'm not too excited about it. We meet twice a month now. <laughs> That's I'm sitting it, here excited. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Each member would decide, but we meet twice a month now. It would mean another uh, two days a month. But I, I don't think now may, maybe it's a function of age, being the elder here, being the oldest one here. Uh, maybe it'll change when I hit uh, 60, or when I hit 67, but uh, I'm, I'm going to, before we take our break, I'm going to ease it in, take a little three-minute power nap. You know, I, I never lost my cool. I lost my cool one time, 26 years in the Senate, because I didn't have the pillow to rest a little bit, but I hate for somebody to lose their cool because they're just exhausted. Thank you. So, so, so Jay, we'll look into that. We have uh, a break coming up soon. So before we go on the break, why don't we talk about what exactly is on the consent agenda? First, I wanted to go over the executive session items to, to make sure and confirm if there was an executive session item that we needed to, to take out of the, con of the consent agenda. Um, that is item uh, 360 as approval of the appointment of Lacey Wolf to the Harris County Sports Authority. Do folks need to discuss that? No, no. ma'am, you wanna move on it now? I'll second it. I'll make the, mo the motion. I'm just going to take it out of the discussion agenda, Commissioner, so okay. we can just vote it on it as part of the consent agenda, just so I don't lose track over here. 361 is the appointment of Ms. Kristen Lee to the tax increment reinvestment zone by precinct two. Judge, just for the record, I don't know who this person is. And <laughs> no, no, she, she's my staff. I really appreciate her uh, willingness to support and no need to go to uh, executive session on her. Okay. 362, Commissioner Precinct 3, appointment of Benito Guerrier, Guerrier to the Harris County Hispanic Cultural Heritage Commission. We can just put that on consent. That's fine. Benito's right guy. there. He's a good guy there, uh, he is. Commissioner. He is. Wonderful. 363, uh, county attorney discussion on the status of Brown versus City of Houston. We do need to take that to executive session. And 364, uh, county attorney requests a discussion on court policies regarding the eligibility of individuals to serve on hiring committees. My understanding is we have to discuss that on op in open court. That's correct, Judge. Um. Other here are here's the list of items that uh, have minor changes, and that's for. Um, let me make sure I have this here. That is for Maricela. So, item thirty on page five, authorization to acquire six tracks. That is a request that we take no action on that item, item 30. Item 131 on page 15, there's a correction. It should say, authorize the landscape architect to perform landscape architecture. It should not authorize the engineer to perform landscape architecture. Item 179 on page 22, that item is a no action item on the parking spaces. Item 192 on page 23, it's an amendment to an agreement for CDBG funds, no action. Item 304, purchasing an agreement with 12 vendors for universal services technology. The department recommends no action be taken on one of the 12 vendor agreements for this item. No action on the Indigo Beam agreement. On um, which agreement is that? Indigo Beam agreement on page 36, item 304 is one of the 12 vendors. Item 330 on page 39 is another purchasing item. 
No action is requested on that one. That's it. So those those items, did you get those, Maricela? Yes, I did, Judge. Okay. And so then going back, yes? I moved up items that are uh, on, shall we call it the consent agenda? So let me pull out the other items that we have to pull that, that are not part of the consent agenda. That These are the items, the following items have been requested to be pulled for discussion. So these items would not be on the consent agenda. Page two, item four, uh, eight hours of paid time off for employees. Do folks need do folks need that a discussion on that? I don't. Uh, time off to get give a vaccination. I don't either. Okay, so we'll keep that on the consent agenda. Um, page five, excuse me, item five on page two. Contact tracing funding. That would be pulled for discussion. Page. Nine, page three, item nine, that is the juror pay. That would be pulled for discussion. Page three, item 11, the broad discussion of the COVID pandemic. That would be pulled for discussion. Your Honor? Yes. Not to back you up, but yeah. I thought that uh, somebody wanted to discuss item six on page two. Does someone the... want to discuss item six, the approval of an MOU with the CDC? And that's a continuation of uh, federal support we've been receiving. This actually shows the CJO is the one that requested that discussion. Yeah, I don't need it, which is why I skipped it. Okay. My staff there you must go. have flagged it. Thank you. Uh, page three, item 12, the equity framework for the allocation of the American Rescue Plan funds. That will be pulled. Page three, item 14, discussion and possible action on the libraries. Page three, item 15, discussion and possible action on metro, the metro transfer. Page 15, item 133, the discussion on the flood bond program. Page 16, item 134. Do folks need to discuss this engineering and program management services for flood control? Yes, 134, you you're asking, Judge? Yes. Yes, I do have questions on it. Item 136 on page 16. <clears throat> that is uh, authorization of the Army Corps license. Just a brief comment, Judge, would like to. Okay. Item 138, an interlocal agreement on page 16 for a public recreational area. Page 132, excuse me, page 18, item 152 is uh, acquiring four simple tracks for a public project. Commissioner Ramsey? Yeah, just a quick comment. I would like to discuss it. Page 21, item 172 is the property, uh, delinquent property tax collections. Page 21, item 173, do we need to discuss the payments of annual membership dues for various organizations? Yes. Page 21, item 174, approval of budget appropriation transfers for the flood control district. Commissioner Cable. I have just a couple quick questions on that. That's not going to be long. Okay. Page 21, 175. Item 175 is the legislative platform. Page 23, item 187, an interlocal agreement with the city of Seabrook to place a grass chromatograph. Page 23, item 195, down payment assistance program guidebook. Page 23, 
Item 196, the winter storm recovery plan. Item 198 on page 24. A judge, an agreement uh, with Head Start, yes. If you can also put 197, I just have uh, one talk about it supported, but just 197. 197, okay, so we're adding 197, Marcel. Page 26, item 224, is the, the policies related to the U visa. Page 41, item 345, the resolution highlighting Women's History Month and economic equity. Page 41, item 350, initiatives in terms of the risk of flooding. Page 41, item 353, two bills in front of the legislature. Page 42, item 358, Placement and usage of annex S for the auctions administrator. Um, and then we've already gone over the executive session items. The next one would be page 43, item 367, request for approval of process accountability mechanisms and priorities for the, uh, for the new federal funding. Page 43, item 368, request for approval of a fund for county youth summer programs. Judge, I think my yes. question on that was answered, which was I wanted to make sure that this was going to be made countywide and available to all the precincts. I think the testimony and the comments of Commissioner Ellis have confirmed that. Am I correct, Commissioner? Yes, sir. With That's that correct. being the understanding, then um, we don't need to go back on that anymore. Can we take that one off of, uh, into the consent agenda, item 368? Yeah. Or we put it on the consent agenda? Yes, put it onto yes. the consent agenda. Yeah. Yes. Marcel, I'm, I'm waiting for you to stop me if I'm losing you here. Uh, no, I just wanted to go back on two more, but I was going to let you finish and then ask you those two for those two items. Okay, so... I'm going to need a motion for all the items one through so move. 368, including Judge, the there were, cup. Yeah, there I'm were, sorry. There were a couple that uh, 349 and 351. Yes, yeah, those are the ones that I was going to ask you about. 349, what, did, what are those? What's 349? 349 uh, relates to uh, another look at this rollover policy. Okay. And 351 has to do with uh, job fair, just want to communicate it. with court. Got it, got it. Apologies for that, Commissioner Ramsey. Okay, so we'll put those on the on the discussion agenda, 349 and 351, and yet those are under Commissioner Ramsey. I remember those, uh, Commissioner Ramsey's agenda. So, so the motion is for items 1 through six, 368 with the changes that were made, uh, excluding items already voted on and discussion items just listed. So moved. Second. Uh, judge, can I get clarification on item number 16? Is that a no action? And second. That one is, a, is an item for discussion. Item for discussion, thank you. Yes. And then, and then just in case she didn't get it, that was an item that Commissioner Garcia, as I recall, it was one that that he added. I believe right. he added 196. That's correct. Not number 16. But uh, well, let me let me just make sure I'm looking at the right thing. That was the um, the IRT the IRT process. Uh, was that item? I, I assumed it was for discussion, but if, if folks don't need to discuss it, we don't need to. It was sort of a um, Judge, that was a transfer report, and we got the report, so I think we're fine. Okay, in that case, we can put it in, into the consent agenda. So then it will have an action on this item. Yes, it will be simply to it's a it's a transmittal, so it's a not no action, not applicable. No action. Okay. Thank yeah. you so much, Judge. Okay. So are you good for us to vote? 
Yes, ma'am. All right, Commissioner Garcia made a motion and Commissioner Gar uh, Ellis made a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. I think this is working, we'll keep trying. Um, but why don't we take a break for 15 minutes? We'll come back at five and, and keep going down this list. Thank you. Thank you. Hi folks, it's 5.01. And Commissioner Scord is back in session. Let's start going down our discussion items. The first one is item five, the contact tracing item under the, the COVID agenda. And I'll share with you also, we'd asked public health to go back and look at the contact tracing program and figure out whether we needed to continue approving the same kind of increases that 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 they've been or or amounts that they'd been receiving in the past. Uh, as it turns out, and this is happening throughout the country, we spoke with um, with Ms. Robinson, who's going to join us as public health director, about this too, and she she shared the same perspective is when contact tracers call a uh, potential contact or, or someone who's been uh, diagnosed with COVID-19, on average, these, these patients, so to speak, provide less than one, fewer than one contacts to the contact tracers. That means that many folks don't even identify a single contact for whatever reason. Because of the sheer number of cases, we still have well over 500 and have been at that in that place for many, many months. The ability of contact tracing to really make a difference has been diminished. So the city of Houston is moving in the direction of, of downsizing to about 69 contact tracing staff. Option three is the one uh, public health recommends here, which would put us about 80 contact tracing staff. And that would focus on congregate settings. So no longer trying to sort of chase an, an unattainable goal, goal outside of the congregate settings, uh, schools, nursing homes, homeless shelters, et cetera. So the recommendation from public health and uh, the folks we've spoken with is downsizing to option three in the spirit of being uh, nimble, smart with our dollars and learning what other jurisdictions are doing. It's disappointing. I wish that we'd been able to control this, contain this really. We, we see it contained places like New Zealand, for example, which you know, incidentally is about the size of Harris County that you know they have a case and they jump on it and contain it. But when you have hundreds, we've tried everything and um, I just want to make sure we're, we're good stewards of the dollars. Uh, Commissioner Cagle, Commissioner Ellis, and then Commissioner Garcia. Judge, um, I'm listening to you. You're talking about being nimble and smart. I have a, a, a simple question, maybe a good question, maybe a bad question, but why not have an option four, which is that we take what grant funds are available, but not put any of our additional funding into this at this time, based on the troubles that you mentioned. I mean, why, why not go with an option four? And the option four would be if there are funds for contact tracing that are grant funds, then we continue to spend them. Let me check in. Perhaps Josh is on the line or someone with public health. My concern would be we would have to downsize for this. And so I don't know if there's permanency to that. I'm personally okay continuing the program. Our charge is though, it's a very, very robust program, hundreds of staff. Uh, I think currently we have about 305 people and I wanna make sure that we're looking at, okay, are we really getting the bang for our buck? Um, but is there someone, is um, Josh on the line? By any chance? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Unmuted, Josh. Thank you. Uh, yes, Judge. Um, Commissioner Cagle, to answer your question, we went back and forth and asking ourselves a question, what would, even though the effectiveness when we have such high numbers uh, diminishes, where are we effective? And in talking with our local health authorities, they're also on the line, Lucinda, um, it would be under Gwen's line. Um, in talking with them, this would be the bare minimum 
in order to uh, maintain the effectiveness that we actually have. We'll still be going down to 80 staff, about a 75% decrease for this. We do have some grant funds, and we're not exactly sure what's going to come out of the federal funding um, out of the $1.9 trillion for these activities in the future. Um, those grant funds that we have earmarked there do not cover the minimum requirement we would need in order to continue with the things that are effective. Also, being able to have that capability there when our numbers do get low enough for us to do like New Zealand surge in when we have such low numbers. That way we have trained staff on hand ready to go. Um, Commissioner Ellis. Judge, I, I was gonna say that uh, you've been uh, knee deep in this, closer to it than any of the rest of us. I, I feel comfortable with going with option three and based on the input that, that I got from talking to uh, the folks at the health department and uh, Ms. Barbara Robinson as well. Oh, but I did want to ask if there is a need, if something changes, either judge for you or Josh and folks at health, how hard would it be to ramp back up? Uh, and, and that is, that is a real concern. And I had it as well. Commissioner Ellis is, and, and you, we have to think about too, you know, we are a source of employment for these people. So if we're downsizing, those are jobs these folks would no longer have, and it would be hard to recruit them back. So that's why I wanted to bring this to you guys, because honestly, I'm, I was like, eh, I had heartburn, but the city's doing the same thing, you know? And so another thing is go to option two, see what happens. If, if suddenly we get a huge, you know, downsize in the number of cases, um, to where we can have a surgical intervention, then we'll have those folks spending. Realistically, I don't see the program becoming more efficient, not because of lack of, not for lack of trying. I mean, we've been working with uh, Baylor on this. We've been in touch with every jurisdiction under the sun. And the answer we keep getting that we're all coming to is the extent of the virus in this country doesn't lend itself to a real robust contact tracing operation. And, and Judge, with your science of medical experts you're talking to, which of the three options or possibly fourth option, you can always get grant money, it's a separate issue. But of the three we have in, in front of us, what are they saying? Are they uh, in unison on going with They seem three? to be in unison on option three. Okay. I'm the one that's a little bit, uh, you know, because of it's a big shift. But if we're looking at the data, sort of the hard facts, I think that it, option three is what comes out that's where Houston is headed to. That's what Barbie says. That's what public health says. I have not, heard, I, I've been the only one saying, wait guys, this is a big jump. Uh, so to be completely transparent with you all, all the advice we've gotten has been to go to option three. And uh, this money is not reimbursable. Is that correct? It is, it is reimbursable. That's part of, you know, Josh, why don't, or, or yeah. Dave, if you guys, maybe there's some texture there. Um, sure, and I'll let I'll let Dave hit on on some of those aspects. But one of the one of the things we're not sure of yet is how much will come out of the 1.9 trillion dollars to be reimbursable for these activities. Um, uh, I'll let Dave talk about where it stands right now. But Commissioner Ellis, on your other point, one of the big points why going down to a, a lower level and worrying about increasing when it when it gets worse. One of the things that understand is that they're in talking to epidemiologists is that this virus has asymptomatic individuals that pass along the virus. And when you have that contact tracing becomes um, very, very difficult because um, those folks potentially aren't getting tested. But Dave, do you wanna talk about um, uh, any of the dollars that would be reimbursable? Unless something changed very recently, Judge, my, my understanding is that contact tracing is not FEMA reimbursable. There could be potential funding available out of the new stimulus bill but it's not part of the existing FEMA authority. So uh, sitting here today, I would, I would, in making your decision, I would advise you to assume that 100 cents on the dollar is, is county money. And, and, even, and even if it is reimbursable, it does not mean there's not some other need that we would have for the, the money. So I mean, I'm, I'm interested, in, obviously, whichever way the court wants to go, but I'm, I'm comfortable with three and assess some strong sentiment to go uh, in another direction. Commissioner Garcia. Thank you, Judge. Um, and I'll, I'll uh, also support uh, 
uh, your uh, your direction, Judge. But I did want to throw this out in that uh, I had a discussion with uh, the health department about this. The, the question of uh, during doing the contact tracing amongst those who have died. Um, I, 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 I don't know whether there is, um, it's important from an impact uh, understanding uh, standpoint to really understand just how many people have died. The, those that we know that have died is still about, I think it's about a third, maybe closer to half of the mortality rate that we've seen change from 2019 to 2020. Um, I just don't know whether, I, I just, uh, I, I, you know, I, I just don't know whether there is, that helps us with a better approach to public health, uh, whether a, a better approach to dealing with the pandemic. Uh, but since it is difficult to try to catch those who aren't going to pick up a phone call, aren't going to return calls, aren't going to, do uh, we don't have an email for and whatever, then maybe there is uh, value from a from a just a uh, academic standpoint as to really working with Yemi's office to know how many of those folks uh, that have that we've lost uh, should be moved over to the COVID death count and um, and understanding that better. But I don't know whether that's um, whether that's something that we can maybe talk to FEMA about. Uh, but I just want to throw that out there. I'll, I'll support your wishes, but I did want to say that something in, in the back of my head or in my gut is gnawing at me that we should probably think about having a more accurate understanding as to how many lives we lost uh, during this pandemic. Commissioner Ramsey, do you have any thoughts? A quick question, quick, quick comment. I think option three looks reasonable and your focus on congregate settings. What well, one thing we know about this virus, it is deadly when it gets into a congregate setting. So our focus on that to try to stay ahead of it. Uh, we still don't know a lot. We still don't know what we don't know sometimes. And even though we're feeling a little better, uh, we got to keep it out of the congregate settings and anything we can do to focus their efforts in that regard, I think would be beneficial. And uh, Commissioner Garcia, I wanted to let you know, I asked the team to run those numbers in the event that we wanted to really focus on mortality. And it was about additional 10 staff to do that um, and an additional $65,000. Yeah, Commissioner thank, Ellis. Thank you, Josh. Commissioner Cagle, I, I'm going to uh, make a run at this one, maybe a hybrid of what you suggested. I would move option three and uh, with the caveat that if we can get grant funding to do it, use the grant funding instead of our money. I don't know if that gives you any comfort or not, but that would be the motion I, that I suggest. Yeah, the other thing that um, public health mentioned is a phase down period over the next three months. So I, I think that's wise. That way, if, if they begin seeing if people, you know, if we're not able to sort of reassign the staff, that's part of what I'm asking them is, are there jobs we can reassign them to? If they're seeing that we are failing at meeting needs that we do have, then we can hit pause on this. So, so I would just say commission with, you know, commissioner, the motion with commissioner Ellis's um, edit that is, is, is commissioner El uh, Cagle had said as well. And then I would also add that, that they do it over a three month period so we can reevaluate as the weeks go by and hit pause if need be. And, and judge, I was leaving with the motion. If, they, if something changes in two weeks, I would hope they bring it back. And yeah, we'll undo yeah. It. yeah. Do you feel comfortable with that, Josh? Uh, yes, Judge, um, if that would be the case in order to do that appropriately with court, I mean, and obviously Jay could weigh in here, I would I would request that we get approval for option two as we move into option three by a certain date um, into the future so that we have the funding to pay for April and then we have a reduced funding 
throughout um, the month of, we'll come back on the May with our May ask for more reduced. So for the month of April, option two and to reduce down to option three. So it's a suggestion I change it to say option two instead of three. So option two, as we move into option three by June 30th. Okay. Second. Uh, Judge, can you please repeat the motion, please? Yes, Commissioner Cable. I, I think I prefer, I personally, this is the old judge coming out, prefer saying that we are voting for option three. Yeah. And that we'll transition to option three by utilizing the funding that is in option two until we can make the transition. That way, okay. that's our goal is three. We are transitioning to three without a hard, a hard slam to the left. Okay, so how about this? Motion to approve funding for case investigation and contact tracing operations at the funding level indicated by, at the funding level indicated by option two with the goal to transition to option three by May 30th. Is that, does that make sense? Or you wanna say, at the, uh, contact tracing operations at the funding level indicated by option three by May 30th, but we will transition to option three by currently using the funding proposed by option two. That's another way to say it, Commissioner Cagle. I think maybe that's more what you wanted. I like that better, Judge. And then okay. Commissioner Ellis also had the... Um... And that grant funding grant funding. is necessary. Yeah. And, and that was just an addendum, uh, Jack. I don't know what's added to the motion, but if they can get grant funding, use that. So to approve the funding for case investigation contact tracing operations at the funding level indicated by option at the at the funding level indication indicated by option three um, by June thirtieth, but we will transition to option three by using the funding proposed by option two, and that grant funding be used as necessary. Does that make sense, Josh? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, we we. We're going to be on cycle for our two month requests um, starting May 1st. So when we come back with May 1st, we'll have a reduced amount, even less than that. So it'll come back to court uh, in May to show you how we're going to transition down for the month of May. Okay. So that makes sense, Judge. Just let us know what you guys are observing and, 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 you know, focus on to the extent that you can, that you can read some of these folks can be sort of retooled as we ramp up, say, vaccinations, et cetera, you know, please keep that in mind. Yes, Judge, thank you very much. I'll move that motion as you read it. Okay. Sec second as you read it and he second. I mean, he- Okay, <laughs> sorry, Commissioner <laughs> King. Okay, motion by Commissioner Ellis, second by Commissioner Garcia. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right, thank you all. Thank you, Josh and the team. Um, the next yeah, thanks, one Josh. is, yes, sir. Item nine, the juror pay item. I'm negotiating. Go ahead, Josh. I hard muted him. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. okay. No worries. So this is, uh, you know, incredibly important to use diversity, to have diversity as a priority, to have efficiency as a priority. So I do want to commend um, District, District Clerk Burgess for pursuing this. I think it's, it's crucial. I also think this is such an important issue that it needs to be taken holistically. And so I, I know Commissioner Cagle sent around some comments that make sense to me. Um, my sense would be let's, let's, continue with the e-juror uh, system, which will help, you know, efficiency and will help more folks show up. And let's look more holistically at the issue of what adds diversity, whether that is pay and or some additional uh, interventions. Needless to say, the diversity issue is huge. Equal representation would reduce Black defendants' median sentence length by 
and the probability of receiving a life sentence by 67%. One of the approaches, for example, that folks propose is to oversample. This is a National Bureau of Economic Research. They propose oversampling individuals from zip codes with more racial and economic diversity. Um, so it may be that we do a package of oversampling and increased pay. So that, that was just where my head is at. Judge, part of my, my motion, and I made a reference to it earlier, was that before we do the pay thing, let's look at other jurisdictions that have increased pay to see if it's actually helped anywhere. Um, I know that this is an idea that back when I was serving on the bench that was floated around several times, and it seemed to me that when the research was done back then, that the answers came back that increased juror pay made the judges feel good because the judges could sit there and tell everybody, hey, look how great I am. I'm going to get you paid for today, but did not increase the actual participation. And so um, not that I'm against judges feeling good. It used to be one, and I'd like to feel good. But but let's, as, as you say, Judge, let's put some science on it and actually see whether there are better outcomes, uh, greater participation, where people have tried this idea of more money. Now, what we did know and had made efforts towards, and I don't know where they ended up, is that if you made it easier for people to come, they came. Um, and the federal system had a had a deal which you which our e serve kind of relates to this to where you sign up and you get a phone call when it's your time to come down so that you don't have what we have here where a lot of people show up and only a few get to play and a lot of people get frustrated because they came down here and spent a morning and they couldn't see the benefit of their of their coming down uh, and so that, that federal approach of when you get your phone call, you're told you're going to get a call sometime in this period of time and you come, um, that seems to work really good because people, when they, you know, they, they know that they're going to be doing something that's worthwhile. They're not, they're not wasting their time. Uh, now we did have a fella, uh, who became a congressman who was a judge that every now and then when he couldn't get enough jurors would actually stop the Metro buses and have, have people get off of the Metro buses. You remember that? Mm -hmm. some, of, some of your sheriffs, when you were, uh, uh, some of it was actually before me, but it, I, I remember it well. Um, I think some compromises had to be made and judge. I used to do a lot of rural trials there. They used to have a thing that they called the courthouse rats which are basically the retired people that would sit out on the steps of the courthouse and wait for trials because it'd be good entertainment and a free lunch. And, and let me, let me, and uh, I think Sheriff Garcia will back me up on this. If you give a good lunch to people when they're on jury service, that makes them a lot happier than pretty near anything else that you could do. So a good free lunch, quote unquote, free lunch, uh, parking, and metro bus passes so that they can get on the parking ride or go somewhere else, I think will get you much further from my old experience than um, making a few people feel good by writing them checks uh, as if this was a job. Well, well Commissioner uh, Kago, I'll just say that uh, on Commissioner's court days, my staff is pretty happy because I do feed them and uh, I let them pick their menu, uh, but they still want a paycheck. A good paycheck at that. <laughs> Did folks have additional comments on this? Judge, yeah, I, I, I think we should try something. I mean, yeah, obviously, 20% participation is abysmal. And anything we can do, try it. Uh, uh, if we see it's not working to pay more, try something <laughs> else. Obviously, the people I talk to, uh, when they think of driving downtown for any reason, uh, if there was some place other they could go, uh, they would probably do that at uh, uh, much more higher participation. But I would encourage us to try something. So, Judge, my, my request is, is that we just look at it a little bit more before we vote on something. Um, and to, to launch that exploration of parking, metro passes, 
lunches, e-service, and to do a little science before we, before we vote on the expenditure. Uh, I'm not saying no, because it may be that the science comes back that if we do that, that we'll have greater participation. If that's what the science says, then I'll be all in. But I, uh, it seemed to me like we did that. We looked at this once before years ago, and and the key factors for jury participation were not related to how much they were getting paid. <laughs> Commissioner Ellis, just I didn't, Commissioner Garcia, did you have your hand up? I didn't want to jump ahead of you. Uh, if you don't mind, Commissioner Ellis, sure. um, I I didn't want to look. I I'm. It's good to hear uh, that there is uh, support and unity to we got to address this and as uh, commissioner ramsey said uh, 20 percent is uh is is nothing to be proud of um I, and i and i and i think but at the same time i think our uh sense of fiduciary responsibility is kicking in a bit and so um is there uh thought about maybe taking a hybrid approach and just if uh, Commissioner Ramsey is saying try something, um, any uh, any thoughts, Judge, on uh, maybe just instituting the fifty dollar for the first day, and uh, let's see if that moves the needle uh, for us any, and that way it's it's just um, and and do it while the pandemic continues. We'll just do the first day uh, fifty dollars and see how that works. Already. Uh, jurors do get free metro, so that's not an added cost. But I would just, uh, you know, uh, get thoughts on whether we do the fifty dollars for the first day. I I would suggest that budget and and specifically budget, but Jad as well evaluate what smaller amount would make sense with a promise to bring it back at the next court. I've had conversations about this with several folks. Uh, and, and we have the district clerk on the line, so I want to give her a chance to speak. I think in some ways we're playing a little bit of broken telephone where the, the key stakeholders here has to be Ms. Burgess's team, but also JAD and budget. And, and from my understanding, it's, it's, this isn't a, a joint proposal. So I would urge that the three parties work together and bring back okay, perhaps jumping from, from where we are now to 50, my understanding is the highest that any jurisdiction around the country pays. And again, it's limited funding. So I don't have, I certainly my team hasn't found evidence that the additional pay increases diversity. Uh, it's a good thing, but how much of the, the fifth, that amount should we put into increased pay and how much of the amount should we put into other, other approaches that have been proven to increase juror diversity? So I do want to deal with this once and for all because we have talked about it a lot and as as i think everybody can tell all of us are in agreement that it's an issue that needs to be dealt with my heartburn is simply that we've yet to receive a proposal that comes from the three parties the budget saying hey yeah you can afford this jad saying i've, I've communicated with all the stakeholders and the district clerk who, for whom of course this is the, the bread and butter so that I, I'm saying this is crucial. I'm grateful to Ms. Burgess. I think we're on, on the cusp of something, but I think it just, there needs to be evidence of some additional communication between these three uh, three groups to come back and say, these proposals specifically as what we're gonna do as a pilot to increase diversity, and this is how we're gonna measure it. Judge, can I add a small, tiny tweak to that? Yeah. I loved it. Small, tiny tweak I would add to that is, is don't forget the civil judges too. Right. I'm, I'm assuming that the JAD would 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 uh, co you know, coordinate with the civil judges as well. But but yes, the judges, the ju the judges, so, and the family judges. Yeah. yeah. Um, Miss Burgess, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear I you. I had prepared remarks that I wanted to give to you, but it's a full three minutes, and I want to address a couple of things I've heard. Uh, respectfully, I disagree with Commissioner Cagle. For someone who is working paycheck to paycheck, they can't afford to appear for, appear for jury duty right now. And the only way that they're going to be able to afford to appear is if we adequately compensate them. 
Um, w this is the ideal time to try this because of the reduced numbers that we're calling. We can give it a trial now without it costing as much as it would under normal circumstances. The budget office has reviewed our proposal and agrees with our numbers. Uh, I don't know exactly what you're looking for from uh, JAD, um, but we have discussed this with all the stakeholders. The judges have signed on in support of it. The community civic leaders are saying it's the only way you're going to get the lower socioeconomic people to appear for jury duty. And we have studied this for two years, uh, and now is the time to implement it. And so I am asking you to vote today to implement um, the request for the duration of the pandemic and for the to the end of fiscal year 2022. Uh, it's the it's the right time to do it. People are at being asked to appear in a pandemic. They need to be compensated if they're going to put themselves at risk to show up. And we can track the diversity rate and report back to you. If it's not working, it doesn't have to be renewed after fiscal year 22. Uh, and I think the time is now um, that we need to act and do something. That is, we've got a broad spread community support for this right now. And if we're going to increase the diversity rates, We've got to pay the people that can't afford to come. Is Mr. Barry, is, is your office endorsing this proposal? Hi, Judge. Uh, we, and to Ms. Burgess's comment, uh, first of all, she has, you know, discussed her uh, projections with us, and, you know, we verified that the math was correct. Um, I, um, I am not, con my office is not convinced at this point that this is the most cost-effective way to, uh, solve the problems. And we also think that um, there are a couple moving pieces here in terms of, uh, you know, PFM is doing criminal justice review that will also generate some recommendations on this topic. And we're implementing e-juror at the same time, which would make, you know, doing a true pilot pretty difficult. So, I, I mean, we'd be happy to engage further on this and, you know, see if we could get to something that, you know, we, we would fully stand behind. But where we are now is, like you said, Judge, this is an important topic but uh, we think the proposal could probably uh, probably use some more work. Yes, Commissioner Ellis. So, uh, Mr. Berry, and hold on, Ms. Burgess, too, if you don't mind. I have a couple questions. But, Mr. Berry, when would um, the PFM report as it relates to this come back? Would that be June 1st, end of June, or when did you? That's what I got was June, June or July. June or July. Um, now, and I, I do think that everybody's making valid points. Um, I would, my staff was trying to tell me what the legislature did. Uh, I think in 2-5, I, it was a bill that I had that uh, the folks from Vincent and Elkins were pushing it. Apparently, uh, the founder of that firm had a, a, a case in which there was very little diversity on the jury. And, and they had something to do with us first putting state money in to pay jurors. And I think what the bill did, Ms. Burgess, you might have to help me. In 05, most people come the first day and then they get dismissed. So they convinced me in the bill, maybe because we didn't have the money on the state level. We got it up to $40 a day. The county was paying six. So for the second day, the state puts in 36. Is my memory, is it coming back? Is that what we did in 05? That is Ms. correct. Right. The state kicks in $34 per day and county pays six dollars per day on the second day the first day is the one that is extremely expensive because in order to get a panel of 12 jurors you have to have uh, 65 go for board dire. so you have like six times as many people there on day one as you do subsequent days um, and that's probably why the state doesn't kick in anything on day one um, so between that you've got six times as many people that have to show up as actually serve on a jury and the fact that the state does not subsidize the first day, the $50, that's why we did that lower than the subsequent days. If you so what, serve what, what, one day. Yeah, was it, where I was headed was, I don't know, I don't know why I didn't go ahead and, and try to push for the state supplement beginning the first day. I assume it was a fiscal issue and it was a statewide bill, of course. And uh, so my point is, so much for that bright idea. 
<laughs> maybe if we were doing something on the day that people are asked to come, you have a more diverse pool to choose from. So here's what I want to, I would just suggest that we talk to PFM to see if they could accelerate it a bit. I do think there's some merit to figuring out how you incentivize more people to show up the first day. And I'm just assuming it was a statewide financial challenge because however much money I was told in 05, the state could put into this, I think if I was better off, just start with the second day. Now that was a long time ago. Uh, and I think Ron Kirk of all people was doing it pro bono, lobbying for the firm, Harry, Harry Reesner, who what we all know from Vincent Elkins came to me and I, either he said, Cactus, I can't remember which one was the judge, Vincent or Elkins. Which one was the judge? Judge Elkins. Judge Elkins. So some famous case he had, and then they even had the folks from uh, uh, Jaworski, there's some famous case Leon Jaworski had as well, dealing with uh, diversity issues uh, as well. So the, the big firms got involved in it. And even with all that firepower, was statewide was the best we could get. But Dave, I'd like to try something and not have to wait until June or July. Uh, and so maybe working with your office, Jad, Ms. Burgess's office, we can find something on the interim, even if we don't go to the end of the year. I'm not above trying. I just cannot remember. I'm assuming it was money. But I could see the argument on paying more people the first day. Look, there's statewide things we can't do. Some states require that you get paid leave to serve on a jury. We don't do that in Texas. And I'm, I'm not asking that we pay for it. That would help with diversity. But for people who are on an hourly job, it'll take more than the lunch and free parking to get them to miss that paycheck when they're living paycheck to pay. So I get it. I'm just looking for some middle ground and would like to not wait until the until the end of June or July on this one issue. May so I say, I, I'm going to suggest. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, we should secured the services of January Advisors, a data analytics firm here in Houston, who did, conducted these studies for us and came up with the recommendations based upon what they, the feedback they got in the studies. And the, the number one thing is you got to pay me if I'm going to be there. I can't afford to miss a day. That's what's going to make the difference. And the big factor on the first day and the second day is with the $50 on the first day and $80 on subsequent days, we're estimating our total cost at around about $6 million. And that's four and a half million of the six is for that first day. The subsequent days are the small piece, the not expensive piece of the proposal, even it going up to 80 on those days, it only represents one and a half million of the total cost. I, I, I would favor some kind of a pilot. So judge and members, I'm suggesting maybe something come back in 30 days uh, and try, so it doesn't have to be for the rest of the year because if it doesn't work, you, you, you know pretty quick. I think if more money on the first day doesn't bring in a more diverse pool, uh, we, don't, we don't have to wait a whole year. Uh, so, I, but I, I'm sympathetic to Ms. Burgess, who's been, who has called me and it seems like Ms. Burgess talked to me about it when we were meeting in person. That was a long time ago, I'm assuming. Uh, so <laughs> That's right. I, I knew it's been a priority. No, and the, the challenge with this, go ahead, go ahead. Why we need a second study when we've already engaged the services of January advisors, why do we need to go to someone else and do another study? Well, let me explain my, my with the information that's been, as it's been presented to me, and perhaps we just, don't, we don't have additional backup information, but it says it was 2,000 folks. It doesn't say how they were sampled. Was it a representative sample or was it folks who, for whatever reason, they're, you know, higher income or lower income or whatever it is? And that's the, that's a one study of, of Harris, one survey of Harris County, which is not clear to what extent the results are statistically significant or to what extent the sample is representative. Then there's two fo focus groups, which of course focus groups are, are sort of um, qualitative, right? It's not quantitative, it's just the whoever happened to be in the focus group. How, does, how do those findings compare to what's been found around the country because around the country this question has been asked before and when when the team look, looked into the research it seems that obviously there's a benefit to increased jury pay there is and we should go there 
But where I'm coming from is I want to see that increased diversity. And so how are you connecting what you're asking us to spend our limiting limited funds on with the increased diversity? That's the connection that, that I need to make so that I can so that I can justify putting the funds to that particular intervention as opposed to something else that will that will increase diversity. Sort of what's the what's the perfect mix? I'm I'm for an increase. I just want to make sure that given that you know where we're at, I want to make sure that it's 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 holistic. So but I I also I've been in many conversations about this and I, I don't want to keep delaying it. So I wonder, I think your point, Commissioner Ellis, is a good one by the end of the month is PFM Jad and Ms. Burgess have to work on something by April 30th. And whatever and what Jad and, and budget with the understanding that as a court, if I'm understanding my colleagues correctly, we all want to do something. So if you guys are helping us be good stewards of taxpayer dollars, you guys have to prioritize this and 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 get something thoughtful figured out. Um, and Ms. Burgess, this is with everything, you know, as with the, the Sheriff's Initiative too, we need, I, I personally need budget to fully stand behind it because a lot of folks are asking us a lot of things and I, I have those questions about the research that was done. And I also have questions about where, what is it that you're doing to increase diversity? But I think we're making, you are making strides. I mean, just the e-juror is making strides. And I don't want people to think e-juror is just internet. E-juror, as Ms. Burgess set it up, as you can call. I mean, that's huge. That's efficiency. These are things that, you know, needed to have been done and you're doing them brilliantly. And, and I commit to you, I want to support progress on this issue. I just want to make sure we're looking at it holistically. So, Judge, the yeah, point yeah. that I want to make is that uh, I, I've not gone to look at the data on it, and I don't know if the state collected it, but so I passed a bill in 05 to increase juror diversity. We could go back and look at maybe what I did was give the largest, I think what we, the press release we put out said it was the first pay increase in Brandon 50 or 100 years, 50 years. So that's a big deal. So what I might have done was increase the pay for the first time in 50 years, but didn't increase the diversity. And I wouldn't want us to be in a position where in Harris County, I don't just looking at the state that we may end up having the best paid jurors and still have some of the least diverse juries. So I'm suggesting we, we just uh, refer this to a budget management, a justice administration to convene all of the parties, look around the country not just a Texas thing. And I appreciate the work of January, January advisors. They've done some great work. But I want to see within the constraints of what we can do on this level to make sure we're hitting some diversity targets and not just paying more to jurors. They need more pay. But I want to make sure we do that. And I would feel comfortable in 30 days for, for me to vote for it. I just don't want to. And, and Ms. Burgess, hey, I did it because Ron Kirk called me, Harry Reason called me, and, and they had all of the big names. But the way you do it in Austin, once you pass it, you usually don't go back and do the analytics and say, did it accomplish what one thought? And I, I want to just try to do that on the front end. So I'm, I'm trying to pull what PFM does out of order if they're going to help on this and get this done quicker. So I'm, I'm suggesting in 30 days we bring it back. You'll be back on Judge, the Judge, another, another, another consideration is the 30 days will buy us a bit more time. We've had people locked up for a year. They're just now getting out. They need to get that comfort level to get out. And before we start investing money in trying to get people out of their house to come serve on the jury, some people won't go to this hardware store hardly. Let's let's go serve on the jury. So I don't, I don't think any amount of money is going to get some people out of their houses. So until we can get a little, a bit further along, in terms of people getting out of their homes after COVID. Uh, I think the 30 days, buying 30 days would be a good, a good approach. Commissioner Garcia. Thank you, Judge. Um, I guess uh, to Ms. Uh, Burgess, and to her question about why do we have to get someone else to study us, has January advisors given you, Ms. Burgess, a clear target to hit? Has, have they said that uh, an approach will have an impact? Um, 
Yeah, it, you know, and, and to your point, I mean, if, if January Advisors has given us some clear, uh, a clear target uh, to strive for, then, then I think that's what we ought to do. I think the five of us are trying to figure out how to be uh, most helpful, but most prudent as well. Uh, but has clear, has January Advisors suggested to you the pathway that gets us uh, to move the needle sooner rather than later? The um, at January Advisors, part of their study was done via telephone call and was scientifically uh, sound. Some of it was done online, which is a voluntary participation. The focus groups were one of was Hispanic, one was African American to find out, dig a little deeper into the answers and, and get a little bit more of what they're talking about. They felt like that anything above eighty dollars a day was having diminishing return, but that the the minority groups overwhelmingly were saying, If you pay me more, yes, I will show up. Um, and the other piece that I want to introduce here is that JAD and PFM are both criminal focus, and Commissioner Cagle does have a point. We don't want to forget the civil side, uh, where we have the family, juvenile, and uh, civil courts uh, that aren't a part of what PFM and JAD are tasked with. And, and so, um, so getting us from here to somewhere near 80, I think, is what you're saying. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Then the then your recommendation is getting us from where we're at to closer to 80. Somewhere's in that ballpark is 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 that your recommendation? I, I, we were I, trying I, to find the sweet pot spot where we would get an impact and yet wouldn't break the bank. And again, the first day is where the huge amount of money is expended for two reasons: because you got many more people and the state's not contributing. <clears throat> and that's why we staggered it. If you're serving and you're going to give more than one day of your time, the financial hardship is going to be greater. <coughs> Excuse me. Gotcha. So the structure isn't really, to the judge's point, scientific by any uh, nature. It's, it's, you're just trying to put a, a bit of a hodgepodge together just to um, try to have a have an impact. Well, it is somewhat scientific because we did ask the participants at different levels <clears throat> where it would make a difference for them. Well, in that in that regard, Judge, I I, I do support getting Mr. Barry engaged and and uh, finding what is uh, uh, sustainable and with the resources that we've got. Looking at both the criminal and civil side, um, my my. Uh, urgence is that we get this, whether it takes 30 days uh, or less is uh, would be my my preference because part of the jail population challenge is that and, and I and I don't know what uh, what things are looking like today with with the condition of the CJC uh, and um, and then just the overall impact of of the pandemic on on the sheriff's operations, but when I was there, we were transporting a thousand inmates a day to the courts, only to have uh, less than half of them actually see a judge and have some degree of, of justice administered. And part of that was because they couldn't assemble a jury right away. So I I want to just put a sense of urgency on this, and whether it's thirty days or less. Let's get a plan together, Mr. Barry. Let's help uh, Ms. Burgess. Uh, but you you know where uh, what our financial health is and uh, what we can afford. And let's 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 get something. Let's get a strong recommendation to this body so that we can uh, uh, take a vote on it. Yes. Commissioner Cagle had a comment, and then Commissioner Ellis. Very very brief one, Judge, and that was that. Um, you know, I didn't really have a problem with the study put on by January advisors to where they asked people, if we paid you more money, would you like it? And they remarkably all said yes. Um, where my point was, is that the only two locations that they cited was New York and 
uh, Washington. As much as we love King County, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that there are places that have tried this and we could see what their results were. And I would suggest that we get Katie Short on this. I don't think we've put in a request to her from Precinct 4 for a while. And maybe we could jump her on to just do that research of places where this has been tried and what was their result. Uh, did they get greater turnout and or uh, uh, diversity of participation by doing this model? Um, I don't have a problem with the surveying component of it, but that didn't, that didn't answer the, uh, the statistical question of where this has been tried, was it successful? So perhaps we could, we could suggest that the budget, the analyst office, Jad, work with the district clerk's office on bringing back a proposal at the April 27th court. And I would suggest, just because Dave mentioned there's something ongoing with PFM, to the extent that you guys need to bring that up to the top of their priority list, Dave, you know, feel free to bring a, an item on that to the next quarter or, or whatever it is that you all need. Um, but I'll just say I've had enough conversations about this. It's so, so important to me anyway that you guys all get together and endorse this. I, I did uh, message Jim Bethke, who who clarified he does and will um, he does and will correspond with the civil judges to make sure that they're included, not just the criminal side and family, et cetera, juvenile. Um, so, Judge, yeah. I'm gonna make a motion to do just that, but I, I would like to raise two more quick points. One is that there may be an effort we could try on the state level. Uh, Brandon on my staff tells me the way we got the bill passed was we'll give the judges a pay raise and we can make the argument if you give how do you get the judges a pay raise and don't give the jurors a pay raise that's how we got that bill passed in 2005 so we ought to look for a vehicle to raise that issue because since then the judges have gotten a pay raise I'm assuming jurors did not and secondly I, it would be good to look at whatever else was in the January advisors report and if we've done those things that would increase juror diversity but I make a motion we send this to uh, the budget office to convene those stakeholders, all of them that were mentioned today, Katie Short Shop, Justice Administration, and anybody else. But we just got to have some point person on it, if that's all right with you, Mr. Berry, and bring something back to us in 30 days, whether we have, uh, find three votes or five votes to do it or not. If uh, Commissioner Ellis, if you would uh, support 30 days or less. Yes. yes. Uh, no uh, problem. I'll second it. No more than 30 days. There you go. Happy to do that. And I do think in 30 days, from our view, there may be some answers we just don't have in that time period. And I think my goal would be to cl be clear about what we know for sure and what, what is, a, is a hunch that we'll need to keep reviewing. But um, the direction I'm hearing is don't wait till June until we've seen how EGER is working and PFM's done come back with something sooner and be clear about what we know and what, you know, really is, um, I don't want to call it a leap of faith, but, a you know, a hypothesis that it'll lead to better results. So, so happy to do that. And uh, my team's been working with Ms. Burgess some, and we'll pick that up and, and, um, and drive it forward. Hey, Mr. So Berry, I'm going to echo what start. Commissioner, uh, I'm going to echo what Commissioner Garcia said there about the or less. The or less becomes important because I think all of us would like to see what you've come up with before commissioner's court. So we don't have to be trying to read it while people are talking. And, and that's where that or less kind of kicks in in high gear. And I know that you'll make sure we get that. So our staffs have enough time to kind of unpack it and look at it before we have to come in and discuss it in court. Um, so yeah, let me, so, let me put belt and suspenders on, on commissioner Garcia's or less. To reframe the motion, the budget management convene the analyst office, Chad, the district clerk and relevant stakeholders and bring back a proposal within 30 days or or less. As pertains to jurors. So moved. That has my second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Burgess and we'll, we'll get this done. Thank you for your consideration.
Okay, continuing to go down our discussion agenda is the, the broad COVID item, item 11 on the pandemic. And look, I just wanted to bring up something kind of looking around the corner a little bit um, as to a challenge that, that may be coming next. Um, the good news side of things is that all of our efforts, the media campaign, going door to door, going to nursing homes, going to the priority 10 and 25 zip codes, everything we've been doing, free transportation to our sites, multiple sites that rotate has meant that, the, as you guys know, the vaccinations administered by Harris County Public Health more closely resemble the demographic breakdown of the county than those administered by everybody else. And the everybody else includes our vaccines. So they it, it's actually inflated for them to their benefit. We still have a ways to go when it comes to Hispanic, but for ev every other demographic group, we are right, right at or better than the population percentage. And with the Hispanic population, we are orders of magnitude better than, than every other provider or all, all providers taken together. Our vaccine wait list currently has about 350,000 people on it. And we've gone through, or over the past few months since we created it a couple months ago, over three quarters of a million people have registered. We've distributed well over 300,000 vaccines, transferred about 40,000 to FQHCs, and folks continue to register. We do have a concern, I have a concern, that at one point we're gonna reach a situation where there is more supply than demand. And I wanted to bring that up to my colleagues to make sure that, that we're all thinking about this. Our media campaign is full force. We have TV ads, radio ads, mailers, uh, the door knocking, of course, um, in, in specifically those hardest hit communities, multiple languages. We can always increase the, the commitment to that media campaign. We're doing all we can but there is a lot of vaccine hesitancy still. And the truth of the matter is only about 12% of the population has been fully vaccinated. And, and there's a lot of hesitancy, especially in the minority communities. And I think that that's gonna become a problem as the, as the weeks go by. Yeah, Commissioner Ramsey and then Commissioner Ellis. Yes, Judge, and we've talked about this before. I think as we get to this point where we have vaccines, uh, I think, again, using our community centers, using those relationships that we have within the precincts, all four precincts, getting people encouraged, because there, there are people that aren't willing to go through. It may be the process of going online. That could be a problem. You and I talked about a particular group that called me. Uh, they were Korean. Uh, in my precinct, and they were struggling not only with language, transportation, and other issues. So I think all of those are still out there. Uh, I, I probably know as many people that have driven to Brenham and Conroe and Victoria to get vaccines uh, because they just, whatever reason, uh, didn't wait and work their way through the system or whatever. So I think we in the precincts can help with that vaccine uh, distribution, if we begin to engage some, some of the networks that we already have. So I think we're ready, well, and able, I know in precinct three, to do just that. So all we need is a, someone to fire the gun. We've been communicating to go online and go through that. But as you say, there's just a hesitancy within some neighborhoods, within some groups to even do that. Commissioner Ellis. Judge, I, I think that at the county, we, we've done a great job, and your, your team has led the way uh, on that. I was at an event uh, that Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee had at a, a high school yesterday, and people were wrapped all around the school. I am glad that the uh, equity index, so to speak, for what we did on the county level was better than anyone else's in the region. It could be better, but it was better than anyone else's. And our partners at the city are getting there. Uh, and we're encouraging others to to uh, to step up, but I I do think it's good that we have 
I think, avoided some of the political criticism you see in other places in, in the country. Uh, so we, we didn't have a system where, you know, you had a lot of folks giving them out and then criticism about were certain people getting them because they knew someone. And I'm glad that we avoided that because we want people to have confidence in what we're doing. But uh, I think all hands on deck and we're doing it. Uh, you know, my staff members out there uh, working with the other precinct staff members, if we don't care where somebody is from uh, and we make all our centers available. So I think we're getting there. And I think that uh, we just ought to keep plowing ahead. Commissioner Garcia. Well, Judge, you, you know where where my sentiment is at. Uh, we need to get into the community. Uh, we need to do it uh, sooner uh, rather than later. And uh, I'm I'm glad that we're in fact we had an incredibly successful vaccination effort uh, today. So, uh, you know, doing all that we can is is critical, and it's also uh, critical that we make sure that our all of our efforts don't just stand there, but with this, with this particular uh, item, uh, I want to make sure that the equity piece that uh, Commissioner Ellis talked about, that we're really paying attention to that and making sure that we're um, that we're doing all that we can. And so I'll look to uh, Dwight uh, to see if there's anything that we're missing to make sure that we're fully utilizing um, equity and and access. Um, I was contacted apparently, I think on the, I'm not sure if it was on the debris removal, uh, whether we had a, a national firm, not a local firm, uh, you know, helping us with that. And so I just want to make sure that we're not missing any opportunities there. Commissioner, are you referring to just the debris contractor countywide when it comes to? Yeah, the, the countywide. Yes, sir. We're looking at all avenues. We're still working closely with um, Pamela's office with the Economic Opportunity Group to ensure for all of our procurements, including local vendors, to procure and bid on those projects. So uh, that's an ongoing uh, process, and we're hoping to have her office up and running soon to allow us to kind of turn over some of our um, processes that would fall into her office uh, with her. But we continue to reach out to the local um, organizations throughout the county to make sure they're getting opportunities to bid and work on these contracts. Good deal. Dwight, good to see you back, buddy. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Yeah, and what I'm hearing, and I think it's it's very it's a very valuable point, is so long as the the supply, excuse me, the demand is outstripping supply, it's very important and very delicate to have this sort of fairness aspect. And we've all been striving toward that as we move and hopefully we won't get there. But if I had to bet, I would bet that we will get to a place where there is more supply than demand. I think that's when we shift. I think that's when we shift. And so I'm going to uh, talk to the team about, you know, figuring out what that would look like. I think it's a good point, a good idea. And you all know we have a, an exciting pilot going on this week. So uh, we'll see where that goes. Um, but but uh, but yeah, that that's helpful. Thank you. So that was the broad COVID item. Do folks have anything to add? Yes, do I? Uh, ju uh, Judge, I had a request by the sheriff. You know, we've been doing the COVID free calls for inmates since it started, and um, they requested that we continue to extend it. But I wanted to ask court if there's an option to extend it for more than one month with the ability that once, um, you know, they're able to do visitation, we can come back to court and say we'll stop that. But they, you know, each month we come back and ask you for these requests. But uh, the sheriff has re respectfully requested that we extend it for at least one month, maybe two months until we can determine when their visitation can begin again in their office. So I wanted to present that to court today. You need a motion on it? I move that we do it. Can you spell out the motion, Dwight, please? Sure. It's just a request by Commissioner's Court to authorize their inmates to have five free phone calls per week through the month of April and May until um, the visitations are available to be uh, presented in person. So move. So are you good? Uh, yes, ma'am. All right. Is there a second? Second, Commissioner Garcia. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Dwight. Thank you.
The next item is precinct one, item 12, an equity framework for Harris County's allocation of the American Rescue Plan funds. Thank you, Judge and members. I'm very uh, pleased that the Biden uh, Harris administration and Congress did approve a, a record amount of money for the American Rescue uh, Plan. Um, I, I wish that it had been able to get bipartisan support, but I'm, I, I appreciate the members who, who did vote for it and even the ones who didn't. Uh, but our local congressional uh, leaders, uh, the dean, I guess, would be Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee and uh, Congressman Al Green and uh, Congresswoman Sylvie Garcia and Congressman Lizzie Fletcher in particular, because they had to take a lot of heat to go and get that done. But part of what they were doing with the largest recovery package probably since uh, FDR uh, did something similar during the height of the Great Depression or, or something on par with uh, LBJ's war on poverty in many ways. I think it's important that we have some equity standards. I know that was the intent. I know Mr. Berry has briefed me on things we can and cannot do. Some of the rules will still be spelled out. I think that uh, Mr. Sperling is the person who will have the role that President Biden had when he was vice president uh, to go and look and make sure that the money is being spent appropriately. But I know equity was a big part of the discussion and a part of the thought on the part of President Biden when he pushed for such a large package. So this is a simple motion, uh, basically making the case that we need an equity framework to help advance strategically targeted solutions to help our region recover better than it was before the pandemic. We know certain groups that historically uh, have been left behind in all ethnic and racial groups. Uh, Harris County is gonna get about $900 million from the rescue plan. Just the Houston metro area alone has lost 370,000 jobs in the first two months of the pandemic. You know, we know buildings where at least, well, four of you, all four of you are downtown. Some of those restaurants will probably never come back. Uh, we may go through another cycle of record foreclosures, uh, not just with homes that people talked about, but some of those businesses. So it's a simple motion I sent around. Uh, it's uh, to move to direct the budget management department the Department of Economic uh, Equity and Opportunity and the Community Services Department to draft an equity framework to guide Harris County's use of American Rescue Plan funds to effectively address the needs of residents and communities most affected by the health and economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. In no way do I intend to leave out any other departments, but I couldn't think of everyone, but I know that the three that I did uh, spell out will bring others to the table. Legal department obviously will play a role, our offices. But whatever our process was to come up with an equity framework for that $2.5 billion uh, bond package, I think we did a pretty good job. Uh, and we've gotten some national reviews for what we have done, including, as I made reference to, that equity platform that Bloomberg Philanthropies is funding uh, I think in great part because of what we did with our direct assistance program, but that is the motion I would move at this time. Commissioner Garcia and then Commissioner Cable. Uh, uh, thank you, Judge. I'll, I'll uh, second uh, the motion. And uh, all I ask is that uh, I think you got the analyst office included, uh, Commissioner Ellis. I, I didn't spell it out, but all of them would be. And, I, gotcha. and I was, Commissioner Garcia, I was trying, I called around, I might just like to say to King County, Mm -hmm. uh, my staff folks were calling L.A. I did call. <coughs> nobody would they have an all-female board running L.A. County now. But when I called them, I was, uh, you know, I, I was embarrassed to say much. They have some equity language. They have some framework language. But when the commissioner sent it to me, supervisor sent it, I'm not sure I understood it all. And, you know, their budget is like seven times the size of ours for right. two times as many people. But and they, I, and they, I guess, analysts would be included. Yeah. And that, control. And that's, that's why I, I, I wanted to mention them because I would like, um, you know, the Hispanic community I still uh, believe is, in spite of the population, is still on the lower end of the spectrum in, in everything we've done. And I, I would like some analysis as to how we can uh, remedy that. 
uh, that we get closer to, um, you know, uh, an area that's representative of the population. And obviously, you know, the community um, and, and uh, you know, our communities better yet uh, died more than uh, others. And uh, not that uh, anybody else is less uh, important in that regard, but I want to make sure that uh, there's there's just something we haven't figured out yet, and I want to make sure that uh, maybe the analyst office can give that a dedicated focus. Yes, sir. Yes. And I was just trying to thank Commissioner Garcia of, uh, you know, I had to grab two or three who kind of be the point person to pull it together. I knew health director was telling me how in Sonoma County, uh, their version of the Harris Center and Harris Health and the health department uh, meet, I think she told me once a month. Because how do you do one if you don't deal with the mental health issue? How do you do prevention if you don't deal with the people treating folks uh, when they are ill? So I was so all of them would obviously be involved. I just didn't want to have a list that would that, that you'd say is there anybody else? But clearly that, that and look, we all use in that analyst office. I got an item later on today, by the way. I hope we'll generate some discussion. But this is I just listed three, but all of them would be included. Commissioner Cagle, and then Commissioner Ramsey. Thank you, Judge. Um, I have two quick little things on there. One is, is that I think that this is an important thing, and so I'd like to have it to where it is provided to our offices a few days before it goes on a court agenda so we could have a chance to look at it and analyze it because this could be a big deal. Uh, and so I would, this is akin to a motion that I think that Commissioner Garcia made a couple of courts back to where we need our staffs need to have it at least two days or three days before the Wednesday court agenda issue. And so I'd really like to make sure that that is part of this is that we all get it uh, in advance so that we can look at it and have a chance to analyze it uh, before it goes on the court agenda. Uh, and then number two, um, I just have to make a little bit of a comment, you know, we, we, we use certain words here as incantations. And if we use those words, then everybody has to do what it is that we say, because if it's in the name of this or in the name of that. And I'm a, I'm a big fan, and as I understand the term equity, when we're talking about helping people that are hurting and need to be helped. Um, I get a little bit nervous sometimes because occasionally it almost sounds like when that word is used, it means that we're going to hurt some people that need to be helped. And I want to make sure that we're never in that mode of where we are hurting people who need to be helped, that we're always in the game of helping people who need to be helped. Those who are hurting the most need the most help. And as long as we're on that same page, I think we're going to be fine. That's sure, Ramsey. Yeah, quickly, uh, I know City of Houston's getting a direct allocation. There's other entities, Bel Air, uh, West U, uh, some other folks are getting direct allocations through, through the uh, through the rescue plan. So I think it's important we always keep an eye out for what others are getting, so that one we can complement that with what we're doing. And the other part about this, having worked with many different federal programs through the decades, knowing what strings are attached to what as we go through this is important. Uh, sometimes we think uh, short term, we need to be thinking long term. So I look forward to seeing the recommendations in terms of being sure this is fair, that it does address specific needs in terms of rescue. If this is to rescue, then we need to rescue uh, some folks that have been significantly impacted over the last year related to uh, the pandemic and crime and other things. So that's look forward to the recommendations. but. Be sure that we understand what the city of Houston's doing with theirs, what neighborhoods, what areas, and so that we can be sure that we complement that. If I might add, and I agree with everything that's been said, I would just add, Commissioner Ellis, could we say something like ideally a quantifiable scoring system? And what I mean by that is I think when we've we've given sort of weightings and say it's never going to be the you know, the gospel, you can never get it exact, but best efforts at, and with, with justifications 
for a way to say, you know, score, this is the scoring system. So it's not just a vague, you know, we're going to do things that are roughly this and roughly that, but, but perhaps some sort of a, a, a quantitative framework. I would just ask that we give consideration to that. Church, I, I like that. And I know later today, we're going to talk about um, our success or uh, possible failure of meeting the equity guidelines we came up with on the flood fund package. So if there's some prioritization, there ought to be some metrics. I don't, I don't, I don't know if we have to write it in here, but clearly implicit in it. I think they get it when it comes back so that we're not in a position, what we're saying, what well, we passed a resolution, we had some guidelines, but somewhere knowing that we follow them. You know, I thought about the conversation earlier. You know, I'm sitting there thinking when I raised it, you pay. Most of it's coming from the state. Did it, I don't have no idea whether or not it added diversity or not, but well, well, well received on my part. I think they hear you. So I, I would just propose that we say either we need to make it to the motion or not, but just say that ideally there'd be a quantifiable scoring system and that members of court receive the proposal at the latest the Monday before the agenda comes out. I'll take that as a friendly amendment. Okay. Maricela, are we good if we vote on it? Uh, I was going to ask if we can please reread it one more time for clarification, the entire motion. Okay. And, and I, I'm sorry if I didn't send it uh, around to you. So my motion, you talk about the whole motion or the judge's part. I'm sorry. Um, I would prefer the entire motion together. Yeah. Okay. I move to direct the budget management department, the department of economic equity and opportunity and the Community Services Department to draft an equity framework to guide Harris County's use of American Rescue Plan funds to effectively address the needs of residents and communities most affected by the health and economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. And Judge, and I've had ideally a quantifiable scoring system and that members of court receive the proposal at the latest the Monday before the agenda comes out. That is a motion. Commissioner, you. did you want to add the analyst office per Commissioner Garcia's comment? Uh, Commissioner Garcia, do, you, do I have to add? I added three, I, but obviously health and everybody else is included. But if you want me to yeah, add the uh, analyst office. If, if we could just add the analyst office okay. to... Okay. Uh, address the um, uh, the disproportionate uh, access. Of the how, how about if I just throw in after community services, uh, put uh, and 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 uh, yeah, with the office. Yeah, with a with a particular focus on, um, you know, uh, the Hispanic community engagement. Did you get Did you catch that? Yes, at yes. the analyst office. Yeah. To focus on and, and, and would you just so disparities. nobody gets mad, just say ethnic and racial uh disparities. Yes, sir. Is that all right, Commissioner Garcia? Yes. Yeah. So are you good, Maricela? Yes, ma'am. Okay. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Garcia. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Commissioner Ellis. Item 14, Commissioner Ramsey. Yes, quickly, uh, again, I brought this up before, and I think it's important in light of everything we've talked about. Libraries and neighborhoods are such an important place for folks to go, particularly as we need to use uh, computers and Wi-Fi, uh, kids read books. Uh, I think it's it's way past time to open them up. Our community centers are opening or open full. Uh, we're providing great services. I think the library. I know my wife in the summer, when she was growing up, she would go to the Carnegie Library and spend hours upon hours. We need to get that back up in our neighborhoods. The libraries, our, our library system is so important. And I, I think it's time we, we get those open uh, to allow and support 
our neighborhoods and our folks uh, to get uh, get back in a, just another source of support for our neighborhoods uh, and folks that that really do need help. Those are the folks that come to the library. Yeah, Commissioner Garcia. Thank you, Judge. Um, uh, Commissioner Ramsey, I fully support uh, your uh, concern and and uh, an item here. However, uh, before we do that, Judge, if we can get the library staff vaccinated, if we're gonna, uh, I don't think they've been fully vaccinated. Uh, so I'd like to have an assessment on uh, on on that uh, before we subject them uh, to uh, you know to a, a, you know, full access uh, situation. Yeah, and, and I think you, you point out something important, Commissioner Garcia, which is we're close. We're really, we're close, but we're just not quite there. And, um, you know, there's still school staff that's not been vaccinated. There's still several folks over 60, 70 that have not been vaccinated. Um, the the numbers still have us at almost 18% ICU capacity full. Um, positivity rate from yesterday is 9.1%. Um, number of new cases, I'm just looking at it at our landscape report, is 592 new cases per day. So we are tied to the, my position anyway, is the threat level system. You guys will want to know that that has been reviewed. We had a fresh pair of eyes look at it just last week, two weeks ago from Baylor, fresh pair of eyes from RISE to say, hey, do we need to update this? based on um, the vaccination rates. And what they came back with is, as people get vaccinated more and more, those indicators in the threat level system will, by virtue of what they are, they will get better. So if we really are headed toward orange, we will get to orange. You will also like to know, Commissioner uh, Ramsey, that I've worked with Ed Melton and they've submitted a plan for what reopening would take place during orange. So it's not the, uh, you know, close indefinitely, we're close to orange. Now, the president did make a statement or the the his advisors yesterday that they're concerned about what's going to happen. Typically, we see a spike uh, about a month to a month and a half after the reopening and things open to 100% no masks about a month ago. So we still have to wait and see whether that that has, ha you know, has the same effect that it's had the past three times, which is about a month and a half later, things start trending upwards, we'll have to see. But if they don't, we'll hit orange and, and we'll get to the reopening. Currently, the libraries are providing three to 4,000 pickups per day. Um, other jurisdictions, whether it's Dallas, Austin, the big counties in Texas, they're also on, only doing curbside service, service. I'd be loath to put these folks at risk. And it, you have folks of all ages congregating. They're there for a long time. You know, when you take sort of a risk survey of COVID, it's how long are you going to be there? How many people are going to be there? Um, and 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 might you have high risk folks there? And the answer to those three would be yes, yes, yes. As a lifelong reader um, who loves libraries, I'm with you on opening them when it's safe and it's adequate. But my position would be to continue pegging this to the threat level system see if we make it to orange, which we're closed and great. And if not, then there's a reason why we didn't make it to orange and we still need to keep being careful. And by then the library staff will get vaccinated. Yes, Commissioner Cable. Judge, what I think I heard you said was that when we hit orange, we'll open up the libraries? To some degree, yes. There's a plan that Ed Melton has submitted. I don't have it in front of me, but yes, there will be some, some it's not gonna be come everyone 100%. But there's going to be some degree of opening of the libraries. I love I love having a target to go for, and so um, thank thank you for that, Judge. And I would like uh, we'll we'll reach out to the head librarian. Um, I'd like to see the plan too, but Judge, I like I like the ray of hope that you said when we have orange, then our kids can get back in the libraries and. Uh, I think that will also address some of the other issues that we've been talking about with regard to um, giving kids something to do instead of getting into trouble, giving families something to do instead of um, the pressures that are in place. And uh, my my father was in the space 
industry. There's a movie that I wish that he'd been alive to see, which is that one of Hidden Figures. If it weren't for libraries, we wouldn't have the space program that we have today. Um, and so I just, Judge, I'm going to say orange is what we're going for. When we get orange, we get books. We have books already, Commissioner. They're, that curbside program is great. The digital collection is doing great. Um, but that 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 would be my position. And yes, there's a there's a plan for Orange for the reopening. Yes, Commissioner Garcia. And I just want to mention that um, at uh, my parks and some of my community centers, we got those. Uh, I forget what name we give them, but we got those little uh, book uh, uh, libraries that people have access to outside. Uh, it's not the best condition, but we're making do with uh, the circumstances we've been dealt with. Well, we're beta testing in all our community centers. That's one. Two, uh, most of the schools are open in Precinct 3. And the reports I get back talking to the superintendent of SciFair, Katie, Spring Branch, it's all good. So uh, thank you, Judge. Look forward to getting orange. Yeah, I hope, I hope we'll get there. I, ho I hope we'll get there very soon. The next item is item. Yes, Maricela. I'm sorry. Is there any action on that item? No action, correct, Commissioner Ramsey? No action. Thank you. Item 15 is a uh, discussion and possible action on the allocation of a metro transfer. Oh, that's a county engineer. Oh, yes, Judge. Um, these funds were certified by the auditor at last court, and I just wanted the court to be aware that they were certified and they are in an account. I'm not advocating they be anything be done with them, but I just wanted the court to know that they are here and they are in an account. Commissioner Ellis. I'd like to ask either Mr. Blunt or Mr. Berry, uh, just so we know, what, what restrictions are there on these? funds. Mr. Bologna, or maybe Mr. Barry, I might have to ask the legal department, I'm not sure. Well, I can tell you, Commissioner, traditionally we put them back and they've been used for transportation. The previous county attorney's office felt since it was re a reimbursement, there was more flexibility. I did send a copy of the contract to the county attorney's office to make sure they had it. So Jay, I, I don't know that Jay's had a chance to read it. He might be able to answer that. Uh, sure. Um, Commissioner, yes, um, I did have a chance to read it. And uh, I, I, so broadly speaking, uh, there is there is flexibility with the use of it. Um, I think there were some questions as to there's a the contract itself provides for some level of flexibility um, in addition to just uh, normal um, uses in, as it relates to general mobility. Those, that general mobility can include uh, things like um, uh, in, in a limited way, or as it directly related to roads and bridges, um, flood control activities, for example, are delineated. So there's an actual list um, of items on there. So uh, the way the contract was written originally uh, provides for a certain amount of flexibility. Now there is a there's a cautionary tale I went on, on as it relates to flood control in particular, because I don't want it to be interpreted as, as a, in a broad capacity to be able to use it that way. But we certainly would be within our right to use it for, uh, or the county could, or the court could rather use it in a way that would allow for you to use it for that as it relates to um, offsets for, for example, street and road construction. So, uh, uh, and maybe Mr. Mr. Toppy, if he's around as well, we know we are $1.4 billion, possibly short, uh, unless the state were to give us the money we anticipated. And there were a number of people who testified on it today. This is only 30 million, but could this money be used for some of those projects? You know, uh, certainly there are uh, things that we have done in terms of roads, all of us done, have done, that help to increase flooding, in particular along greens and halls, all of our watersheds. But do you know whether or not this money could legally be used for some of that? Or is this something that would have to be analyzed, watershed by watershed? Uh, Commissioner, if, if I might, Jay, uh, it's clear that these could be used in the subdivision drainage projects because you're rebuilding the road infrastructure to improve drainage. That's a real, we've used these funds in the past for that. So I think that's a very clear nexus. 
because you're actually using it in the roads to improve drainage. On the, and that there, there were a number of projects in the flood control bond where we're stopping flooding inside subdivisions by fixing the roads and the drainage in those subdivisions. Well, and I would, I know you were doing that equity analysis. Uh, it's going to be much more than this $30 million, but it's going to be a pretty high figure. And from my standpoint, I don't really care whether uh, uh, they are in my precinct or someone else's precinct. I just know that there are neighborhoods. I happen to know that Commissioner, and I, Commissioner Garcia and I represent uh, two precincts, at least with those two watersheds, that have pretty much become the detention pond for the region. And that's those neighborhoods along Greens and Halls. Don't flood sometimes, they flood every time. Uh, and, but they could, they, do you think they could be used over there for detention issues along those watersheds? Even on drainage in the streets. We got to get it to them, to those, to those watersheds. Yeah, Commissioner, I think that it's clear they could be used on the, the, the subdivision projects, what we call in the bond program in those, uh, in any of them. That, that nexus is very clear because you're redoing streets and, storm, and, and inlets and storm sewers and then offsetting the detention. And all that was anticipated in the Metro agreement. The, the question is when you, and as, as Jay alluded, when you get outside of that pretty clear Nexus, the, the contract anticipates what can you do, and that that would. And you'd have to do an analysis to see what that nexus is, right? Right, you have to do an analysis to yeah, make sure that we, we met the, the threshold. Uh, I mean, that would certainly be, you know, my 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 view on it would be that would be something that the engineering flood control would need to essentially need to be able to show that uh, that that there is some sort of nexus between that. So it could very well be. The infrastructure development for roads is causing some downstream flooding, and that downstream flooding needed to be um, uh, needed to be. Uh, I, I want to be clear: the way it's worded doesn't necessarily mean that 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 particular flood control mechanism has to be specific drainage for a particular street. Yeah. Um, I, which would the, the nexus would be, or the argument would be that it's the addition of that infrastructure <laughs> or that street development is what's causing potential downstream flooding. And so that, but that's a that's frankly. Um, uh, that would be the legal argument, but the, to show the nexus would require the analysis from, from flood control and engineering. Yeah, so, and, and Commissioner Ellison, I think you you and your staff and, and the rest of court member staff have seen, we've actually had uh, consultant gauge engineers prepare a report on that nexus. And Jay, I'll make sure you get a copy of it. And is there, Mr. Blunt, some reason why this has to be, uh, action has to be taken on this now? N no, no. No, I just wanted the court to be aware that it, it had been certified and it wasn't in an account. So I, I would respectfully like to suggest to my colleagues that we know we have a $1.4 billion hole and we made a commitment uh, to certain neighborhoods through our equity prioritization. Uh, and we had them waiting, hoping that our state partners would give us federal money I'm going into another issue coming up, Judge. I'm sorry to do that, but uh, I don't. I don't think it's it, it's prudent on one hand for us to have looked at a map, be aware of the problem, uh, and say we're committed to doing something about it. A plan is coming forward in June. I'm told to do something about it, and then here's an opportunity where some funds. I don't know how much could be used to, to try and help us fulfill a commitment we made. I, I would encourage my colleagues to wait uh, and see what options we have on this money uh, before we uh, get into a, a discussion about how to, uh, to divvy it up. That would be my suggestion. Commissioner, Mr. Berry, you, you have uh, any thoughts? Uh, be my last point, Mr. Berry, just want to ask him if he had any thoughts, Judge, and I'll be quiet. Commissioner, I, I, I don't have any doubts that within the flood control program, we could find eligible infrastructure for $30 million. I think it's really a policy question for court about whether they want to direct the money there or they want to direct it to some other, other priority. I think we can, we can find a home for $30 million in the flood control financing program if that's where court wants to go. And do you, Mr. Berry, have any, uh, I guess you've looked at this as well, 
to know what what strings would be on it. Do you have any other thoughts in terms of uh, holes that we know are coming up that we've got to fill? I mean, I, 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 I think for using Metro money for a street related project, such as a subdivision project, everything I understand is it would be pretty, pretty straightforward. And, and John has more experience with these funds than I do, but it sounds like he's of a, of a similar opinion. I mean, that really is a, a road related project, but it is just done to manage flooding. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Commissioner um, Ramsey, then Commissioner Garcia, and then Commissioner Cable. Having, uh, having worked this Metro fund for 30 plus years, working with 14 cities that actually contribute uh, to the Metro fund and working back through Metro through the years in terms of try, uh, being sure that we uh, uh, checked all the boxes. Uh, I think there's a lot of flexibility on their part. Uh, I think what uh, John referred to uh, related to projects with uh, that have drainage issues that should be street related but I'm reading the I'm reading the criteria now making drainage improvements as reasonable and necessary for effective use of related transportation facilities so I I don't think it's that complicated I think we can read through this and get there but I, I there is a transit listen a transit issue related to this so i think it's city of houston probably centric where there are bus routes and other things it doesn't have to be necessarily a bus route i've got things funded by just improving signals and just improving other things so i, I don't think it's too much of a stretch to get there in terms of drainage issues we just need to be sure we we check those boxes correctly commissioner garcia Thank you, Judge. And uh, although I appreciate uh, where Commissioner Ellis is, is uh, uh, thinking about this, I don't want to take the flood control district off the hook. Um, we had a uh, lobbyist in, in uh, Washington uh, that could have worked on our behalf to have gotten uh, that $5 billion that's sitting at the state of Texas uh, to help uh, fund that uh, that $1.4 billion gap that we got that we're talking about. So I don't want to take the flood control district off the hook on that. This uh, $30 million here has typically been looked at for our offices to help support our respective CIPs as relates to the priorities that this court has set, and that is Vision Zero, uh, Bicycle, uh, well, Vision Zero with pedestrian and bicycle safety. And um, obviously, I, I have uh, long talked about the condition of the roadways in Precinct 2. And so um, I, I think the Flood Control District has to continue to do their job and working with the GLO, uh, working with HUD uh, to get that uh, money uh, into uh, the right uh, program areas. And uh, but uh, we typically set our CIP uh, by uh, the transfer of these dollars. And there's just no way I'm going to be able to tell my community that uh, I'm going to give that to the flood control district who hasn't been able to manage their projects or the funds. Um, and so uh, there, I, I'm just, a, I'll be a no on that one. Commissioner Cagle. Judge. We experience a similar issue. We plan on using these Metro funds in order to do our projects. As a little bit of background, you've heard me brag on the engineering department before, but they began a pilot in Precinct 4 a number of years ago that has been very successful. And that is that whenever we build a road in Precinct 4 or we do an expansion of a road in Precinct 4, that we add 25% uh, above the no net impact to the project um, and that became very helpful when we were in the middle of a lot of designs when we had the atlas 14 criteria came in because that meant that we didn't have to redesign a lot of things because we had already built in added capacity and i think that 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 25 percent 
that goes to additional drainage in our projects is something uh, that is being utilized in the other precincts right now. And I know that we have many of our community partners that we're trying to work with that are ready to have those mobility and safety factors in place to where our road projects are also our flood control projects. Uh, and we're no longer in that mindset of you get one or the other. And in fact, we've had some partnerships uh, up in the north. We had a road, a Champions Drive, to where it really was almost like one of the old ancient Roman uh, conveyances to where it was really a road on top of a drainage project and, and really helped that region, and it was pretty. And so, Judge, I, I would argue that there's a second point that's very important as it would apply to Precinct 4, probably also applies to uh, Precinct 3, and that is that much of Precinct 4 is in the Metro tax. But most of the services for Metro are not provided in Precinct 4. We have some parking rides. We have a couple of other things. And, and part of the benefit of the bargain for the people in Precinct 4 and why they continue to willingly subject themselves to a tax is because part of these revenues are brought back into their community so that they can have better transportation. And if we go down the pathway to where we're going to not only not let them have that, but we're going to divert it somewhere else, we have a taxation without representation type issue. And the question is, how long will that be sustainable uh, in, in communities that, that have grown to expect that when they are taxed, that they do get some benefit back from that tax in those neighborhoods? And I would just throw that out as an additional thought as we move down. Uh, Judge, uh, there, there are people that are counting on us to help improve their local drainage and their local mobility. It's a challenging issue. Is there a motion necessary for it right now, John, or what's the deal with this? Uh, Judge, there's no no required, there could be no action. It was just notifying the court that the funds were there. But it did say if you wanted to take an action, that the court could take action. And I would uh, suggest, uh, Judge, that if, if, um, if we're ready, I, I would, uh, I think, make the standard motion that that be divvied up four ways. I second that. So the the vote is for the Metro transfer to be divided equally amongst the precincts. Does that make sense to you, Maricela? Yes, ma'am, it does. Yes, Commissioner Ellis. Well, Judge, I, I made my case to try to do something about the flood control hole is there. We'll get to talk about it later, but I think Isaac Newton would be Maybe it will be Newton or Carl Goss would be considered the best mathematicians in the history of the world. Not Rodney, but I think I can count to three. So I'm going to leave it alone. But I've made my case. Yeah, that's um, a good point. We're going to have to pull the money from somewhere. Um, we'll, we'll keep working on it. So there's a motion, Commissioner Garcia. And who made the second? Commissioner Ramsey. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. The next item is item uh, 133, actually, on page 15. Discussion on possible action on an update to the Flood Control District Bond Program. So just, this was um, my item that I pulled off it. Mr. Poppy, I, I just want you to give us some sense of where we are. Um, I know there are a number of people who came in to speak. Uh, as a follow-up to the $1.4 billion that we know we are short. And uh, I know you all are, are tasked with coming up with a plan. Uh, Commissioner, Commissioner Ellis, I know that you're getting your steam up, and I'm sorry to interrupt. I do have ahead. item 133, but mine is on page 16. You know, in case... Uh, we're okay. I'm sorry, Judge. It's it's our it's our document. I just wanted to make sure that if Miss Hugler was still out there, that she wasn't going to fuss at me if I gave her the wrong page number. Uh, so, but 133 under flood control is is where we're at. I got that, Judge. Thank you for 
and my apologies, Commissioner Ellis, for, for interrupting you. I just want to make sure I, I was on the set head, same head markings as you. We're good. Okay. Yeah, so, so Russ, I just want to get some update. On Commissioner Ellis. Marcia, did you have something right now? Uh, no, I'll, I'll wait. I'll wait till Commissioner yeah. Ellis. Uh, Sorry, Mr. Uh, Mr. Poppy, I just wanted some update from you and Mr. Berry on the process you're going through on how we will uh, get there. I know section, we all know section 14G of the order that call for the election uh, has this language, since flooding issues do not respect jurisdictional or political boundaries, commission's court shall provide a process for the equitable expenditure of funds, recognizing that project selection may have been affected in the past and may continue to be affected by eligibility requirements for matching federal, state, and local governments. I just want to make sure we're staying on this and we're going to get there. So I want you to just give us a sense of where we are and also just to reiterate what commitments uh, were made by our state partners that didn't turn out the way we thought they would be. I'm told that we were told we would get about 900 million and then the state limited each government entity to two applications with a maximum uh, of about up to $100 million per request. And Harris County agencies have requested the maximum amount of $900 million. So the math would indicate we probably won't get there. But I just want some update, some sense of how you think we will get to where we need to be. Uh, and I, I know your target is June, but obviously I've been getting calls and other people have since our court meeting a couple of weeks ago. And I just, I don't want to be in a position where I'm saying when it's too late, well, sorry, uh, we're trying to do as much as we can. And in particular, any comments you can give us about how we uh, fill the gap for greens and halls and sims uh, in particular, because on, on that map in terms of uh, some that were impacted the most that we control, so to speak. There was one other one, Commissioner Garcia, out your way. I don't have the map in front of me, but other counties are involved in that. And I just want to make sure we're staying on it. And Russ, I want to say anything we can do, you know, we're in session to make the case. Uh, you know, all of us are committed to doing that, I believe. But I, I just, I for one won't be in a position where I didn't go down fighting uh, if at some point we have to ask for additional money and it's these lower income areas that have flooded every time. Uh, you, you were the one that helped me understand the federal formulas and how it worked when I first met you uh, in this job. Uh, and uh, I, I'm doing as, as much as I can, maybe we could do more. Uh, but we do not want to be in a position, I don't know how in good faith we could go back to the voters. And those two watersheds in particular, Greens and, and Halls, those two in particular, more in so than Sims, uh, are left out. Um, so that's what I'd like you to give us some feedback on. Uh, yes, Commissioner. Judge, Commissioners, it's Russ Poppy, Executive Director of the Harris County Flood Control District. And I've got Matt Zeven here with me as well. We had planned on giving a, a brief overview of the attachments in the backup about the overall bond program and where we're at. And if it's acceptable, uh, Matt's offered to give an update on the, on the work that it, he honestly led with our team to provide that update, if, that, if that's acceptable at this time. And I would be glad to jump back in and, and address the questions you just asked me, Commissioner. Oh, I'm fine with that. It's fine with me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, howdy, Judge and Commissioners. It's, it's Matt Zeve with Flood Control. Uh, I did attach a, a bond program update to this uh, item on the agenda, and I'm going to go through it very quickly so that uh, Russ can circle back on the funding discussion. Uh, as of as of today, we have 181 projects in uh, in the 2018 bond program. 19 have been completed, 141 are active, and we haven't even started 21 of them. Uh, and uh, out of the uh, out of those completed projects, uh, a big one is our Harvey Repair Program. 
which was partially funded by the Natural Resources Conservation Service, another federal agency. But uh, it was a total of $125 million repair program from damage from Harvey, which we started and completed in a three-year time span. So that was uh, something successful that was uh, partially funded from the bond program. Including, uh, we have, uh, including all individual projects associated with bond projects, we have 372 projects that are associated with the bond program in process right now. Uh, with over 100 of those being those subdivision drainage improvement projects. Also, as part of the bond program, we've been able to establish 20 agreements with our local municipalities and municipal utility districts that have been able to advance their drainage projects uh, with uh, help from the flood control district bond program with more of those local partnerships to come this year. Uh, the 21 that haven't started, the 21 bond projects that haven't started uh, we have uh, until March of next year, so we have one year from now to have all of those projects started according to our prioritization framework. And then uh, going on, uh, going uh, wrapping this thing up relatively quickly, a, a couple other statistics to think about. I've broken our, our bond uh, project life cycle into two uh, high-level categories. I call it inside work and outside work. Inside work is where uh, we do the studies, the preliminary engineering, the design of the construction projects. And the inside work is where the public uh, can't see what we're doing. And we're, we have a lot of inside work going on right now because that's what's required to get to what I call the outside work, which is the construction. And that's where the public and other folks can actually see the benefits uh, of all the inside work that we did. And that's where uh, the flood damage reduction benefits are actually realized on the ground. So we have about 34 projects that are, I can call the outside work that are in construction or completed uh, with the vast majority of our bond projects still in one of those early stages of inside work. But that will change, uh, that proportion will change over the next, over the coming years. Uh, so just some other quick high level statistics. All these are included in the attachment that I provided. 88% uh, of the projects are underway. We've, the Flood Control District has executed 326 engineering agreements with a value of $247 million. And we've awarded 39 construction contracts with a value of around $296 million. We've acquired uh, over 340 properties with a value of two, uh, over $208 million for either construction or floodplain preservation. We've had 140 community engagement meetings with over 11,000 attendees. We've completed 600, 630 home buyouts at a value of over $130 million with 680 home buyouts in process right now. And to get all that done, we've had over 1,000 items on commissioner's court since the bond program was approved. Uh, we've authorized over $515 million of bond funds uh, to be spent, and we've actually paid uh, invoices on over $358 million of projects associated with the bond program, which is around 14% of the $2.5 billion in the bond program. And for those professional services contracts that I mentioned, $65.5 million of value of those professional services contracts have gone to certified minority or women-owned businesses or historically underutilized businesses, which is 26.5% of the total value of professional services have gone to certified MWBE or hub firms. And that's, that's the conclusion of my part of the update. Right. I know that uh, Commissioner Ellis was expecting you guys to also address the other question. So I'll, I'll just allow for that before we uh, hear from Commissioner Garcia and Commissioner Ramsey. Yes, Judge, yes, this is Russ. And regarding the remaining partnership funding opportunities, you know, we, I, I know everybody's getting frustrated at this point, but here we are three years ago, or three years waiting on, on some answers uh, on some applications that we had sitting for a while. And I, I want to put that in perspective, too, because you know, the, the comments that were made by some of the residents earlier on in the day during public comment period, 
they ask some very good questions such as why is it taking so long and and my and i've got a similar question and let me put that in perspective you know within 10 to 16 months of the bipartisan budget act passing in february of 2018 we had secured via contracts with the u.s corps corps of engineers 333 million dollars on four watersheds within like i said the span of 10 to 16 months here we are look, talking about, in particular, to answer Commissioner Ellis's questions, we have two applications worth $100 million each in halls, one application worth $100 million on green. So again, a similar dollar amount, $300 plus million. And here we are three years after the Bipartisan Budget Act has passed, and we are still waiting on definitive answers from the GLO, which is the direct recipient of, of HUD funds. We are a sub-recipient at the county. So if anything that tells me that there's a delivery method issue with the HUD funds, and what that looks like, that's certainly up for debate. And I think that's something where our, our members of Congress may have to help us out. And the, the one thing that has been brought to my attention that could accelerate the delivery method of those HUD funds is a direct allocation. And Commissioner, you asked me what, what we talked about with, with HUD and ultimately the GLO. When we asked HUD for a direct allocation, I was up there with the city of Houston as well. They told us we do not give direct allocations to cities or counties. It has to go to the state. And that's what they told us at that time. And this was early on after Bipartisan Budget Act passed. So like the city of Houston and others across the state of Texas, we are in a holding pattern for $4.2 billion worth of HUD funds that have been specifically allocated to the state that are primarily to be spent in, in low to moderate income areas and those areas that have high social vulnerability and we're still waiting on, on those answers from them. And I'll be honest, if we hadn't gotten the $330 million con in contracts from the Corps of Engineers, we would be having similar funding uh, issues and challenges and head scratching conversations in those watersheds as well. So to me, it really comes down to, can we come up with a better delivery method, especially as there's talks now in, in Congress about another infrastructure package that would potentially make more money available to help us do these types of infrastructure projects. So that's something certainly that, you know, Ender and I've talked about using a, his uh, a federal liaison contract. But if we're going to get additional funds through an additional uh, supplemental bill that Congress and the president are talking about, that's one of the things we absolutely have to advocate for is somehow we've got to get money flowing faster than three years after it's appropriated to HUD. Now, all that said, we are absolutely not standing still. And I want to go back to address the residents' concerns that, even while we're waiting on the GLO to make some of these decisions, we are starting to see some traction. Within the last two weeks, the GLO has started to make some press releases that they are starting to make awards. Uh, one of the awards that they made was $10 million towards the county. And I know that's, that's not the $100 million we're looking at, but we've been told that instead of June, they're now accelerating their decision making on some of those larger applications to come out as early as next month in April. So all that said, we are still moving forward with local dollars that we have in the bond program to continue making progress in halls and greens. And these are statistics for those watersheds in particular. Uh, you know, we just recently finished a $63 million. And San Jacinto, hopefully. <laughs> yes, Commissioner. But since I was asked specifically about uh, these watersheds, that's my focus on my comments right now. And I can, I can address San Jacinto. Uh, but we just finished a $63 million detention basin project in green, on Greens Bayou that's gonna significantly reduce the flooding for 2,400 homes. We currently have $45 million in active construction on projects that are gonna reduce people's flooding in Halls and Greens watershed. And on this very agenda, item 282 on page 34, we're advertising an additional $6 million worth of construction contract for a detention basin on, on Halls Bayou. So I wanna make sure that we are still reiterating to our residents that we have local dollars in the bond program that's allowing us to do, as Matt said, a lot of inside work and even some outside work that I'm articulating to you right now. Um, and while all that is going on, we are certainly working with budget management and other relevant county departments uh, to come up with a plan as, as we were directed to do by June 29th. And I'm encouraged so far by the conversations that we've had. We're meeting at least weekly at the executive level and our staff are in daily com communications, uh, coming up with some, some creative ideas that we can then tap into should we have to go to alternate funding recommendations if in the unfortunate scenario that HUD and ultimately GLO do not come through with making significant awards. Chad. Yes, Commissioner Ellis. So, so Russ, thank you. But I, I want to make sure that, that I'm trying to make myself as clear on this as possible. Um, 
the bond package that was uh, talk about $10 billion, but a motion was never made. Uh, that was talk about a $1 billion package, a $1.5 billion package. At some point, you and I had a meeting in my office, if you recall it, and it was $2.5 billion. And you, you told me if it was at that figure that we do, we'd be able to get the greens and halts. And then something changed. My guess would be that the focus groups or something indicated that maybe the support wouldn't be there for $2 billion because you got to make a commitment that you're going to raise taxes. You, gotta, you make a commitment to service the debt uh, if you put that bond package out there. So then it was going back down to a million. And I, I, my staff's looking for the discussion. I, I think I mentioned to you, I remember this line. I was surprised it ended up in the paper because I said, you, you're telling the people in my precinct and at the time, Commissioner Garcia, Commissioner Mormon's precinct along Greens and Halls. If it's $1 billion, they can enroll in Harris County Aquatics because that's, that's all they'll get. Remember that conversation, that discussion at the table, Russ Poppy? I do, Commissioner. Okay. So I was doing that to push the two priorities that I had with the little leverage I thought I had because oh, 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 Mr. Cagle had to vote so many. But I figured when they went to the voters, they thought maybe I could make a little noise and create a problem. I wanted us to do a disparity study. I was told the court would do it, but I had to pay for it out of Precinct 1's funding, which Precinct 1 did. And I wanted equity language. This was language that passed unanimously at 14G in the order. I was also pushing for us spelling out every project on the ballot because with my limited intelligence, when I was on city council, that's the way it happened. And you all told me, you told me, well, what if you think you're gonna spend X amount for Cypress Creek or greens by you, if it ends up being more or less, you'd be locked into that amount. I didn't necessarily agree with it. I figured a lawyer would figure out how to write it in such a way you'd have latitude. I want to spell out the items. You, Russ, explained to me this cost-benefit ratio business. But my understanding was with this language on the ballot, 2.5, this language in the order, and $2.5 billion, we get to do greens and halls. I was not in the meeting with GLO. It was a commitment, I take you at your word, that you clearly thought, is my math right? The city would get, was it 700 million or 900 million? We'd both get the same amount, right? Roughly, what was, what was the amount GLO gave you the impression we would get for flood projects? It was a billion dollars, Commissioner. A billion dollars for us and the city, right? They were a little lower, right? Thereabouts, round numbers, but yes, each a billion dollars to do mitigation. So he, here's the challenge. Here's how I look at it. I understand the LMI. And now in a, in a poor state like Texas, most of the folks are not, the folks in this state don't live the way we live. There's LMI all over the state of Texas. And when I made the comment, we can't spend all our time chasing federal money that the state has. And they didn't give it to us. You got me? I I wanted, I was for the 2.5 billion. We all campaigned for it. I went out and did my part. I was wrong, Commissioner Cagle. I thought it was better to have the election in November. So did you. You called me to your office and said, back off a little bit. I think you're right. Let me make the case. Don't you do it. And then something changed along the way. We won't go there. Hey, but we're both wrong. It was the largest tax increase with the smallest percentage of people voting on it, probably in the history of the region. Turned out to be right. We were wrong on that. Uh, but look, I was making the case, you can't go out and leave these neighborhoods, greens and halls, they've been the detention pond for the, the region. And if we if they don't get those projects done, how do we go back to the voters? So even when you tell me what's coming up, I'm looking at this map. You've seen it. I hate I don't have it in color. 
what this map says is only 25% of what's needed for greens has been spent. 26% for halls. I'm not going up to San Jacinto because the other counties could play a role as well. They could go out and take some heat with their constituents for it. Sims, by the way, you explained to me that that was earmark. They never would have met the cost benefit ratio standard. They need 50%. That was an earmark. Congress doesn't do those anymore. Even with the new language, you wouldn't get an earmark for sales. But all of those bells and whistles to do it. So what I don't want is us to be in a position where if we have to go back to the voters because we don't have enough money, Baker, Addicts, Cypress, Little Cypress, Willow Creek, Buffalo, Hunting, White Oak. If you go out there, Carpenters, Carpenters is done, Jackson Bayou, Goose Creek, call one of mine out. Where's Clear Creek? I don't see it on here. But I, I don't want to, it would never pass if you're going out there and it's perceived as one just for those neighborhoods, primarily along greens and halls. So you can't just sit back and say, my solution is I'm chasing the federal money that the state has that they didn't give us. So while they ask, but I'm, I'm not with the state anymore. If I were there, I'd be giving this speech up there, but I'm not there. Or to, or to go and say, now we want this new administration to do something that the Trump administration didn't do. I'm going to try it, but that's an uphill battle. Rarely have counties got a direct allocation. It says a lot about the Biden administration, and we got it under this next package of money. Unless you, Jim Clyburn's county, North Carolina, I mean, you you went up there. We, we, we met with the folks at HUD together. Only a handful of counties around the country would do it. Cities could usually make a better case. Uh, but we're talking about the money that has already been committed on our part. And I just... Hey, I hope you get it, but if we don't get it, I want to throw in the towel and go spend all, our money or slow down what happens in other areas. So if we have to go back to the voters, all of us, all of us are in it together, including projects that are in my precinct in higher income areas. You can't just go out there and leave these folks out there. And Rush, you explained it to me. I would, I had no idea what you were talking about the first time you walk through cost-benefit ratio, nor did several members of Congress that I spoke to. You educated me on it. So I expect you to come back with a plan. And it's not enough to just say the solution is we're going to keep chasing federal dollars. As far as I'm concerned, the feds gave the money to Texas, and Texas kept it. If it doesn't come through, they put it somewhere else. I'm sure, Garcia. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Commissioner Ellis, well said. Um, and uh, Russ, on uh, I got several questions. One is out of the two point five billion, um, what is the total cost, uh, or what's the total spend on construction at this point? Well, we've we've spent right around three hundred and eighty million dollars of the two point five billion. And how much has been spent on studies? I don't, I'll have to give that to you, Commissioner. I don't have that exact specific statistic on the top of my head. Um, what is the cost and, um, and performance, the, the cost of the, uh, the overall cost schedule and performance index? Hmm. Make sure I understand your question. Uh, you're asking what, the, what, the, what? What's what's the schedule uh, performance? Uh, the the uh, here we go. The cost performance index. Okay, so we we had a lot of discussions earlier on about the bond program and how we're going to uh, that we our goal was to get it done in in ten years. And then you may recall we had uh, a couple of firms help us look at ways to accelerate that. And, it, and we found that there wasn't a good return on investment to get much 
tighter than 10 years. So I think we all agree that we would do the bond program in a 10 year time frame. And based upon the spending rate that we've gotten so far, Commissioner, we're on schedule to do that, to complete the bond program within 10 years. But what? But what's the cost performance index? Uh, Commissioner, I'm, I'll have to go back to my staff and get that to you. I don't have that handy. Okay. How about the schedule performance index? Well, we have a master schedule, Commissioner. We can we can send that to your office. I just we didn't include that in our in our bond program update. Okay, uh, if you would, because yes, I I know that um, it had it had always been I think at ten years from the get go, and I I thought we had got it uh, overall ten years, but that there would be uh, uh, some significant portion of the program that would be done within seven years. Is, is that, am I remembering that correctly? That's right. There were some projects that we had at the onset of the bond program that we had pretty much designed already leading up to the bond program. And those are the ones that we were able to push to construction first. And that's then that's essentially the, the large part of the $380 million that, that Matt has said that has been spent so far. That is correct. And so uh, to Commissioner Ellis's point, about halls and uh and greens and that map that uh we saw the other day that shows how uh, uh i don't want to say underfunded but there's just been there's just no uh work in those uh in those watersheds and we share those watersheds uh, i'd like to see um a breakdown of the construction cost per precinct. Maybe you can get that to my office. Um, yes. And uh, and when uh, when uh, new construction per precinct will begin. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Ramsey. And I I know we're we're uh, bound here for a break. I was thinking we'll finish this item and then we can take a break. <clears throat> Quickly along the same lines, uh, focusing on Halls Green, San Jacinto. Uh, there, there's dates. We we need to clearly understand when projects are going to be bid, when they're going to be let. I don't under. I wouldn't. I'm not comfortable with slowing down anything. I think we proceed with design, with a with a commitment that we're going to get this thing done. So I don't want to hear about slowing down in halls or slowing down in greens we're going to we should proceed with design as if we've got our funding lined out because that's our commitment so when we get when we go through the schedule and i understand i've got a copy of what we've done here the sense of it is keep those things on schedule you've indicated we are on schedule but i think there is a there's merit to the point that this bond issue passed because there were significant projects being done in all four precincts. By the same token, we should proceed with our design approach, construction approach, based on all four precincts. So I think that's a lot of what we're saying. And the other thing I noted, the people that called in today, Commissioner Ellis, uh, I noted every one of them live in the city of Houston. Now this is what I know about the city of Houston. They've got a big responsibility to get the water to the bayou. And I'm assuming that there is great coordination, hopefully, between what the city's doing and what we're doing. Because we're, we're to deal with halls and, and uh, greens, the bayous themselves, but getting the water to there uh, is typically the city. Are we doing that because the city isn't, or is the city doing a significant amount of projects there too. It'd be nice to know what all's happening in halls and 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 uh, green uh, to be sure that that we properly leverage everything uh, to focus on those areas. Yes, sir, <laughs> Ramsey. Judge, if I may. Yes, sir. We are we are coordinating obviously with the city of Houston. And to your point, we are not on hold. Everything is moving forward, just as you said. We are progressing with design on all the things that are, are, are in the in, inside or in-house uh, work as, as Matt mentioned. So we are not putting anything on hold. 
and the city of Houston is getting, they do have projects in halls and greens that complement ours. We did have some joint applications to the GLO with the city of Houston. Yes, but I believe the ones that we have in greens and halls were partnership projects with Harris County. Okay. Judge, I have four sure points. Can. Yeah. The first one is actually a series of questions that have been asked before that I have of Russ. Russ, clearly, yes or no, is there any project behind the schedule as we are talking today? No, sir. All right. And that would be true of both the original schedule that was voted on and the revised schedule that was subsequently voted on. That's under both schedules, correct? That's right, Commissioner. All right. Second set of questions. Um, I know that you are seeking to pursue, as Commissioner Ellis called it, the federal dollars that the state is holding. As I understand it, the entire state is in the same boat that we are in Harris County. We are not the only ones that are waiting for the state to let go of those funds. Is that correct? That is correct. Now, if we went ahead and spent our local money where the state is holding our money that's to go for these three watersheds, um, then the state wouldn't be under an obligation to give us our money anymore. They could give it somewhere else. Is that correct? We would have to likely modify our applications to the GLO if we start advancing local funds that uh, would take the place potentially of HUB, HUD and GLO funds. That is correct. Yeah. You were the one who educated me early on that when we go too far and too fast ahead of federal dollars, we lose the federal dollars. We have to be very, very careful that we don't go too far. Otherwise, we lose them. Three, um, the proposition that we should slow down other projects in the county as count of, uh, and this is not to you, Russ, this is to my colleague, Commissioner Ellis, is just a proposition. Uh, that, that concept that we slow down all other projects in the county until two of the areas are able to pass a bond, that sounds like uh, Chicago-style shakedowns. Uh, I don't think that the people of Precinct 4 would vote for a bond if they are told that they don't get their current projects that they already voted on unless something happens somewhere else and they vote for another bond. I, I just don't think that that will pass in Precinct 4. I don't think that's, I know it's late, it's 715. You probably haven't had your grapes and your other stuff. And so that probably wasn't your best thought out idea but I, I would not support that approach of holding over people who are waiting on their flood control projects, telling them they don't get theirs until they vote for another bond. I just think that's a bad idea. Uh, not your best idea, but, you know, is it after, after 7 o'clock. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a grace there. The idea that you had at 7 p.m. may not be the same idea you'd have at 7 a.m. Uh, and my last point, is when you've been hearing me interject, there are three watersheds that we keep talking about in this. And one is the San Jacinto watershed. And along the San Jacinto watershed are some of the poorest and most economically disadvantaged people in the county. They live along that river. And, uh, and Umble is in that area. These are LMI areas. Mercer Arboretum is in an LMI area. Jones Park that's right around the corner is in an LMI area. And so when we keep talking about these other two watersheds and we keep ignoring uh, San Jacinto watershed, yes, upstream, there are some other partners that we can have. But we need to not forget, if we have funding that's available for all the people in Harris County, let's not punish the poor people that live in Precinct 4 just because they happen to be outside Beltway 8. Those are my four points, Judge. Yeah, I, we we do have a lot to get through, and I really don't I don't want to. My my vote anyway would be to not to not continue it, it with with more discussion on something that I think it's been made clear to Russ and Matt and Dave is working on it. I know Peter T is working on it that you all need to bring a solution that 
projects cannot get delayed. And I'm with Commissioner Ellis on this one is it needs to be fair for everybody. We can't just say, well, too bad a bond proposal was made that should have been for more money and it was less money. And so the people that are always behind are gonna be behind once more. Every, we have to figure out how we're gonna keep the schedule and, and get that done, whether that means another bond election, whether that means reinvestment of funds, whatever it is. Um, but it's a very similar conversation to the one we had last week. So I would recommend that we take the break and that we continue with the agenda. Uh, I know yes. Commissioner uh, uh, Ellis, Commissioner Garcia had a brief comment, but but that would be yes. my point anyway. If I might, I, I, will, I won't respond directly to my to my colleague, but uh, I can assure you I'm not tired, and I, I choose my words very carefully. Uh, this county would never pass another bond issue after making a commitment with an equity prioritization framework. If that was ignored. Equity does not mean equality in each precinct. Commissioner Cagle, that's what you wanted the equity guidelines to mean. I happen to represent some of the wealthiest and some of the poorest areas in the county. The, the prioritization equity framework had nothing to do with which precinct anybody lives in. A good portion of the spending will be in precinct one. I represent downtown. I represent the medical center, but you cannot have a equity prioritization framework and say, but those areas that historically have been neglected. And by the way, I hit those two in particular because we talked about them so much. I could throw in not just San Jacinto, but Sam's. San Jacinto, as I said, our other partners, other counties could help with that as well. But you can't say, We'll only follow the framework of equity for those poor areas that the equity framework was designed for if we get money from somebody else. That's how they were left on the back of the bus for the last 30 years. And you can dance around it. You can try to act like it has not been the case. The reality is those areas have been the detention pond for the county because of racism and indifference that has gone on in this county for decades. With that, I'd be more than happy to take a break. Thank you, Judge. Commissioner Garcia? You're on mute, Commissioner. I'll, I'll wait till we come back from our break. Okay, so it's, it's 7.23. Let's take a break until 7.35, and then we'll move on. Thank you. Hi, y'all. It's 7.36 and Commissioner's Court is back in session. We discussed the flood control uh, bond program. Uh, did you have an additional comment on that, Commissioner Garcia, or the next item? Yes. No, on, on, on this item, uh, All right. Judge. I, I just want to uh, make sure that uh, Russ uh, heard me correctly, and I, and I want to be clear. Now, when I asked for the schedule performance index and the cost performance index. I want it for each project and I want it for the entire program. Russ? I'm going to unmute him. You're unmuted, Russ. Okay, thank you, Lucinda. Yes, sir, Commissioner, understood. I've checked with our staff and our schedulers and they're they're working on that now and we'll have that deliverable. Yes, sir. Yeah, by each by each project and then by the entire program. Yes, sir. Understood. Good Thank day. you for the clarification. Thank you. Yes, Thank Commissioner. You. Yeah. Just one quick point. Russ, were all of these projects started based on our prioritization, equity prioritization framework? No, Commissioner, they were not because the prioritization framework wasn't adopted by court until uh, in the summer of 2019. And we started initiating bond projects as soon as the voters approved the bond program in uh, August of 2018. So our uh, program is not in compliance with the prioritization framework. Well, it's to the, two, I guess, I, <laughs> Once court officially adopted our prioritization framework, from that point forward, absolutely we're in compliance. And I'd be glad to have Mike Post come in and make sure that we are. 
I just think that's an important point to make that uh, projects were started and the prioritization framework was adopted for whatever reason, X amount of time later. So that leads me to believe just on my simple logic that it would be hard to argue that our plan as of to date has followed the prioritization framework. That's a good point, Commissioner. Yeah. Well, all right, thank you. That's a good point. Hey, thank you all so much. Thank you for your work, and I think we're all eager to get get the solutions back. Thank you. Next is item one thirty four. Uh, Judge, I'm sorry. Um, what action is to be taken on item one thirty three? No action. No action, my thank said. You. Thank you for confirming. 134 is a professional services agreement with Atkins North America. Commissioner Garcia. Thank you, uh, Judge. Um, Russ, what's the, uh, uh, what is the preventative uh, maintenance uh, plan for this? Uh, is there, is there uh, a four year plan for this? Commissioner, this is Russ again. We we put together some time back, I believe it was uh, October timeframe of last year, some what if scenarios looking forward, and it ranged everything uh, off the top of my head from you know thirty million dollars more per year as as more bond projects get completed and get turned over to maintenance, to as much as uh, three times that depending on how proactive we wanted to get with respect to uh, operation and maintenance sides of things. And, and as a result of that conversation and, and subsequent conversations with budget management, the feedback that we got was there was not enough detail in our numbers to act in confidence about <laughs> where those additional monies would come from. And so we, we issued the RFQ that you see here that's being awarded today through Dwight's office. Uh, it was the first one of its kind to have an MWBE goal incorporated into it. But it's to do just that, commissioners, to get that extra granularity in the conversation so that we have confidence in our numbers that right now uh, we're, we're looking to make an interim update to court in July of this year. Good deal. Um, here, are my, here are my four questions. If you, you don't, uh, I don't want to keep my colleagues here any longer than necessary, sure. but if you will hold on to these four questions. The first one is the deliverables from uh, this agreement. Will this effort identify deferred maintenance needs on our infrastructure? And uh, how will this address uh, equity in terms of maintenance needs? And uh, will this effort develop best management practice for maintenance of flood control structures, such as the channel maintenance, vegetation management, detention pond management, et cetera? And um, and so with that, I do have a motion related to this uh, item, uh, Judge. And um, uh, with the execution of the agreement, I do uh, want to add that um, uh, we create a rolling four-year maintenance plan and schedule for all flood control infrastructure based on the asset condition data. Is that your motion, Commissioner? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'll second. Did you catch oh, it? I'd like sir? clarification. Yeah. Go ahead, Commissioner Cable. Are you saying that as part of this agreement of the professional services, you want them to present us with a four-year plan? That's correct. All right. Russ, you got any problem with that? I just want to make sure I'm clear on that, and that is a four-year cyclical plan that would address all of our maintenance and operation needs during that four-year time period, correct? That's, that's correct. It's a, okay. rolling, it's a rolling plan. Not, it's not limited. It's a rolling plan. Con, con, updated every year. Understood. Thank you. If uh, Jay says we can do it, I'm fine. Commissioner Garcia, could you please repeat the motion? Sure. The motion uh, reads to create a rolling four-year maintenance plan and schedule for all flood control infrastructure based on the asset condition data. That's under this contract. That's under this contract. Okay. 
Jay? Do you have an issue with this? No, no issue, ma'am. Part of the question is, is there may be a renegotiation that needs to be done um, with regard to the cost. Because they may want to charge for that added feature. Let's, uh, let's go ahead. We have, we have sufficient funds with the $200,000 initial appropriation not to exceed $500,000 that we feel we can accommodate that request uh, initially. And then if we need to add more money, that's something we can come back and make a recommendation to court maybe in July when we give our initial assessment. Sounds good. Thank you. It, I know, and this is a little bit tied to what Commissioner Ramsey was talking about earlier as far as, you know, connecting the drainage infrastructure to the actual sort of detention and um, and channels, et cetera. I know that John was doing some project around our the outfalls and making sure that we have a, so, some sort of maintenance schedule around our our outfalls. Is that going to connect with this? I just want to make sure that we're not. I like the idea, but I just I, is there anything else we need to add to make sure that these things are working in tandem? That just broadly speaking, the water is has somewhere to go to, whether it's in John's side or Ross's side. Judge, to answer your question, we are working with County Engineer's Office because you're exactly right. Those outfalls drain county infrastructure for the most part and unincorporated areas for sure. And those outfalls, if they start failing, it's obviously impacts our infrastructure and then it could potentially cause the roadways to flood. So absolutely, we are coordinating on that overall asset management program. And this won't get, this will help. Absolutely. Okay. John, did you have anything to add? No, I was just going to second that, Judge, that, that, that the outfall program is tied into this, and we are working with flood control, sharing the data, so it's hand in, hand in hand. Yeah, and I know, I mean, this is more sort of part of the IRT project you guys are going through, but but it, 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 we do need to figure out which outfalls and which drainage is inadequate to where, you know, we can call out the jurisdiction that doesn't have the adequate, second the cable, yeah, that doesn't have the adequate um, infrastructure to, to really do justice to our infrastructure and our channels and our bayous. Um, but that's a whole other thing. Okay, well, great. Uh, Commissioner Garcia made the motion. Was there a second? Commissioner Cable, okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, Commissioner Ellis, we may have to come back uh, and vote on this one once Commissioner Ellis is back. Judge, so, I, I thought I seconded. I'm for it. I thought I seconded. Oh, okay. I put I yeah. put Commissioner Cagle a second, but Commissioner Ellis is that right. in favor, so I'll be in favor as well. It's unanimous with Commissioner Garcia making the motion. Commissioner Cagle a second. Thank you. Thank you, Russ and uh, John. Thank you. Item 136, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers license. Judge Keeping... Keeping our uh, discussion going related to flood control, uh, I did talk to uh, Colonel Bell uh, many weeks back, made him aware of this particular issue there on Mady Creek. And it's currently because the creek at Mady Creek and Greenhouse has not been cleaned out in many years. 1,203 homes are flooding. So this, this project is an immediate relief, and it has to do with cleaning out ditches, if you will, not spending a bunch of money, but going out there and cleaning out ditches. I want to give Russ a shout out because he got the core to expand this to 175 feet either side of the creek, which will be a significant improvement uh, to the drainage there on uh, Mady Creek going into Attic's uh, Reservoir. So that's that's a bit of an update. It's a kind of a indication that the core is actually trying to work with us, help us where they don't have to spend money necessarily, but where they can uh, actually help with what they control in, in addicts. Uh, this is a very good project and the core and our flood control folks do get a lot of credit for that. Mr. Garcia. Thank you, Judge. Uh, uh, Russ, I wanna, uh, just check. Uh, this is um, authorizing the core to do some work. This is, does this mean who's paying for this? 
So, Commissioner, this is allowing us, the flood control district, to encroach upon federally owned land to do the vegetation management that Commissioner Ramsey had mentioned. So okay. we would be paying for it. Got you. But otherwise, it's it would be the Corps' responsibility. Right. And uh, as Commissioner Ramsey mentioned, they, they don't always maintain these channels because they feel like this is a reservoir and it's, and it's made for holding water, whereas we all know that the channels have to get the water to the reservoir. Incredible that the Corps wouldn't understand that. But um, with that being said, um, uh, how, with the conversation we've just been having about the uh, $1.4 uh, billion shortfall that we have on the flood projects, do you have the money uh, to be doing this, to be doing the federal government's job? So we have $10 million in the bond program to do de-snags and sediment removal inside the reservoir limits. Um, so to answer your question, Commissioner, yes. And are there any other similar creeks in all precincts that can benefit from this relationship? Um, I'm only aware of, of Addicts and Barker being exclusively owned by the Corps of Engineers Commissioner. So I think this is a pretty unique situation. Okay. Commissioner Ellis. So we will spend $10 million from the bond package to do this work that the federal government would normally do in one precinct. And how, how does that fit into the uh, equity. Uh, equity prioritization framework? So the bond ID that I referred to is a third quartile ID that was initiated um, in accordance to the prioritization framework, I believe, several months ago. So I'm saying this it's, this comes under the uh, equitization framework. It's, it's not much money, but I'm just making the point. Right. It's uh, right. Know, and, and it's up to, you know, you know what, you know what, if if this money's a problem, I'll pay for it out of my budget. And if it's equity we need. I'll assure you that there's 1,203 homes that are flooding because we can't figure out how to clean out a ditch. If you need me to get on a backhoe and go clean out the ditch because we got a problem, I don't even begin to understand that. And I'll bet you that there's <laughs> wonderful equity going up with those 1,203 homes just because somebody's in precinct three doesn't mean we're not addressing an equity issue. I think the question, and, and I, I would have the question as well, is there's, there's obviously a lot more need than what the bond project program was approved for. There's that. But separately, it was a, a bucket of projects. There was no order to them. A prioritization framework was created. It was created to put things into core tiles. If this project existed under the list of programs, uh, this oh. the, the the list that was approved and is being done according to the schedule, that makes sense. I think what's odd is it makes it kind of sounds like it's a new thing. And given that we're we've got a budget shortfall, does it make sense to be doing new things? So my question to Russ would be, is this a new thing or is this something that had already been outlined in the schedule and has and is going is being timed according to its place on the schedule. Yeah. Judge, this is Russ. And so these agreements are roughly good for about five years at a time. So this is not something new. This is a renewal of, a, of an agreement that we had in place with them for the last five years. The one of the big updates that we had to do to, and per Commissioner Ramsey's comment was that we went from, I believe, 50 feet either side of the center line to 175 feet either side of the center line. So it's not something new. It's just a modification of a rolling five-year license and permission with the Corps. And did it have a place in the prioritization schedule? And is it being done according to that timeline? Yes, it is. And, and to be clear, we have up to $10 million to do this work. And we do not anticipate that the vegetation management work that there be it will not cost $10 million. It'll be something much less than that. Yeah, I mean, I get I get where Commissioner Ramsey's coming from. I think that 
It, it, I'm glad to hear that it is part of the plan. I think that the point is that everywhere in the county, there are projects that we'd like to do that never made it onto the schedule. And so if we start messing with the order one way or the other, whole thing falls apart. And that's where I find Commissioner Ellis's point as well, is you're now messing with the order by saying certain projects that were supposed to get done at a certain time may not get done because the money ended up not panning out. So we got to do it in both parts. So so I'm good with it so long as it was it, it's something that was on the schedule and it's being done according to the schedule, which sounds like is the case. Yeah, Commissioner Garcia. And and to, to that end, uh, Judge, I guess I, I, I still think there's a little bit, something that is a little bit off and that is that uh, we're taking bond money, flood bond money, Harvey bond money to maintain a federal asset, um, the, the the core has a budget for that, and um, but then the taxpayers also are expecting that ten million, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in part to be. I mean that I, I think that ten million is supposed to be for the new maintenance projects because that's part of the motion I asked for earlier was a was a maintenance uh, plan for how we're going uh, forward and we've been asking this question that as the projects get completed what's the maintenance schedule on those and so are we giving the federal government 10 million dollars of maintenance dollars that are to go to new flood bond created projects that are now going to require maintenance on our dough um it is it or are we or did we always plan to use this for a federal asset you know, commissioner it was specifically included in the bond program and this is in response to some of the community engagement meetings we had leading up to the bond program election <laughs> that the, the expectation was that some work be done inside of the reservoir limits the Corps has historically not done any type of maintenance on the upstream portions of the reservoirs. Their main focus and their O&M budget that they have is to maintain the integrity of the dams themselves. In other words, the earthen embankments that, that, that basically create both Attics and Barker reservoirs. So they're, the maintenance funds that they get are really to just make sure that the structural integrity remains in place at the dams. We It is incumbent upon us as the local federal non-federal sponsor to do these types of what they would consider ancillary type work to get water, local water inside of their federal facility. Gotcha. I, I'm willing to trust, but I'm going to verify. So uh, I'll support this item, but I'd like to see uh, that language and that uh, this was included. So that way uh, Commissioner Ramsey doesn't have to get on his backhoe, uh, but, uh, but I'm just going to trust, uh, but verify well, you, uh, you know, you know, I don't mind getting on a backhoe because I've I've been there before, and and hey, here's, hey, the, then, here's, then, here's then, the then you here's can the take deal. the ten million dollars. Uh, yeah, well, Go get and on I'm, the backhoe. I'm, <laughs> I'm telling you, it, it it there has been some effort to get to this point, and I really thought that we could get to the point that where we can get one thousand. 203 homes from flooding and this isn't the uh, 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 River Oaks of Precinct 3. These are good hard-working families that have been flooded Tax Day, Memorial Day, Harvey, you name it, they've been flooded. And, and the Corps, if you've known anything about working with the Corps, they they've got their own way of looking at things and and again in if if you the conversations i had with colonel vale and then later with general spellman see general spellman looked at colonel vale and he says general we're going to have to change our mission and of course being the uh guy in the room that has the questions i raised my hand what's what's the mission we're going to have to change well, General uh, Spellman explained, well, Commissioner, we built these Attics and Barker reservoirs back in the 30s and 40s 
to protect the downstream property owners. They were not built with any thought, any indication of the upstream property owners. So there was effort put forth on behalf of Harris County and citizens, and, and yes, they're in Precinct 3, uh, to try to get them to think, you know, there's some upstream property owners flooding. So they agreed with me that they could figure out how to de-snag, which was a part of our plan uh, and in the budget, what we voted on. But uh, again, I, th I thought this would be something we'd bring to court and celebrate. I didn't realize that uh, 1,203 homes flooding in Precinct 3, that's no big deal. It is a big I, deal. I'm I proud we're able to clean it up. I don't think anyone's saying that, Commissioner, but I'll just say if, because everybody, every member of court can bring something like that of a project that, that well, this one was part of it, but a project that wasn't part of it and it's an issue. And I, the concern certainly for me is just, we, we don't have room to add new things. There's no, we need to make sure that what was promised gets done as it was promised. But there are plenty of neighborhoods and, and thousands of homes and, and hardworking people every, in every corner of the county that are not getting what they need under the funds that were passed because it turns out we need a whole lot more than two and a half billion. All I did was get it expedited. It was on the plan. All I did was get it expedited. And if that's a problem, I guess that's just going to have to be a problem. Judge, yeah. I don't want to put uh, the commission out there on the back hole, although send me a picture when you're on it again. Uh, Russ, I'm curious, when we did the uh, other uh, project out uh, in the Jason County from Commissioner Tego, were those bond funds, or how do we pay for that? Are you, just to confirm, Commissioner, are you talking about the, the Woodridge Village property? Yes, sir. Yes, those yeah. were bond funds. And, and so, Commissioner Ramsey, only when I was bringing the issue up, we could all give a horror story. I could give you the number of homes along greens and halls of sands. With me, it really is not tied to a precinct, but these kind of one-off projects, and I was wondering, was this one of those? Clearly, that other project in another county was one. It wasn't a lot of money, but my point is, what do we go say to those folks? I know you weren't here. But I remember those discussions about halls and greens. So I don't want to belabor the point. And, and what I said in the last meeting was, we're going to do what we committed to do in 2018. That's that's a fact. That's yeah. bottom line. We're going to do what we said we were going to do. Because because as we all agree, we could never have another bond issue in Harris County if we don't deliver on what we promised in 2018. And I'm going to work with you to hold us to that. But here's the reality. You got to have the money. You know, it's like it, everybody, everybody believes in the dream. <laughs> but to keep it from becoming a nightmare, you got to pay for it. Thank you. We need a motion to approve this item. I make a motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And uh, Judge, just to clarify, it's going to be, it was approved as presented. Correct. Thank you. Commissioner Garcia? I'm okay with it. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Item 150, excuse me, item 138, interlocal agreement for a recreational area. Go ahead, Commissioner Garcia. Um. A similar question is um, who's who's paying for this? Is it um, uh, Jack? Is this your precinct, or is or is the flood control district paying for this? This is flood control property. What we're going to do on this area is right now we have the hundred acre wood. I think the judge has been out on the hundred acre wood, which is a partnership that we've entered into with a number of our local conservation groups, and we have leased. Uh, some property to put in the parking and staging area to enter into our trail system. Um, that lease is going to be up and we can't put parking and whatnot on the hundred acre wood itself because of the conservation easements that are there. This is property that flood control owns. That's right next door to the hundred acre wood 
where we're going to use that as a place where folks can park their cars so that they can engage in getting on the trail system. Okay. Thank you. I think you do this all the time yourself with regard to uh, connecting into flood control property for your trails. Well, just I, I, I'm asking the question because uh, there is, I do have an interlocal with the flood control uh, district on long hauls, and uh, it's a trail that has been, uh, it's just old and and it's been damaged. But I was told that Although, I got to pay, I gotta pay, that I got to pay yeah. for it. Even yeah, though I think the, parking lot, all the, the improvements my parks budget is paying for. Okay. Right. Um, we're just using the uh, the flood control property. Okay. Thank you. Next is item one fifty two. I would I would move on one thirty eight, Judge. I'd move the adoption of the interlocal agreement. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Clarification, I'm sorry, as presented. As presented. Thank Commissioner you. Ellis? Oh, I'm muted. Aye. I'm in favor. Motion carries unanimously. Item 152, four tracks for Little Cypress Creek. This was this was something I pulled. Uh, that I think the, this is an example of of detention fees uh, collected over a period of time. Now we're actually starting to build regional attention rather than those frog ponds uh, that, that don't work. So this that was simply an example of how money is collected over time and it ends up end up doing the project. Just wanted to give that as an example, good example of what happens over a 10 year period when you collect funds and you actually do a project. Is there a motion? No, that would just just the approval of it. Okay. Look, we can vote on all of these together the ones we haven't voted on so that we don't have to vote. Okay, on that's fine. Them. Let's do that. Why don't we just do that? Right. Item 172 is delinquent property taxes. I know we wanted to discuss that in executive session, correct, Jay? Uh, that wasn't my request, uh, Judge. That was, I think, Dave Barry's. Oh, okay. Yes, that, that would be our our preference given that it's a contract negotiation. Great. Well, I'll mark that for, for executive session. 173, payments of annual membership dues. Judge, uh, yeah. on this one, uh, I would like to hold the uh, payment of fees for HGAC. I, I think it's appropriate for us to have uh, someone in county government to do a uh, a discussion, and I don't think this item is broad enough for me to, to do that, but to at least explore how we can reconsider our relationship um, to maybe have uh, larger representation for our county. Uh, our population is 67% of the total region, and we have two of the 36 voting members. I think Harris County deserves greater uh, transparency and influence in HGAC decision making and spending based on the population size. I asked the, the court analyst office to do some research on the pros and the cons. Uh, also with the Transportation Council, uh, we're asking them to look at that as well. And I'm not saying that I want us to pull out, but I do think there ought to be greater equity. Uh, in her report, she did look at uh, comparable entities around the state. And uh, our level of uh, participation on the board is considerably lower than it is at many others around the state. Uh, Dallas County makes up about 36% of their COG population, and they have about 5.5% uh, representation on the board. That's one out of 17. Travis County, 55%, they have 8%, two out of 25 representation on the board. Bear County makes up 76%. They have 11% representation, three out of 27. El Paso makes up 96%. They have 14.2%, three out of 21 uh, on, the, on the board. Uh, the fee is not that much for us. Uh, there's some great programs that HGAC does. 
But I think when this model was put together, I think in 1965, and when the lines were uh, drawn, drawn, it was under Governor Conley. A few years after that, there is a role with the TPC in particular that the federal government plays. But when we talk so much about uh, equity, I think this is the place. I think there's need for a lot more transparency as well. So if there's no, I don't think there's a rush. Uh, Mr. Barry, you might comment on that for us to pay, but I'd like to postpone paying that HGAC membership dues. And then at the next court, with some input from our colleagues, I'll figure out who, what entity. I don't think I can do it under this item, um, uh, Mr. Ayer. Maybe the legal department or somebody to just go, or maybe judge you to go negotiate how we can have more influence. I, I have always believed in the concept of one person, one vote. Uh, maybe it's just a genetic thing with, with me, knowing that when this country was, was founded, uh, great thinkers uh, left uh, a certain people out of the equation, not not just me. Uh, they left others out as well. You, you had to be free, white, and a property owner to vote. And a lot of people didn't own property, figured that was okay. Uh, then you had to be a, a male to be able uh, to vote. Uh, but we, we've progressed from that point now. And I, I do think it, it, it merits looking around the country to see if there's greater participation and balance. Uh, and so I'd like to hold the age gap point of this. So the motion would be to, to pass the item as presented, but hold the fees for HGAC. Yes, ma'am. Is there a second? I'll second it if no one else. Commissioner Garcia, you. did you want to second Garcia, that? Okay. All right. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Comments? Any opposed? Opposed. No. Motion carries three to two. Item 174 approval of authorized budget appropriations to the flood control district. So, oh, we can wait until long. Uh, you pull it. Uh, you, yeah. you, you pull the cactus. Commissioner Cagle. Hang on just a second. Yes, I pulled the item. Um, the. Let me get back to you on that. I had a reason for it, but I think that that item, that reason may have been solved in our other discussion. Judge, can we go past that and I'll bring it back in a minute? Yes, yeah. sounds good. Next is the, the legislative agenda. Judge, if Ender, if he's back, I know he's working. Oh, Judge, hard. Judge, I'm, I'm sorry, I remember now. Okay. A small part of this was a transfer to Precinct 1 of $495,000 out of pick fund for the Houston Bank Initiative. And I think that we had tried to make an application for that and we were said that we couldn't do it. And I'm, I'm fine with it if it's a me too and we all get to do it. But I don't think it's okay for just one of us to get to do it. I think it's for the county as a whole, Commissioner. If, if, you, if you will accept and I'm paying for it, right? Yeah, you're yeah. paying for it. Yeah, but you're, actually, you you're, you're getting a you're getting a pick fund while you're waiting for your reimbursement. You're getting your funds now. And uh, and what I'm is, all uh, I'm saying is, 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 if, is, if, is Shane available, Commissioner? That might clear it up for us. I think I'm paying for it for the entire county. So if Shane if Shane is on the line, let him jump in. If he's not, we'll come back to it. But he's not from my but I will reach him. I'm sorry, I was talking over you. I'm sorry, I'm Commissioner. Uh, he's not on the line, but I'll, I'll reach him. Okay. And I'll Cactus, you if you don't but mind, we go to the item and come back. Yeah, we can go later. My issue was, let's. I'm okay with it if we all get to have the same rule. Well, you do, but I don't. I won't ask you to trust me. Just let him explain it when we catch him. All right. Is that okay? Okay. Okay, we'll come back when when Shane is on. 
Let, uh, this, do folks have anything on the legislative agenda anymore? I do, Judge. If Ender is available, are you on the line, Ender? So maybe uh, we'll come uh, back. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I yeah. Ender, yes. I just wanted to make sure that in our legislative package, the position that we have taken, do, I, I know it gives us the ability, you the ability to oppose the various voter suppression bills that are working their way through the legislature. That's correct. Right. Yes, sir. That's yes, HB6 and SB7. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Hey, now, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get Judy to call you, okay? Just answer. So, all right. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll send it. Yeah. So, oh, I'm so sorry. No. That's all right. I'm, I'm sorry. We've, we've given you a lot to do in this late. Uh, Ender, on the federal level, do you have the authority to be in support of the John Lewis Voting Rights Act on behalf of the county? Well, I just want to make sure our legislative team, you and your team, are able to be supportive of that on behalf of this county. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, the, the platform would would cover that, um, but of course, if the court wants to to specify um, that that. No, if, if it's covered, if you can do it, I just want to make sure that it is clear that you know that. I mean, I, and I plan to go up and do some work on it as well, but I just want to make sure that that is part of uh, the county's platform as you, it's the way I understood it. I want to make sure that's the way you understood it. Yes, sir. I, I do understand that. Um, it's generally covered under the platform and specifically con covered under uh, voter access. And, I, and the last, last, the last one, I know the county is in support of Medicaid expansion, so we can draw down those billions of dollars under the Affordable Care Act I know there is a compromise, limited compromise, uh, that has some bipartisan support. Is it clear to you we are for that bill as well? Uh, yes, sir. And and again, the combination right. Thank of, you. of the- yes, You sir. got it. Yes, That's sir. all. It's Thank late. You. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioners and Judge. Item 187, an interlocal agreement with the city of Seabrook, Commissioner Garcia. Um, I'm sorry, Thank Judge, you. real quick, um, for that 175, is there going to be an action? No action. Thank you. Thank Shane you, Judge. Line <laughs> when you're ready. Okay, well, uh, Commissioner Garcia, would you like to do your item, and then we'll come back? Yeah, th this will be just be very, very brief. Again, I just want to thank <clears throat> Dr. Babin, my staff, um, and the, uh, the American Chem uh, Chemistry Council. They provide the grant. It's making this uh, possible, this particular item possible, to have uh, more capacity to check the air quality around the precinct. And I uh, just want to thank Mayor uh, Kapolsky for his support in uh, getting this established at Friendship Park. That was it. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Uh, Shane, there was a question for you on um, item 174. And Judge, if I might, Shane, I think I can help you. It might make it quicker. Precinct yeah. 1 initially did the first agreement with the Houston Food Bank, and we were paying for it with Precinct 1 money. And then once we found out it was reimbursable and the rest of the county wanted to do it, you opted to continue to have us pay for it from Precinct 1 to feed people in the entire county. But just running through our contract since we'd established one, and so we're being reimbursed because we put the money up to pay for the food bank to feed all of our citizens throughout Harris County. Is that correct? Yeah, yes, sir. And we did move the funding over to the contingency fund after a certain time, and that's where it's being paid from right now. But Precinct 1 is, has the PO and the contract and all that and is monitoring and managing it. Yes, sir. So, Cactus, I think the concern was, was I just getting reimbursed for, for my precinct? We get reimbursed because... It was just easier to not have to go through the procurement process of another contract. But so we just happen to be, I guess, the fiduciary for all of us. Where part of my concern also goes to is, is that in addition to the food bank in Precinct 4, we had other nonprofits that we were funding uh, that should be reimbursable as well. I know that Precinct 2 had a number of nonprofits in addition to the food bank that they were also working through. I'm presuming Precinct 3 did as well. And what I'm, what I'm asking is, is that if we are going to be 
upfront reimbursing from the PIC fund on funds that we are all going to get reimbursed in later on, um, I, I think it's great that, that you're getting reimbursed for all of us right now. But I also think that some of those other nonprofits that we were working through, that that same rule should apply. It, does that make sense? Yes, to me, uh, uh, Commissioner. Yes. Yes. Well, what what I don't know is I don't know if we had any as well. I think this contract was just with the food bank. You got yeah, me? This this so one is just the food bank, but we had the food bank and we had a number of other nonprofits that we were dealing with. I know that Precinct Two had the food bank and some other nonprofits. Um, and all I just want to make sure is is that. Um, I'll that leave that to Shane. It, I don't know. I just want to leave it. Yeah, I don't know if we did others. I just thought this one's for the food bank. I don't think we were reimbursing any other not-for-profits that we worked with out of this money. I know that we're um, out some funds that we were authorized to give, and we're now waiting for the reimbursement to come in on the backside. And um, and so where my my I, I like what you're doing, I just want to be able to do it too. Um, to where we let budget wait for being reimbursed as opposed to the precincts waiting to be reimbursed. Um, you have this one contract with the food bank, and you may have expenditures out of the food bank that a portion of that is for precinct four, and I thank you for doing that. I didn't realize you were, you were, you were uh, feeding some of our precinct four folks and other folks as well. To be honest, we weren't doing it. We were just the fiduciary for the food bank to do it. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I'll take that compliment back. Um, I'm teasing with you at 820 in the afternoon. Uh, You're I not getting testy, are you? Is it no, time for you to get some grapes? I had my, I had, I had my salted uh, cashews just a little while ago, so I'm getting salty. Uh, but the, uh, all I'm asking for is, is that if, if this is a program and I, and, and I think it's a good program, to where instead of waiting for your reimbursement on the back end, you're getting reimbursed on the front end. I'd like to get reimbursed on the front end on the nonprofits that we utilized during this process as well. Can, can Dave or Shane clarify this one way or the other so we can move on? Uh, yeah. Is, is David on the line or um, uh, yeah. if not, I mean, yeah. yeah. Um, go ahead. So David, I mean, we can, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think um, in in this particular arrangement, the Houston Food Bank, I think, was at least started before my arrival. But uh, when precincts have asked us, can we be reimbursed on the front end with PIC funds for money that we will be reimbursed for FEMA, we have asked that they carry that cost, and we tried to do that consistently. And the reason is simple, just because the county is building up a big uh, reimbursable for FEMA, and if the precincts are able to uh, where the timing of that, um, which I think, you know, so far they have been, you know, it's helpful to the finances of the county just to reduce the uh, uh, strain on the pick in terms of advanced funding things that will be reimbursed to FEMA. So I gather this is a little different given that it was one precinct during expenditures on behalf of sort of the whole county. I think that's maybe the distinction here. Um, Shane, let me know if you have anything to add to that. Well, I can, uh, I can add to this. That, that is the Shane, I was going to say that is the distinction because we gave money to uh, the women's shelter, as an example. And we hope we can get reimbursed for it. But that was a decision we made. And if we don't mm -hmm. get reimbursed, we did it anyway. And we also gave money to uh, Bread of Life, uh, Pastor Rudy Rasmus's church, $100,000. $100, and we would like to get reimbursed for that, but it wouldn't fit under this item. We did not go do that through the food bank, uh, Commissioner Tago. So I, I'm just suggesting if the court wants to do that, it would be a separate item. But this was because we all, it was, it might have been you who made the motion of, of maybe Commissioner uh, Garcia when the food bank item came up to say, let's do it countywide. And then I was asked, well, instead of going through all of this to go do another contract, and people need the food, can we just, you, your contract serve as the model and do it all. You put the money out, we will reimburse you. So I don't want to go get my 
I don't want to get on the back of my shovel and my backhoe, but I'll be pretty damn mad if I paid the 50 folks in your precinct and now y'all trying to hold up the money. Well, I'll help you with that backhoe. <laughs> I'll give you a picture. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not all that good with the backhoe, and I recently learned that I'm not all that good with the front-end loader. I just busted the tie arm on my front-end loader tractor, but I am real good with the skid steer. Um, but, but, but pushing that off to the side, um, maybe a good way to do it is, is instead of having the transfer coming from, um, the pick fund that the funds that were spent on behalf of precinct four through there, that we reimburse you directly, that each of us reimburse you for what you spent for our precincts. Well, I just like to get it quick. So if you don't mind, I prefer to move this item. You might vote against it, but I want to move it. Well, I, you know, and, I and, and, I, may, and I may vote for, for it, but would you just give? May I ask you, in the in in the name of justice and some of the other uh, invocations out there, that if I vote for this, and I bring a reasonable request to you that we get reimbursed for some of the other things that we've done, that you'll give me the same treatment that we're giving you. Well, I, I do want to be honest with you. You're not doing me a favor. You're fulfilling a commitment that you all asked for to feed folks through the food bank. And I suspect that the items that I funded and the court might decide to apply to let me get reimbursed, or you may not. You got me? So I just, I wouldn't tie the two, to be honest with you. But I did this in good faith. I'm asking you, will you treat me fair? I always have. You just didn't know it. There are a number of times when I've really not felt it at all. Oh, I feel so bad for you. Let's hurry up, it's pretty clear that the, it's a it's a unique item and and we've got plenty to go through is there a motion for it so move commissioner cable will you second it? second i was gonna second it <coughs> uh, i was waiting for him i'll treat you fair cactus Se second i ain't gonna get a treat you fair love you go ahead and vote <laughs> you're not going to treat me fair then i'll vote no uh, yes um okay commissioner but, but i could give you yes if you'll say you treat me fair that's all i ask can we move on guys all right it is I, a i'm put in favor so let's just keep this one of a, a, a 4-1 and the motion carries as presented my <clears throat> thank you judge we went over 187. The next is item 195, down payment assistance. It says precincts two and three had questions on this one. Yes. So maybe I'll just walk through it. Uh, Judge, um, we asked the community services department. Oh, I'm, you asking me or you asking the department? Well, I've got a note. This is for item 195. 95. The note here says I'll that the department do it. Yeah. two and three had, but you know, whoever. Okay. Yeah. So, Dr. Holloway. Holloway. Yeah. Okay. Hello? Yes, go ahead, Dr. Holloway. Good evening, Judge Commissioners. Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to bring this guidebook back to you. Um, as you can recall, we did present this to you at, at an earlier court, and due to some public comment that we received, we did we were asked to kind of bring it back and engage in conversations with stakeholders, really to explain what the purposes of the guidebook. Uh, it's not unusual for us to present a revised guidebook. This is the third one we've done in three years. And oftentimes it's because our funding source has some different regulations that we need to comply with. And in order to make sure that our partners in this program are aware of that, we update the guidebook. But this guidebook is really the beginning This iteration enhancement program for our down payment assistance program. We're really looking at um, improving the way that we're operating, making sure that we are providing opportunities for more people, bringing more lenders to participate in this program, as well as realtors. And it, it, with that particular approach, we hope that we'll have more homeowners that will be um, successful with this program. 
Our program is a bit different than other programs. We do utilize a funding source that requires that our participants make no more than 80% median income um, in comparison to others. So we do need to have a focused attention on how we're going to market this program to that select clientele, which also means that the way we design this program and the guidebook really needs to be very clear. It has to be clear to the client, the participant, the potential homeowner, the realtor, and the lender. And the iteration that we put before you today is an opportunity for us to provide the clarity that some of the previous versions did not have. And we also addressed some concerns. Um, some were brought to us by our partners. We started this, this engagement almost a year ago, about May of, of last year. We started with a survey of our current participants, again, the array of lenders, realtors, and title companies that work with this program to find out what their experience was, what their, their concerns were. And we used that as a basis to develop the revised guidebook and brought it back to stakeholders in various different times, some in a public forum as required by our funder, but also in other intimate conversations with our diverse group and many who have been participants of this program for quite some time to share with them some of the changes that we were making, some of the clarity they were, we were providing, and also some of the concerns that they have presented and how we were resolving them. And even in our last conversation with a smaller group of the members of our membership of the Houston Area Realtors Association with some of our lenders to our stakeholder group, we continue to make some modifications that were within our purview. Many other modifications that were requested, we really cannot make because our funding source HUD requires us to be in compliance with um, certain regs. So um, I'll just give you an example of a couple that we have made since the last time that we presented this to you all for consideration. We had a provision in the guidebook that prohibited potential homeowners from selecting a home that was built before 1978. And the rationale behind that was really to ensure that there wasn't a potential for a homeowner to enter into a property purchase that may have had contaminated, uh, was contaminated by lead and had been abated. So we've since relaxed that rule and, and are allowing homeowners to bring forth that opportunity. However, based on HUD guidelines and criteria, we do have to ensure that the home is not have lead-based paint or is free from lead-based paint and whether it's um, a function of the paint never being in that property or it had been abated. And that will, will have to be something that is provided through evidence of a third party at the expense of either the seller or the buyer because HUD funds can be utilized for that type of activity. But it does open the market up a bit more for homeowners to be able to select pre-1978 homes in addition to other homes as well. Another change that we made in conversation with our stakeholders was just providing clarity on the employment requirement. We do have to have evidence of two years of continuous employment, but we've changed the narrative or the language a bit to allow for um, evidence of employment in a particular sector rather than in the, with the same employer, which would have been in previous iterations. And this, again, recognizes that there can potentially be changes in employment from an employer, but not necessarily in the industry. We just need to ensure that there's continuous employment. And then finally, what we really have tried to do is make sure that what we are receiving from our lenders is a complete package that we can process. And we are looking to process applications up to 35 days receiving those files. So that's just some of the conversations that we've had that produced some changes to our guidebook. But this is really the beginning of this service enhancement process that I've mentioned. It's at the very infancy because after the guidebook, we are looking at engaging in a variety of different training sessions with our partners, doing a whole marketing campaign to bring this program to the far reaches of the county to ensure that more people are aware of it and know that they can participate in it if they meet our criteria. So I will leave it with that and I'm open to any questions that you might have. Commissioner Garcia. Thank you, Judge. Uh, thank you, Dr. Holloway, uh, for your presentation. And um, I just wanna thank you for, uh, for your work and just 
uh, I've, I've seen the data that you sent over, um, but I would uh, just still want to challenge uh, you to really uh, continue to find uh, innovation that will get Harris County to far outperform everybody else. This is, uh, these, these federal programs are always difficult to maneuver, but uh, there's gotta be something that we have not yet explored. Uh, and I know that uh, staff gets to know these programs because they do them over and over, um, but it also uh, has the potential of creating the, well, this is the way it's always done kind of thing. And so I just want to continue to challenge you uh, respectfully that uh, to, to, to look for ways to just uh, further accelerate this. As, as I mentioned, you know, there's, there's a, a big challenge that we have out there. Gentrification is, is uh, creeping up on so many so fast. And so this program at the pace that it's going is totally unacceptable. That's not on you, uh, but I just think that there is a process that we have not yet identified that uh, could make things a lot better for, for, for many. So I would just ask you to please continue to look for ways to uh, improve this and just make us uh, uh, an example for others across the country. But um, uh, the numbers that I saw were, were good, but uh, I just, it, it just gnaws at me that, that we cannot uh, do more. Thank you. Commissioner Ramsey. Dr. Holloway, thank you for your efforts. I like to see uh, metrics like lowering from 45 to 35 days. That's good. That's progress. Uh, having talked to a lot of people in the marketplace that would like to use this as a down payment, sometimes it's difficult to work through uh, the, the, the requirements to make that happen. And of course, we're in a market right now that's very competitive. So when homeowners come to uh, and try to decide how they're going to get their financing and their funding, homes don't stay on the market that long. So we're there is that there is that tension. I think Commissioner Garcia referred to tension between what's happening in the marketplace and what this program is, and anything we can do to help them, particularly folks that are using this to get their down payment, uh, so that they can get into a home. Try and figure out ways to keep the home. Uh, uh, available for 26 days. Some days that's a bit of a bit of a struggle. Anything we can do to help you with the locals? We're getting a lot of phone calls from folks that would like to use the program. It's just they're just not they're, they're, These homes are are going faster than what this program can keep up with at this point. So any ideas? We'll con we'll continue to help you work through those, but use us when you can. Thank you, Commissioner Garcia and Commissioner Ramsey. And most definitely, this is an opportunity for us to continue to re to evaluate this program as we're making these modifications. And we're charging staff to continue to identify what the metrics are that we should meet and how we can exceed them and what are the mechanisms that we can put in place. So starting with this revised guidebook is giving us a different pathway, if you will, to look at how this program can match, match other efforts that we're making in terms of trying to increase options for people to become homeowners with the tightening of the market, bringing in other opportunities to increase homeownership among populations that may not necessarily consider them. So it's this is really being, beginning to be more of a multifaceted approach to the increase of homeownership or opportunity that we look to do with CSD. So it's not something that we're operating in isolation, just a home down payment assistance program. It's really an effort to increase homeownership across our county. And that also includes the supply side. And it also includes increasing the pipeline. So it's the, the pre home buyer, the person who doesn't even consider themselves a viable candidate for it and how we're actually bringing this opportunity to them and prepping them to enter into this as we're also looking at the markets. So by all means, once we um, are able to get the guidebook out and start this service and plan enhancement plan and we'll bring our marketing efforts in a much more aggressive and user-friendly way, we look forward to bringing back to you just an update on where we're at, where we're at with this particular version of the guidebook and the inroads that we've made. 
Thank you, Dr. Holloway. Thank you. So this one would just be as presented. Uh, and the next one is Dr. Holloway as well, item 196. Thank you again. Commissioner, this is in response. I'm sorry. Commissioner, would you do you have a question? We want to hear from Dr. Holloway first. Go ahead, Dr. Holloway. Yeah, it'll go forward, Judge. Thank you. Um, and this is in response to your request to put together a plan of action that can help identify two ways in which CSD can be involved in recovery efforts in a bit more of a, a unique way than we currently do. And also recognizing that what we're responding to is a very different type of event than what we um, typically experience <laughs> in Harris County and how we would want to look at this um, in that unique lens as well. So we were charged with looking at how we can increase the number of applicants to um, FEMA to receive assistance for repairs that were associated with Winter Storm Uri, and then also looking at ways in which we can increase um, access to funding for those who have home repairs that are needed that may be um, not necessarily aligned with current funding opportunities. So we took those charges and we brought those those charges to different groups that we spoke with and helped to inform what we presented. And that's internally with our staff and across the entire organization, but also with other departments in the county. And then our stakeholder groups that are actually involved in recovery efforts. And with that, we landed on three different activities that we thought would help us put in our best effort to get the word out to residents in the county on what this opportunity to receive assistance can be. First, it was really enhancing our outreach and engagement efforts. We were asked by um, precincts to provide training in FEMA so that there can be the opportunity to stand up local disaster assistance center, kind of an informal term for um, precinct staff to utilize their assets in the community and provide access to either technical assistance and or access to technology for residents who needed to complete the application. As many know, the FEMA application this time around was solely done online or via phone call, but it is a pretty um, challenging application to complete. So the technical assistance that was provided was through a training that my staff um, delivered and about 200 of our peers participated in then and participated as in those centers that would st were stood up. What we're proposing is to continue the outreach effort to get people into those centers and or into mobile units um, to complete these applications. We know the deadline is quickly approaching. If we can get more in the queue for um, consideration that we know there's more people who could potentially receive FEMA funding. So we're, we looked at not only continuing to provide training for um, disaster assistance staff at the precincts, but also really getting into a grassroots oriented approach to this and the canvassing piece. And we were a little hesitant and we were still in the pandemic, but I felt that we, we can still do this and safely be able to um, inform people of how FEMA applications are gonna be delivered or accessed at this particular time. And then also looking at social media in a much more strategic way and using metrics to help us identify how we should be able to reach the individuals that we know have experienced significant damage. And this is really being informed by all of the data that different groups have been able to collect through their respective surveys that we've been provided access to that will be part of that target uh, approach. We also know, though, that the FEMA data that has been available really recognizes that only about 12% of, of individuals are initially deemed eligible for assistance. But there is the appeal process, and we want to make sure that we're part of that process to assist people to access the necessary information so that they can engage in that second go round to try to see if they can get assistance. And then finally, if they are unsuccessful with FEMA to ensure that they can have access and know how to access different resources that can assist them in this effort. And that's the, the first piece. The second piece that um, we brought that was different from the charge, but we, we recognize that 
if we're going to enter into communities and identify some of the challenges they've experienced with this particular event, it's also an opportunity for us to identify a, a variety of different unmet needs through a resiliency assessment. This will continue to inform not only the work that CSB does, but we would definitely share that data with our internal stakeholders as well as our external stakeholders to better help us plan more effectively for resiliency activity. We talk about how we expect another event, um, whether it's a natural disaster or something um, to that effect that will have a disparate impact on many people. We wanna be able to better prepare people to withstand some of those challenges and not be so devastatingly impacted. But that requires us to use the data to inform our strategies. And that's the, the resiliency assessment. And then finally, as far as the the damage um, and repair program that was concerned, uh, that was also asked of us. We recognize that there's a variety of ways in which we can assist. We wanna make sure that what we present to you works in concert with what all is already being presented through other stakeholders. But we also know that there's a gap. Even FEMA has identified an unmet need gap, which is about 3,200 households. So what we're asking is a bit more time to gather additional data to work with our stakeholders and to bring back to two different programs. One that's going to complement what's already being provided in terms of emergency repair assistance and meet the unmet needs that are being revealed. And then the other is to provide some sort of assistance for our small landlords. Um, as many who spoke at public comment today, really demonstrated that the landlords ne don't necessarily have the, the financial capabilities of dealing with many units that have fallen into disrepair as a result of the storm, even after ha having homeowners or, or property insurance. But we know that they're providing shelter for many of our low to low to moderate income individuals. So this is not only an effort to help us small businesses, it's also an effort for us to, in the long term, preserve affordable housing, affordable rent housing in particular. But there's more information that we want to gather and, and analyze and work with our partners to put forth to you for consideration a much more robust program that will provide them with an access to funds for emergency critical repairs, but also maybe something long-term to deal with maybe longer-term deferred maintenance issues. So those are the three recommendations that we put forth this proposal and effort for us to really develop a scaffolding, if you will, of how CSD can be activated in concert with our peers and at the county when we are faced with foreseen or unforeseen event that really has an impact on many of our marginalized communities. So I will leave that Thanks, and Dr. Some respond to questions. Uh, Commissioner Garcia, followed by Commissioner Cagle and Commissioner Ellis. Thank you, Judge. Um, again, uh, Dr. Holloway, thank you for your work on this, and thank you for the help of your staff uh, when we were standing up those uh, those assistance centers in Precinct 2. Um, I do want to uh, make sure that we are uh, doing all we can to accelerate this. Uh, my anxiety is... Uh, really based upon what we just talked about uh, uh, with flood control district that we're in year four of Harvey and um, and we still have uh, very little to show for it. And so I want to make sure that uh, that we are again working to do all that we can to accelerate this program as quickly as possible. So I'd like to propose a motion that would read uh, for uh, the Community Services Department to provide a timeline and details of implementation. Uh, consider expanding outreach focus from uh, FEMA centers uh, to, uh, well, I, here I've got to precinct two support programs, but I would say to all precinct uh, who have support programs, emergency repair and small property to get repairs done timely. Uh, this item should consider the language and technology deficiencies uh, that uh, that precincts may have uh, in uh, in areas or throughout their uh, well that commissioners may have throughout their precincts. Uh, again, this is just to make sure that that um, we're focused on on speed and and uh, and completion and full inclusion of all uh, that are in the community. 
um, because as we know, uh, and we've learned through this pandemic, not everybody has the internet, not everybody has computers. And so I wanna make sure that we're not leaving anybody behind. So that would be the motion that I propose. Uh, if anybody has any questions on that. Judge. I have two quick things. One is, is on the motion. I don't know if we necessarily need to have commissioner a motion motion. I think you can just instruct Dr. Holloway to put that in her plan and we're approving her plan today. My, my second comment was going to be along the lines of, um, one of the geniuses over on this table had noted that our libraries are an integral part of this plan. And I don't really need to ask a question of Dr. Holloway, but I just want her to coordinate closely with the judge's office and with our librarian uh, to make sure that when she's ready to, to launch, that she needs to be on the timeline of the judge with regard to orange uh, and that there may be a delay in some of the execution of her plan uh, if she's going to want to use the libraries. I think the libraries are a perfect place for a lot of her plan. I'm not trying to change that. It's just she needs to coordinate with the judge's office to use that. Yeah, and I think I don't think it should be a problem to have a, a sort of a disaster re, uh, resource type thing. People are in and out, Commissioner, and we have established some of them uh, post winter storm, but yes. Uh, Commissioner Ellis. Um, Judge, I just wanted to compliment uh, Dr. Holloway. Uh, a good job. I know all our staff had uh, input into the item that went on the agenda, asking you to come back with something. You did it creatively and uh, very quickly, so I appreciate it. Commissioner Garcia, did you need a second? Um, it, it, I will take, um, uh, I, you know, I'm just, I'm just very uh, hyper-focused on moving as quick as possible, so I would like a motion, but I will, um, I'll defer and, and, and like to hear from Dr. Holloway if she's got any concerns with what I'm asking. Um, no, Commissioner, I do not. We, we've held a couple of things at bay until we knew that this was going to be approved. So particularly with the outreach engagement, we, we can activate that relatively quickly. We will want to come back to you with the two housing programs, though, because that's where we'll be fleshing it out. We do have some drafts that have been developed. So we will look to finalize that and put a budget together for that for consideration. So as far as um, the two, the three recommendations that we have provided, we should be able to activate the first two and we can give you a timeline and give the, the four a timeline because we will definitely need to engage your staff to be able to identify the spaces that we would like to activate, uh, particularly for our canvassing. We do have zip code data that we want to target based on what we've received from our stakeholders as areas that have received significant damage, but not necessarily submitting applications to FEMA. But also, if we're looking at mobile sites, we want to identify populations that we know that may have experiences some damage and neighbors who might not have actually activated the site and bring some mobile units to them. So uh, I think we would be able to send something to you relatively quickly on those two fronts. And then the housing piece would come before the court right. for approval. Got you. With that, Dr. Holloway, uh, Commissioner Ellis, I'll, I'll withdraw my motion. So this is approval as presented, Maricela. And Dr. Holloway, thank you. And thank you for running this down with my team today. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. <clears throat> Item 197. I can't remember who asked to discuss that, that one. That would be me, uh, Judge. And uh, I'll be very brief. I'm just excited about, uh, you know, Commissioner Ellis has inspired me to look for opportunities to do murals. In the, in the community and I, I just really want to applaud the library, uh, the library system for their support of this mural outside the Alding uh, branch. But there's a few others that are happening as a result of it. Uh, so I just, I'm excited and, uh, and also because uh, there's one coming that will also be fe featuring um, 
uh, Staff Sergeant Macario Garcia, uh, who is uh, has a uh, very, very close uh, relationship with my family. He happens to be godfather to uh, one of my brother-in-laws. And so uh, he's an incredible uh, story in, uh, uh, you know, just kind of in the theme of all things. A lot of people don't realize that Staff Sergeant Macario Garcia was run out of a area establishment, I think it was in Pierland, because um, in uniform, and after having received the Congressional Medal of Honor, uh, he was chased out with a baseball bat because dogs and Mexicans weren't served. Uh, so uh, to uh, see the, the way that the community has uh, surrounded him, his uh, heroism, his service to our country, uh, and that uh, we'll now have a mural in Precinct 2 featuring him uh, is exciting to me. And I just, I just it's, it's just great to see these mural projects come forward. But that one with my Cario Garcia will be a, a very special one to see happen. Thank you. Commissioner Ellis. Commissioner Garcia, hey, great, great work. And um, if, if you're free this weekend, I know you've been out riding your bike. <laughs> I took a ride on Sunday in between the rain and there's a great mural that uh, I was gonna split the cost on. It's, I thought it was my precinct, but it was your precinct by that world-class birding muralist. Mm. And uh, Commissioner Cagle, uh, you ought to pull that picture up on my social media. Tom Bacon put up $100,000 to do it and he challenged me to, to match him. So we were trying to do birding mural by the same artist on top of the county attorney's building. But that price tag got up because of the logistics to nine hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars. I committed a hundred from precinct one's resources, but uh, I did tell them I'm still going. We'll put a hundred up, and we're looking at some county buildings. At some point, we will try to put something on top of the county attorney's building. But this guy that did the largest mural in Houston, uh, Japanese American Japanese artist who lives in New York now, uh, about hunger, which is UN resolution on hunger. It's, it's pretty amazing you haven't seen it. it happens to be in my precinct, but they spent twenty-five thousand dollars. The artist did it for free, uh, and they, they're going to do one in uh, Oakland next. And I'm trying to connect them with the mayor or, or a county official or the congressperson over there. But I took them out to the Astrodome, and they're looking at maybe something on sex trafficking mm. uh, there. Uh, but uh, we from precinct one, at some point, I hope the county does a set aside for art. But we're going to. That'll be our policy at Precinct 1, some set aside to do murals or some art with all of the projects that we do. But I'm looking forward to riding my bike, checking out your murals. Good deal, man. Thank you. That one is as presented. Item 198, Urban Strategies Early Head Start. Commissioner Garcia. Thank you, Judge. Um, on, on this one, uh, is um, uh, Edward on the line? Edward no, I'm sorry, no. Ed, Ed, yeah, Edward uh, No, sir, I do not see him. Okay. On this one, Judge, um, I, I don't want to hold it, but I, I uh, couldn't help but to notice the uh, the, uh, uh, the number of facilities that are here, uh, and I just want to make sure that uh, we... Uh, out of the ones that are being proposed, there's only, I think, one uh, that will be, uh, that's been selected for Precinct 2, if I'm reading this, this graph right. And so uh, I want to make sure that uh, we expand this to include all um, Harris County Public Library uh, properties and all precincts so that uh, we can all benefit from this. And so I, I don't know if I need to make a motion on that. Um, and I, I guess since uh, Edward's not online, we'll wait. Uh, I can wait for him and work it out. If I need to bring something back, I'll uh, I'll do that. You need to bring it back. I'll second it when you bring it back. Good deal. Thank you. So for now, Commissioner Garcia, as presented, and you'll work with Mel Ed Melton on adding. Great. Maricela, are you good? <clears throat> yes, Judge. Thank you. 224, is is uh, JAD coming back with their proposals on the U visa that I know Commissioner Garcia has been driving forward? 
And the uh, judge, uh, again, I just want to thank you for your leadership and, um, you know, the, the crime victims that are out there. Uh, it's just, uh, and, you know, with rhetoric that has been, you know, spewed uh, all too long that drives people away from being able to report um, activities on the evildoers in our community who are, uh, you know, and I, and I just happened to watch a movie the other, the other night. I would suggest that it's uh, one of these uh, Christian uh, movies. It's called Priceless and it's based on true stories. Uh, but it, it just reminds us that uh, human trafficking exists. It, it's not happening in some faraway place. It's in our backyard uh, somewhere. And, um, and we need to do all that we can to ensure that we are getting as much information uh, about this. And so I do want to make sure that uh, I get a presentation uh, on this. And I'm not sure if, they, if they're ready to do one this evening. If they, if they can, I'd, I'd like to see it uh, before I, I request a motion on this. Yeah. Line, if you'd like for me to unmute. Go ahead, Jim. Jim, you're unmuted. Mr. Bethke. Jim. Well, he gets on the line. Um, I, I, I reviewed it. Um, I know that some advocates raised concerns about <laughs> survivors criminal history. I think it's been it's been thoroughly done, but I would ask that Jim work on exploring those advocates concerns and, and bring back recommendations uh, for the county that includes, you know, whatever was raised. Um, so that would be my that would be my my position on it. But I, I think it's headed absolutely headed in the right direction. He's got specifics as to what we can do in the county. I just want to make sure it's been run through that lens. And my team was in touch with him. And, and he said, yeah, you know, we ought to make sure that we've sort of gut checked uh, by the advocates that work with those victims directly. Good, good, good. I'm glad to hear that, Judge. And um, I do want to make sure I, I don't think I'll uh, put this in the form of a motion, but uh, since uh, you're engaged as well, I, I know that this will uh, make sure to get uh, to uh, Jim. But I, I do want to make sure that um, we do get um, Ender Reed uh, to work with um, uh, uh, Jad and, and, and Jim and everyone involved to develop the materials that will address the inequities at the federal level. And uh, because the, the fact that uh, there's only 10,000 for the entire countries just beyond ridiculous. And so, um, and then uh, to develop a dashboard uh, so that we can track uh, the, the data. And because my suspicion is going to be that we're, uh, we're going to get a lot of information and, uh, and it'll enable us to make sure that we know just how much uh, need and attention uh, exists. So I think the dashboard would be helpful in that, re in that regard. And then also to um, uh, similarly to have uh, Ender work with uh, Jim to make sure that uh, we do all that we can to locate um, any legislation that is uh, either existent or being proposed at the federal level and uh, support it that would <coughs> help us in this regard to better serve uh, these crime victims. I am. Excuse me. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, Veronica James with JAD is on the line, um, <clears throat> ready to do a presentation. Oh, great. And Commissioner, I was going to say, I noticed it's a transmittal item. So I think, you know, just noting my, my input, your input, and, and I'm sure we'll each circle back directly with Jim for him to bring back the, the specific proposals to court. I'm good with that. I'm good with that, Judge. Judge, what I'm hearing you saying is that since it's 902, we don't have to hear the presentation now. We can listen to a different time. <laughs> yes, I, that too. I think we all we all got the report. It was very, very thorough. Uh, do you guys have any questions for Veronica? 
Judge, how, how, how long is the presentation? Is it two or three minutes? I'm just curious. I don't mind going through it if it's quick. It's about three minutes. I'd say last time I checked, it was like three minutes and 11 seconds. But I'll try to make it as quick even, as even if we need to take I a break. I like your hours of service. Yeah. Yeah, I would okay, like to see it. Keep it. Veronica, if you could keep it to that that uh that that three three minutes and twenty seconds, that would be fabulous. Yes, I can definitely do that. Thank you. Um and thank you for your time. I'm Dr. Veronica James, and on my allotted time, I will give a brief overview of the report submitted to Commissioner's Court on the EU non-immigrant status, U visa, and certification practices nationwide in Texas and Harris County and provide recommendations at the federal, state, and local levels. I will obviously not have um, time to go over all the points on all these slides, but will gladly answer any questions you may have. The U visa was meant to protect immigrant crime survivors, encourage reporting, and increase trust between immigrants and law enforcement. One piece of the application is Form I-918B, but this alone does not provide U visa status. However, the operation of the U visa program has significant issues. Per statute, the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, USCIS, cannot issue more than 10,000 U visas per fiscal year, October to September. Derivative visas, for example, for spouses, have no cap. However, applications far exceed this limit. This has resulted in huge backlogs where applicants wait, on average, five to 10 years for a decision. There is also no federal mandate for agencies to sign certification requests. Some jurisdictions, most notably California and Washington, have enacted legislation to make the process easier and more consistent for survivors of crime. There is a lack of consistent policies and data recording across Texas. Currently, there is no state law for U visa certifications or legislation under consideration. There is also little consistency within Harris County. The Harris County District Attorney's Office unveiled a new policy in 2019 and currently is one of the agencies to have the best practices of those we spoke with in Harris County for completing certifications. The Harris County Sheriff's Office has no formal policy or standard operating procedure for certifications, but they do also currently have a good practice for processing requests. There is significant variation between constable precincts. Newly elected Constable Garcia of Precinct 2 collaborated with Chad on the draft model policy, which has been reviewed and approved by the County Attorney's Office, and as a starting point, plans to implement this as their policy. Per Constable Rosen, the constables are very near to adopting a policy. At the federal level, most importantly, we recommend greatly increasing or eliminating the current limitation on U visas. On the state level, we specifically recommend Texas should consider legislation similar to California and Washington. On the local level, most importantly, we strongly encourage local law enforcement agencies to work with service providers to build consensus around the consideration of U visa certifications, regardless of survivors' criminal history. And going forward, and Commissioner Garcia already talked about a lot of these things, but Chad will be speaking with Commissioner's Court members and intergovernmental and global affairs about reaching out to Congress to urge them to amend the U visa cap. Chad will also coordinate with intergovernmental affairs and Ender Reid to determine if any legislation can be amended this legislative session. We will also continue to meet with service providers and go over their recommendations and meet with local law enforcement agencies to begin this conversation more in depth. Thank you. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. We also thank everyone that spoke with us to help with this report. Thank you, Dr. James. Good presentation. It was excellent, uh, Judge, and she did it in three minutes. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Dr. James. And and uh, Jim was messaged me that they, they've been having uh, technical difficulties, so that's why he couldn't join. But it sounds like we'll all circle back individually with Jad, seeing as it's a transmittal. And uh, Maricela, just be accepting the transmittal. Thank you for all the all the work to Jad and, and all the teams involved in the advocates, the uh, uh, survivor advocates. 
Item 345, a resolution highlighting women and economic opportunity. Commissioner Ellis. Judge, we went through it uh, earlier and uh, we had one speaker and, and she and some of the other uh, academics that helped me work on it and put a lot of uh, effort into it. I won't read it. Commissioner Cagle, you have one change that, that they felt uncomfortable with and uh, I'll take your other changes with that one part we want to take out, if that's all right. Yeah, you were going to just uh, put a period after culture and take out the rest of that, whereas? Is that yes, what sir. And then there was one other little minor typo. I know uh, how sensitive you are on it. Where was that? So I think it was, uh, you don't need to as in the first one where you said where whereas as during the month. Leave that little, little as out. Do I have it right? You see it? I think we sent it to you. Mine didn't Mine. have the as in there. Yeah. So yeah, I'm fine with those two changes, okay. All right. and then we'll 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 be good. Okay. I do I do have a comment that I'd like to brag on the women in precinct four. We got a lot of them, but uh, my chief of staff Cheryl Gunther, my administrative division director Kylie Holbrook, uh, my capital improvement director in a in an industry dominated by men. Nobody dominates my rocky roads. Pamela Rocky. Uh, Jan Sexton, who is uh, in charge of our community centers, our transportation programs, we call it the Encore program, other folks call it their senior adult program, and she also helps us with our emergency response. Angel Hoot, who is the director of our financial department. Elizabeth Stensman, who is our community assistance department. And then my human resources director, Michelle Will. Um, we are... We are filled with the plethora. I think that was a word that Commissioner Garcia used a court or two back. Uh, we got a plethora of, uh, of hook and bull women in Precinct 4, and we're all proud of every one of them, and so I appreciate your resolution. Well, well, and, Judge, I, I would be remiss. I, I don't want to in any way demean it or, or have us go too long, but I hope you appreciate that fourth one. Whereas there is an increasing number of women elected officials in leadership at Harris County, including electing 17 new black women judges in 2018 and County Judge Lean Hidalgo as the first woman elected as Harris County judge. We're all very proud of that. You know, our friends and uh, Supervisor Holly Mitchell, I'm told, will be the, the chair of the Los Angeles Commissioner's Court in Los Angeles. I've known her a long time when she was in the assembly and in the State Senate, and uh, now she's on that five person. She brags all female governing board uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, but we're very proud of you. And uh, I appreciate the court support on this. Women have come a, a long way and it's been through a lot of effort and a lot of sacrifice. Uh, Black women in particular, you know, we, the speaker earlier pointed out initially the vote in this country had to be white male and a property owner. And uh, even when uh, women got the right to vote, black women were not included and didn't get it until the Civil Rights Act passed. And as we go through this effort of voter suppression now, uh, I think we ought to all reflect on our history because it's easy for us to say we would have marched with Martin Luther King. But now, most people didn't do it when he was around, uh, when they had the ability to. And, you know, everybody's against slavery now. Uh, but when the roll was called, uh, most people weren't for ending it. And uh, even if they felt bad about it, they were concerned about who would do the work. Uh, but we have come a long way and we have so much farther to go. So I move adoption. Thank you. Yeah, Commissioner Garcia, second uh, by Commissioner Garcia. Thank you for the, um, for bringing this. Absolutely. Um, Judge, yes, just said. a clarification. So I will be getting an updated resolution with the way it was presented with the amended verbiage. Yes, and do you have it? Do I have to read it or do you have it? Um, I do have the one that was sent to us from um, Commissioner Cagle's office. The change is you on the... the corrected, you sent the corrected version, Commissioner Cagle, right? I'm, I oh, didn't get I'm, your corrected version, but on yeah. the one, two, three, third, whereas of what we sent out, um, that, put a period that after sentence, culture. you put a period after culture and eliminate the rest of the sentence. Yes. Thank Where there's you a comma, that. you put a period and you remove so, the rest of the sentence. So you leave out, we acknowledge your role women have 
play in upholding and promoting the ideals on which our nation is founded. Because we, we, we know people were, were writing it, but didn't do it. So we're gonna leave that phrase out. So we'll, we'll uh, take that with the edits, Maricela, that you've noted. Thank you. Let's keep going and we'll vote on that one together with everything else. 349 on the rollover, Commissioner Ramsey. When this, when we took this up last month, uh, I understood that uh, uh, when we did the rollover, that it would not significantly impact uh, law enforcement. Uh, as I have looked further into this, uh, I can see the impact, uh, significant impact to the sheriff, uh, constables, uh, particularly uh, uh, four and five. And uh, because I voted for this, I'm bringing this back for a revote. And I think within the, that's, that is within the purview of what we can do. So I want to vote again on this. And uh, my concern is that the rollover dollars that are being contributed from uh, the constables and the sheriff, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a lot to swallow in one year. And the other thing I would say, I think the sheriff's rollover was covered uh, by action we took earlier today, the three million, that pretty well covers that. Uh, but there's nearly 14 million uh, in a couple of constables that, that's not covered. And I think that is a lot to transition from one year to the next. I've talked to David Barry, and I, I think he's trying to work through that process, but I, that's a lot to try to transition in one, one year. So that's why I put that on there. I know it's late, uh, but I'm asking for a revote on that particular rollover item. Is that a motion, Commissioner? Yes. Commissioner Cagle has a second. Any comments? Would I be able, Judge, I'm sorry, would I be able to get clarification on what the motion is for this item? We voted last in March 9th, 2021 to approve a county rollover policy. And I'm asking that we we vote again on that policy uh, uh, in this year. So I've got a second, I think, from Commissioner Cagle to vote again. Yeah, Commissioner Garcia. Thank you, Judge. Um, and I guess this question is for Jay. Um, this is the item that we've already voted on. Um, and <laughs> We're, uh, I guess we're bringing it back, but we we voted on on uh, on the rollover, and I'm just curious whether we can uh, just bring it back for another another vote if the item itself was already decided. Um, Commissioner, um, so so the rule is is that a member who voted on the, of the prevailing part uh, for prevailing side in this case. Um, as uh, Commissioner Ramsey pointed out, he voted in favor of the item previously. He can bring it back. So essentially what he's asking for is a, essentially a, a kind of a reconsideration of the policy uh, or a vision of the policy to, to, to do so. And he's, he's within his right to do so. Yeah, I do. Okay, thank you. Sure. Commissioner Ellis. So Commissioner Ramsey, you just want us to bring it back up so you can vote no on it or, uh, or, or could you just... Well, as I, as, I, as I said, I was concerned. I understand better the impact of law enforcement. I understand how crime is impacting Harris County. And I did not understand that completely. Uh, uh, a couple of three weeks ago when we voted on it originally and just going to read it back for, for another vote. Okay, so I'm just trying to understand. So, I mean, I, I get if you want to show that you voted no. I just, obviously every week we don't want to 
keep bringing it back up. So you could have just put another item on the agenda saying you want them to keep it. But this way, we got to do it twice. You got to bring it up again, and then we got to vote to pass it. I guess it. there's five or six ways you can do it. I figured this was the easiest way. So and could, made, could, yeah, go ahead. Anyway, I've made the motion. I think we've got a second, so we can vote. So, and Marty said, are you clear as to what the motion is? Um, not really. I, I know he did mention that the item voted on March 9th. He's asking for a revote. Could the um, motion be that, uh, Commissioner Ramsey, could the motion be that Harris County adopt the, the former rollover policy? And that way it's, you know. That would be clear. Thank you, Judge. Okay. And Commissioner Cagle has made a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. I'm opposed. Motion uh, fails. Three to two. Thank you. And, uh, 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 Judge? Yeah. Um, yeah. A little bit on, on this item. Um, and I think I, I can appreciate uh, some of the concern that Commissioner Ramsey has, because uh, I have spoken uh, to some of the constables uh, about their concerns. Um, um, Mr. Berry, I want to make sure that that all of our constables are treated evenly. Uh, I know that there is um, uh, one constable that is concerned about not being able to pay for gas if not for the rollover and um and so i i i think i mentioned who that was and i'd like to ask you to reach out to them uh maybe to help them be comfortable that uh they're going to have gas to do their job um and uh, and then another constable who was uh kindly paying for staffing out of his rollover, yet uh, I'd heard all along that you couldn't use the rollover for staffing. Uh, and we had approved uh, absorbing deputies uh, who had been, who were on contracts, and then those contracts for whatever reason would be canceled. Then, you know, other offices were able to put those positions on the agenda and they'd be absorbed. But apparently this constable was not. And so I just don't think it's right that some be treated one way and others be treated a different way. So can you make sure to take a look at that, that, uh, that this rollover situation isn't going to adversely impact um, anybody who's, who's using it as a true lifeline. And, um, and uh, you know, and they're just trying to be, you know, responsible with the fact that they have a rollover and they're trying to use it, but it sounds like there's still a, a real uh, fluid policy to what this, uh, how this rollover was uh, told to be used uh, from years back. Certainly, Commissioner, and, and I will acknowledge, I think that there has been some changing rules or conflicting guidance, and um, I, I'm not approaching this with the uh, mentality of anyone's fault for doing anything um we it's a transition it's not always easy i can't promise every single one of our recommendations will make everyone happy but I, absolutely we're letting every department um explain what rollover they think they should keep and why and um if they think it uh will affect their level of service to get that on the table and work through it and you know you can expect to uh, report to my office with the work we did to, to uh, move this transition along and you know we won't make any decisions behind closed doors here so we're, we're very much at work on that you know both with the constables with large rollovers and the constables with small rollovers and with with other departments uh, uh, in between good deal thank you thank you item 351 commissioner ramsey well, that's, that's a bit of good news. We had a job fair at Houston Community College there at uh, I-10 of the Beltway. Uh, we had uh, the CEO of Daikin um, uh, uh, join us, Mr. Kama, and uh, 
the, the good news is Dykin was in a position to hire a thousand people on Saturday. Uh, I want to give a shout out to uh, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. Uh, she can encourage Metro, Metro like nobody else can. And so the reason that Metro needs to be encouraged is many of the people that, that need jobs aren't close to where Dykin is. And so there needs to be some kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, transportation arranged. But I just wanted to give court a bit of information related to that. That one day there were 710 applications, 200 offers were made. That day, 160 people went home with a job. They went to work on Monday with full benefits, insurance, 401k. So these are not bad. These are really good jobs. And we're working uh, with uh, 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 our, our, our community uh, 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 development and Department of Equity and Economic uh, Opportunity to uh, do these further. So this just doesn't have to happen in Precinct 3. And believe me, there were probably people hired uh, in all four precincts on uh, on Saturday. So there's going to be some more of these. There, we're going to do one with construction folks. We're going to do one uh, with restaurant uh, folks. Uh, getting people a job is so important. That guarantees them 52 uh, paychecks a year, not just a couple from uh, from from some agency. Anyway, I I wanted to report that and tell you we're going to continue to push these kinds of initiatives to get folks back to work. That's wonderful news, Commissioner. And I did notice, Commissioner, I skipped over 350 on the flood control. If you if you don't mind going back to that one, I know you flagged that one too. Again, it's it's late. This is a this is a really good initiative that we're going to do with our own precinct three money in terms of what we've set aside. We're going to do some pilot tests on some existing detention facilities where we actually put pumps in detention basins. Why we don't pump stormwater in Harris County, I don't know. We pump sanitary sewage, we pump uh, potable water, but we don't pump stormwater. We can increase by 30% the efficiency of a detention basin. So between modifying outfalls and improving how we look at these that can be some immediate uh, impact to a lot of these neighborhoods and for not a lot of money. So we're going to try it and pilot test it. Obviously, there's detention basins uh, in every precinct in Harris County. Just wanted the court to know that we're going to be pilot testing that and we'll keep you posted. Great. Uh, Judge, I'm sorry. Um, is there any action for 350 and 351? There's no action. Thank you. 353 is next. The Gulf Coast Rail District bills. That may be yours as well, Commissioner Ramsey. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not the only one I think contacted here. I, I, there's, there is a... Uh, I think good support for this. I'm going to quickly read through it. I'm going to uh, second it. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner <laughs> Garcia. I know you. I uh, And I called the question. I think we're all in favor of it. <laughs> yeah. So there's no need to read it. Is that what you're telling me? That's yeah. what I'm saying. Okay. All right. <laughs> I will tell you, Commissioner Garcia, I, I got the phone call and I ran into the office on Monday. I said, get this on the agenda. I think Commissioner Garcia is going to beat me to it. <laughs> but thank you for your support. This is exactly what we need need to do. Commissioner Ellis, are you good with it not being read? Thank you. All right. So we'll keep moving. Sorry, Judge Marty again. So what would be the motion for 353? To approve the resolution <laughs> presented. And this one will be voted on with the other items? Yes. Yes, ma'am. 
358, uh, discussion concerning the placement and usage of annexes. Commissioner Cagle. Update from the county attorney's office. The last time we were in commissioner's court, um, my understanding is that it had been represented that everything had been vetted uh, with the secretary of state. Uh, and before court was done, we'd gotten forwarded to us an email, which we attached as the backup that said that the secretary of state was denying that they were in approval of, uh, of the plan. Um, I don't, I don't know whether, I don't want to say that I'm against utilizing county facilities in terms of finding a way to where we can do so that is both efficient, but also to make sure that we are legal. And part of my whole question to the county attorney's office is where are we now? And let's make sure that we have our belt and our suspenders on and that we're not doing something that is inappropriate. Um, and that if we're going to utilize our facilities in the most efficient way possible, let's do so also legally. Sure, Joe. Ja, um, um, I'm happy to, uh, to to respond to that, Commissioner. Um, so, on, on two items, and I know that uh, the election administrator Isabel Longoria is on as well. But let me just kind of give you a quick update, and I think I'd send a um, a response to your specific question, and I think I included the court as well, um, as it relates specifically to the issue of um, using uh, utilizing the facilities for. Uh, that are currently uh, in the tax office, uh, we feel very strongly, um, and I, I think we're on solid ground, that there's no issue with using those facilities for voter registration purposes. Uh, the election code, I think, is very clear on this matter, um, and the, 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 the notion of the election administrator using those facilities has not been the question. I think there were some other issues that were raised that, uh, Commissioner Cagle, I think your, your office was kind enough to alert me to, um, but frankly, that was unrelated to the to the memo that we had distributed to y'all. Um, at this moment in time, we have no concerns about the issue related to uh, uh, as it relates to voting registration. And I, I, I can I feel quite confident that 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 position is uh, is one that we we're willing to stand by. Um, as it relates relates to other matters, I know that uh, the election administrator I think wants to wants to comment as well. If she's available to comment. So are we in agreement or disagreement with the Secretary of State at this moment? Oh, I, I don't know that we're in disagreement at all with the Secretary of State. The issue, is, and, and I'm not sure that, to, to be blunt, the relevance of that particular issue, the question is whether or not we can utilize county facilities and we can have an office that is, des that is designated for um, the the election administrator to conduct voter registration activities. Our view is is that that is not a problem, um, and we have not seen received anything in, in uh, that contradicts that from the secretary of state. Um, and that's certainly not been directed to us. That's certainly not been directed um, in, in in any way, and, and we don't believe that the code in any way uh, uh, disagrees with that. Um, so we feel, as I said, I think we've, we've looked at that matter um, and they're aware that we're doing that. And I, I don't believe there's any any issue there. I think there was some confusion um, as to the way it was presented to uh, 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 to the election, uh, the Secretary of State's election division had Keith Ingram, um, and that was not related to the voter registration portion of it. All right. Mr. Ellis. Is this it? Is Miss Longoria on the line? Would you like to speak on this? Yes, sir. I'm here. Uh, short answer. We're in the clear. I think there was some confusion last time. We were also talking about the technology transition. That is what I had responded to that we had cleared it by the SOS. And then in regard to establishing branch offices, the county attorney's office, like we said, is cleared and we're ready to go. Judge, with, with that said, uh, Ms. Longoria, I appreciate the work that you're doing. And uh, Mr. Ayer, if we were to end up in a position where uh, you all think we are on solid legal ground and there was an objection from Secretary of State, I hope that there would be no reluctance to go to court. 
and I'm sure that would not be. I mean, you know, it's pretty sad, but we are at a point in this country uh, where people, once again, are proud to uh, suppress the vote and somehow wear it with a badge of honor. And uh, I'm going to put something on the agenda for the next court. I, I hope our business community would join in and, and speak up. Uh, as the business community did on these voter suppression efforts in Georgia, in Atlanta in particular, with us being such a diverse region. Because if not, if, it's, if some of these issues are successful, I think you're going to have boycotts and a host of issues that will challenge uh, our e economy's ability to recover. Uh, you know, just as, as people uh, call for boycotts uh, in the South in, in the past, or uh, against apartheid uh, when it was in South Africa. I think it's only appropriate that that happened here. And uh, so if there is a challenge, I, I, I would encourage you and I will be one who certainly support going to court to fight it out uh, to the highest court in the land if necessary. Thank you. Gail and Gloria, mm -hmm. this is Jack Cagle. Um, you know, I understand the rattling of the saber and the, and the banshee cry of battle uh, by my colleague, but it would be nice if before we went to that step, we talk. Can I, and I, I think what I hear you saying is, is that you have been talking now to the Secretary of State and we've got all this clarified up. Yes, sir. We, we do everything above the law in my office. Uh, and I, I agree. I believe that if Mr. Vera wants to take my words uh, out of context, I would appreciate if he emailed me first so that we can talk about it. Uh, and I appreciate the same of everyone on commission. Uh, I'm here and open, you all have my cell phone number uh, and I'm ready to talk and make sure that we're doing everything above board uh, as is one of the goals of my office. And I believe what uh, Commissioner Ellis was alluding to though is that there are a couple of bills that will be going uh, allegedly through the, the state um, that would require us to go to pre-approval for the Secretary of State before even sneezing. So I do prefer to talk it out here and solve our problems locally um, before we go, you know, several steps above. Thank you. And, and, and Commissioner Kay, I just want to respond to your comment. Look, that, that was a time when people who looked like me had to, was Dr. King say, scratch when it didn't itch and laugh when it wasn't funny? We don't have to do that anymore. Uh, and it, it was wrong when people had to do it then, and, and I, I'm going to fight against it. Uh, with every ability that I have, and I'm proud of that. I mean, we are all, all of us ought to be ashamed that people would want to suppress the vote in 2021 anywhere in this country. It's ridiculous and shameful. It's the kind of stuff that was going on in Russia or somewhere else. We'd be at the United Nations criticizing it. But folks want to do it here and get away with it and act like it's the nice, sophisticated thing to do. It's not sophisticated. It's dumb. It's racist. It's evil. Thank you. Thank you. So no action on this one, Commissioner Cagle? No, Your Honor. Okay. Item 367. That one is mine on the on the priorities and, and processes for the um, for the federal funds. So we've got a, a once in a generation influx of funds, as you guys know. I'm very proud of the work we did with the CARES Act, uh, to be honest. I think it was it was thoughtful. Um, the system worked of having a committee made up of the a representative from each member of court, having the consultants there and having the budget department. I'm proud of the way we kept track of all the initiatives, uh, ha have a, a visual and clear information as to which funds went where to the extent that there were programs that we had to tweak, for example, the initial uh, small business loan program that then became a grant program, the rental assistance program that then we had to tweak and, and turn into direct assistance. It, it was by virtue of the fact that we had to spend those funds very, very quickly. With these, we have a little bit more time. So what I'm proposing is basically a very, very similar system to what we had with the CARES Act. Um, in the interest of getting some of these funds out the door, there's a percentage that would go out the door within 60 days of the, of the funds arriving 
And the suggestion is that whatever projects go out early, that they be a sort of extensions of what we already did that we know works. And then as far as creating new stuff, then we have a little bit more time um, and we can and we can work on it going forward. Same idea of a committee. Um, process wise, we ran this through budget. Content wise, as far as the priorities, the intent behind this is folks are, are beginning to ask, you know, what are you going to do with those funds? And so uh, I tried to summarize and with the team, generally what we did with CARES Act, and, and it's these big buckets. And I think that it's very clear for the community when you talk about health, um, the, the three buckets, health, housing, and jobs. So health, it is the, the immediate needs for COVID, vaccine distribution, testing, but also the, the, the secondary and tertiary impacts, mental health support, food. When you talk about housing, is the rental mortgage assistance that we've discussed in the past, but also affordable housing. And when we're talking about jobs, not only workforce development, but also education, child care. Obviously, all of these get at the root causes of the increase in crime. So the idea is to use these funds to get to the to the uh, uh, yet another another angle, um, different from what we're doing, for example, with the with the funds we've given the sheriff. Um, and then the other thing that that is added is really just spelling out that there's going to be a meaningful vetting of ideas, uh, rigorous evaluation process through the committee. But, you know, we wrote it all out. I reviewed it personally, what was presented, and you shouldn't find anything surprising based on what we did with CARES. My idea was just to have this so that between now and when the funds arrive, probably another few weeks, that we can we can say to the community, you know, these are our priorities. We're going to have a transparent and accountable system. We're going to have a committee as we did before, and um, and 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 structurally, it'll be the same structure. So the motion would just be to designate a steering committee consisting of the chiefs of staff or another designee of each member of court, which will work with the budget management department to establish a program management office for Harris County coronavirus local fiscal recovery funds in alignment with the process, funding parameters and prerequisites, priorities, working groups and workflow as detailed in the agenda letter and accompanying document for item 367 of today's March 30th, 2021 commissioner's court session. Move, Judge. Second. Very well thought out, Judge. Thank you. Any comments? Good job, Judge. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Yeah, Commissioner Judge. Garcia. Yeah, Judge, uh, we were going to discuss uh, 364 in executive session, but uh, uh, we were, the county attorney said we need to talk about this uh, in court. Okay. That's uh, so, so I want to make sure we kind of came back to it. Oh, I missed that one. I'm sorry. Yes, Jay. Yeah. No, no, that, that's correct. I was just going to uh, ask, uh, let you know that, Judge. I apologize for not mentioning it before. D Judge, can we take a 10 minute break? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so this should be our last break of the day. So let's be back at 10 till 10, 10 till 10. One time in the Senate. <laughs> okay, we're all back at 951 and we were discussing item 364 on the hiring committee uh, eligibility. Yeah, Commissioner Garcia. Thank you, George, I've got... Um... Let's see where I left that item. Uh, do, you have, do you have my folder there? I think I may have given it, given it back to you. I'm sorry. I apologize, Judge. Um, but, um, you know, Judge, we are uh, working to make sure that we have some uh, some direction on, on uh, how to uh, fill vacancies. And as, as you know, our staff, uh, tends to uh, come together and, and serve a bit of a vetting role and uh, and uh, and hiring committee process. Um, you know, however, you know, um, 
the Quinnell Sheriff, I uh, regretfully uh, had to dismiss a lot of people. And, uh, you know, when you get to that point, uh, it's a strong signal that the county wants to move in a different direction. And, um, and if someone's terminated uh, from a position, uh, you know, they just ought to have no business serving on a committee to fill the vacancy that they, uh, that they uh, created. So um, my recommendation is to uh, move to make county policy that any county employee terminated from a specific position is ineligible to serve on a current or future hiring committee to fill that vacant uh, specific position. Judge, I, I, I'll second it, and Commissioner Garcia, I'll, I'll second it because it, it would just be awkward, and I mean, it's, it's difficult for, uh, uh, we want to make sure we comply with the law and the challenge of trying to find a consensus when we don't always agree with whatever our, our staff members come up. I can think of a few times, but I just think it would make it, it, it would make it awkward, so. You know, if we need it as a policy, I would do it, but uh, but I'm, I'm proud to second the motion. Commissioner Cagle and Commissioner Ramsey. Judge, I, I understand where my colleague is coming from, and I understand that it may be awkward, but this is a very slippery slope. Each of us are allowed to appoint members of our staff to serve on these committees. And we don't always agree, and our staffs don't always agree. But if we're gonna start a policy to where the three can decide which staff members of others can serve on committees, well, you know, it, it may be some day to where it's gonna be four Ds and one R, or it might be five Ds. And then you're gonna have folks telling each other who you can have from your staff serving on these committees. I think it's a bad policy. I under, you know, there's, there's, a, there's an old phrase in the law that says bad facts make bad law. I understand it might be awkward that his choice of who he thought might be the best person to have the knowledge of what that position is. You know, may ask questions, may, may know where things are buried that folks don't want to know. But it's a bad policy for three or four to start to dictate to somebody else who on their staff they can appoint. It's either an elected official's prerogative to appoint somebody from their staff, or it's not. And and I would just I would just say, I understand it's awkward, but I think it's bad policy. Commissioner Rams. Yeah, it's it's. Uh... Uh, it's interesting that when a good man is fired for no good reason, uh, there's continuing concern because he was not fired on majority. He was fired on majority, wasn't fired unanimously. So I disagree with uh, all the reasons why he was fired, but, you know, that's what 3-2 is. I can count. Uh, when when I was asked to provide someone that could serve on the committee, I thought, well, I'll provide somebody that actually knows something. Uh, he served in a row. Uh, he has no ax to grind. He is to be on that committee to provide insight and someone that has served faithfully. And I have great trust in. It's really a personal insult to me that you would say you cannot pick him. I, I thought we had personal prerogative to pick these folks. I know just this last month we went through this process of uh, we had uh, formed a committee and we went and interviewed different people and the committee came up with a person and uh, there were some independent interviews, which I didn't question commissioners going out and independently interviewing separate from a committee that was set up. So uh, this is just very odd 
Uh, this is exercising. This is voting three two because you can. I, I think it's it it is not appropriate that you're telling me that I can't pick a outstanding uh, person that is well qualified that bring great insight uh, to the issue and. Um, I would not understand. It is a slippery slope, but I would take it as a personal uh, uh, affront to me if if you don't let me pick uh, for no good reason uh, someone to serve. You know, uh, Judge, if I may, and Commissioner Ramsey, um, it is uh, you know, uh, I I I wouldn't take it personal, you know, uh, when I was sheriff and I thought I had elected official, you know, prerogative, um, you know, I, I realized, uh, almost like every court I didn't. And, um, and so I didn't take it personal. I just, uh, figured out other ways to do my job and move forward. And I did. And, uh, and on this regard, look, um, I think you've, Maybe as a businessman, you may have fired a person or two, right? Out of your out of your shop. Um, is that? I mean, I would suspect. Absolutely, that, yeah. sure. And I, I, and as a sheriff, I'd like to mention I, I let a bunch of people go, but um, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't expect them to be uh, in a role to help dictate. Uh, what that future of your business uh, would be, or uh, I never, I don't think I remember asking a fired employee to come back and offer advice to the county. Um, and so I, I just look, no one's saying to unemploy them uh, just in this particular role. It, uh, it just seems to have um, a, um, uh, a, a degree of, of inappropriateness. Listen, I've I go I've come to every commissioner's court meeting recognizing uh, much of what I'm going to propose. I'm going to lose three to two, uh, but I try to do it with a bit of encouragement, and and certainly I've been an Aggie for nearly fifty years, and I understand how to lose. Uh, so this isn't about winning and losing. This is simply uh, this is simply a a preference. And 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 listen, I, I've met uh, I've met with a general, and I think he's he's served us well as an interim, and and so this isn't this anything this is nothing about that either. I just think that a commissioner's uh, prerogative to pick someone to serve on the committee is 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 something that's 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 uh, I won't use the word sacred, but it's pretty uh, pretty close to it. It, one thing's for sure, and it's that we, um, it's an important committee, and as all the hiring committees, and we do need to go through the process and, and figure out who's the permanent. And I, I believe the general's going to throw his hat in the ring, and that's great. Um, I thought about this, Commissioner, when you posted it, and I hear the slippery slope argument. My perception of it and my analysis, and, and I've, you know, I always want to make sure that each member of court is represented in everything. I just don't think the slippery slope argument applies here. I mean, you can make that argument about anything. But to me, this is more about closing the loophole. When I learned that the former director was part of the committee, and this was a while ago, I was taken aback by it. And I couldn't quite put my finger on why. And as I thought about it, I, I, I know why now. Because imagine that someone was fired for stealing equipment or, or some undue behavior. And then a commissioner were to appoint that person to the committee. I see it as a rare instance and something that is, is closing a loophole. And you have my commitment and that it's not at all about... Um, 
limiting discretion. I think if we're honest with ourselves, there, I'm sure there are plenty of people from your stuff you could have put. I mean, on, on all of the directorships, whether it's public health, we didn't each put a doctor. You know, we put someone who is a good at reviewing proposals and has good judgment. And it's hard to believe that you needed the former director to be part of the committee. It's well, your prerogative to have him in the office. And I appreciate, you know, Mr. High, he did good work during the winter storm. But I do think there's something that is that you, there's the possibility of um, inappropriateness when you put somebody who's been fired in the committee to select the replacement. Well, he was he was certainly fired. He wasn't fired for stealing anything. And I think that's a bad example. Uh, I think Mr. High did a great job while he was serving. Uh, and he was on the wrong end of a 3-2 vote then. Looks like he's about to be on the wrong end of another 3-2 vote. Uh, but just know that that he has served us well in, in Precinct 3. And I think he can bring value and insight to this committee. And but if you don't choose to do that, that's I think that's really the committee's loss. So I'm, sure I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, I, if Jay is still on the line, I'd like to ask Jay's opinion of this. Are we as sovereign elected officials allowed? to make our selections for committees or uh, I've, you know, I've hired a number of folks when Bruce high was fired. It was said that the reason why he was being let go is because we we're going to go in a new direction. I don't remember anybody accusing him of malfeasance. They just didn't like his direction. I've hired a couple of people that used to work for the County. I guess that what I'm hearing here is, is that anybody that I hire, I have to submit to the, three of you for approval before I can put them on a committee. If you're going to be uncomfortable, I'm a little bit nervous about that. I'm, I'm thinking right now of a particular person that used to work for the County who's really good in uh, uh, a couple of areas that uh, I may, I was thinking about putting them on a particular committee. Maybe I'm, maybe I'll do it. And then I end up not being allowed to now, Jay, can this board, reach into a precinct or to a judge's office and tell them who they can and cannot put on a committee? Commissioner, the, the, the particular issue is whether or not you can, uh, how, how you want to organize a hiring committee, right? These are recommendations. And so um, that's, that's board policy. That's something that collectively you can decide how you want to do it. That doesn't, that doesn't interfere in your ability to hire or fire someone in your office. But I, but I think the issue is whether or not um, the, the particular parameters of this committee were, was established by the board collectively. Um, I, think you, I think when it was initially um, hiring committees in which the, 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 the court operates um, is designated. And I, I don't know if Shane is still on uh, the line as well, but that's, that's traditionally how it's done. And so it's well, legally you're within your authority um, as a as a as a court collectively to do that, um, and and so however the court chooses to do it, the tradition in the court has been uh, that individual members have the ability to appoint uh, whoever they want to appoint. Um, and while that's been the tradition, that doesn't necessarily preclude the court from moving um, in a different process or policy if they collectively choose to do so. Um, again, these are advisory committees. Um, they're not binding in any way, um, and, and and so it, so to to that extent, I um, I think the only way to respond to that is um, is that if, if you choose to do it collectively, it, establish a committee under whatever format you want to choose, you're you have that uh, you have the uh, flexibility to do so. So after the committee is created, and we're given the opportunity to appoint staff members then you're saying it's okay to come back in retroactively and say no you made a bad choice and we don't want that appointee no i, I i'm not saying retroactively what i am saying is that, that the composition of any committee whether it's current that committee is current or future is established by board policy there was a board policy that was 
um, created uh, to form this particular committee. Um, and, and that was through the HR process. Um, and that the, and, and I think at that time, so if there's a change in that, um, you know, or if you're gonna create a, poli a board policy that's, that limits or restricts certain folks from serving on committees, that is that is a, that is something that you have the authority to do. Whether so you're you saying, choose to do it is your call. So what you're saying is is that if we wanted to create a, another committee to replace someone else that we fire, um, when that committee is created at that time, they could say and and every commissioner can hire or appoint um, whoever it is that they choose as long as they are members of precinct two. Um, or whatever rule that we decide to put in there. My question is, can we retroactively, after we had a set of rules that didn't specify this, now, in essence, unpick another commissioner's pick when those rules weren't in place at the time? I'll tell you, Commissioner Cagle, I would not be supportive of that kind of um, arbitrary is not quite the right word, but uh, but perhaps arbitrary type motion. You you could you can know that I wouldn't. I will say. Well, let me know not go there. But I do think that this is a a unique thing. I can tell you, I would not be supportive of something that was that was arbitrary as what you're proposing, and and I don't think that's what's being proposed here. It's the point is that somebody has a position and they're fired from it they shouldn't be picking the person that's going to take their place. It just, it's not really logical. I mean, we haven't done it. The, the other department heads, if, if what we wanted was their expertise and the folks that have left, we would have said, hey, come, come pick the replacement if, if there truly was this factor of expertise from somebody that we've decided to move away from. It just seems odd. But I, I, I would support this with the notion that, you know, it's not that I'm saying we're gonna, we're gonna have any other, other provisions for who can be appointed to what. I will say historically, the, the majority has had very sort of mercurial policies on who gets to appoint how many people to boards and this and that. And that's why I'm supporting a overall review to try and make things as fair as possible. Um, but but I, I'm okay with this one. I see what you're saying, but I, I think this is a rare situation and it, and it does kind of smell weird when you put someone who's, who's you know, been asked to, to not drive county direction on this for them to hire whoever is going to be driving. He was not appointed last week. He's been, he was appointed several months ago. So, uh, but the committee it, hasn't started the search. I mean, that's the other thing is I'm just eager for the search to get going and, and it's not been going. And so if it hadn't been going, then we better, you know, put, put someone that, that it doesn't create this, you know, some some level of um, inadequacy to put it sort of use sort of a euphemism, and and then just get this show on the road so we can figure out who our permanent director is going to be. I mean, we still don't have a comprehensive website, and there's still the um, juvenile justice department, for example, presented a juvenile probation beautiful dashboard, but we don't have someone that's going across the board, making sure all the dashboards are to the same standard. I mean, there were various things that was feedback that was like, we've got that down on the public health side, but they don't have it down over there. And then Jad has got a different one. I mean, we really got to get the the permanent person on this so they can look at the long-term stuff. Uh, so I'm just eager to, to really get the show on the road with this committee. It, the, is the motion a motion by Commissioner Garcia? So moved. Second. And what's the motion, Commissioner? I'll read it. I'll read it, Judge. It is a move to make county policy that any county employee terminated from a specific position is ineligible to serve on a current or future hiring committee to fill that vacant specific position. 
All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. No. I'm in favor of this specific and, and narrow motion. Motion carries three to two. Now we have two other items that need to go to executive session. That's item 172 on the regular agenda. Your, your honor. Yes. Can I ask a quick clarification? Jay, does that mean that we just fired again, Bruce? Or does that mean that he continues? And this applies to future. What's the impact? Oh, I, I think I think the way the motion is phrased is current and future. So uh, Mr. High is not eligible to serve on this committee. So um, that doesn't mean he's no longer an employee of, of, of the precinct. So I just want to be clear about that. This is these are yeah, but he cannot serve on that committee based on uh, this motion that was passed. I hope we can get the committee moving. So <laughs> that that would be my my only addendum. Um, so there's item one seventy two which is the tax collection contract negotiations. We need to go to executive session on uh, to consult with the, our attorney on those contract negotiations. And item 363, Brown versus the city of Houston, we need to consult with our attorney on pending litigation. So we need a motion on all of the uh, discussion items, except so for those already voted. Second and also excluding items 172 and 363, which are going to executive session. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. So Maricela, if you're good, I'm gonna say that, that we go to executive session on these two items. Are you, are you okay? Yes, ma'am, I am, thank you. Okay, so it is uh, 1014 and we're going to executive session on 172 to consult with our attorney and 363 to consult with our attorney. And here at this table. <laughs> at risk of, or, with the intention of not keeping folks longer, it's 11.10 and completely Move. referred us back in session. So there's no action on um, Maricela on item 363 regarding the Brown case. On item 172, we need a motion to authorize the county attorney's office and budget management to negotiate the changes changes in the agreement with Linebarger as discussed in executive session and that the tax assessor collector work with universal services and an outside consultant to prepare an RFP to potentially replace the act software. I'm over. Is there a second? Second by Commissioner Garcia. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. No. I'm in favor. So the motion carries three to two. Dave, Jay, Maricela, Lucinda, did I miss anything? Not for I'm me. Good. I'm for me. No, Judge, I think you just want to use the catch all uh, for anything that we haven't voted on. Um, uh, uh, it, 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 I think there were a couple of items that we probably want to just do that, just a general catch all for uh, to pass everything else. A, a, a motion for all other items that weren't already moved. I'll move it. Is there a second? <clears throat> Sorry. Sure. Uh, all right. All in favor? Aye. Judge, if I understand the motion is, is everything that has not already been voted on. Yeah, which that was on the thing, but... agenda to which there was not a opposition that we're voting on those at this time. Um, yeah. um, I'm sorry, this is Maricela. All the items that were on the agenda were already voted on. Okay. That's what I thought. Yes. Okay. I thought there was a couple more. Just wanted Thank to make you. sure. Thank you, Jay. Belt Great. and suspenders. Yeah. Perfect. In that case, it's 11 12th has been real. Y'all take care. Thank you so much. And a very happy good night to good all night. of you. Good night, y'all.